I'm working on it, Tony. I'm waiting for YouTube Live to kick in. Okay, okay. go. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the Appropriations Health Subcommittee public hearing today. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here, and I want to ask my chairs. Uh, Senator Austin, would you like to say anything? Senator Austin? Okay, Senator Austin is watching another Zoom, so we'll, we'll go on to... Senator Austin, would you like to say something? Looks like one moment. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, my computer um, mouse broke yesterday, so I have to use a different mouse to get th things done. Um, I don't have anything to say other than let's just get this moving. We have several hundred people to talk Thank today. You. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Senator Minor. I do not do not. I don't see. Um, and uh, okay, Representative France. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, also, as a uh, good Senator said, I'm looking forward to. Uh, day of hearing from the public on the governor's budget and uh, hear what they have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Abrams. Same, looking forward to the day and evening and night and uh, wanted to hear from everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Dillon. Good morning, everybody. It's gonna be a long day and it's good to see you all. Great. Thank you, thank you everybody. As everybody said, we are going to uh, expect a long day today because we have 204 people that, are, uh, that have signed up to testify. So doing my math, um, I'd say about 10 to 12 hours, maybe, maybe 12 to 14 hours <laughs> of testimony. So I ask everybody to be extremely uh, respectful to the people speaking and also to the people that are listening. Um, this is a day for the public to come and testify to us about the things that they are reflecting on the governor's budget when it comes to health. So I think it's very important that we focus on this because this has been a year that has been affecting everybody's health. And I think it's important that, that we do our due diligence and respond to it in a way that serves the state of Connecticut. So with that, I also want to uh, alert everybody that we do have some people who are presenting their testimony with a video. Um, so they, and um, the Madam Administrator has uh, queued everything up. So I will ask you to please be patient and um, Zoom is always so much fun. So with that, I start with the first person, number one, Jennifer uh, Fiorello. Yes, hi, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Good My morning. name is Jennifer Fiorello, and I represent Bridges Healthcare in Milford, Connecticut. We provide vital mental health and substance use services to adults, families, and children serving Milford, West Haven, and Orange, Connecticut. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on House Bill 6439, an act concerning the state budget for the biennium ending June 30th, 2023. Community nonprofits provide essential services in every city and town in Connecticut, serving people in need and employing tens of thousands. I am here to respectfully request that the legislator appropriate 461 million over five years for community nonprofits. Since 2007, nonprofits have lost at least 461 million in state funding that has not kept pace with inflation or adequately covered increased costs and demand for services over the last 13 years. And in the last year with COVID-19, these challenges have only compounded. COVID-19 has presented considerable challenges for our organization, and we've proven to be resilient and committed to the communities we serve despite the costs associated with managing the virus internally and the ongoing need for PPE and maintaining technology infrastructure to provide clinical services using telehealth. We have been forced to quickly adapt to the changes in the rates of the infection across the state and have had waves of shutting down to face-to-face -face groups and services for our most vulnerable clients. 
while we still have the ability to provide services using telehealth, this method of delivering care is not ideal for those who struggle the most with substance use and chronic mental health challenges. We've witnessed a substantial increase in depression and loneliness, as well as more than a 30% increase in encounters in some of our outpatient programs. Back in fiscal year 2018, we experienced a 5% cut to our largest state contract with the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. For us, that was $353,000. In an effort not to cut back on the level of services we provide, we reassigned caseloads to visit existing staff and did not fill vacant positions. This is not a great way to operate. Our administrative costs continue to increase because of our need to manage heavy regulatory and reporting requirements, fiscally, programmatically, and, and operationally. Since this $353,000 cut, approximately 44,000 has been restored. This is not nearly enough to make up for the extra burden our agency has had to absorb. These demands continue to increase as funding is cut or remains level. The need for mental health and substance use treatment is expected to grow and emerge at, through this pandemic. Now is the time to invest in improvements to the system, not a time to flat fund the budget. Please take this opportunity to increase funding for the community. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions? Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. And, and please understand that if people don't ask questions, it's not because you're not presenting something that's important. It's because we have 204 people to hear today. So we're I'm trying to <laughs> we're trying to be as alert as possible for 12 hours. And so we're, we're wearing on that, but it's important. We have your testimonies and we are all going to make sure we read them. Thank you. Thank have you so much. Day. Have a great day. Thank you. Uh, Lynn Evans, number two, Lynn Evans. I see you on the screen. Lynn Evans, Common Ground. Coming, coming. There we go. Sorry about that. That's quite all right. Technical difficulties. We all have them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to do this. I'll have to hold it. Good morning, Senator Austin and Republic and Representative Walker and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Lynn Evans and I am a 67 year old woman and a registered voter in the town of Manchester. I am here to testify regarding the Demas Bill 6435 budget and requesting an increase over the next few years to enable vulnerable communities to stabilize after this pandemic. I have been a member of Common Ground Social Club and Learning Center for about nine years. I am a member of Intercommunity Health Center and also a proud member of Keep the Promise Coalition organization. For years, I have struggled with mental health and for the most of my life, and most of my life, but the members of Common Ground have become my friends and have helped me get through life struggles. During COVID-19 pandemic, I unfortunately caught COVID-19 and was in a hospital two nurse and two nursing facilities for weeks upon weeks. Without, this, without access to telehealth groups, Provided by Common Ground staff and other providers, I would have not been able to survive and get through this difficult time. I am a proud COVID survivor. I feel that without this, these services provided through intercommunity negatively affect my mental health and would have changed my life for the worst. I am pleased. I am. I am. I am asking, please, that you don't decrease the fund, the budgeting, but increase, but I'm asking to increase the funding for nonprofit lines, such as intercommunity, to provide support and services for the mental health community. They need housing supports in, and Connecticut needs to increase the funding for supportive 
housing, and rental assistance. Everyone needs community support services and is, want, and is waiting on a wait list for help. These services and assistance help connect people in need with resources like food, shelter, employment services, and assistance with getting vaccine registration, as well as detox programs and socialization supports like Common Ground, who have helped the population with, who, with whom coping skills and other services. This year has been a very difficult and more people will need the services and supports in Connecticut. I'm also requesting that DEMIS fund a five-peer respite in Connecticut, one per DEMIS region. We need alternative supports for people in distress. Per respites are free and voluntary and staffed with trauma-informed peers. I thank this committee for their service and listening to my story. Thank you again, a concerned citizen, Lynn Evans. Thank, thank you, Lynn. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you for, for, for giving us an idea of different things that we can look into. Have a great yes. day. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, number three, George Reed Perry. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on House Bill 6439. My name is George Reed Perry, Senior Director of Adult Services here at SARA. Our organization provides services to adults with developmental and intellectual disabilities, supporting them on their path to securing employment and community-based day programming. We support between 250 to 300 adults per year with differing abilities in New Haven, Middlesex, and New London counties and employ approximately 130 employees. As you know, and the governor has recently acknowledged, community nonprofits provide essential services in every city and town in Connecticut, serving people in need and employing tens of thousands as well. This past year has shown the resiliency and dedication of the nonprofit community and all those we employ and provide services to. With that being said, we cannot continue to provide these critical services on well wishes and stagnant funding. I'm here to respectfully request that the legislature appropriate $461 million over five years for the community nonprofits. As you know, since 2007, community nonprofits have lost approximately the $461 million in state funding. This has not kept pace with inflation or adequately covered the increased costs and demands for services over the past 13, now 14 years. From March 2000 until current, what we've seen during COVID is an increase in our expenses due to the pandemic. We have spent well over $40,000 on PPE. We needed to create virtual services seemingly overnight at the cost of $25,000. And none of this is something that we account for. But most importantly, during the COVID pandemic, we did not lay off or terminate any of our staff as a result of that. And that's something we're very proud to say as a community provider. As I've noted, previous budget cuts and chronic underfunding have put our agencies in a constant staffing crunch, and we're competing with big box stores now to compensate our employees at higher starting wages than they can. Most recently, Costco announced their $16 minimum wage, which is higher than the $14.75 that DDS implemented two years ago. The requirements and demands of our job of supporting individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities can be very rigorous. Without adequate funding, we will continue to see a decline in our ability to hire dedicated and highly skilled workforce, which this field requires. So I want to thank you for your time today as you consider appropriating the $461 million over the next five years for our community nonprofits. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you for your, um, thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. And have a good day. You as well. Thank you. Uh, next, we will have a, a videotape from uh, Mary Ann Cole, number four. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Susie Craig. I'm the registered lobbyist for MHC, so I'm going to share the video on behalf of Mary Ann. Um, please know that Mary Ann's actually watching the hearing, so if you have any thoughts or comments you'd like to share, feel free to do that in 
also, if you have any questions, I can relay those to, uh, to Mary and get them back to you. And just a special thank you to Susan Keene for accommodating. We have five videos from Mental Health Connecticut to share. So thank you so much for, um, for making that happen, Susan. And now thank you. Thank technically you. let's hopefully make this happen. You will. <laughs> okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. I think your volume needs to go up. Yeah, I can't seem to turn it up. Mm. Oh, that's too bad. Susie? Yeah. Susie? So... Oh. When you did screen sharing, did you click the little button on the bottom left of the screen that allowed for um, sharing a video, uh, I'm sorry, of audio to sh share uh, sound? I clicked the share screen and then I pulled up the video through a, that was on my desktop. Yeah, so, um, so uh, stop sharing your screen. Okay. Okay. Hold on one second. I'm on now, Susan. I'm so happy to see you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry. All right. Right. So, when, so, so when you share your, when, when you do share screen again, you know how you get, you get that window that shows your desktop and, a yep. lot, and says, it, it says you can choose something. Uh -huh. In the, I've learned the trick finally. In the before you click on it, okay. on that on that Zoom screen that you get. Oh, it says share share com yeah, computer it's, sound. It's, yes. Got okay. it. <laughs> so click so click on that. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Back up just a little bit. Twenty twenty three making appropriations therefore. Hi, my name is Mary Ann Cole and I'm a registered voter in Waterbury, Connecticut. I am a participant of Mental Health Connecticut's Independent Center for 11 years. I am dual diagnosed and look forward to the services I receive. I would be lost if I didn't partake, participate in the program that they have, especially during this pandemic. The benefits I received are staff members reaching out every day, food delivery each week, and interacting with people in my life to ensure structure and balance. I praise the staff for what they are doing during these difficult times and would like others to know that there is help out there for those with mental illness. Please increase the funding for this essential non-program that benefit so many. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And and tell tell Marianne that we, we appreciate her testimony and, and her advocacy because she is an advocate. So thank you. Yes. Thank you, Rep. Okay. Uh, next, next we have number five. Jeffrey Zwal Zwalik? Correct, Zwalik. Thanks. Good. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. I wish you were. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Jeff Zwalik. I am a resident of Farmington. Uh, I work for the Chrysalis Center in Hartford. Um, and I'm here today just because I, I have a different perspective. Um, I do not have, I'm not a social worker, I do not have a background in social services. Um, what I do is I run the social enterprise business that's part of the Chrysler Center. Uh, we are a for-profit business that whose profits are then channeled back to the agency um, to cover sh funding shortfalls. And my role today is, is really to speak on behalf of, of where I'm at, but also just as a, as a taxpayer, quite frankly. Uh, I have been in my role at the Chrysler Center for five years now. Um, coming from a for-profit private background. And when I see um, 
what happens here. And I see folks that come into our programs and leave our programs um, as successful, you know, contributing members of the society by the programs they're able to take advantage of here at the Crystal Center. Um, it, if, if everyone could, could go through our programs and see the successes that we have, um, you know, restoring the, the $461 million funding um, would just seem like a, like a no-brainer. For me, it's a, it's a, it's a no-brainer coming from, the, from a private industry background. Um, we are taking people um, dependent on state services. Um, we're job training them. We're putting them back out into the community as sustainable, you know, contributing members um, of the community. And that, that doesn't happen unless we've got a, you know, a strong background to get those people through the process. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm just here to speak in favor of uh, restoring uh, the funding cuts that have happened over the last five and six years. Thank you, Jeff. And I just want to make sure I understand. So you're, you're in support of the funds that were set up for the services for mental health services and community services out there, correct? correct? Okay, all right, thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Uh, next, we have another video. Um, another video from Matthew Zwau. Um, I'm sorry, wrong, wrong one. Ro, <laughs> Matthew Ro. Okay, I'm gonna show this video as well. Um, just a quick note, the next four folks from Waterbury are not wearing masks, but there was more than a six feet distance between the staff person and our program participant and our staff person is wearing a mask. So for them to capture the audio, they had to do that. But just please know there's great distance between the two of them, even though it doesn't look like it. Um, all right. Senator Austin, Representative Walker and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Matthew Rowe and I am a registered voter in Waterbury, Connecticut. I'm here to testify regarding HB number 6439, an act concerning the state budget for the biennial ending June 30th, 2023, and making appropriations therefore. Please increase funds to the Demas budget. Many nonprofits need the funds desperately to provide services to the community, especially since they have been cut for the past decade. One such place is the Independent Center in Waterbury. They remain very active in these dire times. They help with referrals toward other agencies which may help needs such as tax services, etc. They also hold groups online. One I started last week helps me with writing my story. They also provide meals weekly during this pandemic to its members and also help with a food bank which helps supplement my food stamps. They also help by listening to my many needs and offering encouragement and advice. In Hebrews 13.1, which says, let your brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. They help me always somehow. They are truly my angels for listening to my many plights. Um, I also wanted to, to advocate for myself. I was homeless uh, 15 years ago, and the shelter helped me. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that you would you would definitely provide a space for that seven days that someone could stay who's who's going through a mental health crisis rather than go to the hospital. And uh, with that, thank you and Godspeed. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and let Matthew know he did a fantastic job also. So thank you very much for that testimony. Uh, number seven, uh, Sab Saban Haran. Hello, um, thank you. Uh, my name is Siobhan Haran, and I really appreciate the opportunity to testify on House Bill 6439. I live in Stratford and I've worked for Class Poems since 1983. Uh, we're a nonprofit that's blessed and proud to provide meaningful opportunities and quality of life experiences for uh, people who have significant challenges because of developmental disabilities and autism. In those 38 years with CLASP, 
I've seen the inequity and disparity and undervalued view of the work that our frontline staff provide uh, only get worse. Community nonprofits provide essential services in Connecticut and help Connecticut uh, manage so many different challenges. It's a wonderful place to live and work, but I really think that our um, services just need to be recognized. I hope that we can get the legislature to appropriate the 461 million over five years for community nonprofits, um, commit to increasing the funds that uh, we've lost over the last 13 years, uh, appropriate 128 million um, and increase the funding at least by 7%. Um, the cost of living adjustments have not met the need. Uh, the COVID pandemic has only exacerbated the need. We've had to provide uh, hazard pay. We've been thrilled to be able to provide it, but it's not something that we've been reimbursed for. Um, we've had to provide expensive PPE. We've had to upgrade our computer systems and cybersecurity and online meeting platforms. Um, and we've never closed our doors and we've kept people safe. Our staff have been amazing throughout it all. Um, for years, they've accepted the, the, the idea that they're doing God's work, but that doesn't pay the bills and it's, it's just getting um, impossible to compete. And we desperately need help that this committee and the legislature can provide. Um, we desperately need financial compensation that allows our staff to live among uh, above the poverty line. So please restore uh, the necessary funding and um, have our staff make a, a living wage. Um, in closing, I'd just like to say that uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the hundreds of staff who do amazing work and they deserve um, your attention. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for your advocacy today. So have a wonderful day, thank you. Uh, next we have Victor Buscelli and this is a video. This is a video, yes. Okay. And I will be continuing to share my audio so you can hear it better, but this is a little bit hard to hear, so. Okay. Just so you know. We will get, we will get the message though. <laughs> yeah. Representative Walker and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Victor Buccelli, and I'm a registered voter from Naugatuck, Connecticut. I'm here to testify regarding HB number 6439, an act concerning the state budget for the binomium ending June 30th, 2023, making appropriations therefore. I speak on behalf of the Mental Health Connecticut's Independent Center, Keep the Promise Coalition, as well as myself. I am a recipient of the mental health system. I am diagnosed as schizoaffective disorder and suffer from manic depression. I have been clean for substances for many years now, thus the term dually diagnosed. I identify with others like the likes of William S., Lenny B., Pete D., Robin W., and Whoopi G. The list goes on. For me, services are very limited, specifically co pays, affordable transportation, agencies for rehabilitation. Employment, also clubhouses, etc. I only receive $880 a month after rent, utilities, medicine costs, 
then household items, I am only left with enough for laundry. As far as esteemed needs go, I haven't any. The past year has been even more difficult. With the onset of COVID-19 pandemic, lack of services and isolation was a real issue for many. As we are aware, services for the handicapped, homeless, and addicted is an uncultivated population. For the most part in the community quickly advancing with the times, as a new dawn of another area begins to flower, it's proper to commence a reform on these social injustices. Begin to erase words synonymous with inequality, the poor, less privileged, poverty, homelessness, and the addicted. Over the past 10 years, nonprofit agencies have suffered cuts, and I support the increase in funding for nonprofits as the state now has a surplus. I would also like to mention my support for the peer respite programs and increased funding for supportive housing, rental support, and have included some additional comments for you to read when you have the time. We must make these frail issues top priority. As has been professed, the needs of the one outweigh the needs of the many. Thank you very much for hearing my testimony. Thank you. And thank you. Tell him, tell Victor, thank you so much for his testimony. He did a good job also. Thank you. Uh, number nine, Chelsea Ross. Good morning, distinguished members of the committee. My name is Chelsea Ross. I serve as the deputy director at the Partnership for Strong Communities. We're a statewide nonprofit policy and advocacy organization dedicated to preventing and ending homelessness, expanding affordable housing and building strong communities in our state. The partnership staffs and manages the Reaching Home campaign to prevent and end homelessness, bringing together over 120 partners to build a consensus legislative agenda. I'm gonna highlight a few aspects of the budget that are critically important to us and our partners, many of which you'll hear from today. We strongly support Support the proposed budget for the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services housing supports and services line at 23.4 million in each year of the biennium and are requesting an additional investment of 2.5 million for supportive housing services and 375,000 for outreach to unsheltered homeless. Connecticut has achieved great strides in addressing the needs of people experiencing homelessness via the wraparound services DEMAS provides. In the last eight years, the number of people in the homeless system has decreased by 57% from over 14,000 people in federal fiscal year 2012 to just over 6,000 in 2020. And in the last five years, Connecticut has seen a 60% reduction in chronic homelessness. While we've made significant progress, as of February 23rd, there are still over 1,800 people on the statewide binding list of individuals experiencing homelessness. And cuts to supportive housing services will reverse the substantial progress we've made. Supportive housing is the most effective housing model to end the experience of homelessness. And the additional 2.5 million we're requesting would provide critical supportive housing services to an additional 300 households with persistent obstacles to maintaining housing stability. This need is consistent with the quantitative rationale developed by reaching home partners led by the Corporation for Supportive Housing. In order to effectively locate and engage folks facing the most complex challenges, we need outreach services. The additional 375,000 requested would provide critical service linkages to the over 300 individuals experiencing unsheltered homelessness, living under bridges, in cars or encampments. Current outreach capacity is limited, leaving people vulnerable to severe conditions, including extreme weather and the current global pandemic. As you know, nonprofits, including homeless service organizations are facing unprecedented challenges as they work to meet demand. The costs and revenue losses they've experienced during the pandemic are layered on top of years of budget cuts and rescissions. Our partners have reported employees struggling to meet their basic needs on extremely low wages. 
We support the Connecticut Nonprofit Community Alliance ask to restore 461 million in funding for nonprofits by 2026. We ask that you invest in the essential housing and homeless providers and other nonprofits that have dedicated themselves to the safety and service of others. Allowing our neighbors to experience homelessness is unacceptable. Allowing uh, those that work to end homelessness to be paid wages that don't allow them to provide for their families is unacceptable. Thank you for working to preserve and expand investments in housing supports and the agencies delivering these critical services. Thank you for considering my testimony and for your commitment to the thousands of individuals and families we work to serve. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chelsea, for your testimony. Don't go anywhere. Uh, Representative Betts is getting ready to ask a very, very quick statement because we have another 198 people that will bring us to about 11 o'clock tonight. So thank you, sir. You'd like to say hello? I would, and I will be very brief, but congratulations on the reduction of the homelessness. The question I had pertains to the $375,000 that you're seeking. How is that money specifically used? Oh, that could be a long time and that's a long conversation. So how about we have her give you a written response to that? That would be fine. I'd be Thank happy to much. do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that. Um, next, we have number 10, Brian Lay. Yes, and Brian is also a video. Once again, please note all physical distancing precautions were taken into account. Okay. Hi, my name is Brian Leahy. I'm here to testify regarding HB number 6439 and concerning the state budget for the biennium ending June 30th, 2023, making appropriations therefore. I have an anxiety disorder and ADHD. I also suffer from post-traumatic brain injury. I have volunteered uh, trying to help the homeless uh, people in the winter time with mental illness stop taking their meds. And the Monsignor tells me to tell them where the shelter is. Uh, I go to the Independent Center. Uh, I see my counselor. If anything, I believe that you should be reaching out more and increasing the funds take a look at your appropriation of funds from our taxes and see where it goes what is the most important thing i think that's the people who i see suffering and that's about it. You, you don't have to say it the wrong way. Thank you. I want to thank Brian. I, I liked his last statement. He said, that's about it. You can only say it one way, help us, you know? Um, so thank you. And thank you for, for, Thanks, for the, the, the te his testimony. Uh, next we have Tracy, number 11, Tracy Flood. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I uh, thank you for giving us this time to speak. Um, my name is Tracy Flood and I'm the president of Class Homes and we run group homes for adults with autism and Down syndrome and other developmental disabilities in the Fairfield County area. I've been with Class since 1984 and I can tell you that this past year has been unlike any other that I've seen working in this field. Um, we had many people who were positive for COVID, 31 of the people that we serve and 35 staff. And we had a real challenge trying to have our staff feel comfortable to come into work, to feel safe, that they themselves were not gonna get sick or that they were not gonna bring it home to their families. We feel very lucky that out of all those people, nobody, virtually nobody ended up in the hospital and everybody lived. So uh, in hindsight, we're very, very grateful, but I can tell you it's been an extremely difficult year. 
And especially when you look at the wages that we pay staff, you know, my, my uh, coworker spoke before me, we pay $14.75 an hour. And we require them to come in and do work that is life-saving, life-giving, and uh, putting their own health and safety at risk. But this huge, huge COVID situation has put a strain on a system that's already been broken. This is not new. Uh, virtually all our staff work two to three jobs, and that includes our managers, just to put food on the table and to have shelter. And uh, they have, they're living below the poverty level. And they honestly do this because they love the work that they do. They love to do something meaningful, to give back to their communities and to help. But as other people have said, they could work at Walmart or Target or Amazon and make more money. And this year we've seen that people are beginning to leave the field. Uh, quite frankly, I'm ashamed of the wages that we pay. It, it makes me so sad to see how hard these folks are willing to work and to get paid you know, less than they can make at a gas station. It's just insane. Um, we, do, uh, we do ask your support for the $461 million over five years. We've lost quite a bit of ground in the last 13 years. And we do as many fundraisers as we possibly can. We try to be really creative. We have a very lean administration so that our costs are kept as low as possible. But the, the prof nonprofits have just been losing year after year. And this pre year in particular, we've seen many of our staff change fields. They've said to us, we love doing what we're doing. We love the people that we serve. And it, it fills their hearts and it gives their soul, you know, nourishment. But if they can't put food on the table for their families, they just can't keep doing it. And what I'm seeing is now that people are, are beginning to change careers, we can't fill those positions. You advertise for $14.75 an hour and nobody replies because they can make more money anywhere else. So I'm beginning to, for the first time in 34 years, I'm beginning to think maybe this is not sustainable. And it breaks my heart. We've all put our heart and soul into this field and we love what we do. And we accept the fact that we're not gonna make what you make at IBM or these other big corporations, but you have to be able to give people enough so that they can feed their families. So I, I implore you to allow us to have this additional funding to catch up and to be able to build a, our system back up to where it was many years ago. Our staff, I think, are completely undervalued and the important work that they do is undervalued. And I think it's time for us to recognize that and do something meaningful so that people can continue to work and help the people that we serve. So thank you very much for your kind attention. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. You. Uh, next, we have Annette Bambachi. Yes, last video from the Waterbury crew. Okay. Hello, Senator Olsen, Representative Walker, and the members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Annette Bambasi, and I'm a proud registered voter from Waterbury, Connecticut. I am here to testify regarding HB number 6439, an act concerning the state budget for Benham ending June 13, 2023, and making appropriations therefore. I am a member of Mental Health Connecticut's Independence Center and been a part of the program since I was 18. I am now 43. This nonprofit organization helped me get a job, go to college, advocate for legislative issues, and just plain function as a mental health consumer. I am asking for your help because the funding has been cut over the past 10 years, so we need increased funding to keep the program going. There are so many people that need these services, and without them, our lives wouldn't be good. Now, now is the time to give more since there is extra to give in the state budget. As mental health consumers, these nonprofit organizations help us function in our communities. I need these programs and so do many others. This past year has been especially hard with the pandemic. We need our services more than ever. I am in your corner. Please be in our corner now. You want our votes. We give you our votes. We support you every election year. So please support us now. This club is detrimental to people's mental health. I know we're closed right now because of the pandemic. When we open up, we don't want our, our budget cut. We want our budget increased. So please help us like we help you. You want to continue getting our votes? Please help us. 
I am very adamant about keeping my services because I don't want to end up impatient. I don't want to end up off my meds. I want to be a fully functional person, which I already am. So please advocate for us like we advocate for you during the election year. We need your help. Please help us. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. And I, I love the last lines of all their testimonies because that's where, where the real heart of the testimony is for them. And, Absolutely. and again, thank, thank her for her. She's like, take care of me. I take care of you. You take care of me. We're good. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for helping us out. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Kelly Ann Day, number 13. Good morning. That's a hard act to follow. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and distinguished members of the Appropriation Committee, and thank you for hearing my testimony um, this morning. I'm here to discuss the important investments that the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services makes to end homelessness by making it rare, brief, and non-recurring. My name is Kelly Day, and I, I work in New Haven and Bridgeport. For the past 26 years, I have worked at New Reach, an organization that's dedicated to ending homelessness by providing prevention services, to keep people out of the crisis system, providing services uh, on the emergency side, including emergency shelter, and supportive and affordable housing. Um, New Reach employs over 80 staff members who have dedicated their careers to helping others. And the others that we helped last year uh, totaled almost 4,000. I respectfully request that the committee support the following proposals and expansions from the governor's uh, DEMAS budget. The proposed budget for the housing supports and services line item at 23.4 million each year of the biennium, a new targeted investment of 2.5 million in the housing and services line to provide services to an additional 300 households, support of the Connecticut Community Nonprofits Alliance proposal to restore 461 million over the next few years to community nonprofits. And I wanna say Tracy did an amazing job explaining how important that is and the dedication of our staff um, who've been working through the pandemic for, um, for the past year. Um, and in addition, I'd like to ask you to support uh, Senate Bill 340 to enact a law requiring state agencies to ensure that funding levels for homeless and housing assistance services reflect the true cost of the service delivered and pay adequate wages to frontline workers shelter staff, coordinated access network appointments, which is our entry into the system, our homeless outreach, and our, having, our housing navigation and case management services. That's how we have decreased the number of homeless, as Chelsea mentioned, by over 50%. Nonprofits have continued to work through COVID pandemic and should be receiving the following, living wages, overtime, hazard pay, and benefits for frontline staff. We need the ability to maintain our client caseloads to meet industry standards and provide the best services possible. And we need adequate funding for our other than personnel costs, such as our supplies, our PPE, training of our staff, support of our staff, HR for our staff, technology for our staff. Um, those are really important. We are being accountable for the money that we received through all of those um, support systems, and we need to be adequately funded for those. So uh, thank you for allowing me to provide testimony today. Um, and it's very nice to see Representative Condelari and Representative Dillon um, from New Haven, as well as Representative Walker. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I, I, I visit every once in a while, no problem. Thank you very much. Thank you thank for your you. testimony. Have a good day. Yes, uh, you too. Thank you. Peter, to uh, number 14, Peter. <laughs> they are not present, Madam Chair. Not present, okay. Uh, they, uh, how about uh, Terenda Woodward? Number um, 15. Hello, good morning. Yes, there, there you go. Good, good morning, good morning. Go right ahead, ma'am. Uh, just one second here. to find what I need to say as how you just log in. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Are we are we ready? I am ready now. I'm sorry. That's quite um, all right. Go right ahead, ma'am. Okay. So good afternoon, Senator Austin, if I said that correctly. Representative Walker and members of the Appropriation Committee committee. My name is Turn to Water. I'm assistant coordinator for Journey Found in Southington. I worked for Journey Found for seven years, but I've worked in the same house since 2004 when it was owned by May Institute, which puts me in the same house for around 17 years. I'm here today because workers like me need an in increase in Medicaid funds so we can be paid a living wage and have affordable benefits. The increase in Medicaid would also help to attract workers so that we wouldn't have the massive staffing crisis we have in this field right now. I enjoy what I do because I enjoy working with the clients. I love my guys. For me, there isn't a better house in the state. These individuals are like families to me. They're like my brothers. I pick them up from their day program, pass their, medic their medications, talk to them about how their day went, take them to their appointments, cook for them, help them with their hygiene and many other things. While I love doing this for these individuals, I still have to sacrifice my personal life due to the shortage of staff throughout Journey Found. There's not enough staff to go around all, house, all houses, which means I will, which means while I should be working only 40 hours in my house, I end up working about 65 hours, close to every week. And then I turn around and help out other houses working another 20 to 30 additional hours. This puts me around 90 plus hours a week. We have many vacancies, many vacancies. And right now we only have four caregivers total to cover three shifts, seven days a week in my current house. We've had staff quit due to the pandemic, leaving us to float staff from house to house. Staff also quitting because they're not being paid what they feel they should be being, what they, should, the feel they should be being paid. I'm sorry, Trina, could you start to sum up because it, you're supposed to only have three minutes, I'm sorry. Okay, staffing is bad at Journey Fallon has been using staff from, uh, staffing is bad that Journey Fallon has been using staff from staffing agencies to fill out, to fill our vacancies, which can be a problem because they get paid more than us, but are limited to the things that they can do for individuals. When it comes to my wages, I'm able to make ends meet because I work 90 hours a week. If I didn't have to work 90 hours, it could just, I could just work 40 hours and still be able to make me make ends meet. It would mean so much to me. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, next, we have number 16, Christine Olbries. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Hi. Hello, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Christine Olbrys, and I'm speaking to you on behalf of UCP of Eastern Connecticut. Our mission is to advance the independence and full citizenship of individuals across a spectrum of disabilities, including cerebral palsy. UCP supports people throughout New London and Middlesex counties. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify today on House Bill 6439. As you know, Connecticut nonprofits provide essential services in every city and town in Connecticut, and we serve people in need and we employ tens of thousands of people. And I'm here today to respectfully request that the legislature approve the $461 million over five years for community nonprofits. Since 2007, the nonprofits have lost at least $461 million in state funding um, and, has, and hasn't been able to keep pace with, fund, with inflation or adequately increased costs or demands for services over the last 13 or so years. Um, I'd like to share with you today the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic has negatively impacted UCP of Eastern Connecticut and the individuals that we support. So UCP supports people who have significant cognitive and physical disabilities and with the health risks associated with the pandemic, um, it caused people with disabilities to become very isolated and took them away from their work, communities, friendships because of the requirements to stay home and stay safe to ensure safety. And as a result, individuals who were active members of their local community, either through working or volunteering, lost access to that community because of the pandemic. Volunteer and work sites were closed. Many continue to be closed today. And this caused individuals to lose access to the tools and training that they need to learn skills to become competitively employed or has resulted in job loss for them. The pandemic also created staffing challenges for our agency. Many individuals who were no longer able to go to work um, or to their community programs had to stay home. And UCP uh, provided additional staffing to support people to keep them safe and meaningfully engaged. 
This created overtime expenses that outpaced our typical overtime costs. And additionally, realizing it was the right thing to do, UCP began offering enhanced pay to employees during the pandemic, which rose above and beyond our, significant, our uh, budgeted staffing expenses. Uh, additionally, historic budget cuts and chronic underfunding have made it very difficult for agencies and UCP to recruit, train, and retain high quality professional experience direct support professionals and to pay them at a competitive wage. By underfunding or cutting funds, providers are constantly challenged to deliver the high quality services the individuals need because of staff turnover. And demand continues to increase as funding is cut. So I wanna thank you today for your time as you consider appropriating the $461 million over the next five years for community nonprofits. Thank you. Thank you and thank you, thank you for your for your testimony. Thank you very much. Have a have thank a you. great day. You too. Thank you. Um, next number seventeen, Brianne Hill. Hello. Hello. Greetings. Hello. Greetings, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the state budget for the biennium ending in June 2023. My name is Brienne Hill. I'm a day and work program manager at Ability Beyond and have been with the agency for 18 years. I now manage a transitional day and work program for young adults living in the Bristol area. Our mission is in our name. We discover, build and celebrate the ability in all people. Our agency employs and, and serves individuals with various disabilities. As you know, community nonprofits provide essential services in every city and town in Connecticut, serving people in need and employing tens of thousands. They're what make Connecticut a great place to live and work. I would like you to restore funding that was cut. Most young adults I currently work with have a rocky start in life, leaving them to struggle mentally in their young adult years with feelings of hopelessness and suicide. My transition program motivates, educates, and advocates for participants to be, be a better version of themselves so that they feel more confident about who they are and reach their goals. Before budget cuts, my program worked with young adults showcasing how the world of employment could positively impact their lives to live independently and have a stable future while also incentivizing them for their participation. The money gained from participating helps them purchase personal care needs, transportation needs, such as a bus ticket, and some individuals would also save that money to buy furniture or needed items when they move. Consequently, after the budget cuts occurred, we had to stop incentivizing participation. Incentivizing participation also allows my staff to teach young adults to work hard for their money, read a paycheck, budget skills, and eventually instill the motivation to gain employment. The COVID-19 pandemic has intensified our already underfunded nonprofit organizations and swiftly brought unexpected budgetary and operational challenges. Fortunately, our dedicated leaders, clinical teams and essential workers have been working diligently through the pandemic to ensure our vulnerable population's health and safety. Our agency was required to stretch financially to obtain necessary personal protective equipment and cleaning supplies, support rapid change in technology to provide telehealth and virtual services and provide essential workers hazardous pay who worked exclusively with the di um, those diagnosed with COVID-19. For those in our care struggling with mental health conditions, the pandemic has caused an uptick in symptoms. Our clinical team and essential staff have worked tirelessly to guide and support these folks to ensure their health and safety. Virtual programming has also been vital in building social connections with peers, learning life skills and employment hard and soft skills as we anticipate returning to the community. The pandemic has impacted the mental health of many and it will continue to grow significantly. Now is not the time to continue to cut an already underfunded system. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And thank you for doing it in three minutes. <laughs> thank you very much. Have a great day. Uh, number 18, Nika Lyons. They are not present, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, number 19, Diana Hagen. Yes, hello and happy spring to this esteemed committee. Um, I'm Diana Hagen. I'm the manager of Common Ground Social Rehabilitation Club and inter interim co-chair for the Keep the Promise Coalition. Um, we're here to present the Common Ground group testimonial via video and uh, to support the increase of the funding for $461 million for the DEMAS and nonprofit community supports housing and peer respite services. And a special shout out to Susan Keen for, for making all of this happen. Here's the group testimonial. Thank you. 
and hopefully you will be able to share. Okay, it's not sharing. It was. The screen is not sharing. Hold on a second. I'm so sorry. Okay. Would you like me to, oh, well, no, I can't do that. I was gonna say, go to the next one, but it, it won't work that way. No, I got it right here. Okay. Here we go. Don't forget to share vid, the, the audio. I got, got it. <laughs> here we go. Hello, my name is Rick Geisman. I'm a social rehab counselor with Common Ground Social Club. Today, we'd like to present some testimony to you. We have a few of our members with us. They'd like to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Sandy Almeida. I'm a registered voter for the town of Newington. My name is Mike Wimbush, and I'm a registered voter in the town of Manchester. My name is Crystal Piat. I'm a registered voter from East Hartford, Connecticut. Hello, I'm Peter Tecito, a registered voter in the town of East Hartford. I suffer from a severe chronic mental illness, which manifested in 1999. The comprehensive care that I currently receive provides me with a quality of life I was previously lacking. It affords me hope for a future and has given me opportunities to serve in my community. The funds allocated to the Demas budget help support the community behavioral health providers, which are essential for people like me. Hello, my name is Trudy McAllister. I'm a social rehab counselor at Common Ground. Hi, my name is Mark Kemper, uh, resident of Wethersfield. I uh, needed programs that they provided when I was homeless, and they helped me with housing and other things. Hi, I'm Lynn Evans, a registered voter in the town of Manchester and a COVID survivor. If it was not for Zoom, I would not be here. Hi, my name is Julia Pannone. I am an OT intern at Common Ground, and I'm a registered voter in the town of Wallingford, Connecticut. Hi, I'm Kimberly Walton. I'm a registered voter in Stanford, Connecticut. I am Brittany Crockett, an OT8 intern at Common Ground and a registered voter in New Britain. Hi, my name is Michelle Levine. I, I am a resident of East Hartford. Hi, I'm Anthony Rogers. I'm a, a voter from East Hartford. Hi, I'm Hannah O'Regan. I'm a registered voter in Weathersfield, Connecticut. I receive HUD housing, community services, and behavioral health through intercommunity, a nonprofit that works with Demas. I'm a member of the Common Ground Social Club, where I found a home, a community of friends, and peer support. When I'm my mission when I moved to the Hartford area was to create a better life for myself. So I challenged myself to interact with Common Ground in order to create a support network and make a new home here. And then COVID hit. So I learned to Zoom. Not only are Common Ground Zoom groups good for support and distraction from a global pandemic, civil unrest, and then insurrection, they help me with my depression. I Zoom into Common Ground groups to be with other people who are like me. It's my community. Common Ground offers me the opportunity to change myself when I cannot change, do it on my own. I Zoom when I'm feeling alone, overwhelmed, and depressed, and then I feel better. I Zoom even when I don't want to, because that's where we distract, we identify, we vent, and despite everything, that's where we laugh. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, everybody. I'm Diana Hagen, social worker and manager of Intercommunities Common Ground interim chair of Keep the Promise Coalition and a registered voter in Tolland. We are so Common Ground Social Rehabilitation Club and we are stronger and more resilient together. We support and request increases to DEMAS budgets for the ability to provide supportive housing, mental health and community supports for the extremely vulnerable individuals, which many in this group were at one time. This pandemic has made life very challenging when so many more are in need of mental health support and services and are at risk of becoming homeless. Many healthcare workers will need support to overcome 
trauma from this past year. And with all the cuts in the past decade, the current funding is like butter smeared over too much bread. It's just not enough. We thank you very much for listening to our collective testimony. Thank you, Diana. And thank, thank your team and your membership for, for that testimony. Thank you. Thank you for listening, everyone. Have a good day. Me too. Uh, Kathy Flaherty, number 20, Kathy Flaherty. And good morning, Representative Walker, Senator Austin, uh, Senator Minor, Representative France. Uh, my name is Kathy Flaherty. I'm the Executive Director of Connecticut Legal Rights Project. Um, and I'm here to offer testimony today regarding the DEMAS and DDS budgets. Uh, first, as always, must thank the governor for level funding of Connecticut Legal Rights Project, which allows us to continue to represent our clients. Uh, we provide legal services to people who are eligible for mental health services from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Want to point out a couple things that aren't in my written testimony. First, I want to add my voice to the support for the peer respite proposal. Um, I can tell you from personal experience that support from peers is absolutely critical to helping people maintain their recovery. A lot of people think that you need to go into a hospital or that you need to get service from professionals to recover from emotional distress. Frankly, you just don't. Sometimes hospitals are necessary, but sometimes they cause harm in their own right. That's why I very much encourage you to support the proposal in the governor's budget for that funding for money follows the person placements so that people can get out of Connecticut Valley Hospital and the other state operated psychiatric facilities. Our folks who end up in those hospitals spend months, if not years in the hospital because the state lacks adequate affordable housing with funding for wraparound services and supports. People have the legal right to be in the community. That's why we have had a class action lawsuit pending against the state of Connecticut for violating people's rights for the last three years now, because we filed in 2018. So I'm not saying the money is in the budget because that lawsuit is still pending, but I'm also not saying it's not there because the lawsuit is still pending. So I really think it's far past time for the state to do the right thing. And one thing that really concerns me in this budget proposal is the fact that they keep level funding and for us to celebrate that when we all know the needs have increased and level funding of resources is simply not enough. That they're talking about uh, savings for closing a community living arrangement in DDS. Closing institutions is supposed to result in savings that can be reinvested elsewhere, not simply a budget cutting mechanism. So I appreciate your time today. You will see me tomorrow. I know a lot of my friends are testifying, so I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your test testimony, Kathy. I think I've seen you on my Zooms lately. So thank you. Thank you for your, your testimony. Have You're a good welcome. day. Uh, next, number 21, Helen Berlin. And we are through the first hour. Good morning, um, members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for the opportunity speak to you this morning. My name is Helen Berland and I'm the Executive Director of St. Catherine Center for Special Needs located in Fairfield. We are a small nonprofit whose mission includes providing an adult day service program on behalf of the Department of Developmental Services. Community nonprofits provide essential services in every city and town in Connecticut, serving people in need and employing tens of thousands. They are what makes Connecticut a great place to live and work. At St. Catherine Center, we are committed to the individuals that we serve and are passionate about the role that nonprofits play in contributing to the quality of life for all residents in Connecticut. I believe that we all share in a responsibility to care for the most vulnerable among us. This partnership between state government and nonprofits is central to meeting the needs in our communities. During 2020, we all learned new terms like Zoom and Pivot. We learned how important the mute and unmute button was. We learned that 20 seconds of hand-washed feet of social distance was central to our reopening plans. But most importantly, we demonstrated that services such as support for adults with disabilities are critical, essential to not only the individuals that receiving the services, but also to their families who rely on those services. 
and nonprofits like St. Kenner that provide high quality, reliable support for these loved ones are at the core of the state's ability to deliver on this commitment. I am here to respectfully request that the legislature appropriate additional funding for community nonprofits. Since 2007, community nonprofits have lost at least 461 million in state funding that has not kept pace with inflation or adequately covered increased costs and demand for services. At St. Catherine Center, there's a gap of $5,000 and $12,000 between what the state reimburse rate and what our actual costs are annually per individual that we serve. Restated, that is a gap at the low end of 125,000 and at the high end, $300,000 per year. And we are a small nonprofit. That represents more than 10% of my operating budget. As a result of this gap, we have not been able to expand our program in large part because I cannot afford to take on any additional financial exposure. Even though I have more than a dozen individuals who are seeking our services as we speak. Chronic funding of services limits our ability to introduce new programs, meet the continuing growing demand for services, make a stable workforce, and meet our commitment to the individuals and families that rely on our services. Demand continues to increase while funding has not kept pace. Please consider the opportunity to invest in services we provide. Nonprofits are important partners. This is an opportunity to show the state's commitment to that partnership by moving toward a realistic funding model, enabling us to work together in a collaborative manner. Thank you for your time and consideration. Okay. Thank you and thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thanks. Uh, next we have Teresa Passarelli, number 22. Yes, that's me. Oh, good. Hi, Teresa. Go right ahead, ma'am. Okay. Good afternoon, Senator Osten and Walker, Representative Walker. I am a member of the uh, and members of the Appropriation Committee. My name is Teresa Passarelli. I live in Waterbury, Connecticut. I am a residential program worker, RPW, at Oak Hill Group Home in Waterbury and have worked there for 22 years. I come before you today to urge you to increase funding for group, home, group homes like mine. I love to work. I do enjoy caring for my residents and it's a great fulfillment helping them live more comfortably. Happier lives. I'm sorry, I need to change where I am, I'm sorry. Go. Okay. Sorry, I had to go to a different location. No problem. Um, I enjoy um, the fulfillment of helping my individuals, hygiene, getting them involved in activities and recreation, getting them out into the community as well as following their behavioral structures and daily routines. Our residents spend more time with, uh, we spend more time with them than their families, especially during the pandemic. As much as I enjoy the work I do, there is definitely challenges. We are short staff, which can make it can make um, positive care, uh, providing care difficult. Um, this issue ex ex <clears throat> exhausts uh, all of us, and especially during this pandemic, we've had to give up um, being with our families. We are short staffed. We um, come to work and we get stuck in this group, in this area. Um, we have um, a 24 hour home here with three shifts. And that is a total of five caregivers throughout the day. We are a 24, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my foot. 
Um, we only have eight members to our, um, our staff. Um, Teresa, why don't you just talk from your heart? Honestly, what I wrote was very much from my heart. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm supposed to work 37 hours a week. I usually end up working 50, including some days, which is 15 hours continuously. We work double shifts and only go home to sleep. Some homes will use um, substitutes for caregivers and staffing. Um, we are trying to avoid that here in this group home. We are COVID free and have been COVID free because we stick to our short amount of staff that we have. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I want to, you have to sum up because it's um, much longer than three minutes. Okay. okay. Um, we are, we are, we're exhausted because we're working so many hours and, and we, we really, um, could use the extra funding to help the people and the individuals that are intellectually disabled to yep. help them better. And th thank you for your advocacy. Thank you for testifying and, and speaking from your heart. That's important that everybody hear that. So have we, a- have We a love these people and they're part of our family. We're, we're their family. We're our, what they see every day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you. you okay. Uh, next, um, number 23, Heather Latora. Good morning. I'm glad morning. it's still morning for me today. <laughs> Hi. Um, good morning, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Heather Latora. I'm the president of Marrakesh, and we provide services through DDS, DMS, DCF, DSS, DPH, and other statewide um, organizations. And this is actually our 50th anniversary this year, so that's exciting. I've been working at Marrakesh for the past 35 years, and I've been here, here, well, actually in Hartford, too many times to count, pleading with you, our representative of the state to value that we support our league and the quality and cost-effective, critically essential service we bring to Connecticut by reimbursing us fairly for the services we're asked to provide, contracted to provide, and paid for to provide. We're basically your contract employees. Thank you, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, for your bold statement at the press conference. Hmm. Heather? I can't hear, is anybody here? Uh, no, the person uh, his screen is frozen. So, well, Heather, um, Heather, try turning off your video because you've frozen. No, I think we have to move on, Tony. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And I'm sorry for that. Um, next, Derricka Reed, 24. Derricka Reed, is she on? Did I lose my turn? I'm sorry, Heather. I lose my turn. Yes. Derricka Reed, number 24, is she on? She is on the pa panel, Madam Chair. She is. Derricka Reed, please. I'm gonna ask everybody, I see Derricka. Um, everybody, please be conscious of, the, of where you are and be ready to testify as soon as you are called upon because it, it, it creates um, a real time issue here. Okay, Derricka is not responding, so we are going to go move on. Uh, next, we'll go to Candace Carlson. 
Good morning, Senator Olston, Representative Walker, and members of the committee. My name is Candace Carlson, and I have been employed by DDS as a caseworker in the Individual Home Supports Program for over 27 years. I am testifying and advocating today on behalf of our voiceless individuals statewide that do not have the ability and or the means to advocate for themselves. I am also here to ask that you help support and fund the Department of Developmental Services by expanding respite services within DDS that are so desperately needed to help provide essential services for individuals with IDD and their families. I'd also like to speak to the need to staff agencies like DDS and DEMAS. These agencies are consistently underfunded and understaffed in an effort to save money. The COVID pandemic has exposed and exacerbated this systematic pattern of unsafe staffing levels statewide throughout all agencies. The combination of unsafe staffing and lack of quality resources during COVID has cost individuals and employees their lives. That is very concerning, not just as a caseworker, not just as a taxpayer, but as a woman with a moral meter. Our Connecticut residents who have intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities, and mental illnesses and their families deserve better. The state's direct care workers deserve better. This insatiable cycle has to change and each one of you can help. Each and every one of you can demand that our most vulnerable statewide are provided with the highest quality of care. Respite services are much needed throughout the state to help provide essential services for individuals with IDD and their families. Once again, I respectfully ask this committee to help support and fund our Connecticut state agencies that are designed to help our most needy statewide, specifically expanding the respite services within DDS and helping to fund our agencies to the levels that are needed to staff them adequately. I also ask this, this committee to ensure that Connecticut agencies are held accountable in a measurable way for true transparency. With that, I thank you for all that you do, and I thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Candace, and thank you for your testimony. And I think we all got the, the last of that comment, so thank you. We will. Next, we have um, Raymond Sullivan, number 26. Yes, good morning. Distinguished, good morning. Uh, distinguished chairs and uh, members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for allowing me to test uh, to give testament regarding the governor's proposed budget, uh, specifically with regard to public health and local public health. By way of introduction, my name is Dr. Ray Sullivan. I'm director of health for the town of Brookfield and also a member of the board of the Connecticut Association of Directors of Health. I was in the practice of general surgery for 30 years, during which time I have served as a chief of staff, as a hospital trustee of a major health network. And why am I revealing this? Because all that time, steeped so deeply in the field of healthcare, I has had so little knowledge and appreciation for the enormous amount of work and dedication provided by local public health to keep our community safe, healthy, and secure. That is, until I became a public health official myself some 11 years ago. Now my thought remains, if I had so little idea about these efforts on our behalf, how much appreciation could the average lay person or even state officials for that matter or members of the legislature itself have any specific knowledge of the tremendous amount of work that they carry out? Now that the workload has been doubled or even tripled in the face of the current pandemic, my perspective is even deeper. The governor has proposed a level funding budget for the Department of Public Health and for the next few years. This is in the midst of the greatest public health disaster in generations. Perhaps there are still some of you who remember World War II. He appears to suggest, however, that a steady stream of new grants from the already broken federal government will come 
and cover any shortfalls. Indeed, it's highly unlikely that any such thing will occur. The State Department of Public Health has been overwhelmed with work during this pandemic, yet they have stood up admirably any, and uh, have been a huge help to local public health. Level funding of DPH is unconscionable in today's environment. As a part of that budget, there's been a statutory annual rate of $1.85 per capita. That's less than a half a cup of coffee, Starbucks coffee per year, allegedly set aside for just some local health departments and districts, which meet the criteria of serving a population of at least 50,000 residents. So those communities uh, and departments, and many of them are your own, um, There has been no funding whatsoever. If you have 50,000 or less, whether you're a district or a local health department, you are not eligible for any per capita funding. Um, yet the residents of those towns and districts pay their fair share of taxes without receiving any benefit for those dollars from the state. If this not an example of de facto taxation without representation, I don't know what is. Furthermore, to make matters worse, even those health departments and districts designated to receive per capita funding have seen that funding all disappear as that line item has been reduced or eliminated entirely from years. The Mr. primary Scott, response, yes. Ms. Could you sum up because you're, you're over the three minute mark. Oh, okay, sure. I just want to mention that uh, local public health not only is uh, responsible for carrying out the uh, duties and responsibilities of the uh, public health code, but we also assist uh, SDE in overseeing healthy schools and providing vaccines for teachers, for DEEP for monitoring bathing waters and uh, lakes for toxic algae, sewage spills, PFAS, vector-borne disease, for the AG's office, we also work in housing courts, healthy homes, landlord tenant disputes, and the list goes on and on and on. Thank you. We certainly appreciate the financial challenges that Connecticut and so many other states are facing, but giving the overwhelming, overwhelming workplace squarely upon the shoulders of local public health, we beseech you to consider restoring at a minimum and even fair increasing the cost of half a cup of coffee to local public health to support those unfunded mandates. Thank you for your time and thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And, and have a great day. Thank you for testifying. Thank you. Um, Madam Administrator, are we good with the two people that were not able to get through? Did they, do they have connectivity now? Uh, not yet, Madam Chair. I'll keep you posted. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll go on to number 27. Michael Askew, followed by Michael is number 28, Barry Simon, followed by Barry will be number 29, Edith Torres. So please prepare yourself. Thank you. Go right ahead, Michael. Uh, good morning, uh, Senator Olson and Representative Walker and to the uh, members of Appropriations Committee. Uh, my name is Mike Askew. I'm Director of Recovery Advocacy for CCAR, Connecticut Community for Addiction Recovery. We're a nonprofit uh, recovery community organization in the state that promotes recovery from substance use. Uh, and we promote it through advocacy, education, and service. I remember last year talking about the 27 recovery community centers in the state of Massachusetts, but uh, certainly we do have five in the state of Connecticut that's doing extraordinary work. Uh, but I want to just share that uh, I remember waking up in a cold, dark, isolated jail cell to the smell of stale body odor wondering, how did I get here again? I'm a person in recovery now uh, with 31 years removed. And I'm so grateful to have had that opportunity that I was able to be given a second chance. But I think we all understand that we're in an opioid crisis right now still. People are dying. People are dying more than the year before. And, 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 and the couple that uh, we are, have been in a COVID epidemic for a year now. 
the challenges that people are needing to help support themselves with be able to uh, gain employment and housing. And, you know, it, it hurts my heart when people tell me they don't know where to go to get help because it's so limited. And, but the work that the nonprofits are doing is extraordinary work because we're doing the work at the, at the ground level of walking people hand in hand. I think it's been shared that uh, we've lost on uh, increased funding over the years. So I'm, I'm encouraging the appropriation of $461 million over five years to a lot of the community nonprofits that still do this extraordinary work. And I want to thank uh, the Department of Health and Dick Services for being a leader in the state with supporting this delivery system. But more importantly, uh, I just want to leave with a note of the impact that CCAR has made in one uh, initiative that we provide, and that is our Emergency Department Recovery Coach Program. That, that is that we have 20 full-time coaches going into 23 emergency room settings. Last year during COVID, during this epidemic, we still was able to support 4,251 individuals. And half of them, over 2,253 individuals went straight to a detox. Hey, th th thank you, thank you for that. Thank you for that that information. That's really important that that everybody hears and understands the dedication of CCAR. So thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Walker. And I and I just want to thank the committee uh, because you're not new to this. Right. You're new to this. So I know you got a long day ahead. Yep. But stay encouraged. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we have Barry Simon. After Barry, we have Edith Torres, Torres. And after Edith, Adria Giordano. Are all of those people here? Okay, let's go right in. Barry, I, so, I saw you somewhere. So good morning and um, thank you. Uh, my name is Barry Simon. I'm the president of Oak Hill. Um, it's nice to see uh, many of your faces. Um, as you know, we're the largest purchase of service provider um, in Connecticut. Um, Representative Walker, you said to speak from the heart and you have my written testimony. Um, as you can imagine, I'm frustrated as heck. Um, I've been at this for 30 years uh, over which uh, most of it has been without any rate increases. Um, and I'm here today to, to tell you, you know, how we're doing and it is a real challenge to do business in Connecticut. Um, uh, you know, I, I thank you for your public support of our industry, um, but you also know that we've been ravaged by COVID-19. Our employees have gone above and beyond and we're demoralized after years of neglect uh, and inequity uh, in the way that we've been treated um, by the budgets and frankly, by the governor's proposed budget. Um, programs have closed uh, the last few years and they're continuing to do so. Um, we deliver the state's core services, yet we're forced to operate on repeated rescissions and chronic underfunding. Um, our latest rate decrease is $500,000 in our day programming um, while our services continue to be up. We're spending $125,000 a month on COVID-19 um, supplies and um, staff coverage while the state sits on a $500 million Medicaid lapse. I mean, this is an absurd way to treat a partner uh, in the way that we, we do services. So, you know, we can't raise taxes. We can't um, raise our rates. Uh, you guys control that. Um, so we're hoping that you are really committed this time to increasing our funding uh, and appropriating the 128 million that was asked for in the in the uh, nonprofit ask, and the state's net on that is 67 million. Um, you know, it's you know as you can hear, I, I'm highly frustrated. Um, you know, we continue to be ignored. We continue to be, um, you know, passed over as a priority in the budget. Uh, we've been forced to operate under a separate and unequal payment system. 
Um, and it's a false conclusion that ethical appeals and persuasion bring about justice. Uh, our stagnant rates, uh, you know, cement many of the workers in poverty. Um, it creates a situation where strike actions are the only way that our employees get uh, any attention. Um, and the ability to avoid strikes and eliminate poverty or wages rest with you. Uh, the work is hard, the work is noble. Uh, our employees need to be able to think of these as careers, um, but they're unable to do it if the rates stay the way they are. So in this budget process, we're asking for you to vote to make uh, equality you know, imperative in this budget and not to evade the issue once again. Uh, you know, I thank you for your time, your consideration on this important issue. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you for your testimony. And I can assure you that we are not ignoring you. And I can assure you that um, it is not our proposed budget that is shortchanging you in, at all. So please understand that. And we are working very hard to try and get nonprofits the appreciation and the economic support that they deserve because they do so much for all of us to be able to survive. So thank you. Um, and thank you for, for all you do. And so, thank you. Okay, have a good day. You too. Um, Edith Torres and is Edith here? And then Adria, I see Adria is here. Is Edith here? Yes, I'm here. There you go. Go right ahead, ma'am. Hi, good morning, Senator, Representative, and members of the Appropriation Committee. Thank you for hearing my testimony today on the House, House Bill 6439. I'm here to discuss the important investment to the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services to support efforts to end homelessness in Connecticut. My name is Edith Torres, and I'm the Program Manager for the Supportive Housing Programs at Chrysalis Center. I am a resident of the town of East Hartford, Connecticut. Crystalis Center is a nonprofit, socially innovative, multi-service organization that serves individuals and their families living in the state of Connecticut. We help people living in poverty, veterans, men, women, children, and young adults who are struggling with mental health addiction, HIV, homelessness, and those returning from incarceration. I'm here today to discuss the important investment to the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, which support the efforts to end homelessness in Connecticut. As the program manager for supportive housing programs at Crisali Center, I have seen people coming from homelessness and families who are on the brink of homelessness. It is critical to support housing programs like Crisali Center, which make a big difference in people's lives. We know that safe, affordable, and permanent housing is the only solution for, to homelessness. When our state's residents have a stable housing, their economic and health outcomes improve. During COVID-19, the need for permanent housing for all of Connecticut residents has become even more important. I respectfully request that the committee support House Bill 6439. Investing in these critical programs like Crisali Center is so important to ensure everybody has a safe, a stable place to call home. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about Crisali Center and the important work that we can do together to help provide a home for everyone in Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Um, next, Adria, and after A Adria, number thirty-one, uh, Susie Craig is Susie Craig here, and after Susie Craig, Danielle Chenard. Hmm. Okay, Adria. Adria. Good morning, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for hearing my testimony today on House Bill 6439. My name is Adria Giordano, and I'm the Director of Development and Communications at Chrysalis Center and a resident of West Hartford, Connecticut. As you heard from my colleague Edith, Chrysalis Center is a nonprofit organization that serves individuals and families throughout Connecticut. We help people living in poverty, 
those who are struggling with mental health, addiction, HIV AIDS, homelessness, and those returning from incarceration. I'm here today to support Bill 6439 and how critical it is that we support the efforts to end homelessness in Connecticut. Crystal Center's mission is to provide support services to assist people in need to transform their lives. Last year alone, we helped transform the lives of more than 1,500 individuals in Connecticut and many who are families. Our community supportive housing case management services helps ensure that individuals who are homeless or coming from homelessness have safe and affordable housing along with the critical community supports needed to become economically self-sufficient. Truly our clients are living in poverty. They're struggling with mental health, many with coexisting abuse issues. They're coming from homelessness and have no supports around them. We are their support system. As you heard from Edith, securing housing is a first critical step in assisting chronically homeless individuals. And once housing is secured, the underlying issues which resulted in the individual becoming homeless in the first place can then be addressed. As the Director of Development and Communications, I have the wonderful opportunity to meet many of our clients firsthand who are coming from homelessness. They are resilient, courageous, and so grateful for the programs that Crystal Center and many of the nonprofits testifying here today give. Our programs and staff who work with them every single day have given them something, and that is hope. They now have a place to call home and a bed to sleep in. Bill, a veteran I met last year, shared with me he now has room to stretch out when he sleeps. And when I asked him why, he said it was because for the first time in decades, he has a bed to sleep in and he's not sleeping in the back seat of his car where he has for years. And this is hope. As you, has heard, have you, as you have heard, it is vital that House Bill 6439 is passed to continue our progress and ensure that individuals like Bill have a safe and stable place to call home. Thank you all to the committee for this opportunity to present this testimony and for listening to the important work being done by Chrysler Center, as well as many other nonprofits throughout the state. With your support, we can provide individuals and families who are homeless or on the brink of homelessness with both a home and a hope for a brighter future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for, for, for your testimony. Um, and ha have a good day. And thank you for your advocacy, too. Uh, next, we have number 30, Adria. I thought I saw her. Did I see Adria? She was here, Madam Chair, but looks like she left. Okay. She was just on. I saw her on the, okay. Uh, next, Susie Craig. Good morning, uh, Rep Walker, uh, Senator Austin, and members of the committee. Thanks so much for the opportunity to testify. I work for Mental Health Connecticut. I'm the registered lobbyist. I've been here for going on six years. Um, we've been around for 113 years, um, integral part of the recovery community in the state. Um, you have my written testimony, and um, you're going to hear a, a lot of you know personal stories and, and very important uh, testimonies about where the, the dollars are, are going and, and why this is so important that we fund 461 million for the system. I just wanna put a fine point on something that's in my testimony. And it's something that I've learned being at MHC is that we can't do our work unless we have all of our community partners and unless the entire system is funded. So I look at this work as a very complex ecosystem. And like any ecosystem, there's a lot of moving parts. And if one piece isn't supported, it affects another piece. So one of the examples I give in my testimony is a program out of the Department of Housing, but it's a great example um, of, of how and where the future of healthcare is going. Um, so coordinated access networks, um, as most of you know, is um, funding and making sure that homelessness is addressed in the state, something that um, we do an exceptionally great job of. And we do it because through the CANS and uh, which is a, a collaboration of multiple organizations and DOH, they come together to streamline the process, to work together, to make sure that 
they can help accelerate and support and provide a better quality path for someone moving from homelessness back into stable housing and really giving them a great start into the next phase of their life. So that's just one example. Um, and obviously that's, you know, through the DOH, but I think it's a great example to look at, you know, where else can we make sure that we are shoring up the entire ecosystem of care so that when, you know, we need to get something done, we're not missing a community partner that was so critical to making sure that it's helping someone, um, you know, who needs that help. And, you know, I think there's a, there's a phrase that, you know, gets used in healthcare a lot and it's called no wrong door. And the idea of that is there should never be a wrong pathway for someone to have access to care. And I feel like that's the lens and the approach that we need to take to all of this, which is making sure that the system is funded so everyone can get what they need um, to be, you know, long-term have sustainable health and wellness. So thank you for, for the opportunity to talk and, and I really appreciate you listening. I see listening faces and lots of faces. It's great to see everybody. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Um, and when you said um, no wrong door, I, that's, a, that's an old campaign. So you've been around for a while. So thank you. <laughs> thanks, Rob. Okay. Uh, Danielle Chenard. And He's not present, Madam Chair. Not present. Okay. Um, Sonia Morton. And after Sonia Morton, Ruth Kenobi. Sonia, good afternoon. Uh, is it afternoon? Nope. Good morning still. Sorry. Oh, great. Oh, good morning, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and members of the committee. My name is Sonja Morton. I'm a licensed clinical social worker in the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. I work in multiple crises as a trained clinician at Capital Region Mental Health Center in Hartford, where we help people who are experiencing mental health emergencies. Mobile crisis services are a collaborative intervention providing the most effective strategy for responding to mental health emergencies, preventing suicides and overdose deaths and reducing ER visits. We are the workers who provide the safety net for the most disadvantaged people with severe and prolonged mental illness, often complicated by substance abuse. In Hartford and across Connecticut, we disproportionately serve people of color. I'm here today to ask that you allocate $6 million in funding to Bemis' mobile crisis unit. Over many years, and especially the last 10, chronic underfunding has cut our services to the bone, leaving huge gaps in coverage on nights and weekends. As a result, mental health emergencies are often handled by the police, not trained mental health professionals like us. We need to expand mobile crisis services now more than ever. The pandemic and the huge mental health crisis that it has created have exposed the cracks in our safety net. Cracks that our members and our clients have known for a long time. At Capital Region, the number of calls we receive from the police has tripled since the start of the pandemic. One Saturday, my coworker responded to a 211 call from a woman experiencing an emergency. She had overdosed. My coworker knew the woman with her specific needs, so she was able to react quickly. If the woman had called later on during the night and got the answering machine, she would have died. It was only because my experienced coworker was on shift to take the call that a precious life was saved and not lost. This year, we must expand mobile crisis services. It's the difference between life and death. We have the resources to fund universal, comprehensive mobile crisis services statewide and as 1199 members, we are demanding this as a matter of justice for the people that have been left behind in our society. We are demanding this as a matter of um, racial justice because the majority of the individuals we serve in mobile crisis are black and brown. It's not a coincidence that. Oh no. Um, assist working class communities and communities of color in particular. This problem is systemic and you have the ability to change that. Please fund Demas' mobile crisis unit across the state. Thank you for your time. Have a good day. Thank you and thank you for your, your testimony. And you gave us a fact that I did not know that most of the people in mobile crisis are black and brown, which is very interesting. So thank you very much. Cynthia. Thank you. Um, Ruth Kenovi. 
And then uh, number 34, Bruce Kenobi. Yeah, hi, good morning. Good morning. Distinguished chairpersons and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Ruth Kenobi. I'm the Director of Advocacy for the American Lung Association in Connecticut. The Lung Association works to save lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease through research, edu education, and advocacy. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on House Bill 6439. The Lung Association urges this committee to allocate adequate and sustainable state funding to Connecticut state tobacco prevention and cessation programs. When it comes to tobacco, we must invest in our future. Tobacco use remains a major public health crisis in Connecticut every year, 4,900 residents die due to tobacco related illnesses. Tobacco costs Connecticut more than $2 billion in annual health care costs, including $520.8 million in Medicaid spending every year. In 2019, in Connecticut, 27.8% of our high school students use tobacco. And with the continued threat of COVID-19, in addition to the numerous tobacco-caused diseases, it's imperative to prevent youth from starting to use tobacco and to help everyone quit. It's also important to acknowledge that at this time when health equity has been brought to the forefront of our attention, it is clear that our tobacco policies haven't protected everyone equally. Much like COVID-19, tobacco use and secondhand smoke exposure cause disproportionate harm to many communities, including communities of color and persons with behavioral health conditions. To be clear, Connecticut is now on schedule to invest zero state dollars into our state tobacco prevention and cessation programs indefinitely. The state has not deposited funds into the Tobacco and Health Trust Fund since fiscal year 2015. And then in fiscal year 2018, the, that budget completely eliminated the language that transferred the money to the Tobacco and Health Trust Fund, which was the sole source of our tobacco control programming in the state. The Tobacco and Health Trust Fund was established in 2000 and was done so to utilize the funds that the state receives from the Master Settlement Agreement to address the costs and impact that tobacco takes on the state. However, since its inception, this fund really has been treated almost as a rainy day fund. The CDC recommends that the state spend $32 million annually on tobacco prevention and cessation. We have yet to spend cumulatively what that CDC recommendation does, recommends we spend annually. And so while we consider when we consider the fact that we have the second highest cigarette tax in the country and still get more than $100 million from the Master Settlement Agreement every year, our funding status is especially egregious. Connecticut is only joined in ten by Tennessee in providing no state dollars for state tobacco prevention programs. Um, we do want to acknowledge that um, the quality benefits Medicaid offers for tobacco cessation, um, and we thank the governor for continuing to fund a comprehensive tobacco cessation benefit under Medicaid. Um, but we strongly encourage you to invest at least $12 million of the almost $473 million in tax revenue and the master settlement agreement funds that Connecticut receives annually to help those addicted to quit and to help prevent um, the too many people who start using tobacco every year. So um, I thank you for your time and opportunity to speak today. And um, well, thank you and hope you have a good afternoon. Thank you, Ruth. Did you submit te testimony? Um, yes, I'll make sure that it has actually sent out in the in the box, but I'll make sure that it has gone through, but I've got that. It's not listed and, and I, I okay. see a lot, of my, a lot of my colleagues are looking through, I can tell by the okay. through and looking for it. So <laughs> Excellent, please. I'll double check on that. Yeah, please, please okay. make sure that we get your uh, testimony. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. uh, Karen Halbach? Karen? Karen Levesque, yes. Good morning. Karen. And after Karen, Diane Manning. Number 35, Karen. Number 36, Diane. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France, and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Karen Levesque and I am a member and the vice chairperson of the Council on Developmental Services, which is statutorily charged with advising the governor and legislature on issues affecting individuals supported by the Department of Developmental Services, DDS. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you today to testify in support of House Bill 6439, an act concerning the state budget. Before we discuss the budget, the council would like to take this opportunity to thank the legislature, governor, OPM, Commissioner Sheff, 
and the entire leadership team at DDS for working collaboratively to ensure the continuity of services during the pandemic. The compassion, support, and innovation shown over the past year was truly inspiring and a model that was duplicated across the country. To the direct care staff across the state, both from the public and private sector, thank you. Your tireless efforts do not go unnoticed and have truly defined the meaning of a hero during this difficult time for individuals and families. We owe you a great debt of gratitude. The council has taken the time to review the governor's proposed budget and asks that the appropriations committee increase funding to ensure DDS has the resources needed to continue critical services as we continue to navigate through the pandemic. The funding will be used by DDS and providers to address current and future issues that individuals and families will face as a result of the pandemic. The council is particularly concerned with the impacts of isolation, anxiety, loss of employment and skill development opportunities and staff shortages as all fight, fight to defeat COVID-19. The council also recognizes the need to provide fair and equitable wages to all direct care workers across the state who have shown time and time again, they are ready to serve and protect one of our most vulnerable populations. Your support will be critically important as the department and the nonprofit provider community enter the recovery phase of this pandemic. Thank you for your time and for allowing us this opportunity to address the committee. Working together, we will continue to keep individuals safe and healthy during these unprecedented times. Respectfully, the DDS Council on Developmental Services. Thank, thank you and thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much and have a good, have a good um, afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Diane Manning, and after Diane Manning, Allison Gottlieb. Good morning, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the committee. I'm Diane Manning, President and CEO of United Services. We're the local mental health authority for 21 towns in Northeastern Connecticut. We're a nonprofit organization providing more than 30 programs in our communities including outpatient mental health, substance abuse treatment, family programs, and crisis services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on House Bill 6439. A year ago, our world went into lockdown. United Services did not, as we knew that we were vital to the survival of our clients and communities. That has not changed. I would like to tell you about the resilience of our staff who've continued to come to work every day of this pandemic. They have adapted and innovated to meet the community need, one that is continuing to grow at an alarming rate during these unprecedented times. They do this for a shockingly low pay rate. They have worked every day of this pandemic, and they deserve to be rewarded for that. Despite the barriers our staff and we as an agency have faced, we have been here and will continue to be here every day for our clients. I wanna take that role one step further in drawing attention to a service system that is severely lacking here in Northeastern Connecticut and advocating for one that can better support our hardworking staff and serve our community. Because the crisis is not over, we are seeing much higher stress levels in our clients. We are seeing more anxiety and depression, substance abuse and domestic violence. And we are seeing a huge increase, more than 230% year over year in people in crisis. I ask that you add back the funding that has been effectively cut from the service system over years of no increases, estimated at 461 million over five years to the budget to bring these vital services back to funding levels of more than a decade ago. I ask that you support existing services that have been underfunded for years, including staff providing critical services. I also ask that you recognize that the mental health, substance abuse, child abuse, and domestic violence effects of this pandemic are likely to last long after herd immunity is reached. 
We need to expand, not contract services for everyone in our communities. We've learned how quickly things can turn from normal to crisis. We are in crisis in the behavioral health service system. We ask that you fund us properly to enable the dedicated community organizations and their staff to respond and to pay them as the vital services for their communities that they really are. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Diane. Look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Allison Gottlieb. I know I didn't say your last name right, but sorry about that. To be followed by Thomas Ego. Go ahead, Allison. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on House Bill 6439. I'm Allison Gottlieb. I'm on the Board of Directors of Homes with Hope, which is a Westport-based organization where I'm also a resident. Uh, I've been involved with Homes with Hope for some time now. They are an uh, organization dedicated to end ending homelessness in Fairfield County through housing, shelter, and supportive services. And most importantly, getting people from temporary housing into permanent housing so they can maintain stable lives. Now more than ever, especially during this COVID crisis, we need your help and we need the support that we can have. We're doing all we can in the community to raise awareness around this issue. I know separately, I actually have another meeting later where we're running food drives and doing all we can to help with food insecurity and housing. But it's so important that we continue to increase funding for this important organization and the work that we're doing. Since 2012, the number of people utilizing Connecticut shelter system has decreased by 57%. Investing in proven solutions to homelessness is necessary and continuing our progress by ensuring that these people have a safe environment. I now know more than ever having children of my own, having them have a place that's safe to go home. It's so important that we have this for our community's residents as well. So I thank you again for your time and I hope that we can increase the funding that we need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Allison. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming up today. Next, uh, followed by Thomas Ego, who, who will be uh, followed by um, Nika Lyons. Go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Tom Igo. I'm a resident of the state of Connecticut and a member of the board of directors and treasurer of Ben Haven, a nonprofit organization that operates in greater New Haven area, serving the needs of autistic individuals and others with pervasive developmental disorders. My wife and I have a 39 year old son who is autistic. He lives in his own apartment in New Haven and receives daily services from Ben Haven's behaviorists and mentors so that he can live a satisfying and meaningful life. Over the last 10 years, largely because of the hard work, understanding, sensitivity, and courage of the Ben Haven staff, our son's life and the life of our entire family have improved immeasurably. Community nonprofits like Ben Haven provide essential services in every city and town in Connecticut serving people in need and employing tens of thousands. They are what make Connecticut a great place to live and work and our family can attest to that. So I thank you for the opportunity briefly to testify today. Just a few points. First, Ben Haven strongly supports a 461 million increase in state appropriations for nonprofits by fiscal year 2026, starting with 128 million in fiscal 2022. We would also note that 50% of this increase for DDS providers is reimbursed by the federal government through the Medicaid home and community-based waivers. Ben Haven is very grateful for the wage increase that became effective two years ago for direct support staff workers of DDS providers like Ben Haven, which have brought the base hourly wage to $14.75. That said, we strongly urge that the regular ongoing wa uh, wage adjustments should be implemented, indexed against the incremental increases designed to bring the minimum wage to 
In this context, I'd like to note that the role of direct support staff is much more complex in my view than in the, that is the case for typical minimum wage jobs. These staff have great responsibility for, ind for individuals with medical fragility and behavioral challenges. The work is governed by many regulations and training requirements that have to be met and continually considered. In Ben Haven's individual and family support program, which works with our son, the direct support staff work independently with individuals and families and need to exert independent judgment to address many difficult situations. These staff teach individuals the skills they need to increase their abilities and independence. In the group home settings, staff must dispense medications, implement behavioral programs, maintain resident safety, and keep detailed program data. Folks, all this is very tough work requiring a high level of skill, judgment, commitment, and patience. We note that there has not been an overall COLA or rate increase for DDS providers in many years. Without this critical funding, providers cannot improve their infrastructure with up-to-date technology enhancements and training, nor can they respond to all needs for physical plant renovations and upgrades. Finally, we are very much opposed to the $2.3 million reduction in the behavior services program funding that the governor recommends. This account is used to support children and adolescents living at home with their families who present very significant behavioral challenges. Our IFS program workers support many of these individuals and their support in people's homes makes the situation much more manageable for these families. These adolescents can then remain in their family homes for more years than would otherwise be possible. Money becomes available when these adolescents- you, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, if you could wrap up, that would be great. Yes, I'm just almost finished. Perfect. Money becomes available when these adults become adults, when these people become adults and have other funding from DDS. But it's essential that this funding remain in this account to help other families. Ben Haven always has calls for this critical services for more families than we can properly serve in light of this limitation on funding support. That completes my testimony. Thank you so much for listening, and I very much appreciate what you all are doing today. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate you coming in. We appreciate your perspective. Um, we look forward to working with you uh, during the legislative process to see what we can do. Thank you so much. Up next is Nika Lyons, followed by Pamela Paisy. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'll be brief. I'm a mom whose daughter has been with ARI of Connecticut for 12 years. Um, I'd like to share a little bit of her personal story. She uh, lives in an apartment and is supported by ARI and goes to a day program. She is developmentally disabled and has emotional issues. Her uh, needs uh, uh, <clears throat> need a great deal of support to keep her healthy happy and safe. Her caregivers have been more than care, just caregivers. Her relationship with staff has become extraordinary. Their dedication is amazing. They have gone above and beyond to help her. She even calls two of them mommy. That's how much they mean to her. That's how much they mean to me. Some residents there do not have families close by who are unable and are unable to be in contact with them. Some residents have no family at all. ARI is their family. As you have heard from others, staff are extremely overworked and underpaid. Please find it in your hearts to help the nonprofits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nika, for coming on and, and telling your heartfelt personal story. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to working on your issues. Next up is Pamela Paisy, followed by David Porteus. Distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee, my name is Pamela Paisy, and I am the CEO of Community Residences Incorporated, a nonprofit provider of day residence and family supports to more than 700 children and adults with special needs across many Connecticut communities. CRI employs approximately 1,000 staff. 
I am offering testimony on HB 6439 as a member of the Connecticut Association of Nonprofits on behalf of our employees. Since 2007, community nonprofits have lost at least 461 million in state funding that has not kept pace with inflation or adequately covered increased costs and demands for services. I respectfully request that the legislature commit to increasing funding by the full 461 million over the next five years, appropriate 128 million in new funding for community nonprofits in fiscal year 2022, index future increases to inflation, hold nonprofits financially harmless from the impact of COVID-19. The pandemic brought unbudgeted costs and challenges for CRI, such as providing hazard pay and paid sick leave for essential frontline workers, procuring expensive and scarce PPE, adapting to unprecedented workforce and consumer challenges, continuing to staff people's residences even as the pandemic worsened and staff became ill. Demands for service quality continue to increase while flat funding does not allow for growth. We have gone 12 years with no COLA while the cost of living has risen significantly. Raising direct care staff to 1475 two years ago was welcome but did not address the other costs. Private sector staff do not have parity with public sector staff doing exactly the same job. National movement towards a minimum wage of $15 puts salaries for direct support professionals back to minimum wage. Many of our staff work two jobs or more just to survive. Currently, places such as Costco, Amazon, and Target are paying more than $15 an hour. This makes it difficult for us to attract and retain qualified, dedicated staff. Flat funding does not allow for retention. Survey of our staff show low pay is a leading cause for high turnover that can reach 50% annually in the field as a whole. Our staff work through this pandemic, risking their lives to take care of the most vulnerable individuals. They are essential. Essential staff need to be recognized and compensated for risking their own safety to ensure the safety of others. If we want them to be here in the future, we need to ensure that they have a livable wage now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your, your testimony and thank you for your advocacy. Thank you for, for hanging in there. Thank you. Um, next, we have David, number 40. David. And after David, uh, number 41, Amanda Skinner. Is Amanda Skinner here? Yep, there she is. And after Amanda, number 42, Shannon Hansen. Go right ahead, David, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon to all of you. Um, my name is David Porteous. I'd like to offer a few thoughts on um, funding for nonprofit groups, equitably what has been said so far from so many different sources. I I'm here in really two capacities. The first is as the parent of a 36 year old uh, autistic man who has received services from eight different nonprofit groups over the last 15 years. And secondly, as the member of uh, the board of directors of two groups, um, Gilead Community Services and Oak Hill, which between them provide services for addiction treatment, uh, individuals with mental health needs, and uh, those with developmental disabilities as well, serving about 40,000 people in uh, 77 uh, towns around the state. Um, as I think you all know, uh, but I want to emphasize it, nonprofit groups do an outstanding job servicing these populations at really a fraction of what it would cost the state. And I always, always think of them as the, as the goose that lays the uh, proverbial golden egg. But I'm a little bit concerned now that, that that goose is not very well. The level of funding for these groups um, has not effectively changed in 14 years. And this flat funding has not kept up with inflation, as you've heard from others. Uh, and during that same time period, at least according to my looking on the state website, uh, the, the legislature has raised the minimum wage eight times, a total of 50%. Uh, we simply have not kept pace with that. As a board member, I'm painfully aware of the impact of uh, decisions that are necessita necessitated by this flat funding. Uh, programs being closed, things being, uh, other uh, programs being scaled back, reduced staffing and lower benefits. And as a parent, I've witnessed the impact of the static funding from the sidelines. I've watched agencies increasingly have difficulty um, hiring staff uh, at wages that are simply not competitive. I've worked with a revolving door of, of a new inexperienced staff hired to replace folks who are very highly competent but have decided to move on to, to other employment. 
I think it's critical that we take action to address the funding shortfalls that we've created. And others will speak more specifically about specific funding targets, but I do support the recommendation of the Alliance of Nonprofit Groups, and in particular, the $128 million for new funding in fiscal year 2022. Um, I'll close with just a short analogy that came to me when I was driving down the uh, springtime roads in Connecticut a couple weeks ago, and I passed a contractor who was working on the side of the street. And I, I got to thinking, what if, if he was compensated the same way that we compensate many of the agencies that provide these critical services? Um, that would mean that the state would reimburse him for covered expenses, but not all expenses. So he'd be told he'd likely lose a little bit of money along the way. Any unspent funds at the end of the year would have to be returned. They couldn't be set aside in a rainy day fund. You're not allowed to make a profit. Oh, and, and by the way, if you want to, you can set up a table on the side of the road and ask the motorist to give you a donation. Uh, I don't think we'd get too many contractors to help us with that kind of work, but yet we've got nonprofit groups that day in and day out are dedicated in doing the same thing. When I hit a pothole a few minutes later, I got to thinking, what if that pothole had been there for 14 years with no increases to, to the payments? It would be a huge pothole, and that we can't afford that kind of a pothole in the social services programs that the state provides. Um, I urge you to take necessary action uh, which has been long deferred to correct the situation. And I thank you for your time, uh, the opportunity to speak today and really your service in general. There's a lot of complicated issues. I know it's not simple. There are things that you have to weigh in balance, but this is a population that really needs our support. I can, I can tell that you guys care about it and I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, sir, for your testimony and your advocacy. <clears throat> have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, number 41, Amanda Skinner. Good afternoon, Senator Ostin, Representative Walker, and honorable members of the Appropriations Committee. I'm Amanda Skinner, President and CEO of Planned Parenthood of Southern New England, PPSNE, testifying on House Bill 6439. As the state's largest provider of family planning and sexual and reproductive health care to nearly 62,000 patients last year at 14 health centers in Connecticut, Planned Parenthood believes all people should have access to safe, quality, affordable health care. We are here to request an additional 2.1 million for family planning allocated in the community health services line of the Department of Public Health budget to replace the loss of federal Title X. We were forced out of the Title X program in July 2019 after serving as the Connecticut grantee since the program's inception nearly 50 years ago. A detailed explanation of Title X in the gag rule is in my written testimony. Title X exists to support the cost of care for self-pay patients on a sliding fee scale based on their income and family size. Our sliding fee scale, which we continue to provide for quality, qualified patients despite the loss of federal funding, ensures people who lack access to private or public insurance can receive the preventive health care they need. Title X serves an individual at 100% of SPL or $12,880 per year income at no fee and an individual at up to 250% of FPL or $32,200 for reduced fees. We came before the committee last session to thank Governor Lamont and our elected leaders for supporting 1.2 million in additional funding for family planning services. Unfortunately, that budget adjustment was never passed due to COVID-19. The funding we are requesting today will ensure continued access to preventive reproductive health care for Connecticut residents who already struggle to access the care they need. We do not turn patients away for inability to pay, but this is not sustainable. The COVID-19 pandemic has added financial strain on top of the loss of Title X. Last year, we drastically reduced expenses, implemented pay cuts, furloughed over half of our staff, and temporarily closed nine health centers in April, ultimately closing permanently the Danielson and Old Saybrook Health Centers due to the financial hardship. Fundraising is an unsustainable business model to support ongoing health center operations. For many of our patients, PPSNE is their primary, primary care provider. We are indispensable to family planning care in Connecticut, serving 88% of the people served by Title X, which represents more than 41,000 PPSNE patients. Title X funds must be replaced for PPSNE to maintain our current level of service to patients who are uninsured. By increasing the DPH budget for family planning services by $2.1 million, our state will continue its strong commitment to protecting and improving access to women's health care, ensuring all people have access to preventive care, lowering long-term health costs, and improving the health and well-being of our residents. We are committed to continuing to work with the administration and the General Assembly to protect access to this care. We thank the Appropriations Committee for considering the important investment of $2.1 million in preventive health care for those most in need. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm going to go back right now before we go on board to number 23, um, Heather Latora. 
Heather was, she had technical difficulties. Okay, Heather, go right thank ahead. You for, <laughs> thank you for letting me back on. I figured I'd come closer to Hartford so I'd have good reception. <laughs> I've been um, working at Marrakesh for the past 35 years, and I've been here too many times to count, pleading with you, our representatives of the state, to value the people we support, our employees, and the quality and cost-effective, critically essential services we bring to Connecticut by reimbursing us fairly for the services we're asked to provide, contracted to provide, and paid to provide. We are basically your contracted employees. Thank you, Senator Austin and Representative Walker for your bold statements at the press conference back in January about the need to increase funding for nonprofits. I was literally jumping up and down and shared it with everyone I knew. We have to make your statement a reality. I imagine that the state contracts with all sorts of companies to provide various services and products year after year, hundreds or more. And I can't imagine that many companies that the state does business with, such as paper supply, snow removal, vehicle repairs, universities, renewed with flat rates for 14 years in a row. And I'm deeply disappointed that these flat rates have been saved for us, the human service providers and our employees. I know that every contract I have on my desk to sign and renew has an inflationary increase, which I fight tooth and nail. I may get it down, but I still need to pay. At this point, there's no other conclusion I could come up with than we're devalued. The people we support, their families and friends, our staff and our services are considered critically essential, yet the collective us are not as valued as your other contracts. I speak to parents and families who have sons, daughters, brothers, sisters with disabilities, people who are looking for services in the future and who need services today, and people who have services now. And I, I have families, they call me and they say, could you just give our staff some more money and better benefits? And you understand why they're asking that. They want their staff to stay. Everyone sleeps better at night. They wanna make sure that our employees, 70% of who are black or brown are valued and have a career path and will stay with their loved one who is happy and safe, participating in activities that fulfill their lives, learning to be more self-sufficient and well cared for. They wanna know who will be with them long after they pass on. We remained open during COVID, although we did not qualify for PPP money because of our size. 56% of our employees changed their job duties, work shifts, work sites, and some actually packed their bags, left their families, and moved into our congregate living sites. So we were able to successfully reduce the amount of human to human contact and successfully stop the spread of COVID in these sites within 13 days of our first case. For both the people we support and our staff, we are thankful for the funds that we did receive. However, these funds have limitations and we have some new significant expenses that have not been covered yet. I usually feel as if I'm preaching to the choir when I'm here with you, you who have been here, the co-chairs and the others on this and the human service committee have been speaking on our behalf, giving us hope, especially this year. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. However, the governor's budget does not grant an increase for the human service nonprofits. And I hear questions from legislators such as, how can we commit to the, you know, to the future of this payment? And how will we find this money? You pay for what you value most. Please value us, the thousands of lives we touch and support. I'm asking for funding that we have lost for the last 14 years since our last COLA. I'm Thank here to respectfully request Oh, I'm sorry, request ahead, the legislature appropriate $461 million over the next for your time and letting me back in and for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, and have a good afternoon. Thank you. You too. Thank okay. you. All right. Um, Shannon Hansen. Shannon Hansen. Not present, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, next, uh, Patricia Burke, number 43, Letitia, uh, Patricia Burke. Okay. Yep, here I am. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. After Patricia, Pamela Fields, 
Is Pamela Fields here? Okay, great. After Pamela Fields, Sylvia Redding. So let's line up. Go right ahead, ma'am. Okay. Good morning, uh, esteemed and very valued members of the General Assembly and the Appropriations Committee. My name is Patty Burke. I'm here to testify regarding funding for the DEMA system based on my 19 years of experience working with Gilead Community Services, a community nonprofit that serves individuals <clears throat> with severe mental health and substance use issues. Our clients also struggle, obviously, with the corollary issues of substandard housing, food insecurity, lack of jobs, lack of social relationships, educational opportunities, and safety in the community. And perhaps most importantly, the flat funding, which is not cost of living adjusted, that has been coming from the state of Connecticut to help them in their lives. So our ability to maintain good quality, to maintain good quality services for people who live very marginally on the outskirts of society has been weakened by the essentially flat funding over the last 13 years. My program, um, which is psychosocial rehabilitation, which is also known as a clubhouse, and you will hear from many clubhouses today, go clubhouses. Um, we're a hub of the agency. We're about 98 clients gather and get to know each other. But I'm gonna offer you a little pandemics snapshot for this year. Um, we retooled quickly last March, right around this time, uh, to cook and deliver approximately 70 hot full lunches um, per day, Monday through Friday, with an extra lunch on Friday for Saturday to keep people um, fed over the weekend. We did this through September. So um, we ended up delivering, making and delivering. And lunches were could have been um, fried chicken plus a, a, a green vegetable and a starch and a dessert and a beverage. So just keep in mind what that means. Um, so we delivered uh, 70 a day, which would have been um, 350 a month, which turned out to be about 9,800 meals through September last year. And we were happy to do it. I say we were happy to do it. My staff of two and a half people did it. Um, in that time. And then at that point, we retooled and opened uh, to clients to come into the club, but then we had to back off again, unfortunately, when uh, the uh, percentages in the state. Went. So we are desperate to be able to do our work. And when I say desperate, um, I mean desperate. You know, we're, we try to figure out any, any way. We are an incredibly amazing group of people that figure out a zero cost way to do everything that we need to do. Um, our goals are always to work with people side by side to engage them in the world to the point where they don't need us anymore and have found things that they love to do in a social group that they can be a part of. Nothing more than any one of us here today listening wants for themselves. I know that in Connecticut, we believe that all people are born deserving everything that we can do collect collectively to help each other, to leave any one person out in the cold like today just freaking cold outside is unconscionable. So as we all together move forward in our thinking and our collective concerns for each other due to the pandemic of how we all rise or all fall together, I beg you not to turn away from those who most need our help. Uh, as an aside, if you worry about what we are doing with the money that you give us, don't. Because I know I speak for Gilead in that our doors are always open to you to come and see what we offer to this group of people who need our help to simply live their lives. And you can call Dan at 860-343-5300. He Thank is you. always available, always. Thank you. So uh, Thank my you. best regards to you and yours. And have a beautiful day. You too. Thank you. Thank you for Thank testifying. You. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Shannon Hansen first because she, she was able to get on. Shannon Hansen, and after Shannon Hansen, Pamela Fields. Okay, Shannon. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and members of the Appropriation Office. Mm -hmm. My name is Shannon Hansen. I'm a program manager for school-based healthcare at the Community Health Center. And I'd like to thank the committee and the governor for their recognition of school-based healthcare as a value component of Connecticut's special services. I ask that you increase the governor's proposed budget for health agencies and the line EHC provides healthcare to close to 180 community and school locations and specifically provided behavioral, physical, and oral health care to over 18,000 children last year. 
I'd like to share some data from a student satisfaction survey from last school year, uh, where over 1,100 students from grades 6 to 12 responded to our survey. When asked how their care was at their last visit, 100% of the students surveyed rated their care as good or excellent. When asked what they would have done if the school-based health services weren't there, 21% of them said they would have done nothing. It's about 230 students that would have let their problem persist without getting any help. If we expand that to the entire student population enrolled in CHC school-based programs, we have about 3,700 students with mental, physical, or oral health problems not being addressed. So imagine all the students in Connecticut that are, uh, don't have access to this kind of care that are living with unresolved issues. On a more positive note, I'd like to read you some of the comments that students left in our survey. I've learned to drink more water and the staff was very helpful, kind, and gave me helpful tips. Respectful and supportive over me becoming hope. Giving me great advice and helping me understand what making a difference on my lifestyle could do for me. They were understanding of my sexuality and my problems as a whole. Natasha, 11 out of 10, very good at her job. They do a very good job. They make you feel welcome and make you feel you belong here. Our school-based healthcare staff are in a unique position to provide a safe space for students to seek care, and it teaches them to advocate for their own healthcare needs. And because we're in their school, we're able to develop unique relationships with them that other providers aren't. I'd like to share a story from one of our medical assistants uh, at a high school where we provide services. She told me about a student enrolled in the program that would often skip class and was on the brink of failing that year. Our MA told the student on one of her visits to the clinic that she was happy to care for her, but that she didn't want uh, to see her coming to our clinic for more than four years. She told the student she wanted her to come to school so she could graduate on time. A few days later, as our MA came out of the exam room from another visit, she found a note on her desk from the student that said, Maria, I just wanted to let you know I came to school today. School-based healthcare eliminates barriers to care, including location, costs, and the social stigma that prevents many of our youth from accessing the care they need. CHC seeks reimbursement for the services provided, but relies on state funding to support uninsured and underinsured. Please increase funding to school-based healthcare in our state so that young people can avoid living with health issues due to lack of access to care. Thank you for your support. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony, and have a good afternoon. I'm glad we got you back in. Thank you. Yes, me too. Thanks. <laughs> Um, next, Pamela Fields, then Sylvia Redding, and then Nakia Collins. Are all three of them around? Let's see, Pamela Fields, uh, Sylvia Redding. Sylvia Redding, is she here? She is not present, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, is Nakia uh, Collins? No, she is not. Okay. And uh, April Soria. April Sharia, number uh, 47, no? She is on here. Okay, all right, she's on. Okay, all right, then um, Pamela Fields and then April Sharia. Go right ahead. Good afternoon, Senator Olston, Representative Walker, members of the Appropriations Committee, and a special shout out to my Senator, Mary Abrams, and Representative Kathy Abercrombie. I am Pam Fields, CEO at Midstate ARC. Our agency supports 300 people with intellectual disabilities throughout Central Connecticut to live fully integrated in their communities. We specialize in utilizing assistive technology for successful moves into greater independence. I will be testifying on House Bill 6439, an act concerning the state budget for the biennium ending June 30th, 2023. I am a part of an essential network of human service agencies providing vital services in every city and town in Connecticut, supporting our most vulnerable citizens and employing tens of thousands of staff to support them. I am here to implore the legislator to appropriate $461 million over five years for community nonprofits. During the pandemic, Mid-State ARC, along with many other service agencies, have struggled to keep the people we support and their staff safe. We have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars on new technology and equipment to meet these new safety standards, along with hundreds of thousands of dollars to provide hazard pay and overtime. 
We have supported our families and our staff and they, as they have lost loved ones during this time. And we are now dealing with extreme staffing shortages and a hiring black hole that is failing to produce new candidates. Our direct support professional staff have provided supports during this time at risk to themselves and their families' health and safety and doing so for very low compensation. Mid-State ARC never closed its doors. Our staff have worked long hours, endured difficult situations, including wearing PPE equipment for extended periods of time, being directly exposed to COVID day after day, and watching the people they support die. They have been asked and sometimes mandated to go against their religious beliefs to shave their faces and receive vaccines. These are the real heroes during the pandemic. They have been asked to do a lot for a little. The important question we need to ask is how long do we expect them to do that? And I wanna point out when the legislator raises the minimum wage and fails to raise the direct support professional salaries, you are pushing them to an easier and safer job at Walmart and McDonald's. And when this happens, who will be left to care for Connecticut's most vulnerable citizens? We must stop sending the message that widgets and burgers are more important than people. I also implore you to invest any proposed savings in the DDS budget back to the nonprofits. Thank you for hearing my testimony and stay healthy and safe. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for your advocacy. Have a good day. Thank you. Um, next we have um, uh, April Surya. April. April. Is she on? She's in the panel. She is in the panel. But she can't get on. April. Okay, we'll move on and maybe I will be able to get April keyed in. Uh, Kevin Mackey? Oh, oh, April, you're here? I am here. I'm sorry about that. Okay. All right. April, go right ahead. Uh, yes. Hi. I'm here in support of HB 6439. Um, I'd like to start by introducing myself. I'm the proud group sister of Crystal. She has Rett syndrome. I'm also a direct caregiver. Crystal is a blessing to my family and has taught us perseverance, kindness, patience, unconditional love. Uh, 13 years ago, my family had to make a very difficult decision and place her in a group home because it was becoming difficult for my parents to care for her. My other sister, Angel, and I did what we could to help out, but we both worked full time and it became clear that with um, our parents' health and age, we could not continue to give her the 24 hour care she needed or the help our parents need to keep her home. We found an amazing nonprofit company that has become an extended part of our family. Crystal has thrived in her new home. She, um, she, has, she loves her roommates. She has amazing staff that cares for her. It is difficult to entrust the care of somebody you love to people you don't know and you have to trust. What is even harder is getting to know the staff, trusting them, thinking of them as family and then having them leave because they can't afford to pay their bills and need better health care. Crystal doesn't understand why someone who cares for her, keeps her clean, fed, makes her laugh, makes her sh make sure she's safe, is um, gone from her life. She now has to reestablish a new trust and a new bond with a new person, which is not easy for her. I have worked in this field on and off for over 30 years. I decided to get back into the field and join the company that cures for my sister, which was CRI. Crystal had already been placed with them for five years. I was happy with what they did for her and I wanted to do something for others. I currently work in a day program and love my clients and give them the care I want my sister to receive. I am sad to say I find myself in the same situation as the previous current and current staff who had to make difficult choices to do 
what you love, knowing you're making a difference or pay your bills. I do not begrudge anyone making a fair wage. However, when other jobs pay more, offer better benefits, and the work is not as difficult as what you do as a caregiver, it is frustrating and insulting. Oh. April? Excuse me, I lost my place. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Basically, what happens is you give everything you have to the clients as a staff and as a family member who entrusts somebody you love to staff. You put your faith in them. They become a part of your family. They become a part of making sure that what the person you care about gets what they need, the protection, the safety, the care, um, you do this. It's very difficult to put your faith in people you don't know. Mm. Um, it, when people leave for a better paying job, we as caregivers have one of the most important jobs in this world, caring for those who can't care for themselves or speak for themselves. And we have gone years without fair wages and have to make the choice to listen to our hearts and pay our bills or to stay and take care of clients who need us to speak and advocate for them. Um, they count on us to support them, to be their voice. And, and it's um, very difficult. It's, we, we, we thank you, April, for, um, for all you do and how hard you work for your clients. So thank you so much for testifying. Thank you for hanging in there and <clears throat> doing the testimony and advocate, advocacy. So. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Um, Kevin Mackey? He is not present, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, Ari Rosenberg? Uh, neither are they. Okay. I'm here. Oh, okay. Ari's here. I'm sorry. That's okay. Good afternoon, sir. Go right ahead. You have three minutes. Good afternoon. Thank you. Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Representative Gibson, Senator Hartley, Representative Kennedy, Senator Summers, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee, thank you for hearing my testimony today. I am Rabbi Ari Rosenberg from New Milford, Connecticut. I serve as the Executive Director of the Association of Religious Communities, ARC, Danbury's only purposefully interfaith nonprofit organization on a mission to alleviate the causes of violence, suffering, and hate while establishing peace, justice, and human dignity. I'm here to support the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and the Reaching Home Campaign to prevent and end homelessness in Connecticut because safe, affordable, and permanent housing is the only realistic solution to homelessness. As a Jew, I am reminded that my people wandered homeless in the desert 40 years before they had a home to call their own. And then when the second temple was destroyed, we lived in a state of national homelessness for hundreds of years without the full protection of the government. My family came to America after Russian Cossacks destroyed their homes and pillaged their villages. They came here seeking a society where good people would work together to ensure that nobody went without a safe home. I see Connecticut's homeless on my way to work at ARC every day. They come to our food pantry in twice the numbers we were seeing last year. The one remaining homeless shelter in Danbury is bursting at the seams right now, often forced to send people away to other towns. And as important a role as the shelters play, we know that the shelters are only a band-aid approach to the problem that we face. What people need is safe, secure, permanent housing. ARC's case managers use DEMAS funds to take good people off the streets and out of the shelters and to place them in secure housing where they have an opportunity to become independent in time and productive members in society. There were young homeless men and women living in cars on the campus of Western Connecticut State University down the street from here last night when temperatures dropped to single digits. They need our collective support to ensure that they have the bare necessity of a safe home. The transition from homelessness 
to having a home is a transition for an individual from one who requires services to one who in time can provide services for the betterment of the common good. I have a case manager here at ARC on my team who was abandoned by her family as a youth, endured homelessness for a time, received services, was housed in a home, eventually was hired by ARC, and now just this week she placed a 22-year-old who was living in her car down the street at Westcon into a secure apartment in New Mill down the block from where I live with Demas funds. We respectfully request that the committee support the proposed budget for Demas housing supports and services line at $23.4 million. New investments for households and scattered site and development units, enhanced outreach services and wraparound services, and the Connecticut Community Nonprofit Alliance proposal to restore $461 million over five years to community nonprofits like the Association of Religious Communities. Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to present this testimony and for your hard work making important and life-saving decisions during this public health crisis. Together, we have the opportunity to transform the lives of those in need to become independent individuals who provide for others. The place where that happens is in the home. They need our help to provide. Thank you. Thank you, Ari, and thank you for identifying this public health crisis. I hope we hear more of that coming from everybody so that people understand it is a crisis. So thank you, sir, for that. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Um, Daniel, oh no, Zeta Hernandez. Zeta Hernandez. Yes. Go right Hello. Ahead. Hello. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for hearing my testimony today on House Bill 6439. My name is Zeta Hernandez. I reside in am a registered voter in Naugatuck. I work in Hartford currently managing two programs at Chrysalis Center, the RAC and Community Support Programs, both funded by Demas. We never closed, and during the pandemic's peak, we provided much needed food and PPE to our participants. I have participated in several pit counts during cold weather months, taking surveys to gauge the number of individuals living in tents, cars, on the bridges and railroad lines. I've witnessed some of the most uninhabitable and unsafe living conditions none of us can even imagine living in. As a former supportive housing case manager, I noticed the impact affordable housing has on an individual. When our state's residents have stable housing, their economic and health outcomes improve. I was fortunate enough to meet one of those individuals whom dream was to have her own apartment. She suffered from stage four lung cancer and alcohol use disorder. Through existing supportive housing and wraparound services by case managers and related nonprofit staff, she was able to secure affordable housing, medical care, and services to help her battle her substance use disorder. Unfortunately, her health deteriorated and she died shortly after being housed. This may seem like a sad story, but to me, it's a success story of one less person dying homeless in the streets, in her own apartment, with family and loved ones by her side. This success story that would not be possible if not for funding and the help of the, of the staff that supported her. I respectfully request that the committee support the following. Demas is lined at 23.4 million in each year of the binomium. New targeted investment of 2.25 million in the Demas' housing supports and services line. 375,000 in new funding in the Demas housing supports and services line for enhanced outreach services. I support the governor's proposal to provide an additional 4 million in FY22 and 7.2 million in FY23 in Demas for continued discharges from CVH, including 30 new money follows a person's placement. I support the Connecticut Community Nonprofit Alliance proposal to restore $461 million over five years to community nonprofits, uh, funding for nonprofits, including those working to end homelessness, does not adequately cover increased costs and demand for services. Future funding is so desperately needed as I foresee an influx of need resulting from COVID-19 after moratoriums begin to lift. Thank you for the 
Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to present this testimony and for your hard work. It is with your support that we can help make sure Connecticut's residents are healthy and stably housed. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Milstein. Daniel Milstein? Yes. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Good Senator, afternoon. can you hear me? Yes. Yes, oh, okay. Senator Osteen, Representative Walker, Representative Minor, Representative Fred, France and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, my name is Dan Milstein. I'm the clinical director of the Department of Addiction um, of Feral Treatment Center here in New Britain. We're part of Gilead Community Services. I'm here and, I, and I'm um, grateful for the, have the opportunity to testify on the Bill 6489. I'm here to ask you for approximately um, 40, $461 million over the next five years to help um, treatment centers and providers like us stay in business. Um, 26 years ago, I, I went to treatment and I was about to lose everything. I, I was about to go to jail for three years, um, lose a license to practice law, um, lose my family, lose all my earthly possessions and um, start with nothing. And I was able to go to a treatment center and I was able at that time to find a way to deal with an addiction to, um, to alcohol and to painkillers. Now I'm trying, and Farrell is trying to provide treatment for this opiate crisis, this substance abuse crisis that has gotten so much more severe due to COVID-19. Um, What's happened here is that people cannot get the connections that they need with COVID. So that we've seen a 44% increase in opioid um, positive rates in testing over the last year. We've seen a tremendous increase, a doubling of opiate deaths in the last year. We've seen people um, who can't get to treatment because they don't have the technology to get on Zoom calls. We've seen in our own um, treatment center a reduction of 58% in our revenue from outpatient services. We have an inpatient treatment center that has 24 beds for inpatient services, and we have every level of outpatient services, intensive outpatient, relapse prevention, and therapy. And we, like other treatment centers in Connecticut, have, um, don't have the revenue that we need to hire staff, as you heard from another speaker. We, minimum wage goes up, we don't have the money for our wages to go up. So we can't hire monitors. We have a very hard time hiring therapists. But what we do see is people that need more and more services, people that are um, homeless. And you can't be homeless and an addict and not use. Homeless people have to move during the night. They can't sleep during the night. They have to move and they use to survive as homeless people. So we've seen our revenue go down. We've seen the need for services go up astronomically. And we're, we're just holding on, trying to provide the hope that I got 26 years ago to transform my life, to go back to school, to get a master's in um, social work, and to be in a position to um, render service to those around me instead of, you know, I was in jail for three years before I got out and was able to make use of recovery. Here, we need new technology. We need to have a way of reaching these people. We need a way of caring for them with sober coaches. We need funds. So uh, I implore you, make funding necessary so we can stop the rise in death, stop the rise in addiction, and treat those who really are calling out for help. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, sir, and thank you for your for your testimony. Um, Claudette Kidd, Claudette Kidd, number 53, Claudette Kidd. She is not present, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, Lane Bolt, number 54, Lane Bolt, there we go. Hi, how are you? Can you unmute yourself? Let me try. Okay, there you, you go. Can you hear me? Yep, there we go. After I'm Lane, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. Don't be nervous, <laughs> but let me just finish. Um, but after Elaine Bolt, um, Lane Bolt, uh, Teresa Capiello, is Teresa Capiello with us? Okay, Elaine, go right ahead. Good afternoon, Senator Olson, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, and Representative France. Distinguished members of the Appreciation Committee. My name is Lane Bolt. I live in an apartment in Groton, supported by Journey Found. And I like to be active in advocacy issues. Thank you for letting me te testify on HB 6439. And you see, like Journey Found, help people like me to shop, bake, and develop all the skills I need to be a successful adult. Staff help me develop the skills. I need to make good choices and help other people. I am here to ask the legislature to uh, appropriate $461 million over five years of community nonprofits. Since 2007, funding has not kept up the cost, making it harder to give supports. To me, other people supported by community agencies and people who need support to live on our own. Journey Found is, Journey Found staff is family. They are there for me. They are a part of my family. I am happy in my life. I am comfortable with the staff who work with me. They are amazing people. I am close to them. And we talk about many different things. I feel my life would be, be different and very scary without the supports I get. It's important that industry get funds. They need to keep going to the people like me keep getting the support we need to grow and to learn new things. I am a Down syndrome person with a uh, post-stress traumatic disorder with uh, depression. And I want to start doing something important in my life is that I want to be a podcaster to help other people in topics. <laughs> and, and I'm focusing what I'm supposed to do as a person. I want to help other people like you. And if you need any help, I'm there for you as well. Please, we need your help now. Good job, Max. Thank you. You did a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Have a good afternoon. Thank uh, you. Thanks. Uh, Teresa Capiello? Hi, how are you? Okay, how are you? And after Hi. Teresa, Jan Janet Mantley, number 56. Uh, so good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and the distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to speak on behalf of House Bill 6439. My name is Tessa Capiello. I'm a service coordinator at Reliance Health in Norwich. Rather than sharing with you all the reasons that have pushed me to become a social worker and an advocate for our most vulnerable and mar marginalized, I'll instead attempt to use my very limited time to build upon what has already been stated and share with you just the tip of the iceberg that illustrates the anger and sorrow I feel as I evaluate the position of our state and our citizens, particularly in respect to our nonprofit sector. There are over 347,000 people in Connecticut who are living in poverty with BIPOC individuals and communities being disproportionately affected. This does not account for people who are above the unrealistic and outdated measure of the federal poverty line who are still struggling to survive. Over 400,000 Connecticut residents struggle with hunger. Between 2017 and 2018, over 106, well, yeah, 160,000 adults in Connecticut reported an unmet need for mental health treatment. 
And these numbers have only increased since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And these are populations that the nonprofit sector dedicates itself to every day. There are over 18,000 nonprofit agencies in Connecticut, and it's estimated that my agency alone serves approximately 1,000 low-income persons with severe mental health and substance use disorders in a given year. My agency alone distributed over 60,000 meals to our members since the onset of the pandemic. Our wait lists are at an all-time high and people's needs are at an all-time high. We're exhausting our resources trying to make ends meet and our nonprofit employees are not exempt from the stressors we strive to help our clientele and community members overcome with or without the pandemic. So considering these limited statistics, I think we definitely deserve an explanation as to why the people who do the most and need the most continue to receive the least. If you'd like to show the citizens of Connecticut that there are people you care about, value, and wish to, wish to see succeed, you won't just hear the words and the stories that are being presented to you today as they have in the past. You'll take action to prove to your citizens that they matter. You'll stop taking part in the stereotype that perpetuates the idea that we're to blame for our supposed self-inflicted shortcomings and instead take responsibility for the disposable lack of resources and opportunity that the state has imposed on its most vulnerable and disadvantaged. We should not have to prove that we are worthy of more than the bare minimum, and we can't continue down this stagnant path of pleads and wishes. The policy and budgetary decisions the state makes represent broken promises, and it's honestly embarrassing to witness and experience its continued failure to adequately serve the working and lower class. While these issues continue to be ignored, the needs of Connecticut citizens need continue to be ignored. I believe it to be true that we fund what we value, and if a global pandemic isn't enough to erupt change, then what is? This is so critical to the health and well-being of Connecticut citizens. So if after all of this today, you still find that increasing the funding for the nonprofit sector is not a priority for our state budget, I would encourage you to go ahead and take the extraordinary measures needed to push legislature and fund this cause anyway. Because I know that this problem is bigger than you and it's bigger than me, but that doesn't mean we're not responsible for taking every measure needed to fix it. I know I'm trying my best to show up for the people who need me and I hope you will too. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much for, for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, next, um, number 56, uh, Janet. And then, yes. let's see, let me just see. We got Janet, we've got Vile, we've got, oh, Bright. Okay, a second. And Dawn, did I see Dawn? Number 58, yes. She's uh, in the panel, Madam Chair. Okay, and number 59. All right, go right ahead. Thank you. This is awesome. We can move right through these. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Mary Abrams, Representative Pat Dillon, Senator Olson, Representative Walker, and members of the Appropriations Committee. I'm Janet Manthe, Program Manager of School-Based Health Services for the Community Health Center, Inc., and I would like to thank the Appropriations Committee and the Governor for the recognition of school-based health care as a valued component of Connecticut's health care service delivery model. I ask that you increase the governor's proposed 2022-2023 budget for health agencies, House Bill 6439 and the line item for school-based health care. I will be reading a testimony from a high school student about the value of behavioral health services in schools. I was told high school is the best years of your life. It is going to fly by fast so be ready. I believed it was true, but that's not the case. This year has been a struggle. I had to try to learn while not being in class and having to sit in front of a computer for most of the day. All I ever wanted was to be proud of myself and learn and grow with everything I encountered. I ended up disappointing myself. Throughout my accomplishments and disappointments, I met the school social worker. She's well known for her cheesy smile, great advice and always makes time for her students. Everyone who knows her knows that she's a problem solver. If you cannot find a way, she definitely will. During our sessions, whether they were in person or via Zoom, we will always talk our crap and complain about the things we do not like. Getting to know her and being able to get the help that I need from her is something that means a lot to me. There has been so many times where I wanted to give up and just cry. I was always thinking of leaving school because I had zero motivation to learn this new way. My social worker has been the only person to help me keep going. Having these rough patches in my life has been really crazy, and she's been helping me ever since. It is not always about having someone to talk with when you are feeling down, but it is always about whether you need them to just listen. You need their opinion, or you want their advice, and what 
that is, is this person. She always asks me questions such as, good deal? Are you sure? Positive? To make sure we're on the same page. When she asks me these questions, it makes me feel happy because I have someone who makes sure I'm okay with the decisions that we are making together. It is not only the fact that she is great at what she does, but it makes me feel better. I have known her for three years. Everything that she has helped me with in the past was great, but this year has been a huge difference. Having someone to talk with this year was so special because most people feel alone. If, you were, if it was not for her, I am not sure I would still be in school or just making it through each day. With her guidance, I've learned to be more solution focused rather than problem focused. She's definitely someone who will leave a good mark on my life. And for that, I am truly grateful. Thank you for supporting the school-based healthcare. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. And, and uh, your cat doesn't sound real happy right now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you heard my voice. Thank yeah. you. Have a good day. Uh, next, we have Bright Johnson. Hi, Bright. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Bright Johnson, and I am the Connecticut Government Relations Director for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. We have submitted longer written comments on HB 6439, so I'd like to use my time to hit on a couple of main points. Despite significant progress since the first Surgeon General's report issued over 50 years ago, tobacco-related diseases are the single most preventable cause of death in our society. Yet, according to DPH statistics, tobacco use continues to kill more people in Connecticut each year than alcohol, AIDS, car crashes, illegal drugs, accidents, murders, and suicides combined. With that reality at the forefront, we are asking that the committee restore 12 million in funding for statewide tobacco control programs to help alleviate and reduce the staggering annual economic toll tobacco use costs Connecticut. Tragically, 4,900 adults will die in Connecticut from smoking this year, 13 per day. Additionally, 56,000 kids alive today will die prematurely due to, due to tobacco use. Connecticut is second in tobacco taxes, but last in tobacco control and prevention funding. Over the years, just over 1% of the cumulative total deposited into the Tobacco and Health Trust Fund has been spent in support of smoking cessation services. However, since fiscal year 15, that number is zero. Our children are worth more than zero. It gets worse. Since its inception in 2000, the Tobacco and Health Trust Fund has been raided or had funds redirected 79 times. Of the total deposits into the Tobacco and Health Trust Fund since 2000, only 29.2 million has been spent on tobacco control programs, while the CDC recommends 32 million be spent on tobacco control programs in Connecticut per year. To put it starkly, we have dedicated a cumulative total of 29.2 million for tobacco control programs during those 20 years, 2.8 million less than the CDC recommends we spend annually. Many tobacco users fail quit attempts because in part of a lack of access to successful cessation programs. Funding tobacco use prevention and cessation programs that alleviate this burden on our citizens and economy, as well as preventing future tobacco users from ever starting, is not only consistent with our shared goal of ensuring public health, it is also the only fiscally responsible approach we can take. Continuing on the path we are on now will ultimately do nothing to address an entirely preventable problem. This, in turn, will only escalate the current fiscal pressures and result in a greater number of lives being affected by cancer at a greater cost to the state. Restoring funding for proven and effective tobacco control programs aimed at educating parents and kids and that reduced tobacco use is critical so our children can grow up not as next generation smokers, but as the first tobacco free generation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Have a good day. You bet. Thank you. Um, Dawn Fry. Good afternoon, Senator Austin and members of the committee. Um, my name is Dawn Fry. I'm the executive director for Sunrise Northeast. We provide supports for 115 people with developmental and intellectual disabilities throughout the state of Connecticut. And our mission is to create valued lives for people with disabilities. I wanna thank you for the opportunity today to testify on House Bill 6439 and specifically how it will affect employees and persons served by Sunrise Northeast. The nonprofit community has endured budget cuts and chronic underfunding for many years, which prevents challenges in the agency's ability to continue providing quality care and has hindered the agency's ability to offer affordable health care for our valued employees. 
Direct support professionals provide hands-on care while supporting choices and opportunities for independence to our state's most vulnerable population. Sunrise Northeast dedicated employees have come to work day in and day out and have provided exceptional care in a variety of settings throughout the pandemic. At times, putting themselves in situations that could lead to requiring medical care that they themselves cannot obtain due to the lack of affordable health care coverage. Sunrise Northeast currently has 281 employees, 13 of which utilize the agency's health care plans. None of the 13 are direct support professionals. Preventative care is not an option for those without affordable health care, which leads to an increase in illnesses. When illness prevents an employee from working, it disrupts the continuity of care for persons served and puts a strain on the remaining workforce. This strain has resulted in an increase in turnover rates and the agency has struggled with hiring qualified caring employees during the pandemic. You can imagine the effects that high turnover rates have on persons served. Sunrise Northeast strives in developing supportive relationships while cultivating a family environment. Continuity of care plays a major role in achieving this. Sunrise Northeast's mission focuses on creating a healthy and safe environment for all persons served. Sunrise Northeast staff should be awarded the same and provided affordable health care. The agency is unable to do this under the current funding rates. While the agency was able to provide COVID bonus compensation to our employees utilizing federal dollars, it is a gamble to rely on additional federal support. We need the state to make a strong commitment to nonprofits and approve the, the $461 million over the next five years for community nonprofits and appropriate funds for affordable health care. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. And thank you for, for, for your testimony. Thank you. And thank you for your advocacy. Um, John Deramo? Deramo. Deramo. Oh, there's. Deramo. John Deramo. Good Sorry. afternoon, Madam Chair. Good uh, afternoon. Distinguished Thanks. members of the Appropriation Committee. Um, I'm John Deramo. I'm the president and CEO of MCCA Incorporated. MCCA is a nonprofit full service substance use treatment center. We're based out of Danbury, Connecticut, but we provide services throughout the state, which include outpatient group and individual counseling centers in Danbury, New Milford, Torrington, Waterbury, Derby, New Haven, and Bridgeport. We also have detox and short-term inpatient rehabilitation programs at our Danbury facility. And we have long-term inpatient <laughs> rehab programs in Kent and Sharon, Connecticut. Uh, I would first like to thank you for the opportunity <laughs> Uh, to testify on House Bill 6439. I'm here today, as many have been, to, to uh, request that the legislature appropriate $461 million over five years for community nonprofits. Uh, with the cuts over the last 13 years, community nonprofits have struggled to keep pace with the cost of inflation or to adequately cover increased operational costs. Um, this has all challenged our ability to meet the demand for services as well. At MCCA, we've had to reduce access to services because of budget cuts, which has resulted in wait lists uh, and increased risk to the people that we serve while they're waiting for treatment. Since March of last year, when COVID-19 affected us, um, it impacted our, our ability to provide in-person services. Uh, we had to reinvent our agency and assure the needs of the people we serve were being met while also keeping everyone safe. This new challenge exacerbated the impact of years of inadequate funding leading to new un unanticipated costs, purchasing uh, protective, uh, personal protective equipment. These were masks, gloves, gowns, face shields, cleaning supplies, wipes and disinfectants, creating telehealth services overnight and purchasing the necessary equipment for these services. Uh, we, we had to buy numerous laptop computers, uh, cameras for, for uh, the personal desktop computers, online meeting platforms, and then train the staff. I think one of the important things to note is that as we emerge from the pandemic, the need for mental health and substance use treatment is expected to grow significantly. Although we've, we've seen at MCCA about a 30% <laughs> decrease in our outpatient business, our, our inpatient residential programs have remained full, but our our outpatient uh, clinics have seen a 30% decrease in business. 
uh, through the pandemic, through the pandemic. But we continue to hear from individuals um, that there's a, there is a continued need for service. Many of these people are working from home, um, using substances throughout the day, so-called day drinking, um, and they're waiting to be able to come out and access in-person services again. Uh, once once the, the restrictions are lifted, what we're going to see is, uh, what I believe we'll see is the floodgates will open, uh, and, and we're going to see tons and tons of people that are in need of support and help. Um, so now is the time to invest in the nonprofit community and give us the needed resources and the support these individuals and our communities need. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify on House Bill 6439, and I urge you to support our request. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Duramo. Um, uh, we appreciate your comments and uh, look forward to working with you. Up next you. is um, Jaffe Carey, number 60. To summarize, we ask Okay, you're, you're uh, muted, Mr. K uh, you're, you're muted. Hmm. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, please go. Uh, I work for an agency uh, that services adults with developmental disabilities. I've been in the field for 40 years in a variety of positions, from direct care to every ship imaginable, uh, to a house manager, to a behavior specialist. I also serve as a consultant to the state of Connecticut. There's a behavior specialist providing consultation services to families and other agencies. I'm going to discuss how the lack of funding uh, affects multiple needs, starting with the least important and going to the most. Uh, managerial salaries and supervisory salaries in this field are much lower than they are in the public sector. Uh, I haven't for myself gotten a raise nor any manager in my agency for the last 11 years. And even if the inflation rate being relatively low, my income is actually less than it was 11 years ago. Uh, with my multiple graduate degrees and experience, if I was in the public sector with a job that was equivalent to the, stat, uh, to the job title that I have, I'd be making approximately 60% more or $35,000 more. Now, it's not about me. This is, if it was only me, I wouldn't be talking. This affects everybody in this field. Uh, but I put this as least important, okay? And I want to uh, stress our direct care staff. Our direct care staff uh, get salaries that are often not much higher or equivalent to an entry level position working in a supermarket or at a, at a fast food restaurant. And uh, let me clear any stereotype. The type of individuals we get, many of the people we serve are delightful, but many of them come with multiple dual diagnoses, psychotropic medications, behavioral challenges, medical challenges, physical challenges, and they represent some very challenging issues. In fact, in my agency and in my experience with other agencies, probably about one third to almost 40% are on multiple uh, on psychotropic medications for some form of diagnosable mental uh, psychiatric condition. Many of them have behavior issues that result in physical aggression or self-injurious behavior. Okay? And for that, for that, we offer people salaries that are no different than individuals who are working in supermarkets, okay, or in, uh, or we have to compete about filling positions uh, for people who could get the same salary working at McDonald's or Burger King. Uh, this has a result. And the result is, is that often during periods of low unemployment, we can't fill positions. It has another result. The gap between the needs that we need to cover, the needs of the individuals that we serve and the skill set of the individuals that we have to serve is ever widening. And why is this important to you as representatives? Because it leads to increases in abuse and neglect cases. It also leads to issues that need not be repeated over and over and over again, being repeated over and over and over again, because the need of the, uh, and the staff that we have to meet these challenges are not equal to the tasks. You know, I get a laugh you go to a psychiatrist and you could have some issues and you have to pay, if you're not on insurance, two or $300 an hour. We have individuals serving individuals with dual diagnoses, 
with significantly challenging behaviors and we pay them no more than the person who's serving your cup of coffee at, uh, uh, at Dunkin' Donuts, okay? So I say to you on multiple levels, if this problem is not going to get worse, and in my 40 years I have seen the gap widen, not get better, then you need to really seriously consider this HB 64039, and I plead with you. I'd like to retire knowing that things are getting better, not getting worse. Thank you for your time. I'm done. <laughs> I can go on, but I know there are many other people. No, I'm sorry. Um, uh, uh, I'm just on too many meetings today. Uh, I apologize. Uh, thank you very much for bringing your testimony here. Um, uh, seeing no questions. Up next is Dana Schmidt. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Dana. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and um, all the members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Dana Schmidt. I am a licensed clinical social worker and school-based behavioral health clinician at School-Based Health Services for the Community Health Center Incorporated. I would like to thank you for allowing me the time to speak today. I believe in briefly sharing with you quotes from students and a parent about how valuable and necessary school-based health centers are. It will provide evidence to ask you to increase the governor's proposed 2022-2023 budget for health agencies, House Bill 6439, and the line item for school-based health care. I have worked as a therapist in the state of Connecticut since 2003. I have a, a deeply invested uh, in my work um, that I provide to children, adolescents, and families who are part of our underserved communities. It has been apparent in my years of service that these adolescent children and families will not enter nor have the time or capacity to enter the typical counseling office. The barriers of access, location, cost, transportation, and social stigma about therapy has caused many to not receive the care that they rightfully and desperately need. I have witnessed and been a part of providing quality care in schools where we are addressing disparities in opportunity and providing access to care that otherwise would not be there for the adolescents and children to have support, learn the tools they need to heal and grow. Today, I would like to share several quotes from students and one parent who I work with in, Be in the Bethel Public High School. I chose to state in their words, the importance of school-based health centers uh, as they're the ones that most need it. Um, from a junior female student, I like the fact that we can do telehealth sessions around my school schedule. And when I come back to school, I will have you to go to when I have panic attacks. I am really anxious when I am in the school regularly, but wearing a mask makes me feel even uglier and insecure. I am really glad that you are in the school when I do go full time so that I can have you to come to as a support. Parent of a freshman boy said to me yesterday as I was setting up an intake appointment for today, I am so glad that there is a therapist in the school because I do not know how to pick anyone from like psychology today or how I would select someone from my long list of clinicians from my insurance company. I am happy that this service is in the school and it makes it easier for my son to be seen. A junior female that I work with, this has helped me a lot of ways during the pandemic in multiple ways. The most valuable thing about having sessions is it feels like I have a safe space to let go all of, go all of my feelings to a friend. It doesn't feel like I'm being forced to talk to an adult. It feels like I'm talking to one of my lifelong friends. A 10th grade student that I work with, I am very grateful to, my, to have my therapist. She has helped me with anxiety so much in ways she might not even know. I look so forward to our sessions to talk about my week. It feels so good not to have to rely on a pill thanks to her. Her listening and providing techniques has helped me so much. I'm very grateful to be able to have video sessions too and praise our sessions continue. 
from an 18 year old junior autistic female that I work very closely with that has many problems understanding her world around her. Um, Hi, and Dana, if you could wrap up, please. Okay, yes. Um, she said, I feel better about myself. I am able to relax and be more calm. I was able to get through hard times this year. Um, there are many other uh, adolescents that on uh, families that I work with, um, and especially from uh, newcomers from New York City. Uh, but um, thank you, uh, you know, very much for uh, providing this opportunity uh, so that many children across Connecticut can be seen. Um, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to share the real life examples and time for listening. Thank you very much, Dana. Appreciate it. Thank you for testifying. Up Thank next you. is Yvonne Ellis, followed by Caitlin Warner. And Hi. Senator Abrams is going to take the lead for a little bit. Okay. Um, are you ready for me? Yes, please. Okay. Good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Walker. Members of the committee, my name is Yvonne Ellis. I'm from Ashford, Connecticut. I'm a residential program worker at Oak Hill. I work in Coventry, Connecticut. I'm also an 1199 uh, member. Um, I've worked in the same house for 30 years. The clients have changed um, through that time, but I come before you today with an urgency to ask for increased funding for group homes so that we can continue the mission to provide excellent care for these individuals. I love my job, why? Because I love caring for the residents in my house. Over time, you get to know them, uh, build relationships, become close, you become like family. I know that one of my ladies loves to dance and listens to Christmas music. The other one likes to bake and also likes to eat it all. Um, being adequately funded and staffed properly also allows me to facilitate such activities. Um, in these moments, I truly feel like I'm providing quality of life for people with disabilities. Oak Hill's vision is that people with disabilities be able to achieve their full potential. However, over the past 14 years, the cost of everything, as we know, has gone up. Gas, food, daycare, medical insurance, just to name a few. Without rate increases, how are we expected to continue? Our management has attempted to fill vacant positions, but it's hard when the wages just can't compare. The fact is that 75% of my coworkers have a second job just to make ends meet. And if that's not testament enough that we're not being paid enough. Last year, we had a wonderful young lady that was employed um, who ended up having to get another job making $8 more an hour because she couldn't live on the wages that she was paid. Uh, this all culminates into burnout, especially with COVID-19 on top of everything. Um, so please increase our funding to appropriate levels. We are the ones that make sure that your daughter is properly fed or that your son is dressed warmly. In the political process, you often ask for our vote. So we are respectively, respectfully asking you today for your vote. Please help us. I thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you very much for your testimony today, Ms. Thank Ellis, you for being here. Um, next, thank we you. have uh, 63, Caitlin Warner. Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France, and the distinguished members of Appropriations Committee. My name is Caitlin Warner, and I'm a licensed professional counselor and a regional director of school-based health services for Community Health Center. I'd like to thank you for allowing me the time to speak today in support of increasing the governor's proposed budget for health agencies and the line item for school-based health care. I'd like to begin today with a story of one of the girls in our program. I chose her story not only because she's precious to me, but also because I believe it shows the importance of the work being done in school-based health centers. This fifth grade girl is sweet, kind, funny, very often misunderstood and deeply hurting. A grandparent who's doing her best to juggle work and raising five grandkids is her primary caregiver. Her parents, while both alive, continue to make choices that do not allow them to parent. When she first started in our program, she was acting out at home and in school, she was very angry, had few friends, failing most of her classes, and was severely depressed. 
She could not regulate her emotions as that's a skill usually learned through a bond with a trusting adult and she had not had one. Despite this, she is growing and our program work has begun to help her identify her emotions and express them instead of bur burying them deep inside. She's advocating for her needs and building resi resilience. Her depression is subsiding. She's addressing and changing past and healthy habits she used to meet her needs all at the age of 11. As Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to build strong children than repair broken men. I asked her last week to write down what having access to counseling in school has meant to her. I'm gonna share with you what she wrote, even though if I'm being honest, it feels awkward for me to read as she was very generous in her words about me. My therapist makes my life so much better. She is like the mother I never had. She is fun, caring, sweet, kind, makes me laugh and makes me feel loved. I know she loves me a lot, but she sure cannot dance. I've grown so much over the last year and a half and I would not have been able to without her. Having therapy in school helps me and my grandma as she could not afford the gas to get me to a counselor. And she is just one of the many children whose lives are being changed through school-based health centers. I'd like to thank you for listening to my testimony and being a part of providing this opportunity to so many children across Connecticut. I've submitted comments online if you'd like to read those as well. In conclusion, I again urge you to support increasing the funding in school-based healthcare. I'd like to use whatever remaining time to address any questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Ms. Warner, and thank you for giving voice to the important work that you do. It's really appreciated. Um, Next, we have number 64, Ms. Barry Bosworth. Thank you. Uh, my name is Barry Bosworth. Uh, I am uh, past president of the ARC of Connecticut, uh, and I'm currently a board member for STAR, Inc., Lighting the Way in Norwalk. Uh, more importantly, uh, my wife and I are parents to a 41-year-old daughter, her name is Catherine. She likes to be called Cat, though. And uh, she's the uh, one of the greatest joys of our life. I'm, I, I signed up to speak today because, uh, to put it simply, I mean, you've heard the message from several people. The, the nonprofits serving the community need more money. I know everybody comes to you and says, we need more money. You're not increasing enough. You're not paying enough. As I understand this, uh, this DDS proposal, this budget this year, it's flat funding from last year. Uh, look, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I very much want to be polite when I do. Uh, I think that's important. Star and, and virtually all of the community providers people with disabilities need more money. They need to pay their people a respectable and a reasonable uh, salary and a wage. Uh, I was impressed by the last person who spoke. Uh, she may be offline now, but um, that's the kind of staff that you, you love and respect. And STAR's got plenty of those. It's very difficult to recruit good people who who want to do the job uh, because they care and they want to show uh, their their love for their fellow human beings by working in a job like direct care at STAR or, or any of the other community providers. And they just, many of them, they can't afford to do it. Uh, we compete in the marketplace for, for people who who want to work at or are willing to work, I should say, at a pretty low rate of pay. I can't say enough, and I, and I say it respectfully. Please do something to put more funds into the proposed uh, budget, this $461 million over five years. And I know that's a lot of money. We can't compete for qualified workers who are good people that want to work and do a good job at a, at a respectable uh, profession. We need your help. I know things are tight. Please do whatever you possibly can to put some funding into these community providers because they deserve it and the people that they employ deserve it. And certainly uh, the people they're serving deserve it as well. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much for your testimony today, Mr. Bosworth. Um, next, we have number 66, Brian Williams. Go ahead, Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams, are you there? You're on mute. Good Go afternoon. Right ahead, Mr. Williams. Go ahead. Very well. Um, good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Brian Williams, and I'm currently a substance abuse counselor with nine years of state service. I'm here to respectfully request that you allocate $6.3 million to expand addiction services. There are people in our state currently with a dire need uh, for treatment. Before this pandemic that currently preoccupies us, we had an epidemic an epidemic of substance use disorder. It has not stopped, it is getting worse. Before the pandemic, we had a need to expand services. And while the pandemic continues, the need is greater. We have seen a 22% increase in overdose deaths in Connecticut since the start of the pandemic. Before the pandemic, CVH was operating, Connecticut Valley Hospital was operating 110 beds in Middletown at Merritt Hall. We had a waiting list then. Currently, our capacity is reduced in order to be in a posture to help with the pandemic to 32 beds, and the waiting list is getting longer. In the course of an addict's journey, there are a few times when the addict is receptive and open to getting treated. As we all know, denial is part of the illness. When an addict gets to the point where they are willing to accept treatments, that window is very short. When parents or families, members of an addict calls for treatment, and we tell them that we do not have a bed, we lose critical opportunities to reach out to people and get them into treatment. People die every day from this awful illness. Recently, I've had the experience of sitting in the screening office at CVH, watching our members having to tell folks calling in that it can't fit them in because we do not have a bed. Uh, encouraging them to go to the state website to check to see other places that may have beds. Most of the time, however, if someone is calling us, it's because there is nowhere else that's available. We have an opportunity to invest in our residents and the services that help save lives. We need to restore capacity to pre-pandemic levels, but we also need more beds. Merritt Hall has the available units, but even before the pandemic, we were not utilizing them. DMAS just needs the funding from the state to hire about 100 positions. 38 nurses, 60 direct care staff, and 14 clinical staff to restore our capacity to 110 beds and operationalize 30 more. I came to the United States as a 19 year old many years ago with dreams of going to business school and becoming an uh, international banker. While in college, I got a job at a group home with some emotionally troubled boys. It changed my life. It helped me to understand my own life, but most important, it helped me to realize how deep my passion is for this kind of work. Those boys taught me a lot. I stay in state service because we're able to help people transform their lives. Prioritizing recovery by investing in DMAS will save lives. We all deserve an opportunity to do the next right thing, but we need the resources to be able to provide life-saving care to our residents. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. Next is number 67, Giancaro Casa. Thank you, Senator. Uh, members of the committee, I'm John Carl Casa. I am the president and CEO of the Connecticut Community Nonprofit Alliance. Uh, we represent nonprofits from across the state who employ 117,000 people, about 14% of the state's workforce, and serve about 500,000 people more than 500,000 people each year. I wanna thank members on both sides of the aisle for the support that they've given to nonprofits this year. I mean, in particular, uh, the chairs, Senator Austin and Representative Walker for standing next to nonprofit leaders last month and talking about the need to start rebuilding the service network that has been allowed to fall behind for too long. You have my written testimony. It details our proposal. It details our concerns with the budget before you. The $461 million figure was calculated at the beginning of 2020. And since then, since a dozen years had passed without a funding increase, COVID hit. 
And what nonprofits did is what they have done all the time. They fulfilled their mission. They helped people. They did their jobs because it's what they are and it's who they are. We believe the state can do this. This is the year. OFA in its February budget estimates estimated an operating surplus of $187 million plus $543 million that is going into the $3.5 billion rainy day fund. We all know that a strong rainy day fund is important. We know that paying down the debt's important. I know that from my own past job experience. But we know that we don't have to choose between restoring funding and responsible budgeting. State has the money. On behalf of the people who are here today, and there are so many here today telling their stories, on behalf of all of the folks who work and are served by nonprofits, I, I ask, if not now, when? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Casa, for being here today. Um, next, we have number 68, David Haddon. Thank you, Senator. Um, my name is David Haddon. I am the uh, uh, Oak Hill board chair. You heard earlier from uh, our CEO and president, Barry Simon. Each year we serve at Oak Hill over 40,000 people with disabilities and with uh, over 1,700 professionals across 73 towns, we are a significant employer in the state of Connecticut. The vast majority of our employees are hardworking union members. We're a proud union shop. And I could not be more proud of Oak Hill's courageous professionals like Yvonne Ellis, who spoke eloquently just a few minutes ago, uh, at every level who have repeatedly put their own health at risk to protect the fragile individuals entrusted to our care from COVID. I'm also the father of two beautiful, gentle souls who communicated poignantly without words and who needed assistance in all aspects of daily life. My wife and I could not have cared for them as they were cared for for over 35 years without the essential help of nonprofits like Oak Hill and Hart. I particularly want to thank Representative Walker and Senator Austin for recognizing at your recent press conference that the nonprofit sector must have an increase in rates now after 14 years of flat funding. It's um, inexplicable to me, frankly, that the governor has proposed continued flat funding for what would be 16 straight years. 16 years is a generation. That would be shameful. And I have to say that on behalf of employees and the many families that are part of our network, um, we're, we're more than discouraged. We're angry, this has to change. The cost of everything over the past 14 years has gone up. With no rate increase, nonprofits providing essential services have had to do more with less every year. And more critically, the wages of our employees have effectively decreased year after year. And consider this, two thirds of our workforce are persons of color. With flat funding, the ability of our employees to live decently in Connecticut has steadily declined as a result of flat funding, which is a Connecticut public policy. The impact of that policy falls most heavily on black and brown people. It seems to me that is a classic illustration of systemic racism. It's unacceptable and it's inequitable. We heartily endorse John Carl and the Alliance's proposal to restore $461 million over the next five years index for inflation to the, to the nonprofit system it would mean appropriating for the next fiscal year 128 million, which after you net out Medicaid would actually cost the state 67 million. Thank you for your hard work. I know it's not easy. I know you have a lot to balance and I really appreciate you listening to, to me and to all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hayden, for taking the time to testify today. 
Uh, next, we have number 69, Stephen Bob. Go ahead, Mr. Bob. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and members of the committee. My name is Stefan Bob, and I've worked at Demas for 13 and a half years. I started in 2008, and currently I'm a mental health assistant one. I was hired of a class of 50, but only 12 of us remain. Many of my co coworkers left CBH due to staffing shortages, risk of energy, injury, no opportunities for upward mobility. That is why I'm here to tell, today to tell you that without increased investment in DEMAS funding, we will, we will be unable to staff our DEMAS facilities to the level that they should be staffed to deliver the best care that we can give. I work in Woodward Hall in the General Psychiatric Division at CBH. Originally, Woodward was designed as a geriatric unit for elderly folks who couldn't be in long-term care or community nursing homes. Over time, we started bringing in other types of patients, such as traumatic brain injuries and eating disorders. So now we have a total care uh, geriatric patients and on the same floor that we're treating for patients with traumatic brain injuries who are often younger, more ambulatory, who present more aggressive behaviors. When I started here, the base level staff for first and second shift was eight people per shift. Over the years, best ratios have been, have been reduced. So we currently work with five staff on the unit. The staffing shortages mean we're on mandatory folks every day. So staff are burnt out and patients don't get the individual attention that they deserve. Working in Woodward means working with geriatric patients with psychiatric diagnosis. We have 15 patients per unit and many of our patients need total care. Staff on the floor are needed to monitor meals because most of our patients are at risk for choking or have gastronomy tubes in their bellies or catheters or combination. In addition, many of our patients are on, on special diets. Bathing, bathing is another major staffing demand. Our patients are total care. We have an increasing number of non ambulatory obese patients who require adaptive equipment to get proper hygiene. We need a minimum of two people to bathe or monitor meals. Most days, we have multiple patients on constant observations requires at least one staff to monitor patients to ensure he or she is safe. If three of our patients are on constant observation, we have three staff assigned to monitor those patients and only two more staff available for bathing, feeding, or engaging with patients, just saying hi. Additional funding to DEMAS to fund positions is crucial for providing adequate care for the patients. Where, when we are available to engage with patients, patients get antsy and aggressive. A lack of staff, that means that we can't build rapport with these patients. And patient assaults on patients and patient assaults on staff are increasing. DEMAS needs increased funding to hire more staff and provide us with adequate training so we can provide the necessary care for those folks that need us. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the work you do, Mr. Bob, and also for being here today to testify. We really appreciate it. Thank Next you. is number 70, Regina Hampton. Regina, you're on mute. Regina Hampton, you're on mute if you're there. Okay. okay. Well, oh, go ahead. Hi. Um, good afternoon. Sorry about that. Um, Senator Bradley and Representative Hahn, distinguished members of the Public Safety and Security Committee. My name is Regina Hampton. Um, I'd like to testify on HB 5583. Regina? Yes. Regina, this is the Appropriations Committee. Okay. This is the number that they gave me. I came in a little mm -hmm. while ago and I, I sent a message because Okay. It was you. It weren't. The, it wasn't the right people. And this is the first time yeah. I've done this. So okay. I have no clue what I'm doing. All so, right. I'll, I, ask, but I'll ended ask somebody up from the. I'll let somebody from our host, uh, one of our hosts, to contact you. You're, okay. you're looking to testify for public safety. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. But we'll I ended up get... on your list. 
I guess so. So we'll, we'll try to get someone to help you with that. Okay. All right. Thank you. So hang on. Thank you. Um, okay. Next is number 71, Tracy Walker. Good afternoon. And thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Tracy Walker, CEO of Journey Found, a private nonprofit and unionized provider of residential and other supports and services for adults with intellectual disabilities throughout North Central and Southeastern Connecticut. Community nonprofits are critical to providing a quality of life that makes Connecticut a place where people want to live and work. Yet Connecticut has not recognized this contribution through providing contracts and rates that reflect the true cost of services or kept place with inflation since 2007. Based on inflation alone, this represents a loss of $461 million that has strained the service system. And I join my, many of my colleagues in requesting that you appropriate $461 million by fiscal year 2026, a 28% increase over five years. Furthermore, I ask that contracts and rates for community nonprofits have increases that are indexed to inflation so that we can keep pace with the increasing costs of doing business moving forward. Journey Found needs these funds for wages and benefits, the cost of home ownership and infrastructure. In 2018, we were one of the DDS agencies that received funds specifically to raise starting wages to 1475. At that time, minimum wage was 1010. That gave us a much needed boost in placing a far, a far enough above minimum wage to attract the skilled workforce needed for the vulnerable people we serve. As the state minimum wage now increases, we need increased funding to maintain that difference. Journey found staff do not do minimum wage jobs and they need to be paid accordingly. The intellectually disabled people we support deserve a skilled and stable workforce. We also own 11 of the group homes we manage and the cost of utilities, maintenance and upgrades have gone up while our funding has remained the same. These increased costs over which we have little control take away from our ability to offer training and staff development, tuition reimbursement and other benefits, transportation for those living with us, program supplies, technology and more. And COVID has only added to the burden. We are self-insured for healthcare and COVID testing for employees and their families alone has cost us $13,000 this year. We spent tens of thousands on PPE. We've increased personnel costs for overtime and the use of temp services due to absences for COVID related issues and the difficulty in attracting new staff. No one wants to put themselves at risk in this time of COVID doing this very personal work. It's important to note that funding appropriated to community nonprofits needs to be done in as flexible a manner as possible without designating specific uses. Agency needs to be, agencies need to be able to utilize any increased funding where it is needed most in their organization and we are all different. Please allow us to utilize increased funds where we need them within parameters that are broad enough to allow that flexibility while still maintaining accountability and transparency of funding. And I have one last request please allow any savings realized in the DDS budget to be reinvested in serving the IDD community rather than to balance the budget. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Walker, for your testimony today. Next, we have 72, Wendy Epstein. Hi, I began working to help formerly homeless, mentally ill individuals remain stably housed almost 20 years ago. As a case manager and now as the Director of Supportive Housing at Homes with Hope in Westport, I have seen firsthand how lives can be successfully turned around with the help of housing subsidies and supportive services. Most of our clients come to us with numerous and complex histories, often involving mental illness, substance abuse, poverty, and barriers to employment. One of my first clients had been adopted into an abusive family as a little boy. Because of his dysfunctional upbringing, he grew up with serious anger issues, and in his late teens, he tried to blow up a gas station. Because of this substantial criminal offense, he was incarcerated from ages 18 to 26. When he was released, this client had limited skills, a criminal history, and a family that wanted nothing to do with him. He was very depressed and understandably frustrated and quickly found himself homeless. Fortunately though, he was able to move into supportive housing where he was able to take the time he needed to get his life on a better track. Since he moved into his own apartment, this individual has gotten a job, stopped smoking, lost weight, and he has gotten a new front tooth. He also volunteers for the town of Westport in a variety of ways and feels very good about being a contributing member of society. I am immensely proud of the man he has become, and I am certain that his strides would not have occurred without the case management services made possible by this funding. 
Over the past 20 years, I have seen versions of this scenario unfold countless times, but these positive changes require money and resources. Please do what you can to support those most vulnerable in our community. Sometimes the clients who initially seem most difficult are the ones that surprise us. We need to continue to offer opportunities and resources to protect the homeless and empower them to become more self-sufficient and self-reliant. Ultimately, by providing housing subsidies and connections to resources, we are getting our neighbors off the streets and setting them up to be responsible, successful citizens. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you for taking your time to testify and share that story. Appreciate it. Um, next, we have number 73, Rebecca Martin. Had to unmute. Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee, thank you for hearing my testimony today on House Bill 6439. Um, I'm here to discuss the important investments through the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services to support efforts to end homelessness in Connecticut. My name is Rebecca Martin and I volunteer as a director of Homes with Hope here in Westport where I'm also a resident. It's so nice to follow on Wendy who works at Home with Ho Homes with Hope and does that transformative and life-saving work every day with our clients. Um, it's the reason why I give up, you know, my personal time um, to support this organization. And I guess I come, I come to this work personally because I have a 12 year old daughter with neurological differences and she is bright and capable in many ways. She bakes from scratch and walks herself home. Um, but when I think about her future, I expect that she will require supports to live independently she is like the people we serve at Homes with Hope. She's in fact like all people and that there are certain things she needs. And we all, I think, recognize that the only way to um, immediately solve homelessness is to give somebody a home. But at Homes with Hope, they recognize that the key to maintaining um, a home is, is having those supports and services that keep people um, living independently and doing their work and um, and caring for those around them. Uh, the demand for mental health and addiction support that is offered through DMHAS has only increased um, during this pandemic and in our town where many residents have had adult children return home unable to maintain employment during the economic downturn and unable to cope with the economic stress and isolation that the pandemic has caused. So our, our effort to provide um, our efforts uh, must must be expanded and to that end we um, support the proposed budget for the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and housing supports and services line at 23.4 million in each year of the biennium, a new targeted investment of 2.25 million in the DMHAS's housing supports and services line. Um, at Homes with Hope, it's supportive services that are the key to breaking the cycle of homelessness. As I said, it's not just giving somebody the home, it's giving them the ability to keep it. Um, we request $375,000 in new funding for the homeless supports and services line for enhanced outreach services that would enable us to better identify individuals experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Um, and we support the governor's proposal to provide an additional $4 million in fiscal year 22 and seven point two million in fiscal year 23 for continued discharges from the Connecticut Valley Hospital. Again, people need continuing supports. It doesn't end with a, with a hospitalization. Um, the addition of 352,000 in each year for wraparound services for 47 individuals anticipated to receive HUD mainstream vouchers during fiscal year 22 and the Connecticut Community Nonprofit Alliance proposal to restore $461 million over five years to community nonprofits. Nonprofits like ours are the, are the, the key to um, not just keeping people housed and supported, but connected to the, to the community and keep the community invested in the lives of everybody. Because like I said, it's that interconnectedness. We all need help at some point. And I thank you for your continued support to alleviate homelessness in our state. Thank you very much, Ms. Martin, for your testimony today. Um, next, we have number 74, uh, Laura Co Lori Collins. And also, can everyone just make sure that you're on mute, please? 
Thank you. Go right ahead, Ms. Collins. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Olson and Representative Walker and the distinguished members of the committee. Um, I want to thank you today for the opportunity to testify. My name is Lori Collins, and I'm the Association Director for the Connecticut Association of School-Based Health Centers. Uh, I'm here today to thank the governor for the continued support for our school-based health centers and the level of funding, um, and to ask the committee to strongly consider increasing the funding for school-based health centers in Connecticut. School-based health centers in 22 communities across the state serve as the main point of contact for nearly 40,000 children children uh, to obtain medical, mental health, and dental care. For so many young people, school-based health centers have become a lifeline for them uh, to be able to access quick and easy and free of charge services to keep them healthy. For a child, building a strong relationship in a safe environment with a trusted adult can change their life, and we know that. Uh, more importantly, building that connection with a licensed professional at a school-based health center uh, that exists right there in their school can and has changed the trajectory of a child's life who is struggling with illnesses like anxiety and depression. School-based health centers keep children out of emergency rooms, healthy and able to participate in their learning. It was really nice to be able to hear some of our members uh, speak before me because I think they gave some great examples and we heard some great stories, uh, pretty compelling about the difference it makes in children's lives. Throughout the past year, school-based health centers were able to respond to unique circumstances created by the COVID-19 pandemic like the transition to remote and hybrid learning in schools uh, with innovative practices that enabled them to continue to provide care to students safely. School-based health centers developed uh, vaccination drive-through clinics to ensure that immunization schedules were kept. They performed aggressive outreach to at-risk at students to keep them from uh, being even further disconnected. Uh, those kids that we worry about slipping through the cracks uh, on a good day, uh, there was a lot of work to make sure that they stayed in contact and, and made sure that those kids were, were being seen. Uh, the new stressors in children's lives created by this pandemic will continue to affect their physical and mental health for years to come. Uh, School-based health centers are here uh, and they're ready to provide the care that the kids need. Um, I wanna share a story if I could very quickly. I know we're limited here. Um, it's a quick, a quick story that was uh, shared with me from one of our school-based health center directors it was from a student who wanted to, who she didn't want her name shared, um, but it's quick. She said, good morning. I'm writing this email out of appreciation to you. This was directly to her um, healthcare provider. During the summer in school, there have been instances that bad things could have happened, but you have been there to help me get through it. You have shown me how to look at the bright side of things and not necessarily just look at the bad. I've had some good days and bad days but you have taught me that I am not alone in anything that I have to go through. Without you, I would not be doing good and still strive to reach my goals. I just want you to know that even though I may talk a lot or repeat things a lot to you, I appreciate you and all that you have done for me. I think that's probably uh, one of the best stories I've ever heard because she said two things in there, that she knows she's not alone and there have been bad things that could have happened. And, and so that really makes a big difference to us. One thing that the pandemic has continued to highlight for us is that communities without school-based health centers have a disadvantage. Children have much uh, more limited access to healthcare and mental health providers because parents have to take time from work uh, to bring children to medical and uh, medical offices for appointments and to licensed practitioners. It's well cited in the literature that when access to care is limited, preventative care is often de deprioritized and healthcare outcomes worsen over time. Connecticut Association of School-Based Health Centers strongly believes that healthy kids make healthy learners. Providing medical, dental, and mental health services on-site at schools contributes greatly to the physical and mental health of students and the community. For this reason, we're grateful uh, that the budget uh, maintains the funding level for school-based health centers, and we strongly urge the committee to consider increasing the funding for school-based health centers to allow for new centers to be implemented in communities that lack resources. I wanna thank you for the opportunity for testifying today. Thank you very much, Ms. Collins, for your testimony. We appreciate it. Um, next, we have number 75, Michelle Weinstein. Go right ahead. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, members of the Appropriation Committee. I'm Michelle Weinstein and I work at Ability Beyond, a nonprofit that serves individuals Michelle, you're breaking up. Disabilities. Michelle, 
You're breaking I've up. I've worked here for 16 years and have come to see firsthand just how valuable our services are. Oh, no. Ms. Weinstein, may, may we make a suggestion? It, we're getting a message that says that your bandwidth is low. Perhaps if you um, let me try a different room. Camera. It's okay. Why don't you Why don't you see if you can correct it, and we'll move on. But but get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, next is number seventy six, Earl Given. So before we go on, appropriation staff, we're going to leave Ms. Weinstein in, okay? For now, thank you. Thank okay. You, Madam um, yeah, I'm in. Uh, oh. Can you hear me now? Yep, go right. We'll try it again. I'm sorry, Mr. Given. Hold on one minute. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ms. Weinstein. Try. You're on mute. Go right ahead. Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Try it again. Is this connect? This connection better. I apologize. Um, so I was saying that it, my name is Michelle Weinstein. and work at Ability Beyond. I'm sorry, it's still breaking uh, up. I'm sorry, Michelle. It's still uh, social service up. agency that Michelle? provides Michelle. You're still, you're still breaking up, Michelle. <laughs> Michelle, you're still breaking up. I'm sorry. No. Okay. We're going to, we're going to move on. And yes. Speak. Yep. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Given. Try again. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, it's okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Senator Abrams and Representative Walker and other members of the Appropriation Committee. My name is Earl Gibbon and I'm a member of 1199. I work with, uh, in the Southwest Connecticut Mental Health System. Young Adult Services Program in Bridgeport. I'm here today to ask for funding for Demis, to, Demis Supportive Housing Services in Yaz. Yaz used to have a 16 hour step down residential program for our young adults who didn't need 24 hour levels of care. This program focused on helping the young adults gain a level of independence so they, would, that so they could live out on their own. It created a sense of security for the clients knowing that they had staff to assist them if needed. And it also created a sense of independence about, um, excuse me, a, a sense of independence being able to go out on their own and take care of their personal responsibilities. The site was staffed from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. to provide support for clients if needed. Clients would check in with the staff and coordinate any support needed for that day. The site had uh, six individual apartments and a staffed apartment that was used for respite if needed. Since the 16 hour program was cut, it's been very difficult to assess the level of care for our clients. Uh, we see that clients, they're, they're not moving, they're, they're at a standstill as far as moving from being in a 16, I mean, excuse me, in a 24 hour service to being able to move out on their own. Clients being moving out on their own too early and they're not ready to live out on their own in the community. Uh, hospitalizations have increased due to the lack of support that the 16 hour site offered. The attendance of programming for the Young Adult Services program with clients has declined. The uh, clients have moved out into community too early, tend to lack the ability to maintain their daily schedules. So they, you see a decline in other areas like uh, their case management, employment and education and other wraparound services that we provide. I ask again that you fund the YAS services uh, program, 16 hour program, uh, because it's very important to our clients. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony today and for taking your time to talk to us. Um, next we have number 77, Marilyn Rossetti. Go Thank right you. ahead, Mr. Rossetti. Hello, hi, thank, thank you, Representative Walker. Thank you, Senator Abrams, and thank you all your uh, esteemed colleagues. Um, I'm here today, I've been listening to my colleagues. I'm humbled by the work that we do. Uh, I am the executive director of the Open Hearth in Hartford, Connecticut. What we do, we house homeless men. We house homeless men and hope that they will then permanent, be permanently housed. We do that through employment, recovery, reunification with their families. 
what we did, what did we do? In the last year, we were in a war. We stayed open. We went in every day. First line staff was there. There were days early on, we thought we were walking to our death and we still went. And I don't like people comparing that if someone works at a coffee shop or someone works somewhere else, we all deserve to be paid what we should be paid. What we want, everyone said what we want. We're a nonprofit, but we're a business. We pay everything a business does. Frontline workers have saved lives. I've watched the staff that I am with day in, day out, stay committed, come in. Um, were we worried? We did have a perfect storm with a COVID early on. All the kitchen staff was gone. Nothing like cooking for 135 men. Why do we need it? It's time. It's time. We're here every year. You're here every year, a lot of you. I admire the work you do. I know you admire the work we do. I think someone said, if not, not, if not when now, I think we're at the time. This is a year for us to do it. I thank you. Uh, I see all your faces and I know what hard work you do, but remember the work that we do. Thank you very much. We do remember Ms. Rossetti and thank you so much for the work that you do. Um, next we have, uh, I think we're skipping to number 80, Deidre oh. Delaney. Yes. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you for listening. Uh, my name is Deirdre Delaney and I'm here to talk today about HB 6439 in my capacity as a board secretary for, of the nonprofit agency Horizons. Horizons has been around a long time as many of you know, providing year round supports for people who have de developmental disabilities. I volunteer frequently at Horizons and have met hundreds of campers and their families. I've come to know many of the remarkable individuals who rely on the supports, su supports su provided by Horizons. I've also come to know the staff who provide those supports. The dedication and passion they bring to their work is truly inspiring. They form profound connections with the individuals they support and the work they do is challenging, all consuming and essential. I've also learned about the financial difficulties they face. Many full-time full -time Horizon staff take on second and third jobs to pay rent and simply put food on the table. Some I know have energy assistance, others who can't afford the high deductibles in the Horizons health insurance packages are forced to use Husky. Let me reiterate the key point here, the work that these people do is essential. For decades, this work was done by the state at a far greater cost. In the 1980s, as an alternative, the state charged community nonprofits like Horizons with providing individualized high quality services. Horizons has met that charge with 40 years of innovation, ingenuity, and a lot of belt tightening along the way. <clears throat> the bottom line, Horizons provides year round supports less expensively than the state ever did or ever could do, even with the proposed increase of $461 million over five years. We ask that the state provide a fair living wage to, the, to these often in, invisible human service professionals who provide essential services that previously were provided by the state. They dedicate themselves to helping less fortunate ind individuals lead dignified and fulfilling lives. Your support of HB 6439 will help assure that these deserving professionals are able to lead dignified and fulfilling lives as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Delaney, for your testimony today. We appreciate it. Next is number 81, Denise King. Go right ahead. Hey, oh, good afternoon, um, Senator Abrams and um, the other members of the uh, Appropriations Committee. Thank you for hearing my testimony. My name is Denise King and I'm from Lebanon, Connecticut. My husband and I are the grandparents and the guardians of Matthew King Jr. who has intellectual and developmental disabilities. We raised Matthew and his three siblings 
um, from the ages of eight, seven, and three. Matt is now 30 years old and is a happy, healthy young man. Because he was given a residential placement from Horizons, Connecticut in 2016, he is now living with his two roommates and his support staff and is currently working about 15 hours a week at the Coast Guard Academy, cleaning classrooms with some, some of his coworkers and his job coach. He will hopefully return to his job at UConn when the dining halls fully open after COVID. Matthew is a happy, confident young man who continues to grow in his independence and abilities. We believe that that is a direct result of his life in an independent setting with the give and take and camaraderie of roommates and staff. We have also benefited from this transition as we are now able to fully enjoy our retirement without the constant worry of what will happen to Matthew in the very quickly coming future. We are so happy for him, although to say that the arrangement is perfect would not be truthful. It will always take some type of overseeing to ensure Matt's continued growth and well-being. Last year we were able we were finally able to get Matthew his fully his full residential funding and that will go a long way towards help to ensure a brighter future for him. The residential wait list has been and will continue to be an issue for people who need residential placements. Please help other people in the ID community to reach their potential no matter the level of need that they may have please allot funding for placements. This community has lost a huge amount of funding through budget cuts in past years. Nonprofit providers like Horizons in particular have suffered greatly with, lots, with loss of the budget for staff. Most of these providers are working short and the staff that they do have are overworked and underpaid. Please restore funding. These issues will not go away. Please help other people thrive and blossom as our grandson has done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. King, and thank you for advocating for others and hoping that they get what your grandson has gotten. Appreciate it. Um, next is number, um, oh, I see number 79 on here now, Tania Garuli. I'm, I'm sure I'm saying your last name wrong. Go right ahead. Hi, it's Tania Spruill. How are you? Thank you so much. Go right ahead. Yes, so I am, I work at Mark Community Resources, and I work with individuals with different disabilities. Um, I'm here, I'm going to read, I'm going to, okay. So I'm here to respectfully request that the legislative appropriate for $61 million over five years for community nonprofits since 2007. Community nonprofits have lost at least 461 million in state funding that has not kept pace with inflation or adequately covered increased costs and demand for services over the last 13 years. Please commit to the increase in funding by the full 461 million or 28% by fiscal year for 2026. Appropriate 128 million is state net of 67 million after federal reimbursement and new funding for community nonprofits in fiscal year 2022, a 7% increase. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated the impact of inadequate funding for nonprofit services and brought unanticipated and unbudgeted costs and operational challenges for many community nonprofits such as providing hazard pay for essential workers on the front lines with the higher risk of exposure, um, procuring expensive and hard to find personal protective equipment and cleaning supplies, creating telehealth services seemingly overnight and purchasing necessary computers, cybersecurity, online meeting platforms and training for both staff and people receiving services. Many community nonprofits never closed their doors even as the pandemic worsened. Um, I know working through the COVID pandemic, it was a challenge, definitely getting things together as fast as possible with the change and everything going on as we all were learning, you know what I mean, day by day with the different changes and just trying to adapt to it and cope with it. Um, I know firsthand, like just working in houses where individuals became positive, 
just knowing how to be able to work with what you have the best that you can while still, you know, following the updated CDC guidelines that would happen reoccurringly. Um, and outside of that, just like the extra, you know, trying to put together Zooms and learning how to do like telehealth visits and everything like that. And, you know, working together to try to keep it all, you know, afloat and to keep flowing while doors were closed. But um, I know that this would be a great, definitely a great thing for us all moving forward for sure. Thank you very much for your testimony. We really appreciate it. Thanks for being here today. Looks like and you're thank working you. hard. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> um, sure. Next, we have number 82, Kathleen Stauffer. Thank you. Go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Kathleen Stauffer. I live in Mystic. I'm CEO of the ARC Eastern Connecticut. I'm testifying in support of HB 6439. The ARC Eastern Connecticut respectfully requests that Connecticut increase funding for its nonprofits by the full amount proposed by fiscal year 2026. Please keep pace with inflation and real costs. Please support people with intellectual disabilities as we walk them to self-sufficiency. Please, please support our COVID heroes, our essential worker heroes. Please acknowledge by passing this bill that PPE and cleaning supplies have been difficult, if not impossible to find and extremely expensive. The ARC Eastern Connecticut is meeting all participant needs during an international pandemic by rapidly pivoting to innovative service models not previously used. The ARC initially protected the people we serve and our team of nearly 500 with no funding or help obtaining protective equipment. To date, 153,000 for masks alone at a rate of 300 masks per week. One order of gowns recently cost $65,000. The ARC has worked with the CDC, the state and Connecticut's DDS, constantly reviewing and revising services and protective measures to meet all federal and state requirements as they rapidly and necessarily evolve. The ARC is a 69-year-old agency founded by families. Today, we serve 900 plus people with IDD with a network of more than 2,500 voters. Services range from residential to in-home supports to, East, to employment services and support groups for survivors of sex abuse, both men and women. We employ more than 440 adults contributing more than 9 million in wages to Eastern Connecticut's economy. Nearly 30% of team members are people of color and 72.7% are women. Last July, in the heart of the pandemic, I intended a by invitation only international virtual seminar offered by Harvard University called Nonprofit Crisis Management. Its premise, what to do when nobody knows what to do. At no cost to us, this course provide, proved providential, but the survival of Connecticut's nonprofits cannot be left to Providence any longer. For the last year, I have walked my team through heart-wrenching stress, shifting on the fly 24 seven, housing nearly 100 people with severe challenges seven days a week for 52 long weeks, supplying 97,455 4, 97, meals, providing day supports to nearly 100 families more and providing Zooms so that families might visit one another, all the while constantly reminding my team about self-care. When I left the for-profit world 10 years ago, if you had asked me my most satisfying moment, I would have guessed it was seeing people with IDD reach their potential, and that certainly has proved true. But I was not counting on the joy of watching young people. Many from the same families join our team at the ARC, grow up, grow as professionals into leaders, and thrive by leading people with IDD to real independence. My team wants and deserves careers. I beg you, please help us to retain and reward these fine young people. I ask you also to please invest in Connecticut's most vulnerable people. Yes, people with IDD can become independent. Please support their families who love them. An investment in the ARC Eastern Connecticut is an investment in Connecticut itself. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And thank you for your service to Connecticut. Thank you, thank you, Kathleen. Thank you for, for your testimony. Um, you you guys are really you you really make us happy because we hear the passion in what you're doing and how you're serving your 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 clients. So thank you so much. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, next we have Stephen Wolf and followed by Stephen Wolf. Uh, Stephen Wolf is number 83. Number 84 is Lee ooh, from New Reach. Stephen? Hi. Good afternoon of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide my testimony today. My name is Stephen Wolf, and I'm the Connecticut Executive Director for Kencrest, an agency that provides and supports services to adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Kencrest operates in 13 community, community living areas in Fairfield and New Haven counties. Our workforce direct support professionals, or DSPs, provide essential supports and services so that people with disabilities can live an independent and everyday life in the community of their choice. COVID-19 has severely impacted um, the IDD community, excuse me. Individuals with intellectual disabilities are significantly more likely to become severely ill or die from the disease, or our DSP workforce as essential workers are at a higher risk for contracting the virus. Throughout the pandemic, DSPs have gone above and beyond and served faithfully despite the numerous risks and challenges. In all of, in all of that we face, DSPs are paid relatively low wages, which causes high turnover in the field. In the IDD system has one one payer Medicaid supported by the state and federal dollars. Therefore, we, re we respectfully request the General Assembly appropriate $461 million over five years for our community nonprofits. Over the last 13 years, community nonprofits have lost at least this amount in state funding that has not kept pace with the inflation and adequately covered increased costs and demand for services. This funding is critical to continue our high quality supports and services that stabilize the community service system. We're also urging that the state legislator, state legislator reinvest in the IDD system by using proposed savings from programs, transitions to people served with IDD rather than balancing a budget. Ken Chris stands ready to work with the state legislators, DDS families and the provider community to solve these issues so that we can all continue to provide essential community supports and services to the people with disabilities in Connecticut. Thank you again for your time to hear my testimony. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony and thank you for your advocacy. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Lee? Good afternoon. Uh, I thank the distinguished members of the Housing Committee for your time and consideration. My name is Lee Bortinsky. I work at New Reach Incorporated in New Haven and I'm a resident of Ridgefield, Connecticut. I've worked at New Reach for about a year as a rapid rehousing caseworker and an employment specialist. I'm a disabled veteran of the US Army. I'm a person with a mental health diagnosis and I'm a person who has experienced homelessness himself. If it weren't for state homelessness programs and support, I would not be in the amazing position I am today. I have a fiance, a full-time job helping others. I'm back in college and many areas my life continue to improve. I know from firsthand experience that when our state's residents have stable housing, their economic and health incomes outcomes improve. During COVID-19, permanent stable housing is more needed than ever. Increased funding through DEMAS in this bill will be very important to addressing homelessness. I support the CP Community Nonprofit Alliance proposal to restore 461 million over five years to community nonprofits. Funding for nonprofits, including those working to end homelessness does not adequately cover increased costs and demands for services. I can also say firsthand that as far as addressing inequality, unfair privilege, and exclusionary policies, every single client I have helped is a person of color. They have been hit the hardest by far. I have had the sorrowful privilege of observing how dire the situation has become. If we want to start chipping away at the glaring problems in fairness and equality, this is a great place to start. I would also like to address the fact that my colleagues in human services and I make very little, yet we do such important work. Homelessness cannot be minimized without us, yet many of us are drowning in debt simply because compassionately helping people through our work pays so little. My organization does what it can, but it can only do so much. I would highly recommend more funding to show workers like my colleagues and I that the state cares and that we are appreciated and valued. I want to keep doing what I do. However, I also need to survive and soon may be forced to get other work due solely to pay. Thank you to everyone who's taken the time to hear my testimony. I'm grateful to be able to contribute to making a difference in Connecticut and hopefully even further. Thank you for considering everything and making the critical life-saving decisions in these areas. Homelessness support can get so much better with your help for both workers and people in need. So I implore you to ensure that every youth, family and individual has a safe, stable place to call home. Thank you. 
Thank you, and thank you for your testimony and your advocacy. Thank you. Have You're a welcome. good day. You too. Uh, number uh, 85 and Daniel Osborne. And after Daniel Osborne, Sarah Fox, number 87, and number 88, Carrie Dyer. Okay, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, my name is Daniel Osborne. I'm the CEO at Gilead Community Services in Middletown, Connecticut. Uh, Gilead has provided a full continuum of mental health and addiction services in Middlesex County uh, for over 50 years, uh, and we've recently expanded to Hartford County. Uh, I, I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to testify uh, today as I have uh, many years uh, prior uh, this year on House Bill 6439. Uh, and once again, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm testifying on behalf of the amazing staff, over 300 uh, amazing staff members at Gilead, our over 2000 individuals that we have the privilege of serving every year and the thousands of community members that come out in force to support us uh, every year, whenever we ask. Uh, and I'm here for one reason, and that's to implore you uh, to adopt uh, and appropriate the 461 million that several others are advocating uh, for throughout the day today over the next five years based on the plan uh, that the CT Nonprofit Alliance has, has presented. I, you know, reviewing my testimony from previous years, and I know you have it on file, so I'm not going to go through this testimony word for word, but reviewing my testimony from previous years, you know, it stood out to me that almost every year over the past you know, seven or eight years, I've used consistently the language protect and fully fund. So I thought maybe this year I would highlight what I really mean when I say those words, because maybe it's not, not as evident as I, as I think it is. When I talk about protecting, uh, every year we've, we've asked, we've come to um, the Appropriations Committee and we've asked uh, to, be, um, to be protected as nonprofit providers and the thousands of people that we serve. The need for mental health and substance abuse treatment has grown significantly throughout this pandemic, as I think we're all aware, and it's expected to continue to grow as we emerge from this pandemic. Agencies like Gilead are proud and honored to serve those who come to us in need of treatment, and we have skilled and trained professionals ready to respond when called upon. Throughout the pandemic, hundreds of thousands of state residents have depended on the nonprofit provider system for essential services that can meet the different, mean the difference between life and death. And throughout this pandemic, we have stepped into this need uh, and we have met the challenges head on. So when we ask for you to protect us, what we're really asking is for you to protect and prioritize your families, your colleagues, and all of the other people uh, that nonprofits serve and save year after year. When we talk about what it means, when I talk about what it means to ask to be fully funded, we definitely don't mean flat funding. And I think we all, we all know that at this point. Over the last 14 years, community profits in Connecticut have lost at least 461 million in state funding simply by not keeping pace with the inflation or effectively covering increased costs associated with the ever increasing demands for services. So based on the analysis that, that has been developed, um, we know that we've lost financially, but based on my experience in Connecticut's nonprofit healthcare system over 20 years, I've seen what this has really cost. I've seen decreased programming, decreased staffing levels, closed agencies, reduced client capacity, while all of the needs in these areas increase year after year. Um, and so we, we see the reductions in client capacity. We see the impact on our ACT team, our CSP program, our rehab center. And ultimately the true cost is the years and lives that are lost to untreated mental health conditions and addiction disorders. This shouldn't be okay with all of us. I know that it's not okay with many of you. I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir uh, in, in many respects and I appreciate the support uh, that all of you provide uh, for us and to us on these issues. So just in closing, some years I've come with my testimony and, and honestly, I'm really not sure if the state can even do the things that we're advocating for, but I advocate anyway, because that's my role and that's what we do. Um, but this year is different this year. Uh, we know that these steps are achievable. Um, we know that we can make these, these steps. And again, I think many of you support these steps, uh, but it does require for all of us and all of you to believe that the services that nonprofits provide to our communities truly are of great value and need Thank to be preserved for future Thank generations. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Uh, next, Sarah. Sarah, didn't I just see you last night? <laughs> 
Yes, you've seen me nonstop. Um, hold on a second. Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee, thank you for allowing me to testify. My name is Sarah Fox, and I'm the Director of Policy at the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness. I speak today representing a broad coalition of more than 100 organizations across the state, all committed to ensuring that homelessness is rare, brief, and non-recurring. I'm here today to discuss the important investments to end homelessness in the DEMAS budget. Homelessness is one of our state's most tragic, urgent, and solvable crises. When the stay-at-home order was issued, the public saw what we all knew to be true, thousands of people across the state who had no permanent home. The pandemic makes it hard to ignore the astounding disparities that fall upon those who are impoverished, people of color, and others who have been dis systemically disenfranchised. We must recognize that housing is healthcare and access to housing is an undeniable human right. The state's current approach to engaging unsheltered people is inadequate and fragmented and under-resourced. These are some of our state's most vulnerable people as simply being without a home is a dangerous health condition and they are at heightened risk of contracting, spreading and dying from the virus. These people often avoid homeless shelters and instead, of, instead sleep outside in tents and in, and in abandoned buildings. CCH joins the Reaching Home campaign in requesting 375,000 in new funding in the DEMAS support, Housing Supports and Services line item for enhanced outreach services. CCEH also joins the Reaching Home campaign in calling for vital investments in permanent housing and supports to protect our state's most vulnerable. We know what works to end chronic homelessness, it's housing and supports, and we also know that we save the state 70% of the costs that those that are chronically homeless would otherwise incur by their homelessness persisting. Lastly, during the COVID-19 pandemic emergency, homeless service providers have played an important role in our state's critical infrastructure and our emergency response system. But regardless of their essential role, homeless service organizations continue to be funded at state agency levels far below the actual cost of delivering services. The net effect of asking providers to maintain or in some cases do more with flat funding has been lower wages, lower morale, high turnover, high vacancy rates amongst frontline staff, and too often our frontline staff are near or at homelessness themselves. CCH stands in support of proposed Senate Bill 340, an act concerning funding for housing services, which will come before you this session. Um, this will ask for a, it will require DEMAS and DOH to review and adjust funding levels and existing contracts. Um, adequate funding and livable wages would go a long way towards eliminating the racial and economic inequities that have become so glaring during this, during this pandemic. I thank you to the committee for the opportunity to present this testimony and for your hard work making important and life-saving decisions during this public health crisis. And in closing, I respectfully request that the legislature appropriate 461 million over five years to community nonprofits. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for your advocacy and all your hard work. Oh, I'm thank sure you. I'll, see you. I'll see you probably in two days, I know. Yes. <laughs> um, next, Carrie Dyer. After Carrie Dyer, Kevin Zingler, Zig Ziegler. After Kevin Ziegler, Daniela Maldonado. Are they all here? Let me just slow down a bit. Um, is Carrie, I mean, uh, Kevin Ziegler here? Yes. Yes, good. Okay, and Danielle Maldonado? Uh, not yet, Madam Chair. Okay, all right, so let's go right in. Okay, Carrie Dyer? Good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Carrie Dyer. I'm the CEO of Reliance Health, a nonprofit agency serving Eastern Connecticut that is primarily funded by DEMAS and DDS. I wish to share comment with regard to House Bill 6439 and the governor's proposed budget. Our agency provides a wide variety of services to individuals who navigate mental health, substance, and intellectual challenges. We've provided these services since 1976 and have grown and adapted to the needs of our community. We're creative, optimistic, and nimble. Sadly, we've been forced to use that skill set, though, to cope with neglectful funding patterns. Since 2007, the nonprofit sector has had flat funding. That's 14 years. That's half of my career. 
of no increases to account for inflation, insurance premiums, technology demands, housing expenses, and the overall cost of doing good business. Ironically, we hold three leases with the state of Connecticut for properties where we provide residential supports. The state, citing escalating administrative costs, raises our leasing fee at each renewal, yet our state of Connecticut funding does not increase, thus reducing resources to support the individuals living in those homes. It's simply absurd. This is not my first time testifying on this topic. I could have copied and pasted from my previous testimonials, but clearly they weren't effective. Nothing changed. I've struggled to decide how to put words to my frustration. I'm sure you can hear it in my voice. And I know though that this is a friendly um, group who understands where we're coming from. Um, the pattern is just illogical and it's insulting to the people who do this great work. Our contracts, unlike our state counterparts, have been frozen in time, yet we're expected to meet the increased expenses and demands without question or complaint. Each year, we're told that we're valuable, that we're essential, that we're the safety net. And this year, we need you to prove it. We need um, to have folks advocate for us to commit to right-sizing the funding for the nonprofit agencies. Please treat us with the dignity and respect that we so readily provide to our communities. We appreciate the bold statements of support at the beginning of this legislative session, and we really do understand that you are on our side and that you are hoping for the best for us. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. And if if we could pass this budget with just uh, the the fifty members here, I think you'd be okay. Um, we, and then get it signed by the governor. All right. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kevin Ziegler. Senator Alston, West, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France, and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Kevin Zingler, and I am the President and CEO of Mark Inc. of Manchester. We're a nonprofit organization that supports people with intellectual disabilities in day, residential, respite, personal supports, employment, and transportation services. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you today to testify in support of House Bill Number 6439, an act concerning the state budget for the biennium ending June 13th, 2023, and making the appropriations thereof. As a partner with the Developmental, the Department of Developmental Services for the past 69 years, I am here to respectfully request that the legislature appropriate additional funds to the DDS budget to increase pay increases for direct support professionals and address the ongoing needs of individuals with intellectual disabilities resulting from the pandemic. In regards to pay rates, the legislature clearly articulated via the passage of Special Act Number 18-5 in 2018 that a wage differential between minimum wage and the rates earned by direct support professionals or DSPs, as you've heard about today, is not only warranted and earned, but essential to ensure the quality of care is provided. This past year has unequivocally proven this statement to be true. When the state imposed restrictions due to the pandemic, our staff continued to show up to work. They worked longer shifts and sacrificed their own health and the safety of their the individual to ensure the safety of the individuals that they support. They are truly heroes. We owe them a debt of gratitude as our collective efforts have resulted in one of the lowest death and infection rates across the country for people with intellectual disabilities. During one of our stakes darkest times, they were there for us. I'm asking you today to recognize the critical work and support that they provide in, in, by increasing the funding to DDS. I would also like to take this time to remind you that the wage differential established via Special Act number 18-5 is set to be reduced by another dollar this August and will fully erode away completely by 2023. An increase in funding will allow DDS to address, to address wage disparities, but also provide enable, provide enable private providers such as Mark to work in partnership with DDS to address current and future needs of the individuals and families impacted by the pandemic. Over the past year, we have seen firsthand the increase in anxiety, depression, isolation, job loss, reduction in employment opportunities, and regression of skills, which will need to be addressed as we enter the recovery phase of this pandemic. Thank you for your time and for allowing me this opportunity to address the committee. Working together, we will continue to keep individuals safe and healthy during these unprecedented times. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your testimony and thank you for your advocacy. 
we we hear you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Um, next, we have Daniela Maldonado. Daniela. No, not present, uh, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, uh, Mark, number 91, Mark Paravuka, Russo? Not, not here. Okay. Uh, number 92, Todd Reagan. I see 93. So we'll go to 93. Uh, it, am I okay with that? Um, Mr. Reagan is in the panel, but he, he is not speaking. Oh, okay. Then we'll go to number 93. Margaret. Oh, hello, I'm, I'm oh. here. Oh, okay. All right, hi. How are you doing, Mr. Reagan? Go right ahead, sir, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Representative Gibson, Senator Hartley, Representative Kennedy and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. <clears throat> Thank you for hearing my testimony today on House Bill 6439. I'm here to discuss the important investments through the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services to support efforts to end homelessness in Connecticut. Uh, <clears throat> one second. <sighs> my name is Todd Regan and I'm a resident of Hamden. I work in New Haven for uh, New Reach as a recovery support specialist. New Reach has been providing housing and homeless services to the greater New Haven community for over 30 years. We, alongside many other partners in the state, know that safe, affordable, and permanent housing is the only solution to homelessness. When our, um, when our state's residents have stable housing, their economic and health outcomes improve. During COVID-19, the need for permanent housing for all of Connecticut's residents have become even more important. Since 2012, the number of people utilizing Connecticut's shelter system has decreased by 57%. Investing in proven solutions to homelessness is necessary in continuing our progress and ensuring that every youth, family, and individual has a safe, stable place to call home. My role as a recovery support specialist with New Reach allows me to witness firsthand the advantages of granting the right of stable housing to those most in need. In addition to my work with New Reach, I can speak from my past experience as a homeless, drug addicted individual residing in the streets of New Haven. In my experience, a path to recovery was unforeseeable due to a lack of basic needs and shelter. The uncertainty of whether I would be safe, warm, or healthy in the night to come would trump any thought of hope or security. My time spent homeless consisted of countless hospital visits and health scares. Um, it was not until I was stably housed I could finally heal, um, only with my fundamental fundamental needs met, was it possible to capture and experience the therapeutic value of services and a uh, conceivable path to recovery. Stable housing alleviates the pressures and dangers that come with the uh, homelessness and allow us to focus and thrive in recovery. At this point, our community needs and is deserving of DEMAS funded programs and services that are proven to be effective for not only me, but also the clients I get to work with daily. Um, I wanna emphasize to the committee that we are living proof that these programs do save lives. Um, some tell me they don't know if they would still be here today if it wasn't for being connected with housing and services they have. Uh, I can relate to that and I think that alone speaks volumes to the significance of the funding for DEMAS. Uh, thank you to the committee for hearing my testimony today and for your unceasing efforts to make the important decisions that are saving lives in our community. Thank you and you did a great job. Thank you for your thank testimony. You. <laughs> wasn't that bad, was it? <laughs> no, not too bad. Okay. <laughs> Just have anxiety. <laughs> Don't worry. All right. Um, Margaret Middleton. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Representative Walker and Senator Austin, members of the committee. Um, really thank you because this is quite a long, uh, quite a long day for you. My name is Margaret Middleton. I'm the chief executive officer at Columbus House in uh, New Haven. We help lo very low income people achieve safe and affordable housing. Uh, in New London, Hartford, Middlesex, and New Haven counties. I'm here today um, to ask you to support both the Reaching Home campaign's requests regarding the DEMAS budget and the Alliance for Nonprofits request for additional funding for our entire sector, which you could hear today is in a great amount of distress. Um, and I wanna request that you consider proposed Senate Bill 340 as an essential add-on to the request from the Alliance for Nonprofits 
because it speaks to the structure of the contracts uh, that our housing providers, including Columbus House, uh, rely on. And it would make those contracts reflect the value that we provide our community as opposed to just being based on the historic amount of the contracts that we get. Um, you've heard a lot today about, you know, incredibly important work that people are doing and how underpaid staff is, um, and all of that is important. I'm going to leave that to my colleague, Angela Bucciarelli, who will speak to you later. She's a second shift um, residential supervisor in our organization. Instead, I want to talk to you about two other ways that funding emergency housing makes important investments in our community. First, um, COVID has really highlighted the extent to which Emergency service, emergency housing providers, and including Columbus House, are a very essential part of public health. I'm not sure I appreciated this before COVID as much as I do now. Um, we have moved clients to hotels. We have moved thousands of clients across our sector into permanent supportive housing and COVID safe housing. We have managed and prevented outbreaks of COVID. We have coordinated thousands of COVID tests and are now coordinating thousands of COVID vaccinations. We are a very essential part of this community's health. The other way in which investing in emergency housing supports our communities is one of racial justice. Of those essential frontline workers at Columbus House who identify their race to our organization, 90% identify as Black. Investing in uh, emergency services means helping elevate the work of frontline essential workers like those at Columbus House from minimum wage to more of a living wage, which they deserve for the incredibly um, difficult and important work that they do every day. Uh, I know that this committee and the state is not interested in perpetrating and prolonging patterns of racial injustice that undervalue the work of people of color. At Columbus House, we're extremely committed to um, ending those patterns as well. And with your support and the support of this committee with additional funding to DEMAS, we can achieve that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And thank you for your, your, um, your testimony. And we'll have to get together since I'm next door to you all the time. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you. Um, next, we have Rebecca Simonson. Rebecca yep, Simon, I'm here. Number, number 94. Great. Uh, good, e good afternoon, uh, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, um, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Rebecca Simonson. I'm a vice president at 1199 New England, um, the state's largest healthcare workers union. Um, we represent in the public sector approximately 7,000 um, healthcare workers working directly for state agencies, um, like in DDS, DEMAS, and DPH. And like most public sector unions, 1199 state members are uh, disproportionately women um, and workers of color, um, like the communities that we serve. Um, I have an extended uh, written testimony that's been submitted, but I'm just going to give some of the highlights here. Um, this, this moment that we're in, this perilous moment um, has produced, not like folks have said um, throughout the day, has produced not just one of the biggest public health crises uh, the state, the, the country, the world has ever seen, but also one of the biggest mental health crises uh, the country has ever seen. And um, we must reject the very premise on which the governor has based his budget, which is to shrink the state healthcare workforce um, and critical mental health and public health services at a time when overdoses and suicides are skyrocketing, when unemployment, housing insecurity, job loss, and social isolation have pushed our communities to the brink. And we cannot just talk about restoring cuts. The members of District 1199 are united in calling for the expansion of the life-saving public health and mental health services that our communities desperately need. Um, and these are proposals that have been developed in collaboration with several of the leading uh, community and advocacy organizations, including the ACLU, Bridgeport Generation Now, NAMI, Hampton Action Now, the Alliance of Retired Americans, the National um, Association of Social Workers, and other really incredible faith, service, and community organizations. I'm going to highlight just a couple of the proposals that we have. So uh, number one, 
we should appropriate an additional six, six million to expand the Demas run mobile crisis services. So anyone across the state experiencing a mental health emergency can receive mobile crisis services 24 seven, 365. We have seen the need for mobile crisis services skyrocket during the pandemic. Um, at Capital Region in Hartford, crisis calls have tripled since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, at Southwest Connecticut Mental Health System in Bridgeport and Stanford, calls have increased by over 400%. We are calling for an additional 6.3 million to restore and expand Demas addiction services to address uh, Connecticut's mental health crisis and the growing waiting list. Um, budget cuts have had con consequences in, in addiction services. From 2016 to 19, Demas program served about 9% fewer patients in inpatient detox and about 12% fewer in residential rehab. Demas op operated rehabilitation facilities like CBH and Blue Hills are critical to serving some of the state's most vulnerable patients. Uh, but they are turning people away, seeking treatment due to lack of staffing and capacity. In late January 20 uh, of this year, there are 118 people on the waiting list for services. Finally, we have over a thousand healthcare worker vacancies across the largest healthcare agencies in the state. We must fully fund essential services in DDS, DMIS, and DPH, and hire to fill the over a thousand state healthcare worker vacancies to address the critical staffing shortage affecting our patients and our services. We all know we're living through um, this unprecedented moment in history when multiple crises are coming together and producing enormous suffering for millions of people, uh, millions of working people, including in our state. Um, and we cannot, we simply cannot allow for a budget that shrinks state healthcare services when people need more. We cannot allow this to happen in the wealthiest state in the nation. Access can, I get, can I get you to sum up, please? Thank yep. you. I'll just say access to mental health services shouldn't be a lottery. And if we're to emerge from this emergency, we must um, finally address and eliminate the extreme inequalities that these funding co cuts have produced. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Um, let's see. Uh, you want me to get this now, Tony? Please. Monique Anderson. Thank you. Okay, Monique, you're up. Not present, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Mary Etter? I'm here. Very good. Thank you. Senator Aston, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Mary Etter, and I'm the Executive Director at Bristol Adult Resource Center, also known as BARC. We support 150 people with developmental disabilities in day programs and 38 people in residential programs. We employ nearly 200 staff and we serve the greater Bristol area. I also serve as a board member at March Inc. of Manchester, which supports individuals in Manchester, Vernon, Columbia, Windsor, and Willimantic. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on HB 6439. While much of the state closed down last March, BARC staff was not able to stay home and stay safe. Our residential programs remained operational the entire time. Staff continued working, at times putting themselves and their families at risk of catching COVID-19. The measures we took then and continue to provide for our staff and individuals cost money. Our workforce is ethnically and racially diverse, which also puts them at greater risk. Last spring, I was shocked and moved to hear stories of our staff who were pulled over on their way to work and questioned as to why they were out during our state's lockdown. I was asked to provide a letter for them to show that they were in fact essential employees. Employee. Getting individuals to their jobs was just one of the many obstacles we faced while serving our individuals. The challenges to keep everyone safe and healthy during the pandemic proved to be a difficult and expensive task. We had four Bark residents who contracted COVID-19 last spring, one of whom succumbed to the virus. We have had only four additional cases in our residential programs through fall and winter. 
We thought it could have been much worse given their vulnerability, and we think that the many precautions and protocols we had in place were the reason we didn't experience more illness. We do not receive full funding for our homes if there is a vacancy, and our staffing levels do not decrease with the vacancy. The pandemic has created challenges to safely fill our vacancies by not allowing us to observe potential housemates or for families to visit homes and meet staff. This of course makes it even more difficult for families and it greatly affects our bottom line. One empty bed can cost our agency between $80,000 and $130,000 per year. There isn't enough money to pay our employees what they truly deserve. We are finding it increasingly difficult to staff our programs because companies like Walmart and Costco have increased their pay. Thank you so much for your support of the nonprofit sector and the very important work we do. We need your help to ensure that programs like ours will continue to exist for Connecticut's adults with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Thank you very much for this opportunity today. Thank you, Mary. We really appreciate your testimony. Uh, thank you very much for what you said. Up next is Jasmine Perezzi. Jasmine, please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished members of the committee. It is a pleasure to come before you all. My name is Jasmine Prezi, and I'm a Norwalk resident, a graduate of the Norwalk Public Schools and a former mentee in the Norwalk Mentoring Program. In September, 2020, I became the director of the Norwalk Mentoring Program, the program that I was a participant in for over 10 years. The Norwalk Mentoring Program is the first school-based mentoring program in the country. And for the past 35 years, we have been matching students with adult volunteer mentors. Mentors meet with their students once a week for an hour one hour that changes both the lives of the mentors and the mentees. We partner with the Norwalk Public Schools to match mentors with students who are chronically absent and exhibit problematic behaviors. 94% of our mentees feel more optimistic about their future. 99% of our mentees parents say that their child seems much happier. 94 of our mentors 94% of our mentors try harder in school and 93% of our mentors make better decisions. Due to COVID-19, we transitioned our program from on-site to virtual. We currently have 315 mentors and mentees that are meeting virtually each week. We are recruiting mentors monthly and just this year alone in 2021, we have already recruited close to 40 mentors. It was extremely essential for us to address the needs of our students in the community. We know that our youth become, became isolated, which led to depression and emotional dysregulation. Our youth needed mentoring more than ever, and we provided them with a stable, caring adult to have fun with on Zoom while they were being home. I am an example of what, what a mentor of youth can do for our community if you choose to invest in them. While I was in school, I had a mentor from first grade all the way up to high school, and I still have a great relationship with my mentor to this day. I remember all of the lessons and the life skills my mentor instilled in me and how special I felt when my mentor continued to show up for me throughout every transition of my life, from elementary school to middle school to high school, and now a three-time college graduate working in the social services field. One of our sixth grade mentees expressed that my mentor makes me feel like I can make it. The Norwalk Mentoring Program is truly making a difference in the youth of Norwalk, and I believe that our model of mentoring should be replicated throughout the state of Connecticut. I encourage you to, to fund and maximize mentoring programs like the Gover Governor's Prevention Partnership and the Norwalk Mentoring Program, because we are truly doing the work and truly planting prosperous seeds in the lives of our young people that will grow up to reach their full potential and become our next community leaders. Thank you for the community for the opportunity to speak and I look forward to your support and to advocate for more mentoring programs. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Jasmine. Appreciate your testimony. We look forward to working with you. Next up is Carrie Fenton, number 96, followed by number 99, Menon Walker. Hi, thank you uh, for hearing my testimony today. Uh, my name is Carrie Fenton. I am the Director of Finance at the Chrysalis Center in Hartford, and I am a resident of Portland. 
I respectfully request that the committee support the expansion from the governor's budget for the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. As the Director of Finance at Chrysalis, I can testify that the series of funding cuts we have received over the past few years have negatively impacted our ability to serve the state's most vulnerable population of homeless individuals. In addition to the program funding cuts, we have received only one 1% 1 COLA in the last five years, and as a result, cannot offer competitive wages to our staff. This has resulted in turnover as case managers come to us for training and then move on to take state positions, which further impedes our ability to assist our clients. Please consider that further cuts to DEMAS funding after an unprecedented pand pandemic will undermine and disrupt any progress in reducing homelessness and providing quality services to mental health and addiction recovery. Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to present today. Thank you very much, Carrie. We appreciate you coming in um, and listening and we uh, will be working with you in the future. Next up is number 99. Men and Walker. Hello, my name is Men and Walker. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm an 18 year old freshman at Capital Community College in Hartford. I am here to support the Governor's Prevention Partnership and other prevention organizations on the front lines supporting young people through this pandemic. I am a proud advocate for the LGBTQ plus rights, a member of the U the Partnerships Youth Advisory Board, and a youth peer advocate for the Windsor Locks Wellness Coalition, where I've been a member since my sophomore year of high school. Our coalition focuses on spreading awareness about the dangers of substance abuse and underage drinking to our classmates. We follow a peer-to-peer -peer prevention model, which means we focus on making connections with other young people by having open and honest conversations that can be difficult to have with some adults. The Partnerships Youth Advisory Board empowers youth to be advocates for ourselves and our peers by helping Amen, and we've seemed to have lost you. I'm not certain where you are right now, but you, you have no voice anymore. We can't hear you. Youth voices on the LGBTQ plus issues and how adults who want to be good allies must listen, learn, and act on the concerns of the LGBTQ plus youth. The partnership created a safe, judgment-free environment for us to talk about our needs and lived experiences. We also talked about the value of inclusive mentoring opportunities and new initiatives at the partnerships to support inclusive mentoring around the state. Like thousands of young people across Connecticut, isolation has been one of the hardest things for me to cope with during this pandemic. This panel meant a lot to me and other peer advocates who thrive on community because it reminded me that we are not alone and that our work must continue in this new and changing world. That is why I'm here today advocating for as much money as possible for prevention during these uncertain times. The Governor's Prevent Prevention Partnership provides essential resources to developing leaders throughout the state. They understand that connection is what keeps prevention and hope for a better future alive. I hope you will revisit, reinvest into my peers and me by supporting the partnership in this life-changing work. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, is number 100 in? Eddie. Uh, yes, she is in the panel. Uh, Miss Healy is. Well, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, Miss Healy is in the panel. Yes. Miss Healy, if you I can't. can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Hello, Senator Austin and Representative Walker and the members of the Appreciations Committee. My name is Karen Healy. I live and I vote in Hartford, and I'm here to share my personal testimony regarding the governor's budget. I would like to say thank you to the governor and the legislators for maintaining the budget this year and hope that increased supports and services considering the budget surplus. If I did not have the services through DEMIS, I might still be sitting in an inpatient CVH, not in my own apartment in the community. I was institutionalized between Poughkeepsie, New York and Hartford, Connecticut. I spent most of my time in state house, which is self-injurious behavior 
from 1989 until December of 2014. I was put in psychiatric hospital on and off since about the age of 16 up into December 4th of 2014. State funded services are important to me because I am able to live in the community setting successfully since December of 2014, which I believe is less expensive than it would be for an inpatient at a psychiatric hospital. My current level of support from Goodwill Incorporated and residential support program allows me to live in the community, which is less costly than the state psychiatric hospital bed. I'm able to live in the community and contribute to my day-to-day -day living expenses, which I could not do if I was a state psychiatric hospital. I want to continue to live in the community and not return to a state psychiatric hospital that would cause the state to pay more for my day-to-day -day needs. I am a successful person when I'm able to make my own contributions. Perhaps someday I would not require state financial help. I am working hard every day to make my dream come true. That is to be able to meet my day-to-day -day needs completely and independently. When I moved to the community with my current level of support, people doubted me. They felt I would always be a screw up and institutionalized. However, there was a number of staff who believed in me. It also through the efforts as well as my family that I was able to be discharged in CVH December 4th of 2014. During my final case conference at CVH, my mother was told at that time with my conservative person in the state, she was told never let me have my hip surgery because I was never believed I could not could handle my surgery. They, can, they expected me to be back at CVH in one to two weeks following my discharge on December 4th of 2014. I was discharged from CVH six years ago. I had my hip surgery and walked successfully without a walker. I also volunteered at my church. I have gone through many weeks of withdrawal from high doses of narcotics was given to me while at CVH. People should not be judged because they have a long-term psychiatric illness or addictions or physical limitations. Everyone deserves a chance to be treated well and have a normal life as possible. I'm at, I also am asking the legislator $6 million for the first year and $5 million to subsequent years for starting and continuing the operation of five care respites. I ask that five respites be located per Demas region and be sat, staffed for persons with lived, lived experience in the mental health field and certified in additional peer support. Thank you for listening to my testimony today. person. Thank you very much. Um, now we're up to, uh, we really appreciate your testimony. Now we're up to Wynn Thank Everts. You. Thank you. Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and other esteemed committee members, my name is Wynn Everts. I live in Norwalk with my family, and I'm the executive director of the ARC of Connecticut. I'm here today to speak on House Bill 6439, an act concerning the state budget for the biennium ending June 30th, 2023, and making appropriations therefore. I've submitted written testimony, which you have, so I'm gonna cut straight to the heart of the matter. And that is to discuss the major item that Governor Lamont's budget does not address, which is the impact that COVID-19 and an increasing state minimum wage will have on the essential workers that support individuals with ID D in the community, at work, and in their homes. This work is hard. It's harder than many other jobs at similar wages. The current pay of a minimum of $14.75 an hour frequently necessitates working multiple shifts, possibly for multiple employers, in a day. As the minimum wage increases to $13, then $14, then $15 an hour, those who are now essential will leave the human services field and the relationships that depend on them to pursue careers in other fields where the work is easier. This scenario further unfolds to an individual with IDD then possibly being supported by someone inexperienced or inappropriate, or by a parent who has to leave a job or it results in a qualified provider determining that it can't operate without appropriate staff, which will leave people with IDD without the necessary supports they need. This scenario can be avoided by doing a few things, namely by appropriating $461 million over five years, in order to lift the rates of human services providers to reflect the true costs of providing the supports embedded in an individual's plan. Secondly, you can index those rates to a premium to the state minimum wage 
thereby, thereby professionalizing the direct support workers that are essential. Thirdly, you can implement annual contingency payments for reaching certain service milestones, things like getting a job with competitive um, uh, wages. And fourth, you can do away with cost settlement and negotiate retained revenue every two years with qualified providers. Implementing practices like these that are aimed at basing the payment system on the needs and plans of the individuals being supported and paying human services employees a fair wage worthy of their work and incentivizing desired outcomes and innovation by qualified providers will enable individuals with IDD and those that, su that support them to thrive. I wanna thank you very much for your efforts to improve the lives of all the people that live in Connecticut and the opportunity to deliver this testimony. Thank you. Thank you, and um, thank you for your, your testimony. And uh, hmm, I see a hand that is up. Uh, uh, Representative Datham, you're just gonna ask for con contact information? No, I'm just going to thank Mr. Everts for all of his work for on behalf of the IDD community. He's been a wonderful asset in our community and wanted to thank him for his presentation today. That thank was it. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Dathan. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a, have a good day. Thank you. Um, let's see, 102. Joseph? 102 Joseph Agnestino. Hi guys. Hi. Hey guys. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Joey Agostino. I am from North Connecticut. I attend the Star a Star Day program. And um it's really important to me. And um uh it's really important to me because I have a lot of friends to start, and um, I, I've been doing lots of classes in Zoom with StarCast, the, 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 the college, every Monday through, every Monday through Fridays. I'm doing classes like martial arts, cooking classes, uh, honor classes, we we all can uh, learn to do some uh, life skills in, in the community services. And, and Star is is supporting me and following my dream. Became uh, became professional DJ, and um, you know um, is is and, and to support Star. Thank you. And, and thank you. I'm Lori Agostino. I'm Joey's mom, and I wanted to say thank you to the committee and thank you to Lucy Datham, our representative here in Norwalk, and a special thanks to Star um, for all they have done for and continue to do for Joey and the entire Agostino family, especially this past year. Joey has been homebound for the entire year due to COVID risks. Star is giving him purpose with five day, um, five daily Zoom classes, five days a week, and up to four classes a day, which keeps him connected and healthy and so. Social, um, and it just makes him happy. Star has been there with for the Agostino family from birth to three uh, with uh, helping find Joey a job and day services, as well as uh, you know, SIB support shops and, um, and family, um, you know, all kinds of family support activities. Uh, we ask on behalf of the Agostino family, we ask that you please support funding for Star. Thank you for having us today. Thank you so much, and thank you for 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 testifying, Joey. And I I understand that you're doing a dance party during the pandemic. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's correct. Yes. Dance party, right? I I I visual dance parties every Saturday sometimes, and and I know um doing Star Day program, uh, they they just they just honor me. I, award for uh, oh. Set to Love of Visual Death Parties. That's right, Joey received an award um, for community service, so that was really exciting. Thank you for- Congratulations. <laughs> you see everybody, everybody's clapping for you, Joey. Okay, thank see that? You, uh, thank you for doing that. Thank you for, uh, thank you for clapping for me. Thank you so much. You're welcome, have a good day, and thank you for coming to testify. Have a good day. You, you too, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Melanie Myers. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go right ahead. This Great. is I just want everybody to know this is the halfway point for us. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Good to know, isn't it? Okay, go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Melanie Myers. I'm a clinical case manager at Gilead Community Services in Middletown. I provide in-home rehab care to individuals with serious mental health illness under the Mental Health Waiver Program WISE. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on HB 6439 uh, for the state budget for the biennium ending June 13th, 2023. I'm here to request the legislature appropriate 461 million over five years for community nonprofits. Since 2007, community nonprofits have lost at least 461 million in state funding. Please commit to increasing funding by the full 461 million, appropriate 128 million in new funding for community nonprofits, index increases to inflation. And lastly, hold nonprofits financially harmless from the impact of COVID-19. The need for mental health and substance abuse treatment has grown significantly throughout the pandemic and is expected to continue. Agencies like Gilead have stepped into this need and met the challenges head on. My clients in the WISE program have struggled through the isolation of the pandemic, worsening their mental health and largely decreasing opportunities for support in their community. They are unable to receive visits from family, participate in community programs due to restrictions and are isolated even more than before. Their prolonged mental health and physical disabilities prevent them from engaging in daily activities and leaving their homes, especially during a pandemic. Furthermore, our program lost staff due to the pandemic, severing relationships that clients built with those that provide them the care that they need. The COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated the impact of inadequate funding for nonprofit services. Due to budget cuts and chronic underfunding, I've seen decreased programming, decreased staffing levels, and reduced client capacity. There's also been a lack of salary increases to our essential employees providing to isolated and vulnerable individuals during this pandemic. Many of my clients can't leave their home without staff support. They need clothes, food, and water, but require staff support for these necessities. Underfunding means less mileage allotted to staff to transport clients for necessities, a lack of staff to provide for basic needs, like assistance cleaning homes, meal prep, or navigating their medical issues. And lastly, those in need of our services are going unnoticed and not receiving help due to client capacity and lack of intake. Our clients deserve to survive through this pandemic. And while staff is working hard to provide, we need the support of funding to continue. Please commit to fund the full 461 million, appropriate 128 million in new funding for community nonprofits, index future increases to inflation. And lastly, please hold nonprofits financially harmless from the impacts of COVID-19. Thank you distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for your advocacy and staying around. Thank you, have a good day. Next we have uh, Mike Morgan, uh, number 105, um, 104, sorry. And Hi, after my name is Mike Morgan and I'm a manager at Marrakesh. I manage the Taking Initiative Center, which is a drop-in center for people with substance use disorders that are disconnected from treatment. Most of them also have co-occurring mental health disorders that they are, aren't getting treatment for and are homeless uh, outside of the shelter system. Um, so we do a lot of harm reduction as well as just basic needs and trying to uh, show people some dig dignity and supports and be a, a hub where their case managers can find them. Uh, and doing so, we save the taxpayers a lot of money by uh, reduced hospital visits and reduced arrests. We also do recovery. People get into recovery. They get connected to services for mental health, for substance abuse. Uh, they go on to get their apartments, uh, get married, have kids, reconnect with their family. I had one guardian who had thanked us once. Uh, he said we gave him his son back. 
And I think that that's one of the most important outcomes of the work, never mind all the things I put in Demas, all the other outcome measures. Uh, and I heard someone earlier today said that uh, they please fund her program because that's where she goes to laugh. <laughs> and, and that's what that touched me. However, I am old, old. I've been in human services a long time. Uh, and I can remember the promise of Governor Weicker when he wanted to, a state income tax saying this would bring parity between the state employees and social services and the nonprofit employees and social services. And that was a long time ago and a lot of governors ago and a lot of promises ago. And I've stuck with it. I've kept my part, but it's gotten worse. And now I'm looking at retirement. I just had a quadruple bypass, heart bypass. I should be slowing down. And I'm thinking I have to get another part-time job. I already have a part-time job outside of this to make ends meet. I have to get another part-time job because soon I won't be able to work. And I've got to be able to put money away. Besides the low wages, there's no pension. And for a lot of nonprofits, as you know. Mm -hmm. We've been sticking it in. We've been doing our part. And then we see how it impacts on the clients. And that might be the part that hurts the most. You know, $200 food budget for the week buys a whole lot less in 2021 than, in, than it did in 2007. And we're begging the community and the community is stepping forward. Churches are uh, the local stop and shop, Starbucks, others with giving us donations and things of food. Uh, but now instead of spending time with consumers on helping them move forward and things like that, I'm spending time uh, hat in hand. And I think even the community is starting to have this kind of burnout of. So we really do need your help. I really do implore you to um, help the legislator appropriate the 461 million over the five years community nonprofits, uh, commit to increasing the funding uh, and 28% for the fiscal year 2026, appropriate the 128 million uh, that's been asked for by the nonprofits for fiscal year 2022. Uh, index increases to inflation to ensure that state funding will keep pace with the increased cost. Please hold nonprofits financially harm, harmless from the impact of COVID-19. I'm very proud of our agency. We have stayed open uh, throughout the whole. We didn't uh, cut back hours or anything. Uh, even when a lot of the other state and city uh, programs uh, closed, especially in March last year, we remained open. Um, and I just really want to thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And thank you for your dedication. And I'm, I'm amazed. You look great for someone who had a little, a little surgery there. <laughs> You're good. So thank you for, for all you do and your compassion. My pleasure. Thanks. Have a good day. Uh, next, we have Sandra. 105, Sandra Viberio. She's joining right now, Madam Chair. Thank you. And after that, uh, 106, Michael Van Bladern. Blandern. I mess. I, I butchered that. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, distinguished Madam Chair and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Sandra Ribeiro, and I'm speaking on behalf of the American Lung Association. I am a public health professional and dedicate much of my personal time to organizations working to help people breathe such an essential action to life, which many of us take for granted. There is nothing that more negatively affects one's health than smoking. I see the negative health effects of smoking each day. That is why I strongly encourage the committee to commit to investing in tobacco cessation and prevention programming in the state of Connecticut for fiscal year 22, fiscal year 23, and beyond. Even in 2021, far too many Connecticut residents remain addicted to tobacco, a deadly product that not only cuts lives short, but causes diseases like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, the third leading cause of death in America. 
As someone who sees what COPD patients deal with on a regular basis, I can tell you that this disease that cruelly robs its victims of their quality of life by making it so difficult to breathe that performing even normal daily activities becomes a problem. At this time, there is no cure for COPD, but that doesn't mean we don't have the power to prevent its onset. Between 80 and 90% of all COPD cases are caused by smoking. Connecticut can and must do more to help smokers quit and to prevent a new generation from getting hooked on nicotine through cigarettes and other emerging unregulated tobacco products. Imagine what the future would be like with significant fewer people suffering and dying from lung diseases and other tobacco caused diseases. How many more mothers and fathers will there be to see their children grow up, graduate from college, get married, start families of their own, and be part of their grandchildren's lives. I know you have many difficult budgetary decisions to make, but I ask you to please consider funding tobacco prevention and cessation programs, despite Governor Lamont's proposed budget. These programs can have a tremendous impact. To most of all of us, it's simply priceless. We need Connecticut to make a long-term commitment and investment to reduce healthcare costs and to save lives by funding tobacco control programs. At a time when COVID-19 has only highlighted the need to help people quit tobacco and prevent others from starting, we know that this investment could make a real impact for our state and its residents. Too many people think that the battle against tobacco is a thing of the past, but I see evidence to the contrary every day. If the governor's proposed budget were to go into effect, Connecticut would be fighting the millions that the tobacco industry spends in the state each year with nothing. In that fight, everyone loses. I thank you for your time and consideration of my request. Thank you for your work on behalf of Connecticut residents. I'm, I'm on mute, sorry. <laughs> thank you very much for your testimony um, today and staying in here and, and advocating for your clients and. Um, and we, we still struggle with um, how we handle the tobacco funding. Thank you again. So with that, um, next we have uh, Michael. And after Michael, one, uh, 107 is Bianca Arias. Is Bianca here? She is. Oh, good. Okay, great. And then Sue Starkley, is, is, he, is she here? Uh, not currently, no. Okay, so we're, we're good with Michael and Bianca. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Representative Walker, my Senator, Senator Austin, uh, members of the committee. My name is Mike Van Vlanderen. I am a resident of Norwich uh, here in Southeastern Connecticut. And I have worked at Reliance Health in Nor with our primary uh, site in Norwich for the past 30 years. Uh, I currently serve as the Chief Operating Officer our primary funding is Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and Department of Disability Services. We have 250 staff and we serve about 1,500 members a year. Um, I'm here to speak about HB 6439, as it seems the majority of the folks today are, uh, specifically in support of um, the work the Alliance has done in outlining an ask of $461 million to um, right size what's been done to nonprofits uh, across the state for the past 13 plus years. Um, in, I've submitted my written testimony, which you have, and I hope you get a chance to look at. Uh, in the more I read it, the more depressed I get because it simply outlines what we've heard today, um, which is the shortfall that we all deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and have been for over a decade. Um, instead, I like to focus on the gratitude I feel towards uh, the creativity and the compassion um, and the fearlessness of the nonprofit providers uh, in the wake of all that's happened uh, over the past decade. Um, for everybody that's on the call now, for staff at Reliance Health, um, I wanna say to our staff and to your staff, uh, thank you for coming in when you're tired from working a second job. Thank you for coming in when you need to get a ride to work because your car has broke down and you can't afford to fix it. 
thank you for doing the work, even though you have to put your groceries on your credit card. Thank you for doing the work, even though you have to rent in a, an economy that it's hard to rent, where your real dream is to buy a home. And thank you for coming in every day, knowing that the pay is the same it was last year and the year before and the year before that. So I'm grateful to all of you. Please pass that on to your staff and thank you. Um, and I know Dan Osborne said this earlier and our own uh, CEO said it, Carrie Dyer, that I know we're preaching to the choir that this is a very supportive group. So hopefully this year you can win the day. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I really appreciate you thanking the people that work in the nonprofits. At, they're unsung heroes and we so appreciate all of them for what they do and how they keep our society together. I mean, with a, with a, a band-aid and a shoestring. And I believe this year is the year that we should be making those changes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next, Bianca. To the members of the committee, hello, my name is Bianca Arias. I am 18 years old and a current senior at the Morgan School in Clinton. Although this is my first time testifying, I feel like I'm pretty well versed in the world of prevention. I recently received the 2020 Connecticut Youth Service Association's Youth Leadership Award for my prevention efforts at the local, statewide, and national levels. As the president of our local substance use prevention group, I often lead campaigns to educate others. That's why I'm here today to ask you to continue funding prevention organizations and agencies at the maximum amount possible. The support of prevention is very important to our communities and is what got many of us through these tough times. I've attended both youth to youth and CAG national conferences so I can bring my prevention knowledge back into my community. Prevention works. Underage marijuana use in Clinton specifically has decreased almost 20% since the introduction of a prevention coordinator in the town, which does not sound like a coincidence to me. My volunteer work has recently led to a paid peer assistant position under Clinton's prevention coordinator, Kelly Edwards. This opened an opportunity to analyze data and present to Clinton's town council and town manager about the recent student survey about drug and alcohol use trends in the high school students. One of the most influential experiences for me has been working alongside other motivated youth as a member of the Youth Advisory Board from the Governor's Prevention Partnership. I continue to keep in touch with many of my peers from other towns in hopes to work alongside their coalitions so we can bring our prevention experience to a statewide level. These connections and varying perspectives drive this work. I ask that you consider continued funding of the Governor's Prevention Partnership the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and our prevention councils. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Oops, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, Sue Starkley. She is not present, Madam Chair. Uh, she's not, okay, just one second. Okay, then um, Catherine Dupree. I'm gonna have to call up. Oops. Catherine Dupree. She is in the panel. Okay. Should we go on to the next one and if she is able to get on? Can you hear me? Ah, there we go. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chairs and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Catherine Dupree and I'm the Executive Director of Ben Haven, which is a nonprofit organization that serves individuals on the autism spectrum disorder in the greater New Haven area. We serve approximately 250 individuals. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you on House Bill 6439 concerning the appropriation for the Department of Developmental Services. 
I, like many others who have come before you, support the proposal of the Alliance, which represents hundreds of nonprofits like Ben Haven, to increase the funding for the work all of us accomplish on behalf of individuals with disabilities. The Alliance has proposed a $461 million increase in appropriations for nonprofits to be phased in in the next five years. Nonprofits have not seen any across the board COLA or rate increase in several years, which impacts our work negatively. I do wanna thank all of you though, for the funding allocation two years ago that increased wages for our direct support professionals to 1475 an hour. Individuals and families depend on these staff for the care, safety, supervision, and growth of the individuals they care for. And the work of our staff is essential to the quality of lives of these individuals. In supporting my request, I wanna summarize the following points from my written testimony. The quality of our services depends on the commitment and competence of our staff. They have always been remarkable, but their dedication was never more apparent than during this last year of COVID. We in residential services had no outbreak in our homes until November. And even then we were able to keep everyone home and most staff working. No one was ever hospitalized. We have a sizable individual and family support program. Families with adult children at home depended on these staff during COVID when day programs were closed. We also serve individuals who live on their own. They could no longer use their typical community services or activities. Our staff supported them to maintain their own homes and feel connected during this awful pandemic. We can only keep and attract good staff if we can pay them a living wage and one that recognizes their work is more complex than that of minimum wage jobs. We need this funding increase to occur regularly to support our workforce. And we also need this funding to keep pace with increased costs, upgrade our technology and maintain our facilities. I wanna close by also strongly urging you to keep the funding for the DVS Behavioral Services Program whole. It's an essential service to families who keep their children at home even and despite the behavioral difficulties they present. The need is great and it is not diminished as some adolescents age out of this program because other families continue to have this need. I thank you for your advocacy and support always for DDS and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you for your testimony today. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Uh, Sandy Rice. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sandy Rice, and I'm here to speak to HB 6439. For 15 years of staff of Horizons, those dedicated and committed team members who serve people with developmentally dis disabilities have not had an increase. Please let that sink in for a moment. Imagine a spouse or a partner or an adult child of yours sits across a dinner table to tell you once again, as it has been since 2007, funding levels have not increased. Imagine their heartbreak as they contemplate leaving the people they serve, leaving the career that they have chosen, forfeiting their education and training because they simply can no longer pay their bills. Serving people with de developmental disabilities for 40 years, Horizons has developed processes and creative techniques to provide for the essential needs of this often overlooked segment of the Connecticut population. In this 40 year period, Horizons is recognized on the state and the national level for our exceptional practices and the ability to develop and scale our practices to serve more of this de deserving community. The benefits to those we serve, their families, the communities, and to the state of Connecticut are immeasurable. As treasurer for Horizons since 2009, I have the unique vantage point to monitor and respond to the dire circumstances we face. The impact of the absence of an increase leaves us hamstrung to provide a living wage to those on the front line who day in and day out, minute by minute, serve our people's ever-changing needs. The core of any firm is the ongoing retention of their employees. Our team members are extremely dedicated to their charges and each day increase their skills, techniques, and approach and experience. At the end of the day, they return home to a reality where their rent, food, insurance, and other simple household budget items continue to rise. The economic reality they face and live with becomes overwhelming 
sometimes forcing them to leave the people and the career they love. The leadership team at Horizons has worked diligently to manage and reduce our overhead and administrative costs, successfully reducing to just 12% of our overall operating costs. Horizons has long viewed our staff as essential workers. Their responsibilities and efforts have only significantly increased during the COVID pandemic. Now, at the intersection of a reasonable budget, matching federal assistance, and the beginning of an economic recovery, Connecticut is uniquely positioned to finally provide a necessary and tangible relief. Please enthusiastically vote to appropriate the $461 million over the next five years and demonstrate Connecticut's commitment to these essential employees. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandy, for, for your testimony. Thank you very much. And thank you for your advocacy. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Jill Holmes-Brown. Good afternoon, Representative Walker, Senator Austin, um, distinguished members of the committee. My name is Jill Holmes Brown. I represent as the government liaison for the Connecticut Association of School Based Health Centers. And I am also the chief operating officer of a nonprofit, Integrated Health Services, and we operate school based health centers as well. I'm here to thank you for the uh, level of funding that uh, school based health centers is receiving, but also to ask for an increase as well. There are many districts and schools that don't have any school based services. And although mental health services and some services are great, I think we're really going to see a need for comprehensive services, medical and mental health and dental in a lot of cases, but we are really gonna see the need. And rather than read my testimony, which I submitted, I wanna just read you a couple of things that uh, kids wrote. Um, and behind me, I think you can see it says, we love our school-based health center. I think it's backwards, but in those frogs are some of the things that kids say, and we ask them to write them. Um, I love the health center because it's a safe space. Uh, the staff is helpful. They make me feel better. I trust the staff. They're kind and helpful. They make me smile. Someone is always there for me. I, um, 11th grade young lady um, wrote, I have been coming to the school-based health center since I was a freshman and I currently receive counseling once a week. It is super helpful in talking to us because I feel like I can talk about my family problems or other issues that I'm facing. And she gives me good advice. Seeing her has helped things at home with my relationships with my parents and my family. It has helped improve my grades and makes me wanna to come to school. She's taught me a lot about the feelings we have behind our emotions and how to cope with certain things that bother us. I think school-based health centers play a very important role in schools, and I am very happy that we have one here at Connecticut River Academy. Sincerely, Talia Vargas, Senior Class 2021. And I think she hits upon something that I think we're gonna have to think about as well as retention in schools. It is proven that schools with school-based health centers, students tend to attend more often if they're not feeling well. It keeps kids in school and it keeps parents at work. So I thank you so much for your time. And I know I'm preaching to the choir that most of you are staunch advocates of this, but uh, I, again, I thank you for the repetitiveness of it. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you for your testimony. And you're absolutely right. Everybody here loves school-based health clinics. Every year we have another request for another school-based health clinic because they work. So thank you so much. And thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, uh, Denise Kennedy. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Denise Kennedy, and I have been working at Miracash for 25 years, a private nonprofit agency that supports over a thousand people with disabilities and similar service needs with over 700 staff throughout Connecticut. I started my career with Miracash as a student at their Academy for Human Service training program. Like myself, the people who attend the training academy are black or brown and come from low income, underserved and oftentimes overlooked communities. After successfully completing the 16 week comprehensive training program, I began working part time as a program counselor and steadily was promoted during my 25 year tenure. Today, I am the chief compliance officer. And in my role as the chief compliance officer, I am responsible for advocating on behalf of the people we support and employees, and that is why I am here today. 
Marrakesh provides critical essential services to our most vulnerable population. We have worked safely through the pandemic and couldn't stop because we support people 24 seven. Marrakesh handled the onset of COVID best, protecting the health and safety of employees and people supported by being creative to set up living positions and task forces to ensure that there was as few human to human exposures possible. We kept everyone employed with no layoffs. Through the task forces, we set up support to support our programs. The task forces took PPE order deliveries, laundry services, groceries, you name it, our task force did it in order to keep uh, traffic in and up from going in of our programs. We are deemed critically essential, yet Marrakesh and all other human service providers um, are, did not receive a cost of living increase since 2007. And that's when the first iPhone and Segway was created. So think about how long ago that was. There was nothing paid for nonprofits to pay for our medical benefit cost increases, our retirement savings, our program upgrades, et cetera, for 14 years. I work at Marrakesh because I care about the people here, my coworkers and the people we support. I have worked here without any promises of a color increase. Most of us working at Marrakesh, 70% to be exact, including myself, identify as black or brown, which is similar as the other nonprofits in the state. The people we support, their caregivers, and our hard work on behalf of the most vulnerable people appear to be not valued in Connecticut, which is sad. We provide high quality services for a fraction of the cost of state-run services. This inequity should end. It is hard enough to recruit staff to work at our programs due to pay rates, cost and benefit coverage, responsibilities, the pandemic, et cetera. Without fixing the years with no increases, I don't know how we will begin, keep going in the future. We have seen our critically essential staff take jobs at higher salaries and non-critical roles. Community nonprofit provides essential services in every city and town in Connecticut, serving people in need and employing tens of thousands. They are what make Connecticut a great place to live and work. Recently, I discovered that the Department of Developmental Services is looking to hire 200 part-time employees in an effort to reduce their overtime. Our staff make $14.75 to perform the same duties as a DDS direct care employee, yet the starting rate for DDS direct care employees is $24. So not only are we faced with the possibility of our employees leaving to go work for the state where they will make more than they make at Marrakesh working just part-time, it will be more challenging to fill the vacant positions when those employees leave. I'm here to respectfully request that the legislator appropriate 461 million over five years for community nonprofits. Since 2007, community nonprofits has lost at least 461 million in state funding. Please commit to increasing the funding by the full 461 million or 20% by fiscal year 2026. And index increases to inflation to ensure that state funding will keep pace with- Thank you, costs Thank you, Denise. Are you all set? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming up. Um, up next is Susan Boschbaum. 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 Can you hear me okay? No, can you hear me? Yes? Yes, oh. ma'am, we can hear you. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Thank you. So my name is Susan Boschbaum. I'm a recovery support specialist, and I'm here today to talk about the uh, DEMAS budget, HB 6439. Um, thank you, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and all the esteemed members of the community. I'd also like to give a shout out to Rep. Gaffin uh, for representing the needs of those of us with needs in Southwest Connecticut. Thank you. Um, I'm here to talk about Demas from personal experience. And what I would like to say is that you know, everything seems to be Hart Hartford centric and actually region one, which is Southwestern Connecticut actually has 27% um, of the population in the state. And so here's the other thing. I, um, I'm so grateful for the uh, services that I received from Demos. And I'm talking about 
I, I received services in Stanford. My psychiatrist, my therapist, um, there is a recovery support specialist whom I work with. Those people are so great. But when it comes to administration in Demas, over the 30 years that I've been advocating, it's very depressing to me. And I think that there's a huge difference between line staff and what they offer and administrators. And it, it really feels like those of us with lived experience in the system are not listened to. Our needs are not listened to. And we're discriminated against by Demas. I recently had a situation where I went to the Du Bois Center, there's a metal detector and they were screening for doing COVID screening, okay? That COVID screening was a HIPAA violation because they had the sign-in book that had people's full names, date, time, and who you were seeing out on a table in a public space, okay? The other thing was that in, after the COVID screening, the woman would shout your temperature about 20 feet away to where the security guard was. And that very same day, I saw people waved by by the security guards that did not have to pass through the metal, de metal detector. And I have watched over the years at how clients get treated differently than staff members, and other people who work in the building. And it's not fair, it really isn't. So I'm, I'm, I'm torn. On the one hand, the line staff I work with are great. And so I say, yes, funding this, keep funding Susan, them. are you almost done with, hi I Susan. Yes, almost hi. done? Thank I you. Am almost done. On the other hand, I say, give it to the nonprofits, all of the funding, it's very, very frustrating to come here every day, every year and talk about these same things. And it's just such a shame. But anyway, I thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And please take what I've said to heart because it's been really difficult throughout the pandemic for many of us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Susan. We appreciate your story. Thank you. It's nice to hear. Um, up next is Stephen Schwartz. Yes, good afternoon, distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, I know it's been a very long day for you, so I'll keep it brief. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Steve Schwartz. I live in Woodbridge, and I'm representing the all-volunteer board of Marrakesh, where I've served for the past 17 years and am the current chair. Marrakesh provides day residential and other services to around 1,000 people with intellectual and other disabilities we have 715 employees who are dedicated to providing the best possible care to the individuals with disabilities. Uh, employees like Denise Kennedy, who you just heard from, and Mike Morgan, who you've heard from about 40 minutes ago, are my heroes. And I know I speak for the whole volunteer board when I say that I'm proud to be associated with such a caring group of people. Our funding comes from DDS, DEMAS, and other state agencies. However, despite the high quality service that our staff provide, our staff go year after year without a cost of living increase. Every year, our staff face an increased cost of living without an increase in their income to compensate. Every year, Marrakesh must pay vendors more money for health insurance, snow plowing, and other service. And that makes life very difficult for our staff, our consumers, and their families. So I am here to requestfully, respectfully request that the legislature appropriate $461 million over the next five years for community nonprofits. Thank you very much for listening and thank you for your advocacy. Hold on a minute, hold, hold on. Hi, how are you? Um, thank you very much, Stephen. Is number 115 on? He, uh, they're not, Madam Chair. How about number 116? Yes, Madam Chair, I'm here. 
Okay, Tabitha, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. You'll be followed by Matthew. Madam Chair and distinguished uh, members of the of the Appropriation Committee, thank you for hearing my testimony today on House Bill 6439. Uh, my name is Tabitha Brown and I work um, from in eight towns from Milford to Guilford, Connecticut. Uh, I am a resident of Northford, Connecticut. I support the proposed DEMAS budget, HB 6439. Um, budget, state budget. I wanted to share why I chose to testify. This is my first time testifying and I'm nervous, but I've had spent most of my whole career in the nonprofit world helping others. I've been at almost every level, level from direct support staff uh, to administration, whether it's working with individuals with the intellectual disabilities or working with the homeless. What I've learned in my almost 25 years of working for nonprofits, the everyday resources dwindle more and more. Families and individuals become homeless. They have to choose between feeding their children or paying their rent or buying medications that they desperately need or paying the light bill. Today, we're at a crossroads where you, your decisions can make a difference for everyone. Every day I see the consequences of past decisions, not enough funding for services such as housing, shelter services, mental health, case management services, wraparound services. These services are crucial in order for each individual to be able to have a productive life. I do wanna share a story about an individual that I came across recently. This individual is fairly young, 50 years old, but has not had an easy life. When he was younger, he had experienced a traumatic brain injury and survived, but not without consequences. He has never been married, has struggled with mental health and addiction issues. And just within the last year, this individual was hit by a motor vehicle, was in the hospital and then in rehab. He came on my radar when he was released from rehab and the apartment building he was living in had been sold and his home was just gone. He had no longer had a place to go. This gentleman had no family here in Connecticut and minimal natural supports. The rehab center did not follow through to ensure that the gentleman's discharge plan was viable. No one checked to ensure that his visiting nurse referral, that he had his visiting nurse referral or that he would have a home to go to. End result, we have home, a homeless man with multiple challenges, no home, no wraparound services, mental health issues, substance abuse <clears throat> disorder, Without the funding that is being requested, we will continue to set people to fail instead of succeed. Today, you can make a difference. You can change the course of someone else's life. You can be the reason that somebody succeeds instead of, instead of fails. Thank you for your time and the opportunity and the patience. Thank you very much, Tabitha. We appreciate you coming up and testifying. Up next is Matthew. Morgan, Hi. that's you. Hello. Hi, how are you? Go ahead, sir. Very good. Um, uh, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity today to speak. Um, my name is Matt Morgan. I'm a resident of Plainfield, Connecticut, and I have served for 10 years as the Executive Director of Journey Home, uh, which works in the Capital Region, uh, and we coordinate efforts to end homelessness, and we're the backbone support agency for the for the CAN or the Coordinated Access Network um, uh, that work on the issue of homelessness. And I'm speaking today on behalf of the 2000 people uh, roughly that experience homelessness each year um, in the capital region. Uh, and Journey Home is a little bit unique as well because we interact every day with uh, senior executive leadership, uh, middle management, and then frontline staff at our, all of our partner agencies that are providing emergency shelter, homeless outreach, housing services, all of those um, kinds of services that help um, address homelessness in, in the capital region. Um, and I'm speaking today in support of the proposed budget for the DEMAS uh, housing supports and services line item at 23.4 million. Um, and the important, the reason I'm in supportive of that is just because the investments in case management services have been working um, we have seen in the capital region a reduction in chronic homelessness by 80% since 2015, and that is made possible because of these investments in the services that are helping people who were experiencing homelessness um, to remain in, uh, in supportive housing. Um, also, since 2012, we've seen the overall number of people across Connecticut, the, um, the utilization of the shelter system be reduced by 57%. 
Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to say that specifically in the capital region with the um, youth homelessness demonstration project, we've been able to reduce the amount of time that youth experience homelessness by almost half from 182 days to 97 days on average um, for youth and young adults who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and we're also requesting a targeted new investment of 2.25 million for NEMIS uh, Housing Supports and Services to expand what they are able to do to 300 more households uh, in scattered site units. And then we're also requesting $375,000 in new funding for the DEMAS Housing Supports and Services line item to cover homeless outreach services. And for us in the capital region, homeless outreach services, those staff that go out under the bridges and into the parks to find people and engage people, that's one, been one of our biggest gaps um, that we've identified through the CAN process. We had more than 100 people who were identifying themselves as sleeping outside um, last fall, and we had not been able to, uh, to assign a homeless outreach worker to go and engage them. Uh, we did see, we have, because of the pandemic, we've seen an increase in unsheltered homelessness in the capital region. And at the moment, many of them are in hotels and uh, cold weather pop-up sites that we were able to set up for the winter. Um, but we do expect that we will have um, many more people at the end of the winter being unsheltered and turning out of doors again. And so we really need those services to be able to support and engage those, those individuals and help them get into the housing uh, that they need. So thank you for giving me the time today to testify. Happy to take any questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, appreciate you coming. Thank you for your testimony. Up next is uh, Jane Norgren. Uh, Jane, you're, you're muted. So I'm sure you're saying scintillating conversation, but we can't hear you yet. You're still muted. How's that? There you go. Now you're all set. Go ahead and start. Well, all I did was say good afternoon. And um, thank you very much, Madam Chair and the committee for allowing me to speak. Um, really as a parent and a volunteer, I did not, I, I have prepared notes, but I'd like to speak in favor of all the, um, support that you could give to the nonprofit community and particularly to the human service nonprofit community. It's an interesting perspective to be, I'm almost 80. And so it's an interesting perspective. I've been in Connecticut for the last 50 years and 50 years ago, Connecticut was the place to come if you had a child with a disability because they were way ahead of the feds and other states in providing services. Little did I know then that the services were generally provided by the community itself and by the parents who looked hard and then joined together to help provide those services. I represent um, the organization ARI, which is located in Sanford, and it was used to be always reaching independence, and I'm not quite sure what the ARI stands for. We keep changing it, but um, it's really, I have a son who's 50, who's Down syndrome, who lives in a group home, and um, who is prospering not because, well, not because of anything that his family, and we do a lot, try to do, but really because of his community. And that's not just the, the ARI community, but the larger community, which rallies so much to, um, to help us raise funds to serve our um, young people. Um, our current political life fears the framework of the welfare state where we get our um, where government provides total services. Well, we know we don't have that because the government doesn't provide total services. It's the private and community sources that are so much um, needed by um, nonprofits. So actually people are getting a great deal if they support nonprofits because we can expand we could provide more services, develop more and more um, possibilities for our people um, to be more self-sufficient. Um, Connecticut has steadily been closing services to providers and paying less to community providers. Um, it really can't be sustained by the nonprofits. It's hard to find staff. I think each person that has testified today would say that we're all in competition and we've heard why. Look at the difference between the 
amount paid to a nonprofit staff, direct staff person versus what might be paid to a state staff person. Um, it's hard to find staff, grants, and even opportunity. So I'm asking you to help continue doing what you're already doing to help support the community, to help support all of us as we try to um, help our children become better citizens. And um, I agree with all the previous speakers and ask you for more funding for the nonprofit sector. Thank you for your attention, support, and this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. We really appreciate you coming in. We agree that the nonprofits need a lot of more money. We just have to figure it out. I see I'm the only one in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. Thank you. Yonique Hendricks, are you here? She is not, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Thomas, you're up. Good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. My name is Chris Thomas, and I wish to share comments regarding House Bill 6439, an act concerning the state budget for the biennium ending June 30, 2023. I currently serve as the Vice Chairman and Secretary of the Board of Directors of Mental Health Connecticut, MHC, a 113-year-old nonprofit, and have been a board member for six years. MHC is an organization that continues to demonstrate its value through the excellent delivery of mental health services. I am here to respectfully request that the legislature appropriate $461 million over five years for community nonprofits. To address this situation, please commit to increasing funding by the full 461 million by the fiscal year of 2026 and index, and probably most importantly, index future increases to inflation to ensure that the state funding will keep pace with increased costs going forward. The need for mental health services is expected to grow significantly as the state emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the time to provide additional funding to the DEMAS budget due to this increased demand and improvement in services. There may never be a better time in the state of Connecticut to make this investment. I spent my entire career in the manufacturing industry in Connecticut and experienced firsthand how a supportive workplace in, is critical to the health of everybody in that environment. Many coworkers could have benefited from a better and simpler access to important mental health services. Although I've been with MHC for six years, this past year demonstrated the flexibility and responsiveness of the organization. At the outset of COVID-19, the staff of MHC had to start new programs, shift existing programs, change their individual roles, how they work, when they worked, and what was needed to care for the people and coworkers that they have. These changes clearly demonstrated just how strong and resilient this organization is and how the return on the state's investment in MHC is incredibly high. Since 20, 2007, community nonprofits have not been funded by at least $461 million required to keep pace with inflation or adequately cover increased costs and demand for services. In addition, like other employee work groups in the state, this funding is required for competitive wages and benefits to ensure that nonprofits are able to recruit and retain the skilled, dedicated employees that deliver the high level of client care required. Please protect the state's covenant with nonprofit organizations so that community-based services are adequately funded to ensure that MHC and all our nonprofit counterparts can continue this important work. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today and for your consideration. Thank you very much for your testimony. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for your story. And um, congratulations on your work in manufacturing. Uh, up next is Nathan Wise. Uh, he is calling in, Madam Chair. So he just has to unmute through his. You won't see his picture. 
Okay. Is he here? He is. He's, um, he just has to unmute. Star six? Yes. Mr. Wise, if you could star six, please. I, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and members of the committee. My name is Nathan Wise, and I am a residential support staff happily employed at Gilead Community Services in Middletown, which was recently deservedly named Nonprofit of the Year by the Middlesex Chamber of Commerce. I love my job, and I love my work. I currently make $16 an hour as a private sector healthcare worker, but I was not always in this position. When I began my human services career, it was 1975, and I made $3.24 an hour at a state institution where it cost the state $500 a day to care for someone. By the time I retired in 2008 as a full supervisor, I made $34 an hour. When the state was ordered to begin closing state institutions and moving individuals into smaller community settings, mostly under private care, the legislative intent was to upgrade private employees' salaries to approach parity with state workers doing similar work. Even if salaries were the same, the state was still saving millions of dollars a year by moving individuals into community settings. Unfortunately, after I retired from state service and began work in the private sector, I earned $15 an hour with no understanding of any pay raise, clearly an abrogation of the legislative objective from years earlier. I am very proud to be an active delegate in Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s favorite union, District 1199 Healthcare Workers. However, I believe that Dr. King would be outraged that as of today, there has been so little progress to compensate the work of dedicated staff in private nonprofits in Connecticut, commensurate with the ongoing needs of the clientele. Our union president has stated that $20 an hour would be a justified pay rate in the context of the 21st century economy. And I am here today to appeal to your sense of fairness, justice, and historic commitment for a fair wage for private health care workers. This is a reasonable and wholly responsible request, and I thank you for this opportunity to make my case on behalf of my fellow workers. I therefore urge you to make this a strong consideration as you plan your budget to increase funding for private nonprofits so that this long-forgotten legislative intention may at last become a reality. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Wise, and thank you for calling in. Up next is Heather Gates. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Heather Gates, and I'm the CEO of Community Health Resources. We're a behavioral health and housing provider and Connecticut's first CCBHC. Um, CHR has always been there for individuals and families with the most significant mental health and substance use challenges. We never turn anyone away for lack of payment. We respond to crises in the community. We help the homeless find housing. We add programs and services to respond to overdose deaths. We respond to requests for help 24-7. We added a hero hotline to provide support for free to first responders and healthcare personnel last spring in response to COVID and stress related to work. We are an essential healthcare provider. We didn't miss a beat last spring when we converted many of our programs to telehealth in a two week period, opened urgent care centers to see folks face to face, continued to provide residential care to 110 adults and children, maintained our crisis response teams, including our embedded clinicians with local police and offered remote services in schools. But we also had to furlough 60 staff to manage the loss of revenue from COVID and lack of funding to keep us whole. 
We've spent over 1.5 million on PPE, computers, software, hazard pay for staff and retrofitting vehicles and office space to provide for the safety of our staff. We spent close to half a million on hazard pay in December alone, and only 187,000 of that was reimbursed by COVID money from Demas. Our DCF therapeutic group homes are running a deficit of 230,000 through January. We need your help to stay financially strong and to keep doing what we do best, which is to serve those most in need. These expenditures come at a time when we can ill afford it after decade of no uh, funding increases and in fact funding cuts to the DEMAS budget that have required program closures and reductions of staff. As you consider our request for 461 million over five years, 128 million next year, please ask yourself, if we were not there, who would care for the 27,000 children, families, and adults who come to us for help every year, including during the pandemic, without missing a beat? We are deeply appreciative for the support that members of the Appropriations Committee have shown for our need for funding and recognizing the efforts we have made during this period of time. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. We really appreciate it um, uh, for you hanging in so long today. And just think of those 80 other people that are after you that will be here until like one or two in the morning. <laughs> Pernicia Clark, you are up next. Hello. Good afternoon, Senator Olson, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Vernicia Clark, and I have been working as an employment specialist for Sarah Inc. for almost two years. The mission of our agency is to enhance skills and enrich the lives of all individuals with differing abilities. Some of Sarah Inc.'s supports include birth to three early intervention, enrichment activities, customized employment, individual and family supports, transition services, and much more. As an employment specialist, it is my job to assist those with disabilities to prepare for the workforce and to gain employment, fair wages, and benefits. Our agency has been committed and will continue to be committed in providing individuals with employment by enhancing the necessary skills needed, such as building resumes, interview practice, job preparation, filling out applications, and teaching what it takes to be a vital employee in the community. Many of our participants have been extremely successful in the workforce, some of which have been at their jobs for over 20 years and earning the title of Employee of the Month. This is just a couple of examples of the successes of our agency. I am commenting on House Bill 6439, an act concerning the state budget for June 13th, 2023, and making appropriations therefor. Community nonprofits provide essential services in every city and town in Connecticut, serving people in need and employing tens of thousands. They are what make Connecticut a great place to live and work. I am here to respectfully request that the legislator appropriate 461 million over five years for community nonprofits. Since 20, 2007, community nonprofits have lost at least 461 million in state funding that has not kept pace with inflation or adequately covered increased costs and demand for services over the last 13 years. Please commit to increasing funding by the full 461 million or 28% by fiscal year 2026. Appropriate 128 million in new funding for community nonprofits in fiscal year 2022. Index increases to infl inflation to ensure that state funding will keep pace with increased costs in the future. And also hold nonprofits financially harmless from the impact of COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic has greatly impacted our agency Due to the pandemic, Sarah Inc. had to close in-person supports to keep those we serve and employees safe. During this time, it became difficult figuring out how to still stay connected to those we support. It was decided to provide, it was decided to provide support to our individuals from home using a virtual platform. This worked for some, but for many others, it simply was not enough. 
many of our resources shut down, for example, for example, public libraries. This was a huge upset as the library is where many of us take our individuals to apply for jobs and work on varying skills. Due to this, Sarah Inc. had to provide their staff with laptops, hotspots, and iPads to participants to ensure we are still able to provide supports efficiently to do our jobs. The agency also had to cut into the budget to ensure every staff had the necessary PPE to keep everyone safe. Since the start of the pandemic in March, staff and participants have had to be creative in how they provide and participate in services. Even during these challenging times, Sarah Inc. continues to be committed to providing supports for our individuals. Once again, I respectfully request that the legislator appropriate $461 million over five years for community nonprofits so that our agency can be a positive light in the lives of the individuals we serve. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much, um, Vernicia. We appreciate it. Um, next up is Regina Hampton, number 70. She is calling through the phone, Madam Chair, so it's going to take her a second to unmute. Regina Hampton, you have to star six. Hold one second, Mark. I'm on the, I'm on this Zoom call. I'm just starting a person so hold on till that's started okay? okay thank you Regina Hampton to, do you hear me you have to star six Regina Hampton you have to unstar uh, unmute by star sixing I see you, but you're not, you're still muted. Regina, you're still muted. I'm going on to the next one. If you can figure out how to unmute, you'll be next. Uh, Judy Gao, you are, you are next. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. My name is Judy Goff. I'm the chief of staff of the Chrysalis Center, one of the largest homeless service providers in the state of Connecticut. Chrysalis Center provides the necessary services to ensure our most vulnerable residents of Connecticut receive supportive services and advocacy to ensure their housing stability. I'm here today to request the support for HB 6439 biennium ending June 30, 2023. I respectfully request that the committee support the following proposals and expansions from the governor's budget for the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. I ask that you support the expansion of the DEMAS budget for housing services, including 300 households in scattered sites and development units. I ask that you support the enhanced outreach efforts that would better enable us to identify individuals experiencing homelessness. Lastly, I ask that you support funding efforts for nonprofits, including those working to end homelessness, which currently does not adequately cover the increased costs and demands for our services. Please know that my staff work tirelessly to provide effective and efficient services to those underserved population. It is difficult to retain dedicated and committed staff without offering COLA increases. With that said, it is my hope that you will support and pass the bill to increase funding for these valuable and much needed supportive services. I look forward to the day where we, our collective energies and commitment to end homelessness becomes a reality. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Judy. Is Regina Hampton on? She is not, Madam Chair. She seemingly I, left the panel. Okay, thank you. Let us know if she comes back. Stan Selby. Hi, Stan. Good afternoon, Senator, and, and thank you. Um, and thank you to members of the Appropriations Committee for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. 
I'm Stan Sobey, Vice President for Public Policy and External Affairs at Oak Hill. And I'm here once again now with 14 years and counting of flat or reduced rates to ask for fair funding for the services we provide. I want to thank the chairs and those members of the committee who have voiced public support for our work. One would have thought, given all that we have been through during the COVID pandemic as a country and a state, organizationally and individually, that this would be the year that the governor's proposed budget would recognize the value of nonprofit providers to the citizens of Connecticut, both the people whom we serve and those who serve them, like Yvonne Ellis, who spoke earlier, who are too often devalued by the decisions made by our government. If you truly value the services as we have heard from you, now is the time to vote those values and commit to appropriately and adequately funding them. Kicking the can down the road once again will mean more cuts to vital services and additional program closures. It is up to you and your colleagues as we are price takers, not price setters. We are not able to add a nickel to each coffee drink to cover rising costs. We've gone from lean to emaciated even before covering pandemic related costs and it's not sustainable. I'm here to respectfully request that the legislature increase funding as the Nonprofit Alliance has proposed. We appreciate past legislative initiatives that gave us pass through dollars to raise the wages of many, but not all of our deserving employees, the majority of whom are women and people of color. We continue to be challenged by other industries who have raised their hiring wage to $15 or more. And while understanding the rationale for doing so, we will also be challenged by DDS's hiring of 200 part-time staff, as it will be at a wage some 50% higher than what we nonprofits can offer. And sadly, we're talking about just staying ahead of minimum wage when this worthy and challenging work, which I have done, is anything but minimum wage work. And framing it in this way masks other costs to the state and diminishes the dignity of the people committed to the work. Without adequate rates, we cannot address these significant equity issues. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Sorry, Stan. I I'm trying to go between too many Zooms at the same time. Totally thank understand, you. Senator. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for your testimony. And, thank and you. we look forward to working with you guys. Uh, up next is Scott Bray Brabant. Uh, Scott Brabant, Madam Chair. Thank I, you very much. I gave it a shot. I'm sorry. You <laughs> did. Ahead. I appreciate that. Thank you. Go ahead. And th thanks again for giving us all an opportunity to provide testimony today. Uh, I've actually been on just about all day, and I really enjoyed a lot of the many stories shared by our program participants. Uh, I'm the chair of the board for Mental Health Connecticut, which is a 113-year-old nonprofit providing mental health services and support throughout Connecticut. I've been on the board for six years. And over that time, I've seen MHC weather several state rescissions, decrease, and or flat funding. These funding challenges have continued despite a growing need for our services. Our communities, as you know, have been ravaged by an opioid crisis, and we've seen more prisoners released into society requiring additional support. Like many of those that have testified today, I'm proud to say that MHC has been resilient and adaptive through all of it. They continue to deliver superior programs with great outcomes. They're able to meet the needs of their facilities, and even with the pandemic, quickly and swiftly moved to 75% telehealth, where they were previously providing 100% in-person services. They're truly heroes asking to do more with less. But as a business leader, I'm concerned about the future. I understand the importance of your role to ensure fiscal responsibility, but we can't continue at this pace. Without improved funding, community nonprofits will continue to struggle recruiting, and retaining talented service providers. They'll struggle to innovate and struggle to create programs that meet the needs of our program participants, and they'll limit capacity and ability to serve more. I respectfully urge you all to consider increasing funding for community nonprofits by 461 million by 2026, 
including $128 million for fiscal year 2022. Second, and most important, commit to index increases to inflation to keep pace with increased basic costs uh, that we'll face in the future. Third, support $6 billion of an increase in discharge and diversion services. Please make recovery a priority for Connecticut. The need for mental health and substance abuse services is expected to grow significantly once we emerge from the pandemic. This critical funding will enable community nonprofits to collectively address the social determinants of health and make true systemic change. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today and allow me to share my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you got this, uh, Representative Walker? Yep, I'm, 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 I'm back. I, okay, I'll, uh, all right, I'll, I'll take it in, in another little bit. Thank you. We've got Regina Hampton is on next. She's number 70. She's on on the phone, so she has to star six. She just got back on again. Okay. Go Thank right you. ahead. Go, Hello? Thank, go right ahead, Regina. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, um, Madam Chairman and the distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Regina Hampton. Today, I'd like to testify on HB 5583 an act concerning intervention by a police officer when a person suffers from an overdose. As a family member in recovery and a pre-pandemic volunteer recovery coach at CCAR in Bridgeport, CCAR quickly became a pillar in my life. After attending their course, Parents of Children in Recovery, I learned so much that I wish I had known before CCAR. It gave me an education and an understanding that I was so in need of. Attending meetings, hearing clients' stories, feeling their struggles and satisfaction in achieving success in recovery gave me a new look in recovery. I started with my attending classes to become a volunteer recovery coach. That is the power of CCAR, to make people whole again, to educate, heal, and allow you to help others. Healing others is the key. CCAR offers so much more than a place to go. It's a lifestyle that enables people to live. I am so thankful for CCAR. I know that I do not have an object, I, can, I do not have to be an object or an enabler, that I can be a resource. CCAR gave me that power. Everything depends on your concept of yourself. CCAR has helped structure that concept through their meetings and classes and allowing you to become an asset to the community. As our world changes and marijuana becomes available to all, we are going to need DEMAS to help fund many more CPAR centers, more recovery coaches in hospitals and prisons, since marijuana is a gateway to stronger drugs. So I'm asking you to trust me now, take action, and believe me later. Prepare us for CCAR in the future. Help make us all whole again. Thank you for letting me share my experience, strength, and hope. Regina Hampton, Wilkin, Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you for, for coming back uh, and making sure you could get your testimony through. So have a good afternoon. Um, oh, you too. Thank you so much for all your dedication. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, I'm going to go back to 119, Yannick Hendricks. She's joining right now, Madam Chair. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Okay. Hi. Sorry. I just want to make sure you guys can hear me. Yeah. Go right ahead. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, and to all the members of the Appropriation Committee. Thank you for hearing here in my testimony today. My name is Yonique Hendricks. I am a housing coordinator employed with the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services for the last 17 years. I currently work at the Western Connecticut Mental Health Network in the Danbury office. I'm here today to talk about the importance of increasing housing options in shelter plus care and residential services within DEMAS. Currently within shelter plus care, within the shelter plus care program, we're understaffed and do not have enough PSH 
vouchers to fulfill the need of housing homeless individuals who meet our criteria. Housing, coordinator, housing coordinators like myself are administering vouchers and providing case management services to a very vulnerable population that we serve. During COVID-19, we have continually done our jobs, which includes services like outreach in the community, meeting with the landlords and tenants for lease renewal, doing crisis intervention, doing risk assessment, just to name a few of the services, while also providing services to our new referrals that we receive from the Coordinated Access Network, the CAN. If DEMIS fails to address this present crisis in the housing PSH program, we will face a situation of individuals placed on a waiting list for two or more years. We really don't wanna get back to that. Our vouchers do not have a time limit and therefore, should be, there should be no excuse to prohibit expansion of the voucher access, as well as staffing simultaneously. On the residential side of housing, there is a critical backlog due to the limited resources and housing options. DEMA should consider reinstating residential options that were recently closed due to budgetary restraints. For example, within Western and our Waterbury office, our young adults 24 hour supervised housing um, was closed due to budgetary. And our clients are suffering in the meantime as a result of this overwhelming demand with limited resources. Demas workers like me need your help. Please allocate funding to the programs I have spoken about, but also to residential housing options within Demas. We are in serious need of funding and we really do need your help. Thank you very much for your time to listen to my testimony. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank you for, for, for making sure that you do provide us with that testimony. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 127, Jennifer Keatley. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and distinguished members of the Appropriation C Committee. My name is Jennifer Keatley. I'm the Executive Director at UCP of Eastern Connecticut, and I'm a resident of Waterford. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm here to respectfully request that the legislature appropriate $461 million over five years for the community nonprofits. United Cerebral Palsy of Eastern Connecticut provides essential services to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We serve Eastern Connecticut and we are an affiliate of UCP National, an organization which started over 70 years ago by families who hope for a better future, better future for their children with cerebral palsy. We hope for that better future for all people with disabilities here in Connecticut. Today, our affiliate serves nearly 200 people every day and we employ 80 direct support professionals. This past month, UCP and ANCOR published a case for inclusion. It's a special report on the sustainability of community disability services in America. It starts with an examination of where we've been over the past year and how it's changed our understanding of the cracks that have long existed in our system. It lays out a blueprint, a blueprint for how lawmakers such as yourselves can seize on this critical moment to transition to a post-pandemic world and build from the lessons on COVID-19 to invest in structural changes that usher in long-term sustainability. I urge you to read it at caseforinclusion.org. Of note in the report is how the COVID-19 pandemic has amplified the crisis that has long plagued our Medicare funded system. The trauma of this past year will live on for all of us, but for people with IDD, intellectual and developmental disabilities, the effects of the pandemic are especially pronounced. The pandemic has left people with IDD more isolated than ever. UCP of Eastern Connecticut pivoted at the beginning of this or at this beginning of the pandemic to provide telehealth and remote services. And our committed, dedicated, hardworking staff members risk their personal health to maintain in-person services as well. But these direct support professionals who support our family members, our friends, and neighbors with IDD, they're exhausted. They're constantly worrying. They're exhausted by the added steps necessary to ensure that people that they support remain isolated from the virus, but not from their communities. 
They're struggling to balance homeschooling with working from home. They're struggling to care for family members with COVID while maintaining their employment. Some are so exhausted, they choose to leave this field altogether. Our direct support staff can't do this work out of the goodness of their heart. Goodness doesn't pay the bills. We need to be funded in a way that allows us to pay our staff members like the professionals that they are. This is not a minimum wage job. It's not paper or plastic or would you like fries with your order? Our staff are teachers, coaches, therapists, mentors, and counselors all rolled into one direct support professional. They take pride in their work and they should be able to learn, earn an income that provides for their families. Some would even say that we do God's work. I hear people say that often, you do God's work. And I've asked myself, what does that mean exactly? And what it means and what it implies is that the work is very important and necessary, but it also implies that the work receives little or no recognition and little pay. And I guess it's true then, we do God's work because based on the way we're funded, it would appear that the state of Connecticut thinks that we do God's work too, with too little recognition and too little pay. But should it be that way? I don't think so. And I don't think you think that either. I'm asking that you affirm to the citizens of the state of Connecticut that they are not second class citizens. And especially, if not secondarily, to our direct support staff, most of whom are women or people of color, that they too are not marginalized. You, as our elected officials, can change this. The time now is to recognize the importance of the work. The time now is to take action and provide the needed funding to the providers. Investing now will pay off spades down the road. It will Jennifer, ensure a functional, sustainable service delivery system. Jennifer, could you sum up, please? Thank you. Yes. I respectfully request that the legislature commit to increasing funding to $461 million, appropriate $128 million in new funding, index increases to inflation, and hold nonprofits financially harmless for the impact of COVID-19. Thank, thank you, you for listening, and thank you for your hard work to make Connecticut a great place to live and work. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for your advocacy. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Sabrina Torres. I saw her. There she is. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Sabrina Torres. I work from our community resources as in, in, the custom in the custom department. I work with individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities as well as behavioral challenges. I have been with my company now for three years. I am very passionate about my job and the individuals I serve. This past year has been overwhelming on everyone, but especially us direct support workers. We have been struggling to keep staffing in our company due to COVID and due to our pay rate. In my unit specifically, we are short staffed, which is making it harder for us to get our, indiv our individuals back and our program up and running. We are not able to get our raise in this department until we have more staffing and more individuals attending the unit. Majority of our individuals are one-to-one -one or two-to-one. Because of that, we can't have individuals return until we have proper staffing. I have been working overtime in the residential homes to make sure we're fully staffed and help to make ends meet. Unfortunately, with my overtime, I'm getting more taxes taken out to where my overtime isn't being shown in my checks. Us as DSP workers, we take care of the individuals daily, we help them work towards their goals, and we help them become independent and successful part of the community. I am advocating on my behalf and all direct support staff throughout Connecticut as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony, and thank you for, for sticking around to, to talk to us this afternoon. Um, Absolutely. Thank, thank you for letting me share. Yes, thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much. Uh, Jessica Watson. She's not present, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Lynn, number 130, I see. There's Lynn. Okay. <laughs> Chilinski. It's Chilinski. Chilinski. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go Thank right you. ahead, Lynn. Uh -huh. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. 
My name is Lynn Chalinski and I live in Newington, Connecticut. I am testifying with the hope of impacting you and helping you see why many of us are so passionate about supporting people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. My older sister, Christine, was diagnosed with IDD as a child. Here's an adorable photo of both of us that I just have to share with you. <laughs> My inspiration. Growing up with Chrissy in a house full of girls, meaning my two younger sisters and my mom has led me to become a strong advocate in this area. It has also led me to a, a career at Mosaic, a nonprofit agency in Cromwell, Connecticut. Who would have thought I would dedicate 32 years of my life fulfilling a mission that held so much meaning to me? Our mission at Mosaic is embracing God's call. Mosaic relentlessly pursues opportunities that empower people. Looking back now, it all makes sense. Life has come full circle and I am meant to be right where I am today, talking to you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this important issue. Community nonprofits like Mosaic provide essential services throughout Connecticut. I am here to respectfully request that the legislature throughout Connecticut, that, sorry, request that the legislature appropriate 461 million over the next five years for community nonprofits. Since 2007, community nonprofits have lost at least 461 million in state funding that has not kept the pace with inflation or adequately covered increased costs and demand for services over the last 13 years. The COVID-19 pandemic has negatively impacted all of us personally and greatly affected our communities as well. My mother and I both contracted COVID-19 in December of last year, and it was very hard on my mother who was admitted to Middlesex Hospital twice. It was even more difficult for my sister, Chrissy. Why do you think it was harder for Chrissy? What I haven't shared with you yet is that my sister, Chrissy, has lived in a home supported by Mosaic for the last five years in Portland, Connecticut. Chrissy has, had been living with my mom in our family home in Middletown until my mom became critically ill with cancer in 2015, which she has fully recovered from, thank God. Mosaic staff have provided crucial support to my sister Chrissy and our family. Mosaic support staff are coming to work, as you heard on previous testimonies, every day and are fulfilling a variety of roles. They are providing emotional support, cooking meals, assisting with FaceTime calls, which is not always easy, administering medications, um, all while having their own lives and their own families outside of work. Our Mosaic staff have been impacted and have shared stories with me of their loved ones that they have lost during, due to COVID-19, but they still come to work with the individuals that we support. Chrissy has had a hard time understanding the virus and why she could not be with my mom. Why could she not visit my mother and sit and talk with her about the neighborhood and Millie's husband and the mailman if he was delivering her People magazine or if her recent Peapod delivery it contained chocolate ice cream or brownies to snack on, which were important to her. Little things to other people, but very important to my sister and the relationship with my mom. The support staff at Mosaic were critical in providing a caring environment, activities, holiday celebrations, fun and laughter, and comforted Chrissy and her housemates when they were upset or frustrated during these challenging times. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit nonprofit services and brought those brought additional costs and challenges. Mosaic has provided hazard pay for essential workers on the front lines, who have a higher risk of exposure. The huge task of obtaining and organizing an adequate supply of PPE and cleaning supplies has been incredibly challenging and costly to Mosaic, but these items are such a necessity. Mosaic leadership has worked diligently over the past year to ensure Mosaic would, re would remain open even as the pandemic worsened. Community nonprofit agencies that you have heard from today need to be adequately funded in order to provide extremely important supports to the most vulnerable people who count on them day in and day out. The work that Mosaic does as a community nonprofit is, is, community nonprofit is very important. Um, I can't imagine what our family and other families would do if it were not for healthcare providers like Mosaic. The direct support staff are essential. Again, I respectfully request that the legislature appropriate 460 million over five years to community nonprofits. This is necessary funding to ensure that my sister continues to receive the critical and vital services that she needs and that I and my family have come to rely on so heavily. Thank you so much for your time and listening. I appreciate you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for testifying, especially for your sister. Thank, thank you. you and everybody she works with too. She lives with, thanks. Okay, Charmaine Brown. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Go right ahead, Charmaine. Um, my name is Charmaine Brown, and I'm a direct support professional with Sunrise Northeast at a Vernon World Group home in Vernon, Connecticut. I am here today to testify in support of our increase of Medicaid funding for this group home workers like me. 
I have been employed with Sunrise for 13 years now, and I love work. I love the work that I do because loving, because I love taking care of the people. Most importantly, I enjoy taking care of my individuals and having them become like family to me. I work Monday through Friday on first shift. As much as I love what I do, there are definitely things that are not okay with Sunrise. My coworkers do not feel appreciated by our company, and this makes us feel like they just do not care. Staffing in a good amount of our houses is not adequate at all to the point where my, I myself has bounced around numerous of times and picked up extra hours just to help out my coworkers and give our individuals the support they really need. Sunrise Employees has thousands of employees, but you can count on your hand how many of those employees actually take the insurance through the company. The reason for this is because the insurance is nowhere near affordable. The family plan alone offered by Sunrise, for instance, is 5,200 a month. This is more than I even make in a month. Sunrise claims to be the highest paid, one of the highest paid companies, but yet they do not pay their employees enough to even survive on a daily basis. Elected officials like you can help workers like me. A raise in Medicare Medicaid funds would mean so much to me and my family because it would mean a raise in wages and affordable benefits. As a mother, I would be able to provide for my son with so much more without always trying to figure out what bills is more important. I could provide for my son and myself with much better health insurance. And on a whole, if I had an extra boost in income, it would help me. It, it would help me pay my bills and still have something left over. I really appreciate you guys listening to me today. And I want to just thank you. And I hope, I hope this changes everything. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you for, for, for testifying today. Thank you. Oh, we got to see you too. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> thank have, you so much. Have a, have a good evening. Thank you. You too. I appreciate you guys. Thanks. Okay. Sarah Lombardo. Good, morning. good evening. I started to say good morning. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Hello, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Sarah R. Lombardo, and I have an MSW in Community Organization. My face should be somewhat familiar by now, as I have come for the past few years to testify for my place of work, Reliance Health Teamwork Clubhouse. I also remember Representative Walker coming to my Yukon School of Social Work class about 10, 11 years ago. It was great, I still remember, always good to see you. <laughs> um, I, I'm also a voter and I vote for those I serve, the underprivileged with mental illnesses. Teamworks is a place pre and post COVID-19 where our members can get a hot meal, a cup of coffee, some inspiration in a group and skills to live by. It is a social Mecca where members feel safe, both physically and emotionally where a connection with staff and fellow participants can be made and people do not feel so alone, isolating at home with no one with which to converse, a hospital stay looming on the horizon. Dur during COVID-19, we, the teamwork staff, have reached out to our members, sharing a bit of companionship with them, be it on the phone, on a hike, or to dine outside. The members really have appreciated the time taken just to make them smile. On the basic needs level, we have joined forces with another program at our agency, Penobscot Place, in putting together food bags for all in need. We have also put together activity packets full of word searches, crossword puzzles, playing cards, a little candy for a stimulating treat during the dull days of COVID-19. Our members have access to a food bag every two weeks and they are always grateful when we drop one off at their door. The activity packets have been in less demand and we have tried to meet all needs. Up and coming, I personally just wrote and won a grant for 46 tablets so that members are able to join groups we are offering virtually, including a political advocacy group that I will be running. Exciting times for the folks we serve and I'm so proud to be part of it. Hearing members say, I miss the clubhouse. I need to get connected with people. Also knowing what a positive impact the clubhouse makes on members' lives, keeping them free and clear of hospitalization, really brings it home that we need your funding. 
Also, we are asking the legislator for $6 million for the first year and $5 million in subsequent years for the starting and continuing operation of five tier respite. We ask that respite to be allocated one per Demas region and be staffed by persons with loved, lived experience in the mental health field and certified in intentional peer support. Thank you for all you do and for hearing my testimony. For anyone who may not know the definition of a peer respite, there's a definition at the end of my testimony. And I, I just wanna say thank you. And I do work at Teamworks Clubhouse Reliance Health in Norwich. That, that's my place of working in case I skipped over it. <laughs> and thank you. And, and it's really good to see the, the MSW students coming through. And I've, there are quite a few that are, I've been noticing that have been coming through and it makes me, makes me very happy. So, oh, good. Yeah, I feel like I'm definitely using my degree when I come up here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Um, Amy Stoddard, uh, what, number 133. Amy Stoddard. I see her on the board. Amy, can you unmute? There we go. How's that? Great. Good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Amy Stoddard. I'm a job coach at Journey Found in Pawkatuck, Connecticut. I have worked in the group home environments for 18 years, starting as an eight years with Journey Found, starting as direct care staff on all shifts, being promoted to assistant coordinator, then program coordinator, and now as a job coach. I come before you today to urge you to increase funding for group homes like mine. I love my job. I love that I get to work with the same people every day and that the work I do empowers them to make their lives better. As a job coach, I work with people to find jobs. I help our residents find fulfillment in employment and become productive members of society despite the challenges that they face. One of the gentlemen I work with, for example, is a two to one in public, meaning he needs two caretakers to attend to him when he's out in the community. I get him up in the morning, give him his medicines, we get him dressed, we make his breakfast and we help him safely enter and exit the van. Generally get him ready to go out into the community. I assist him at his job every day that he works. We don't get paid enough for the work that we do. We are paid around $50 an hour, which is barely adequate. Under normal circumstances, I live paycheck to paycheck and worry constantly about whether or not I will be able to put food on the table. Sometimes when I do receive a decent paycheck, I will buy more food than I need and freeze it because I deal with food paranoia and don't know if I'll be able to afford groceries the following week. Right now, I am able to make ends meet but only because of the number of hours that I work. I work 75 to 90 hours every week. On a few occasions, I have even worked over 110 hours in a week. The amount I work has negative impacts on my relationships as well. I barely get to spend quality time with my daughter, my boyfriend, or my dog. My daughter moved in with her father 3,000 miles away because she didn't want to live with me anymore because I'm never home. Aside from my boyfriend and my dog, I don't get to spend time with any of my other friends or family. I'm supposed to have weekends off, but I can't remember the last time I went out for coffee or movie or attended church. I can't remember the last time I was able to take a vacation. There's a direct connection between the number of hours I work and the wage I earn. It is hard to address staffing vacancies and reduce people's hour load when you can't find people willing to do this job for $15 an hour. Most people don't want to do this kind of stressful, laborious work when they can make the same amount of money stocking shelves or bagging food at the local grocery store. As a result, we are chronically understaffed. If we were paid more, we wouldn't have to work absurd amounts of hours to make ends meet, and we could attract talented caregivers to fill vacancies we currently have. My colleagues and I are overworked. We are stressed and we are exhausted. Please support funding for our group home services to put an end to the exploitations of workers like myself. We deserve to be treated better and paid a living wage. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Amy, for, for sharing your story, for being honest and, and, and allowing yourself to be vulnerable 
in front of us because of the importance of what you're trying to get to us and make us understand. Thank you so much for, for doing that. And you did a fantastic job. I think you got you got to a few people. So uh, thank you very much. I probably got to everybody because of your dedication. So thank you. And we really want to help you guys. We really do. So thank have, you. A good, have a good have a good evening and hug that dog and kiss your husband. Kiss your boyfriend, okay? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Have a good day. Um, Deborah Carpenter, 134. Good evening, Deborah. Hi. It is the evening, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Five o'clock. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll be here. <laughs> Go right ahead. So, good evening, Madam Chair, and the distinguished members of the Appro Appropriations Committee. My name is Debbie Carpenter. I'm a senior case manager at Gilead Community Service. Um, we serve people with mental health issues in Middlesex and Hartford County. Gilead Community Services, like other nonprofits, provide essential service to people in need. I know we are essential because I've worked through this pandemic. I've contracted COVID-19, caring for an ill client at the start of the pandemic when we did not have adequate PPE. Keeping our clients safe keeps Connecticut a safe place to live. I'm here to respectfully request that the legislature appropriate $461 million over five years for community nonprofits. Since 2007, community nonprofits have lost at least 461 million in state funding. The loss of funding meant no increases in wages, low retention of staff, and staff will move on to higher paying and less demanding jobs. Nonprofits were not adequately funded before the pandemic. And once the pandemic hit, our jobs became harder. People end up leaving the field. We are working under staff and we have more work to do. Doctors and psychiatrists are telephoning or Zooming with clients. That's all well and good if the client has a phone or internet access. Most of our clients don't have a phone and especially do not have internet access. So if clients A, B, and C have a tele appointment with their mental health provider, this means I drive to client A's house with a company's cell phone so they can talk to the client. Then I sanitize the phone and drive to client B's house so they can talk to the client. And then I go to client C's house. The doctor is safe. He doesn't have to interact you know, with the community clients, but how about me? It's even worse if someone has a Zoom appointment because there's no internet at most of our clients' houses. So I use my personal cell phone so the client can have a medical appointment. I don't know how many of you have been handing your cell phone out to community people, but it's not really the best idea during this pandemic. It's said that we're going to need more mental health and substance treatment services. It's going to grow after the pandemic. I'm here to tell you it's already here. Those of you working from home may not see it, but I'm out in the community and people are not doing well. So please provide the funding so we don't have a mental health pandemic after we're all safe from the virus. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for all the work you do with your clients. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Um, 135, Kim Ackerman. Hi, Kim. Hi. Good evening, Senator Osteen, Representative Walker, and members of the committee. My name is Kim Ackerman. I live in Canton, Connecticut. I am a direct support staff member at Whole Life Incorporated, and I have worked in healthcare for over 25 years. I come to you, I come before you today to express 
how urgent the need for increased funding is in group homes like mine. I have been working at the Mullen Hill Whole Life location for three years, but I've worked in group homes for the last eight years. In my role as a direct support staff member, I work very closely with highly behavioral autistic individuals. Some of these individuals don't have families that visit often, so the staff becomes their families. Being able to build these relationships with our individuals is one of the most fulfilling parts of my job. With that said, my job is also incredibly challenging. Not everyone could do this job. Working with highly behavioral individuals can sometimes be difficult. My coworkers and I have been bit, punched, kicked, and on one occasion, I was concussed after a blow to my head. When these incidents occur, we don't blame the individuals, but rather the subpar staffing. We have been experiencing a staffing crisis in my group home for quite some time, but it hasn't always been like this. The unit that I work on has four individuals that we care for. And when I first began working here, we had eight caregivers. We used eight caregivers per shift. That was 24 workers. Over time, this number has shrank to seven staff members a shift, then six. Now, often we staff this unit with five caregivers. This is un incredibly unsafe for both the staff as well as the individuals. Two of the individuals are two to ones and the other two are one on ones, which and then one of the individuals is a three to one while we are out in public. Um, it's in meaning they require the caregiver to care for them. Short staffing makes it incredibly hard to provide the care that they deserve. One major issue when it comes to recruiting additional staff are the wages we earn. This is an incredibly difficult job and it is not easy to find someone who is willing to do it for, the, for low wages. We do not make enough money to live off of, which forces me to work three jobs to make ends meet. I come to work every day at 6 a.m. to pass meds for third shift because we don't have someone on third shift who is certified to do so. I then work my own shift, which is eight to four. Before heading to my second job, most weeks, I work every day of the week. This leaves me exhausted and stressed out. My life consists of work, sleep, work, sleep, work, sleep. I have no time for anything else. I am burnt out, and so are my coworkers. Group homes desperately need more funding. We cannot continue to be paid wages that force us to work ourselves to the bone every week while putting ourselves and our individuals at risk because of low staffing. With additional funding, group homes could only could not only hire more staff, but they could pay the staff a wage that allows us to work less and give more of ourselves to our individuals and our families that rely on us. Please do the right thing and increase funding for group homes in Connecticut. I would like to thank you for your time for um, allowing me to give you my testimony today. Thank you. Thank you for, for staying and thank you for providing us with what's going on in, in your life, both in your home life and in, and in your facility that you're working in. So thank you so much for everything you do. Thank Tony, you. you want me to take over now? Okay. Tony, I'll take over. Okay. Um, up next is uh, Roland Harmon, followed by number 137. Mr. Harmon, please go. Yes, good evening and thank you, Madam Chair and the esteemed members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Roland Harmon and I am humbly serving as the co-president of the Governor's Prevention Partnership. I'm a Hamden resident, a father, grandfather, son, person of faith, and a student at Hartford Seminary. And I'm here today to ask for your continued support of the state's prevention infrastructure uh, to keep it intact so that our young people can continue to grow and thrive in supportive uh, families and communities. Uh, the Governor's Prevention Partnership uh, has empowered families and communities for over 30 years. We collaborate with both public and private entities and partners 
to reduce the risk of substance abuse, bullying, violence prevention among our youth. Uh, our seasoned team of prevention professionals, we work with parents, schools, communities, organizations, providing effective prevention strategies and intervention uh, through youth mentoring to make sure that our communities are drug free and they will thrive and that our young people uh, will have personal achievements in their lives. In the midst of this dreadful pandemic, and we've heard so much about it throughout the testimonies today, uh, so many lives in our, our state have been impacted. And at the partnership, we had to quickly pivot uh, to this new normal uh, through virtual connections and opportunities to broaden our reach, convening groups, innovating, serving as that change agent, funding organizations in non-traditional ways, providing thought leadership and continued advocacy. And we're taking initial steps to continue to ensure that our services are culturally responsive, uh, our, all of our activities and best practices and prevention and youth mentoring. Uh, and our board, our team, our key stakeholders have made this commitment uh, to ensure that we're relevant, inclusive, and we're meeting the needs of youth and families in this day that we're living in. And part of that uh, cultural responsiveness, diversity, equity, and inclusion work at the partnership has focused on work uh, and mentoring services for LGBTQ plus youth, making sure that there are tools and resources that mentors have at their fingertips, making sure that we're recruiting mentors with lived experience to connect with our young people, and making sure that communities are welcome, welcoming and inclusive uh, where young people can thrive and they have voice. And you heard a little bit of that from Menon earlier today in testimonies. Also through our services to Latino youth and families through our Poor Los Niños project, we've expanded that in Hartford and Waterbury, efforts to reduce substance misuse upon, uh, uh, among uh, Latino youth in grades four through 12. Uh, and, and lastly, we promoted virtual connections and mentoring. And so there's been an all out campaign and effort to connect more caring adults to young people. We know that young people are dealing with anxiety, depression, isolation, all those things that we've been talking about today. But we know that a mentor can serve as that bridge to help close that gap and keep young people and students engaged and connected, whether that's at school or with their families. And so we know that these times are difficult and we recognize that um, you guys have a, a mammoth task to balance uh, the needs of our state during these extraordinary times. And we know that this is not easy. But we just want to remember that every dollar invested in prevention programs has the potential to save uh, 18 in costs related to substance use disorders. And so at the partnership, we want to highlight and encourage that prevention infrastructure and funding stays strong and that funding will be made for prevention initiatives at the maximum possible uh, 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 max funding that is that is that is at the maximum for prevention and we just want to thank you for this opportunity thank you very much uh, mr Harmon we really appreciate you coming in and testifying and hanging out with us all day uh, have a have a wonderful day and we are looking at a lot of these issues a uh, number uh, 137 Stephen Civitelli followed by number 138 <laughs> Helen McClendon Good evening, members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Steve Civitelli. I'm here on behalf of the Connecticut uh, Association of Directors of Health. I am the health director for the town of Wallingford and the past president of the Environmental Connecticut Environmental Health Association. I'm here, we've provided written testimony for this evening, but I'm just here to briefly discuss uh, local per capita funding. I know we have met before this body before in the past and made reference to uh, public health infrastructure funding for our local health departments. Um, I could probably go on for hours about what we've done in this past year, but I think what I'll say is this. Um, local health departments have stepped up to the plate in the pandemic. I think we've proven that we could support our towns in our state uh, throughout an event such as this, whether it's through vaccination clinics, contact tracing, enforcing governor's executive orders, uh, Connecticut reopen guidance documents, uh, the health departments locally supported our communities as well as our businesses throughout this event. Um, and so what I'm requesting tonight on behalf of the directors of health and being the current president of the association, uh, that the per capita state funding that's statutorily obligated at $1.85 per capita be increased. Um, so I think, again, while I could 
continue on. I will keep my comments brief and I appreciate uh, your time. And I'm sure we'll be seeing more of each other in the coming weeks. Well, we're actually hoping to finish the budget early this year. We'll, we'll let you know <laughs> that then we're hoping to take care of some of these problems. Um, thank you, Mr. Civitelli, appreciate it. Up next is Helen McClendon. Hi, um, Senator Austin, Representative Walker and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Nice to see you again. And thank you for hearing my testimony today on House Bill 6439, um, the Demas budget. I'm Helen and I'm the president and CEO of Homes with Hope, which is a Westport based organization dedicated to Indian homelessness in Fairfield County. Um, when um, our state residents have stable housing, their economic and health outcomes improve and our taxpayers are saved money. And we all like that. During COVID-19, the need for permanent housing for all of Connecticut's residents has become even more important. One thing that has become very evident in this pandemic is the collaborative approach to Indian homelessness from all our state organizations and nonprofit partners. I applaud all the state agency commissioners for working together. We all feel passionate about discussing the important investment through DEMAS to support efforts to end homelessness in Connecticut. We have seen firsthand how supportive housing um, services work. Since 2012, the number of people utilizing Connecticut's shelter system has decreased by 57%. We still have a long way to go, but this much needed funding will be a huge support in ensuring that homelessness becomes rare, brief, and non-reoccurring in Connecticut. Um, continued investment in proven solutions to homelessness is necessary in the ongoing process in ensuring that everybody has a home. I am honored to have been involved with homeless programs for almost two decades and have seen how supportive housing and wraparound supports helps our most vulnerable become productive members of society. I am proud of our staff and the staff of all the other homeless provider agencies throughout the state. The staff continue to come to work through COVID-19. I liked how Mike Van from Reliance House and Jennifer Keatley and many others spoke today when they advocated for the frontline workers. And Amy and Kim's stories, they were heartbreaking too. We all know they are frontline heroes, making sure the most vulnerable in our society are taken care of with dignity. Please support the increased proposal to make sure we can continue this necessary work. Thank you, Senator Austin. I don't know if you're still there. Um, um, I, I am, I'm still here. And I'm just listening to your slightly Irish brogue that you have. <laughs> <I'm enjoying. laughs> Thank you. It is, it's kind of gone, but it's a little bit there still. It's um, still a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very um, much for your testimony. I actually just have a few more things, a quick thing to say. I just okay. wanted, um, Senator um, or Republican Walker referenced the um, frontline heroes as um, unsung heroes, and that's who they are. They really are that. And thank you for the committee for the opportunity to present this testimony today. It has been a very long day for you all, and your commitment and leadership within the Appropriations Committee in the state of Connecticut is very much appreciated. Thank you for allowing me to testify today for the most vulnerable in our community. Thank you very much, Thank Helen. You. And this is the only way the people actually get to speak about a budget because the governor's uh, budget never takes into the account or the comments that are made by it, the everyday people out in the state. And this is that way to handle that. So that's Thank something you that's all. very important. You're you're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. Appreciate it. Up next is Elena Davis. Good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and members of the committee. My name is Elena Davis. I live in Chaplin. I am a program aide at Whole Life Inc., formerly known as Tri County ARC. I have worked here for 13 years. I'm also a certified nurse's assistant and have a total of 22 years in healthcare. The people I serve at work daily have been referred to as clients, participants, consumers, and individuals. But to me, they're just my guys. I work at a group home and a day program. We are responsible for helping our guys learn how to socialize, develop life skills, and integrate into the community. And to make sure that a beyond acceptable quality of life is met. 
Yes, this is a job and we are here to provide a service, but the people we serve quickly become a part of our hearts. This is not to say that our job doesn't come with challenges. Short staffing has made our job increasingly difficult. We work long hours to fill in the gaps and miss time with our families. Management has tried to fill open positions, but it is hard to attract professional caregivers for the wages that we are being paid. As a day program and group home worker, we are not being paid a living wage. Many, many of us work incredible amounts of overtime or have a second job just to make ends meet. Earning a higher wage would enable those of us living paycheck to paycheck more of an opportunity for a savings and more time to be able to have with our family. We can't say that the kids are our future, that the children are our future, like people like to say, if nobody's home to raise them. Please consider caring for the caregivers by funding our programs and our group homes. I appreciate you taking the time out. I know it's been a long day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alana. Really appreciate it. And actually, you live right down the road from me then in Chaplin. I live in Sprague, so. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, up next is Sean Grady. They are not present, Madam Chair. Do we have anybody else in the waiting room that is a lower number than where we are? Uh, not currently, no. Thank you very much. Um, up next is Linda Ayavana. There you go, Linda. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, my name is Linda Ayavana, and I'm the President and CEO of Mark Community Resources. We're a $7.5 million private provider of services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We have over 250 families that use our services. We have 140 uh, employees. And we provide services all through Middlesex County, up as far as Old Saybrook and into Hartford County. Uh, and I'm a resident of Cromwell. So thank you for the opportunity to testify on HB 6439. I'm here to respectfully request that the legislature appropriate 461 million over the next five years for community nonprofits. And you've heard from numerous nonprofits today um, that we provide the services that keep communities intact. We help your brother, your cousin, your mother, your son, and your neighbor. We're hired by the state of Connecticut to support all the people in need. We are a key component of Connecticut being a great place to live and work, and we keep families together and safe. The people who work in these nonprofits are both highly educated with numerous degrees as required by the state, and people with no formal education, but significant level of training also required by the state. Yet these bright committed people must sacrifice personal comfort and gain to pursue their desire to serve. Cuts, rescissions, and flat funding over the past 14 years has necessitated a duct tape approach to infrastructure and maintenance and has kept direct support professionals at or near poverty levels. Despite COVID, Mark is open and operating. We have a waiting list of people who want to return to program as well as new referrals. We have had to delay their return because of staffing shortages, not because of COVID. We have many heroes here at Mark, but we simply are not able to pay wages high enough to attract and retain well-trained staff. Without staff, we cannot provide the services that families are desperate for. COVID-19 has created another level of hardship for us. Our agency closed from Mark, uh, March through July. We opened our doors again at the request of the state but prior to doing so, we were required to implement a safety plan with safety protocols, including items like touchless thermal scanning, PPE, sanitizing pro uh, products, plexiglass, special cleaning equipment, HVAC, virtual services, technology, and training. The list was endless, is endless. Mark has spent in excess of a half a million dollars to provide um, services in a safe manner. We've had uh, several homes with COVID positive residents and staff who ultimately became positive as well. We've had to pay exorbitant fees to temporary agencies to assist us while our staff quarantined. We've had other staff that have stayed in hotel rooms for 14 days to prevent further exposure to others with individuals who were positive. DDS has kept us stable and I'm very thankful for that. And we've done our best to use appropriated funds to help cover overtime, hazard pay and quarantining costs, but expenses continue to pile up. 
Nonprofits should be held financially harmless for the impact of COVID. Nonprofits have also suffered a loss of fundraising income as well. This is from loss of event revenue and loss of donations that have been diverted to COVID relief and to the Black Lives Matters movement. We've also had foundations realign their giving priorities in order to respond to immediate needs. So I'm here this evening to thank you for your time and again to reiterate that I'd like you to appropriate $461 million to nonprofits. Thank you very much, Linda. We appreciate your testimony um, and uh, you know that we're working on it. So um, up next, we have Beth Fisher. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Beth Fisher. I'm the Executive Director for CUNE Employment Opportunities. We're a nonprofit human service agency uh, serving our, committee, our community since 1962. Our agency contracts with both DDS and DEMAS, and I'm here today in support of the nearly 400 individuals that we serve as well as the 70 individuals that we hire as staff to provide compassionate quality services. We deliver our services throughout Central Connecticut with our headquarters in Meriden and an office in Middletown. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on HB 6439. I am here today to respectfully request that the legislature appropriate the $461 million over the next five years for community nonprofits. As you've heard from many of my colleagues today, community nonprofits provide an essential service in every city and every town in Connecticut, serving people in need and employing tens of thousands. Since 2007, community nonprofits have lost at least 461 million in state funding, but has not kept pace with the inflation or adequately covered the cost of in, the increased cost and demand for services for over a decade. Yet throughout the COVID crisis, our committed and underpaid staff continued to work to keep our program participants safe and engaged in services, some in person and some virtually. And while our staff continued to provide critical services, our agency's cost for PPE, cleaning supplies, technology and equipment for remote work and services, and premium pay for staff with high risk of exposure to COVID-19 skyrocketed. Beyond the challenges of COVID, the years of inadequate funding have taken a toll on community nonprofits and the individuals that we serve. I have shared through testimony to this committee over the years many examples. One in particular continues to puzzle me and illustrates the short sightedness of inadequate and decreased funding for nonprofits. In fiscal year 17, our agency saw significant cuts to our DEMAS funded employment programs. And that resulted in a, in a loss of services for 70 individuals living with severe and persistent mental illness in our community. We have been able to restore services for 20 of those, 50, of those 70, yet still here we are in 2021 with 50 people, 50 less people able to access these critical services. Why not fully and adequately fund a service that assists people with disabilities to gain employment and earn a living? Individuals who have, have the support to go to work and be productive and valued members of our community can over time become less dependent on public assistance. Why is that not a priority? Research shows us that employment is a key component to recovery. Instead, nonprofit agencies continue to scramble to make ends meet while services further erode. And the demand continues to increase as the funding has been cut. I urge you to please commit to increasing the funding by the full $461 million that was outlined by the Alliance, appropriate $128 million in new funding for community providers for fiscal year 2022, which re represents a 7% increase, and to index uh, the increases to inflation to ensure that state funding will keep pace with the increased cost in the future. If not now- Beth, are you all, are you almost all set? I'm almost done. Um, okay. So I just ask, if not now, when? Uh, and again, I know that I am speaking to the choir with many of you and do appreciate your commitment, but we really, really hope that this is the year that we will see some relief. Thank, thank you for your time. Thank you, Beth. We really appreciate it. 
Up next is Claudio, number 143. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Uh, can you see me? I, I don't see. We cannot see you. Huh. Um, just one second. Yeah. Representative France, you're not muted. There you go. Go ahead, Claudio, go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. There you go. Now, now we now. see you. <laughs> okay. Yes, All sir, right. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, good afternoon, uh, distinguished um, state senators and representatives and the members of the Appropriation Committee. Um, my name is Claudio De Noia. I'm a resident of Old Lyme. Um, I, I am a PhD and research advisor and a member of the board of directors of SARA Inc. in Westbrook. Uh, most importantly, I speak today on behalf of my daughter, Mariana, who is 43 years old and has multiple mental and physical disabilities. Um, as you know, the community um, nonprofits provide essential services throughout Connecticut serving people in need. The, this organization serves thousands of people every year in the state. Among their services, they provide important support to people with developmental disabilities. My daughter lives with us and depends on the services, in this case of Sarah Inc. in Westbrook, to carry a daily dignified and happy life through social, educational and community activities. It is my strong belief that community nonprofits, as Sarah, represent our best values as human beings and the pillars of our beloved country. At the level of society, they contribute essential support to all those in need, bringing an exceptional example of social justice, equality and moral values which in turn enhance the image and recognition of our state as one of the best in the nation. During the last decade, community nonprofits have lost at least 461 million in state funding that has not kept pace with inflation. I respectfully request the legislature should appropriate funds to nonprofit services by 128 million in the new fiscal um, year, by year 2022. Commit to increasing the funding by 461 million by fiscal year 2026, and if possible, apply an index adjustment to keep pace with inflation and increase cost in the future. Thank you for my attention, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. We really appreciate it. and know that we think about your family when we make these decisions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is James Johns. Hi, can you guys hear me? How are you? Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Senator Wilson. Um, distinguished members of the appropriation committee. So my name is James Johns and I'm here representing uh, Sarah Inc. Uh, and more importantly, my daughter, Megan Johns, who's a 22 year old uh, individual with an intellectual disability who's part of the Sarah program. I um, want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify on HB 6439 and Act concerning the state budget for the biennium ending June 13, 2023, and making appropriations, therefore. Community nonprofits provide essential services in every city and town in Connecticut, serving people in need, employing tens of thousands. They're what make Connecticut great, a place to work, a place to live, and more importantly, what we all call home. Uh, I'm here to respectfully request that the legislature appropriate 461 million over five years for community nonprofits. Since 2007, community nonprofits have lost at least 461 million in state funding, that has not kept pace with inflation or adequately covered increased costs and demand for services over the last 13 years. So I ask you please to commit to increasing funding by the full 461 million or 28% by fiscal year 2026. Appropriate 121 million, state net of 67 million after federal reimbursement for new funding for community nonprofits in FY22. 
2022 to 7% 7 increase. Also increase or index increases to inflation to ensure that state funding will keep pace with increased costs in the future and hold nonprofits financially harmless from the impacts of COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic exasperated the impact of inadequate funding for nonprofit services and brought unanticipated unbudgeted costs and operational challenges for many community nonprofits. These include providing hazard pay for essential workers, providing PPE, cleaning supplies, creating telehealth services over one monthly overnight, purchasing necessary laptops, iPads, other communication devices, and many and as well, many community nonprofits near to close their doors during the pandemic. So that's kind of the, the, the iteration of what you've heard now 143 times before me. Uh, to bring a slightly different perspective to this, I'm coming at this from strictly a parent's point of view. We've heard from a lot of providers recipients of services. I guess in some extent I could be a recipient, but um, from my point of view, the importance of the funding here is to allow these these, these organizations, these, these programs to have the funding to be sustainable for a good period of time. Um, there's a need now, obviously, um, without question, but for somebody like my daughter, there's a need now and there's a need in the future. And the sobering reality of that is that future is when somebody like myself is not around. I'm a caregiver, I'm a parent, I'm a guardian. But these programs become an extension of your family. And the folks that you've heard previously throughout the day today, talking about the needing adequate wages, uh, adequate experience, it's those people that can provide that extension of family that actually maybe even selfishly allows me to sleep a little bit better at night knowing that my daughter can live a fulfilling life for the rest of her life, whether I'm here or not. So to that point, I want to thank you for your time. I know it's been a long day. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much, Mr. Johns. Um, uh, we really appreciate it. We appreciate your story. Uh, um, is Martin Legault on? I am. You are up now, sir. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Martin Legault. I'm the parent of a client of Horizons Inc. in Wyndham. Horizons has been supporting our family for more than 30 years through their many services, including weekends in the country, summer camp, day program services, and residential support services. Our daughter has very complex needs that would that without the expert services provided by Horizons, we would be at a total loss to meet. We are extremely grateful for the state's financial support to Horizons over all these years that has allowed them to continue providing these critical services to our daughter. Prior to my retirement in 2015, I also served as the president and CEO of Corporation for Independent Living, a statewide nonprofit agency developing specialized housing for people with disabilities operated by other nonprofit agencies such as Horizons. In that role, I became acutely aware of the critical role that nonprofit agencies play in meeting the needs of families and individuals throughout the state. It is both as the parent of a person with a disability and as a former nonprofit service provider that I'm here today to request that the legislature appropriate $461 million over five years for community nonprofits as part of HB 6439. These funds will help cover the losses in state funding that community nonprofits have experienced over the last 13 years by not keeping pace with inflation or adequately covering increased costs and demand for services. In addition, these funds should be indexed to keep pace with inflation and used to hold nonprofits financially harmless from the impact of COVID-19. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you very much, Mr. Legault. We really appreciate you coming forward. Without your stories, uh, one good thing about doing it this way is the stories are on YouTube. So I want you all to know that this is being heard by a lot of different people that would not necessarily hear your stories. And so you have a lot of people hearing your stories. So thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Legault. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Up next is uh, Mr. Valentine, number 146. 
Yes, good evening, uh, Senator Olson, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France, and other members of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, yes, my name is Bill Valentine. I'm the Chief Financial Officer of Network Inc. Um, Network is a nonprofit uh, that serves, uh, we have 258 constituents um, in throughout Northeastern and Central Connecticut. And we have 390 employees. Um, we offer um, community living arrangements, in, um, IHS services and day program services. So thank you for the opportunity. I know you guys have had a long day, so appreciate um, uh, the, the chance to be able to speak. Um, as, as everybody else has been saying, um, we were, we're looking for um, really the, the the legislature to appropriate 461 million over the next five years um, for community nonprofits. Since 2007, nonprofits have lost at least that much in state funding and we've not kept pace with inflation or been adequately um, covered for increased costs. So we're asking for a commitment to increase funding the full 461 million um, by 2026, um, appropriate 128 million, which would be um, a 7% increase by fiscal year 2022, and index increases to inflation to ensure that state funding keeps pace with increased costs in the future. And as uh, a lot of other folks have been saying, we'd like to also hold nonprofits financially harmless from the impact of COVID-19. Um, our agency has had similar um, impact from COVID-19 that you've heard from other people, um, having to close our day program for a period of time and um, using uh, remote services um, and for which we had to buy equipment. Um, and I will say DDS was um, terrific with us with uh, providing um, funding for us to get through that. But, you know, the costs are still there and they're going to be increasing in the future. Previous budget cuts and underfunding have neg negatively impacted our organization, um, which of course affects the people we serve and our staff. Um, you know, the lack of funding, you know, the wages we pay are barely above, above the poverty level. And um, we, you know, we've had to uh, deal with increased benefits costs over the last few years and expect that to keep increasing. Um, and this causes, you know, a challenge for us to retain staff. Um, we've been having to increase overtime and, and temporary costs, agency temporary costs, um, which really just doesn't give our staff a good career path. So again, we're looking for that um, funding increase of 461 million over five years. Um, and to keep the index um, increases in, to, to inflation so that we could keep pace over the next um, years in the future. So I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to, to testify today. And um, thanks again for your time, um, which I know has been a long day for you guys. Thank you. Well, you know, Mr. Valentine, we think it's been a long lot of years for you. So we're trying to figure it out. So you, you not, not to worry, we're okay. Um, Appreciate that. Uh, no problem. Up next is Jennifer Paradise. Hi, good evening, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for hearing my testimony today on House Bill 6439. A special thanks to Representative Kennedy, who uh, understands the important work being done in Milford to end homelessness, as she has continuously rolled up her sleeves to support the needs of the center um, and knows how essential these funds are to our continued progress. Um, my name is Jennifer Paradis, and as I mentioned, I'm honored to serve as the executive director of the Bethel Center in Milford. Um, we provide emergency homeless uh, uh, response services, including diversion, outreach and engagement, and emergency shelter for men, women, families, and veterans, as well as permanent supportive housing and soup kitchen services. Um, I'm also a resident of Middletown. Um, and I think it's necessary to share that there were years of my life as a high schooler and a young adult where I did not have an address, um, experiencing homelessness from ages 15 to 21. 
With this said, this is my life work and the life work of many of my colleagues who you will hear from today and have already heard from. I'm a member of the statewide Reaching Home campaign to prevent and end homelessness in Connecticut, focusing on the efficiency and the effectiveness of the coordinated access network and ensuring that the system is responsive to those with the highest barriers to accessing assistance, people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. I'm also proud to serve on the board of the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness. As we come before you today and throughout the legislative session with our many hats and asks, please note that it's because we are so acutely aware of the needs of our program guests, staff, and community that we ask for the specific needs that we know will get us closer to ending homelessness. It is no longer a matter of if, but when. The COVID-19 pandemic turned the lights on to how underfunded our essential services have been. While communities closed out of fear and necessity, our shelters were spaces of warmth, information, education, PPE, food, shelter, safety. We are still doing that emergency work today. We are an essential part of the state's crisis response system and public health system. I can personally share the number of occasions in which I have donned full PPE and entered one of our COVID-19 isolation rooms, bringing food, clothing, toiletries, and human connection checking on the well-being of those diagnosed with this deadly virus, how many nights I've spent in quarantine in my own home, afraid to pass along the virus to the ones I love. And I can name the 25 staff at the Bethel Center who have done the exact same thing over the past year. Those staff deserve to be compensated at a professional pay scale that invests in them as they have invested in, uh, in their clients in our community. However, that has not been, to your point, Senator Austin, the legislative's priority over the past years. And so we must now deal with the harsh reality that at times our staff become our clients overnight. With this said, I respectfully request that the committee support many proposals um, outlined today. Um, and I've submitted a, a written testimony that's more at length, but I wanna highlight the, the, the primary ones of importance. Supporting the proposed uh, DEMAS uh, housing support services item at 23.4 billion. <coughs> Targeted investments to the housing supports and, and services line, um, including the support, uh, excuse me, support services to the 300 households and scattered site and developed units. I also request the 375,000 in new funding to the DEMAS housing and support line services for enhanced outreach services that would enable us to better identi identify people experiencing unsheltered homelessness and support to the uh, uh, Community Nonprofit Alliance proposal to restore 460 million over five years in community nonprofits. Funding for nonprofits, including those working to end homelessness does not adequately cover the costs and demands for service. I thank you all so much for your work um, and for the opportunity to present testimony. And I look forward to continuing our work to end homelessness together. Thank you very much, Jennifer. We appreciate that. Um, you know, this is always one of our more favorite public hearings. I wouldn't say that except for the, you know, because it's long, but it's when we actually get to hear the detail from people, not from, uh, not from um, a piece of paper. It's not really about the numbers on a piece of paper. It's about the day-to-day -day people that have to deal with this issue. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, I just want to let my colleagues know that um, uh, we have finished five out of seven pages of people um, to talk today. We have two more pages, about two, two and a half hours left. Uh, so um, uh, make your chairs comfortable. We still have a little bit of time left. So uh, up next is Diane Millan. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Diane Mian. I've worked at Marrakesh for over 30 years, a private nonprofit agency that supports over a thousand people with disabilities and similar service needs with over 700 essential employees throughout Connecticut. I'm here to ask you the same as everyone else, increase funding by the full 461 million in, by 2026, appropriate 128 million in new funding for fiscal 2022, index increase to inflation to ensure that the state funding keeps pace with increased costs in the future and hold nonprofits financially harmless from the impact of COVID-19. When I turned 60 in January, I realized I spent half my life working at Marrakesh. I began a career as an essential frontline worker. My daughter is learning about Marrakesh's role in people's lives. In fact, during her college years, she worked at Marrakesh because I made her. 
And she ended up with Youth with Challenges, which helped her in her college studies of music and education. Being a teacher, you have to be able to deal with many different people. I also have a nephew who has intellectual disabilities. My heart. <laughs> One day he too may need these services and I only hope that we're keeping pace so that he can have the best possible. My current role is as vice president of risk management. My job is multifaceted. However, over the past year, I've spent countless hours listening to employees who needed to take leave in order to care for their children who were home for remote learning, who had no daycare because of closures, who had, were sick or their family members were sick and their fears about how they will get unemployment and afford to live without their multiple jobs, which are usually in human services. Hours I spent with them, multiple phone calls, since the pandemic, our remaining employees have worked tirelessly to support people 24 seven. We've kept everyone else employed. We've had no layoffs other than people who had to leave because of other reasons. Um, and we made changes to our programs. We protected the health and safety of our staff and our employees and the people we serve by creating models and tax task forces to limit human to human exposures by making door to door deliveries. Task forces delivered PPE, food, completed laundry, put together activity supplies, drive-bys for happy birthdays to keep people engaged. They were awesome. We're deemed critically essential employees, yet Marrakesh and other human service private nonprofits have not received a cost of living increase since 2007. There was nothing paid to nonprofits to pay for our medical benefit increases, our retirement savings, our program upgrades, etc. for 14 years. So why do I stay? I work at Marrakesh because I care about the people here, my co-workers and the people we support. I have 30-year relationship. People call me all the time. It's hard enough. Okay. Um, it's hard enough to recruit employees to work in our programs due to pay rates, cost and benefit coverage, responsibilities in the pandemic. Without fixing the years with no increases, I don't know how we will keep going in the future. And I worry about my nephew because one day he will too need these services when his parents aren't able to be there for him. And Auntie Di won't be here to help him out, more than likely. Um, so please support us in your endeavors and thank you for your long hours. Thank you for your testimony. I Somebody's got either got a pet or their microphones, uh, something's great because I can, it, as you were testifying, I could see or hear, I mean, I could hear something going by. So you got this one, Representative Walker for now? Yes, I've got this one. Thanks. Thank Kat. you. <laughs> um, but thank you. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for your, your, your advocacy and your hard work and for staying this long to do, uh, to testify. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, next is Paul Ackard, and after Paul Ackard, Selena Kum, Kum, Kumper, 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 Selena. Uh, Selena is number uh, one fifty. She is in the panel. She's she's in the panel. Okay, good. Okay, all right. Good, good, uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. I think we're evening now. I, I think we are, Representative Walker. Thank you, and, and S Senator Osten and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Paul Acker. I am the Program Manager of Advocacy and Education at Advocacy Unlimited, uh, a peer-run organization in the state of Connecticut, um, and a registered voter of the town of Portland. Uh, my written testimony has been submitted, so I'm going to try and be brief. I, I think we've all heard that the current budget going forward as it is, isn't going to work for a lot of people. Um, and I want to make sure that the other thing that I've heard throughout the day gets amplified because I know a lot of people have been saying $461 million. Um, what I want to bring to your attention is the call for peer respite. Uh, through DEMAS services. Many people um, see this as a way that we can help the state save money as a kind of uh, um, 
diversion from the emergency room, pure respites. We're we're asking for one in each Demas region so that there so that there is some equity among the states, uh, because usually what happens is we get one and it's in one area and the rest of the state doesn't get it. And so we want to try and spread the wealth throughout the state. We're asking for six million for startup costs and then five million in the annuals um, after that to run these. Um, on average, um, a peer respite uh, would be able to take um, at least four to six people out of out of the ER and give people a choice who are in crisis. Right now, a lot of uh, what we've been what I've been hearing the state looking at for for crisis is basically just changing the nozzle at which people end up in the ER. And I'm hoping that we can offer alternatives to people that are going to help save the state some money and take some pressure off of the ERs. Um, I, I included a, a, a study uh, that was published in JAMA that actually shows that someone going to the ER for, for depression and suicide is 100 times more likely to, to complete suicide in the weeks following their hospitalization. Um, and a lot of this is because you cannot find an unlocked psych ward in the state of Connecticut. Um, people go in and right away they're, they're assumed to be an escape risk because who in their right mind wouldn't want to spend a week in, the, in you know, a psych hospital. Um, and so we want to try and find ways that we can help the state save money so that we can free up money to be spent elsewhere um, as opposed to a crisis situation. Um, right now, um, Advocacy Unlimited, Connecticut Legal Rights Project, uh, Keep the Promise Coalition, NAMI Connecticut, um, a group called Seeds and Sprouts in New Haven, and Black Lives Matter New Haven has come out in support of this. We want to try and build these uh, respites in a way that we can promote equity amongst the citizens of our state and to give people real choices when it comes to how they want their crisis addressed. So with that, I want to say thank you and, and hopefully you'll have a shorter night. <laughs> thank you and thank you for, for being considerate, but it, it is important that we do get to hear because it, the, the messages that you all are giving us, they should be embedded in our, in our hearts and our minds by the end of this evening at least. And we will have another evening so Tomorrow we'll be here at the same amount of time because we have a uh, human services uh, hearing tomorrow, but it's important that we hear it and you guys are going through it more than than anything. So this is the least that we can do is give you the opportunity and, and the dignity to to talk to us about the issues with hopeful and results that will help all of us. So thank you. We, we, we want to try and help the best that we can. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Uh, Selena, uh, number 150. Selena. Hello. Hey there. Um, good evening, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Selena Kemper. I'm a director at Journey Found. We're an organization based out of Manchester. We provide services for people with disabilities um, throughout North Central and Southeastern Connecticut. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on HB 6439. And like many of my peers, and like you've heard probably 150 times today, um, I'm here to respectfully request that the legislature appropriate $461 million over five years for community nonprofits. Um, I, I, it, it saddens me to feel when I was writing this that I could essentially copy and paste most of my testimony from the testimony I gave last year at the exact same time. Um, I will let a lot of my peers do that and go through the numbers and all the facts that everybody um, is pretty well aware of. I'm not going to repeat that. This year it's a lot more personal. Um, Recently, I described kind of what this, what I've been going through, what we've been going through in this field. Um, I, I described it to a peer and I said, it's almost like bombs dropping every single day. You can't avoid it. You just scramble to pick up the pieces and try and make sure everybody's safe. Um, but these people we support and the incredible staff keep me going because failure is not an option. We can rest when we win the war. 
And when I wrote that, I had two group homes under my direction that were COVID positive um, that uh, resulted in 11 people impacted. Uh, almost all the staff were out at both houses. I had two staff and two people supported in the hospital. And one of those people was almost 80 years old. And as I stood in her COVID isolation unit, all I could think was that I promised her sister that she would not die alone. We, she's been with us for so many years. Um, and she made it through that night against all odds. And as our staff kept showing up in that COVID isolation room on their own time, since we were no longer able to bill for services after she was admitted, um, miraculously, she came back to us. And to this day, her sister swears it was the love and support from her staff that, that brought her back. And, and this is, this is what we do every day uh, between December and January as an administrative staff and kind of the, the backup when everything else fails. I was working over 90 hours a week in addition to my 24 seven on call. Um, I've worked shifts over 24 hours. I've had staff stuck in shifts for over 48 hours in storms because there's just nobody left. There's nobody left to relieve them. Um, I've had staff move into COVID positive programs so that they wouldn't expose their families working 18 hour shifts with six hour breaks. I've had staff living in their own basements, not because they were afraid of um, infecting their family with anything, but because we support a lot of people who have extremely compromised medical systems and a lot of people for, for whom this virus could be an, a, a death sentence. And they were so worried about things that their family would bring home to them and they would then bring into the group homes that they were living in their own basements to avoid exposure to their own family. And th these staff are, uh, they're doing this for $15 an hour. I have witnessed um, so many direct support staff change their entire lives over this past year to keep people we support safe. It isn't just me working this many hours, we all are because there just aren't any options left and we refuse to give up on the amazing people that we support. I've watched our staff put the lives of the people we support before their own and those of their family. And I've seen too many people not able to handle it. But the dedication I've seen from those of us still standing is something I will not soon forget. Uh, what it comes down to is, is you know, we do, we do this every year and at this point, um, sorry, the money isn't available, just isn't an option anymore. If we as a state value the vital services nonprofits provide and the people we support, Connecticut has to find a way uh, to fund it so that we can hold this system together. In a state, in a country where we focus on job creation and unemployment, we can't hire anyone because we can't pay, pay people enough to be willing to do this job, especially during a pandemic. Um, the people we support require hands-on care. There's no social distancing. Uh, you're working in hospitals. You're working in um, COVID positive homes. Um, those of us still doing this are doing it because we love the people we support and because we know that there's nobody else. And how many people do you know who would be willing to do what I've described for $15 an hour? And I want you to think about if you had a loved one with a disability being supported in this system, who would you want supporting them? Would you want the staff that's on a 48 hour shift or the one working three jobs trying to make ends meet or the temp agency staff that the person's never met before because we just don't have anybody left? This is, it's not a low skill job. We support these people in every aspects of their lives. We run the home, the finances, we pay the bills, we provide and arrange their medical care. We provide clinical support, follow individualized and in-depth behavior plans required to keep the people we support safe. We track all their behaviors. We track all their food take, intake. We track all their medications. And all of those things are secondary to actually supporting the people that we are working with to live the life that they want to live. The amazing people we support and the incredible staff to support them deserve better. And Connecticut needs to do better because this system is literally falling apart. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and thank you for, for staying late in your advocacy. Have a good evening. Thank you. Karen Niak. And is Tracy Lowell here? She is. Yes, okay. And uh, Tina Mart Martir. Martir? Yes, she is also here. 
Okay, and Lynette Singleton. He is not currently here yet. Okay, all right. Karen, go right ahead. I, I, that was a wonderful job from Selena. I'm here to speak for Selena and all the other care providers that have been at this meeting here today. Um, thank you, distinguished members of the Appropriation Committee for giving me the opportunity to hear my humble request for increased funding for the nonprofit organizations in Connecticut. Um, this would be Bill 6439. My name is Karen Neag, and I love someone with a rare disability who relies solely upon services provided by nonprofit organizations. My daughter, Stephanie, requires around the clock full assistance for every aspect of her wellness. Stephanie needs to have care providers for personal hygiene, overall safety, medical attention, physical health, occupational development, as well as social and recreational enjoyment, all of which are provided by paid professionals from a nonprofit organization such as Oak Hill. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Thank you for, for, for your testimony and thank thank you for the support that you provide. You're 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 muted. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. Yeah. Um, I was I was wondering because I was like that she didn't finish her sentence, but I didn't <laughs> I didn't know. Okay. So my daughter is very beautiful and as beautiful as she is, she's equally challenging, active and demanding of care from the direct court staff. To date, I believe the staff has not been recognized or valued within the budget for many years. I'm not a stranger to this committee because I've come to the table with several requests for increased funding. I don't know why that keeps doing that. Um, for more than 14 years now. My daughter is 24 years old now and the lack of funding has a long history. And this is what the history would look like. This is her, three years old, me putting her on a bus to a special needs program. And um, now she has graduated from Oak Hill. I'm sorry, it was in my, my letter, but she's graduated from Oak Hill and now lives in a group home in Torrington with her peers. So there's a lot of people that this budget has forgotten over the years. The lack of funding for this length of time has made future generations struggle for their loved ones to have quality services and quality environments in which living and school environments. Lack of funding means nonprofits have to tread in water in the development of future group homes. Uh, they struggle in the development of providing better technology, retaining their personnel for uh, livable wages. This budget shapes many lives that are both in need of the increased funding like Stephanie, as well as the personnel delivering services for a living. There's a very large number of Connecticut residents that are forgotten within the year's budget. If ever there was a budget that the committee should take pride in providing nonprofit organizations, as it is this year. I've witnessed the COVID-19 effects on care providers and felt a huge gratitude for the care given to Stephanie. The direct, the, the direct care providers have done curriculum action in providing and protecting my daughter's health and well-being during an unpracticed, unimaginable, and demanding crisis such as COVID-19. Staff came to work on a daily basis with the fear of a deadly virus. Karen, yeah, can you can you wrap up a little because it's it, it's gone past the three minute time, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, well, well, thank you very much for your time and attention to uh, increasing the budget for my daughter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we have Tracy Lowell. Are you, tr Tracy, you're muted. You're still muted. Um, I'm sorry, my power just went out for the oh. second time today. Um, so I apologize. Okay. I can't, I can't read my notes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So real quick, uh, I come here with, uh, I, I appreciate your uh, time with everyone who's been speaking. I come here with three different hats. I'm going to take on and off quickly. I first come with a family member. My nephew lives in a group home and I've seen the 
just the, uh, the downward spiral of, of, of care because of uh, staffing shortages, uh, lack of training. It, it's, it's, his care has really been affected, affected by the, um, the budget shortfalls. Um, secondly, I'm probably 25 years on the DDS South Region's Human Rights Committee. And I've watched uh, over that time, the budget affect how agencies can provide services and how it affects individuals' human rights because the money just isn't there to do things right all the time. It's really heartbreaking. Um, and, and finally, uh, my hat as a, I'm the um, Director of Individual and Family Support at Benhaven. Uh, over 30 years, I, um, we have been um, providing support to families or, or individuals who, who live independently. Um, it, uh, it's been a challenge this year in the time of COVID. Um, we have direct support staff going out, taking people out in their cars. You can't social distance. It's been um, an unbelievably big challenge. And I, I am so unbelievably proud of the staff's um, commitment to what they've done. The, um, the piece that I, that I wanna focus on, however, is probably the BSP, the Behavior Support Program because all the numbers, all the, all the testimony has been so wonderful from the providers and the families about uh, the DDS cuts and the, and the DEMAS cuts. Um, but, but behavior support program has taken hit after hit, year after year. I don't know, it's probably 20 years I've been going to Hartford trying to advocate for that program. The, both BSP and the ISP program, I think saves the state money we allow families to continue working when we're caring for their folks who live at home. It's so much less expensive a service than having folks in congregate settings. The BSP program helps families learn skills to manage the extremely challenging behaviors of their children. And I just, I, I don't understand why it's been the victim of budget cuts year after year. And I'd really appreciate if somebody could take a look at what a valuable service that is to families in Connecticut. I thank you for your time. I apologize for my technical problem with having no power. I'm sitting here in the dark. I'll end there and thank you for your time. I, I want to thank you for being a trooper and saying you're going to reach a virgin no matter what. I expected you to light a candle and read something. I, I didn't know. But thank you, well, <laughs> thank you so I, much for doing Thank you. Uh, I'll light a candle now and, I'll, and maybe that candle will be the, the candle that, that's lit to uh, help the funding get, get in. All those numbers are in my testimony. You've heard them enough. Thank you so much. Thank you. And good luck with your electricity. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Uh, Tina Martir, Materi? Tina Materi, one, uh, number 153? Yes, Tina Martiri. Okay. Go right Hello, ahead. everyone. And I know it's been a long, long day, and tomorrow's even longer. But I do want to say thank you to the esteemed group here for listening and for allowing us to have this day to testify. Um, my name is Tina Martieri, um, and I'm echoing what Tracy Flood, our president of Class Poems, and Siobhan Haran um, said earlier, but I just wanted to say I've been in the special needs field the majority of my life. I started as a special needs teacher in the public and private sector, worked family support in DMR, I'm dating myself, um, now DDS and private families, and I am the proud Nona of my rock star grandson who has autism, and he just rocks. But when I came to CLASP almost 30 years ago, it was like coming home. And as you know from Tracy earlier, it's a nonprofit, smaller agency. Um, we have wonderful, wonderful folks. Um, I've been part of the CLASP family for close to 30 years, and as an ambassador for our folks, I am happy to have the opportunity to talk today about the huge need to increase the wages in our field across the board. Um, our folks are entrusted to our care, and even in the worst of times, um, with the least amount of money, we take the very, very best care of our family, and we won't compromise the quality of our service. So that leads to doing things, being underpaid, underfunded, like everyone else has echoed today. Um, having said that, it's just not okay that we can't make ends meet with our job's wages. Too often we find our staff and so many of us being forced for economic reasons to work two, three, and sometimes even four jobs 
just to supplement the much-needed money that we need to take care of our own families as well. The strain of such a schedule, the impact it has on people's health, well-being, and family life is just immense. And yet the smiles constantly emerge when our group home door opens. The work we do will always be needed, and it is critical for our folks' quality of life and well-being, as well as for our staff's quality of life. Our CLASP family has never been us and them. We have always been just one family, and this is our main focus. It is our grateful hope, like everyone else today, that you will ease the worry with financial increase in this economic situation, enabling us to keep the main focus the main focus. That's it. Thank you so much for listening Thank and you. letting me testify. Thank you. I had Thank video you. problems, so I had to go on the phone. That's that's okay. <laughs> it seems like the weather is not helping us in our in our public hearing tonight because we're starting to see more people affected by the, the storms or the winds and things. Yeah. So thank you so much though for, for testifying that that shows that you were dedicated you are dedicated to making us um, address, address the, the, the funding issues that uh, Demas <clears throat> and DDS are struggling with. So thank you again. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Um, Lynette Singleton? He is not here, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Denise Henry? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, good evening, Madam Chair and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in HV 6439. I'm Denise Henry, the CEO for Sarah Inc. Our agency delivers early intervention services and supports for adults with intellectual disabilities to more than 1,400 people in 50 towns across five counties. We're able to do this work thanks to our more than 130 employees that live and work in all your communities. I'm here to once again respectfully request that the legislator appropriate 461 million over five years for community nonprofits to help make us whole after years of underfunding. I say once again, because at this time last year, just before we had to radically change how we live and work, I sat before this committee making a case for the very same request. Now a year later, nonprofits have been further strained by the costs associated with continuing throughout this pandemic to safely deliver essential services to the people and communities we support. I can't say enough about the dedication and the resiliency of our staff. It is thanks to them we have been able to continue our work Make no mistake, the work of our adult services staff has always been challenging, but now even more so. Our staff had to juggle virtual learning for their children, unpredictable in-person learning school schedules, and the threats of COVID-19 in order to financially support their families. Similar to other nonprofits, many of our employees are women and from minority communities. A funding increase for nonprofits will help stabilize and strengthen our businesses, and it will mean a pay increase for our staff. Our direct support staff deserve to make a living wage. This is a social justice issue. This is an equity issue. It is also simple math. We won't, we won't be able to continue to hire and retain staff if their pay does not outpace the state minimum wage increases. As dire as this situation is, and it certainly is as you all heard today, this time virtually sitting before you, I have more hope than I ever have before. I have hope that this is following the year nonprofits will receive the funding increase needed to remain in business and pay our staff a better wage. I am hopeful because this year when speaking with legislators from both sides of the aisle about the need for a funding increase, you get it. You know we have been chronically underfunded, that the pandemic has proven especially difficult for many of us, and that a funding increase can no longer wait. Legislators are always appreciative of our work, which we nonprofits welcome. But this needs to be the year your words are turned into action by committing to an increase in funding by the full 461 million. I truly hope that it is for the sake of the people who need our services and the dedicated employees that are long overdue a living wage. Thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for hanging in there today. I know it's been a long day for all of you. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Have a good evening. Thank you. Uh, Nathan Wise? Uh, not here, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Joseph, uh, 157, Joseph Cynthia. Good, yes, Joseph, 157. Yes, you're, you're still muted, sir. Can you hear me now? Yep. 
Well, I'm not just an advocate, I'm a client. Uh, good evening, uh, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee, including my representative, Geraldo Reyes. My name is uh, Joseph J. Cynthia, and I'm a registered independent voter from Waterbury, Connecticut. I rely on services from Mental Health Connecticut for my continuing recovery. In the past, I have been homeless and suicidal, and services from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and Mental Health Connecticut are vital to ensuring my continuing mental health so I could be a good member of society and an asset to the community. Uh, some of the things they do for me is they provide me with a psychiatrist at Demas. I have a worker there that makes sure that I'm all right, uh, gives me a call. Uh, it's very important uh, now that I don't have any, any natural supports during this COVID virus crisis. I have a worker also at Mental Health Connecticut to assist me at the Independence Center, a recovery resource center. Uh, I do mending art at Mental Health Connecticut to help me to relax and use my emotions positively. Uh, I have a mental, mental health problems since I was 17 and uh, I have bad thoughts unless I keep myself busy. And their mending art phone workshops keep me busy and give me positive things to do. Uh, they have a writing class that helps me to tell my story in words like, like I'm doing now. I get employment assistance with Mental Health Connecticut through Choices. They have food assistance uh, with weekly food deliveries of healthy meals. I get a monthly food bank that uh, helps me with my monthly food budget and encourages healthy eating. And other workshops offered by Mental Health Connecticut and the Independence Center to help me pass the time. These are essential for maintaining my mental health, especially during this time of the COVID-19 virus crisis. It helps me so much that I feel the need to advocate for them in the budget to see to it that I and others like me can receive these services in the future. This has made me politically active and feel more part of the community. Being disabled doesn't mean that I and others like me cannot be able to be good citizens and assets to our community. I hope the budget does not get cut, but rather increased to meet the needs during this trying time. I've, I've been here all day watching these, uh, these great people who put in such a dedication like, uh, like I've seen with uh, Mental Health Connecticut. And they're, all, they're, all they're asking for is a raise. I mean, uh, you, you probably get a raise every year. The Congress it, it gets a raise every year. It's, it's unfortunate that we don't, we don't uh, appreciate what we have here and how important it is for our communities. And, uh, you know, at this time, every dollar can be allocated to mental health and especially nonprofits to assist people during this crisis, because this pandemic has, has uh, totally changed people's lives. It's, it's done terrible things to people's social lives, and it's uh, kept people away from their families. I mean, we need mental health uh, people more than we've ever needed before. So thank you for listening to my testimony, and I hope we can count on you to do what is right and necessary during this dark time in our history. Thank you. Thank you for coming on and advocating for us. And I just want to give you a point of information. And, and I'm not complaining, but we, we've never gotten a raise. So <laughs> oh, maybe okay. I, I, I saw some of my colleagues when you said that they all gave me this look like, who got a raise? <laughs> but that, it, that, is not, that is not the issue. The issue is we should be paying people for the job that they're doing. And that's the most important thing. And the people that are working with our kids and our families need to have a raise. So we hear you and thank you for your support. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Anne Roy, I don't see Anne on here. I'm here. <laughs> well, I, I don't I don't see you on the on the on the board. I think oh, I think Representative Terziak sees me. He's waving, but <laughs> I see you. How are you? Go right ahead, ma'am. Uh, very good, very good. And I want to um, thank all of you for being the legislative advocates that we all need in the nonprofit community, because looking at your faces, um, I know you're listening and, and hearing the stories from new advocates, um, more veteran advocates um, like myself that have come before appropriations for many years. Um, but I thank you for the listening because we had over a hundred members from the Kinetic Nonprofit Alliance um, that were 
you know, on your roster today to speak about, you know, our, our issue in terms of lack of funding. So as you know, I'm here uh, to speak uh, about HB 6439. My name is Amaret, and I'm actually um, proud to be the CEO of CCARC in New Britain for four more months. Um, I've announced my retirement. <laughs> So, but you won't, uh, you'll continue to see me because advocacy is in my blood. Uh, but your public services, I know, having served in the legislature is really um, untelling and being here as long as you've been is so important. But this past year, really, I think out of my 26 years has really tested the waters uh, for so many nonprofits um, and particularly our direct support staff. And hearing from many of them today, um, they've articulated it better than I ever can. But as a leaders of organizations um, like CCRC, we hear every day from staff. You know, I think the number was 75% of our staff are working multiple jobs, sometimes two and three other jobs. That shouldn't be, they are direct support professionals. Um, we, we actually do whatever we can to entice them, to incentivize them, to come into work, particularly during this past year. Um, anything that we could giving them premium pay, which doesn't even compare to um, pay that Amazon is giving to their employees as they walk into the door. So, you know, these are our employees that have actually high risk positions. Um, they work um, changing, you know, individuals, you know, I, I love to see young, young uh, men come into our, our workforce and all of a sudden are faced with having to change um, and diaper some of the individuals that they support. It's a humbling, um, difficult job that, you know, most people will never do. I heard someone say they had their son work. Um, I've had both my sons go through uh, work at my agency at one point in, in my history there. And it humbles them, it teaches them to go into whatever life work that they, they choose. Um, and they've all chosen something different than human services. I don't know why, but uh, they, they, they have learned you know, in that experience. But this past year, as I mentioned, has just been uh, very difficult for all the nonprofit providers, 24-7, um, uh, when everyone else is sitting home, Zooming, our employees are going to work. So this is the year, this is the time, please, as a retirement gift, can you please do the $461 million over five years? It is uh, critical. Our expenses continue to go up. We have 11 homes in the greater New Britain community uh, that really... Uh, have sustained itself. We've had, people have mentioned about uh, donors and fundraisers. We've been fortunate within our agency. They have stepped up and kind and generous, but it could never, never meet the actual cost of providing these services. So it is more than critical this year. And I've, I've said it before, if not now, when? Uh, this is your opportunity to do the right thing. I am so grateful for uh, Representative Austin and Senator o Representative Walker and Senator Austin who came out right ahead of the game here and uh, supported this initiative. So we thank you. I thank you. Um, our board of directors who are all volunteers um, really can't understand, you know, some of how the state works in terms of our contracting um, and are baffled, you know, that we don't get increases on an annual basis. So I thank you and appreciate your time and effort. And I wanted to leave with this one photo because not only as a uh, leader of an organization, a past, a former legislator, but now I'm an auntie to this very sweet little boy, Kyrie, who, you know, for me, advocacy for the future is even more critical. So um, you'll, you'll continue to see me after this year. Thank so, you. Thank you, and thank you for your advocacy. And I, I thank you for also all the work that you did in the legislature to promote nonprofits also. So thank you and all the things that you've done. Right, and we hear you. you. We all hear right. you. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Have a good evening. You too. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Weiblin. Good evening. Good evening, I had to unmute, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, That's all right. Good evening, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. I want to thank you for the eight plus hours that you've already put in listening to testimony today. 
Um, one of the difficult things about being number 159 to testify after eight hours is that everything that I had wanted to say, a lot of it has already been said and been said very well. So I've struggled with what to present to you tonight. So what I wanna talk about is partnership. I hear a lot of talk from the state about the partnership between the nonprofit community and the state. And a partnership is when two people come together to go into business and share in the risks and the rewards of that business. And I'm struggling with what our partnership with the state really is. Our funding since 2007 has remained flat. Our expenses have continued to rise. Where is the partnership in that relationship? To stay in business, we've had to make sacrifices to keep up with the rise in uh, expenses. Our utilities, our repairs and maintenance, um, we're now being charged property tax by municipalities. Um, so how do we manage those increased expenses? Well, we manage it by not paying our employees a living wage, by not providing them with an annual increase, which is so desperately and richly deserved. And it, this lack of funding puts our staff at risk. It puts the individuals that we support at risk. And it, puts the, it jeopardizes the relationship with the families, with the parents, with the brothers and sisters that have entrusted us with their loved one for support. I have 500 employees that work for me at Key that are your constituents. And they're counting on me in these three minutes to impact you and to convince you that they are worthy. There was testimony from three women recently, Amy Stoddard, Kim Ackerman, and Selena uh, Kemper, who all described their experience as a DSP working multiple jobs. My employees, just like them, work multiple jobs. It is not uncommon for most of my employees to have between two and three jobs. And as we talk about partnership, I think about what Amy Stoddard said, where she said she feels exploited. That's very telling. Is a nonprofit relationship with the state a partnership? Or is there exploitation that goes along with that? And that's something that I would like you to think about and that Amy Stoddard has caused me to think about. What is our relationship with the state? What is their expectation of us with the people that we support and the families that we've made promises to? So like everybody else tonight, I'm going to ask, beg, and implore you to consider the increase of $461 million by fiscal year 2026 and the $128 million being appropriated in this fiscal year so that we can have a true partnership with the state and the services that we provide. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you so much. And thank you for, for being with us tonight and, and also supporting your team that's here demonstrating for you. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, Tanisha Baptiste. Hi, good afternoon, actually good evening. Um, um, thank you guys so much for the time and the opportunity. I'm greeting to Senator Austin and Representative Walker and all the members of the committee. Um, my name is Tanisha Jean Baptiste. Um, I live in Hartford, Connecticut. I'm a direct support staff at Mosaic in um, Fruit Home, and I have worked here now for one and a half years. Um, I come before you today um, to express how urgent and necessary the need for increased funding is in group homes like mine. I love my job. I love my job dearly. Um, I definitely think that it's a being a caregiver is a job of the heart before anything else. Um, I enjoy working with my clients. I like having um, a direct impact on their quality of life. Um, it's rewarding to build new relationships with my coworkers as well as the clients that we care for. Um, the work is a very, very important work. And it's not because of, of, of the pandemic. It's not because of the times that we're in, but it's because we are really advocating and being there for the most vulnerable population. And it's not as if, I think it had, this has been mentioned earlier this evening, not necessarily every single person has the heart to do this work. As a society, we need to support this work in any way that we can including financially. 
I became involved with this work during a series of medical complications that was experienced by my father a few years ago. My dad had a diabetic seizure that was followed up by two strokes. Um, it enabled him to end up in a nursing home um, for rehab. And after his numbers of days were up with the insurance company, my dad was placed back in our home. Um, so ultimately, me and my mother um, needed to care for him in our home. I shifted my full time financial services job to remote so I can care for my dad with my mom. He was total care, meaning we had to help him do absolutely everything. This is when I began developing the skills of caring for individuals. And I found it that I was good at it. And I found that it actually brought me great joy. My father was home for a while, but after a mental behavior episode, it was determined that he would be best served in a nursing home permanently where he could have medical services close at him should he need them. After this, I continued doing financial services work full time from home, but decided I would supplement my income by getting a job in a group home. Having experienced caregiving, I knew it was something I was good at, and I knew it was incredibly important work. A short time later, I got a job at Mosaic in Hartford. I was immediately shocked by the low pay. It, if I did not have my second job, um, I don't know how I could survive off of what Mosaic currently pays us. I have a daughter. I am a single mom. And I have no idea how my fellow coworkers make it work. Similar to what has already been shared, a lot of my coworkers do work more than one job, as I do myself. The only reason that I am able to get by, pay my bills, and save a little bit is because I work over 80 hours a week and I have a really good primary job. My coworkers are not as fortunate. While they provide life-changing and uplifting care to our clients, they are paid poverty wages. The wages do not match the work. Group home workers making $14 to $15 an hour is unrealistic, not when the federal government is trying to pass $15 across the board for minimum wage. Mm -hmm. How can anyone be expected to support a family on this wage? Everyone wants to save money and to achieve financial security and stability, but with this wage, it doesn't allow for that. Low wages also make it very difficult to retain talented caregivers, as mentioned prior as they will leave seeking higher wages just for bare survival. This rampant turnover often results in poor staffing levels, which negatively impacts the quality of care that we're able to provide to our clients. At the end of the day, we know that this work is important. It's been shown over the years. It's been shown greatly with the pandemic. As mentioned before, me and my coworkers, we couldn't zoom in. We couldn't take care of clients. We had to go in and were deemed essential when it was when it counted. Our clients and their families. Could, could you sum up a little, a little over the, the three minute mark? Okay, of course. And it is clear um, that the state um, does not understand this. Otherwise, they would put their money where their mouth is and increase funding for group homes so my coworkers and I can have a living wage. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you for staying to testify. And, and thank, thank you for taking care of your dad and learning. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Next, Have a great evening. You too. Next, Wendy Marku. Yes. Can yes. you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good evening, Senator Liston and Representative Walker and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Wendy Marku and I live in South Windsor. And I am a direct support professional for whole life. I am here today to talk about the need to fund private providers in DDS because workers like me need higher wages and benefits that can actually, we can actually afford. Caring for people has always been a passion of mine. I first began working with children and eventually moved to working with adults. Within my position at Whole Life, I care for people with mental and physical disabilities. I help them learn new skills that they can use in their everyday lives. Through this work, you develop bonds with individuals you care for and fulfilling to see them do well, and you know you've helped them. While I enjoy doing this work at Whole Life, I feel disrespected whenever I attempt to utilize our health insurance plan. The monthly premiums are manageable, but the deductible is backbreaking. For individual plans, the deductible is $3,500, which means unless I am in need of a serious procedure, I must pay out of pocket. And furthermore, I make too much money to qualify for health 
So unless I want to be uninsured, I am stuck with this plan. The wage I earn is considered too rich, too rich for Husky in which I have to make choices between paying my bills and buying groceries. I rage for more financial security and the ability to afford my bills, which I have hard time putting food on the table. I'm not paid enough to keep up with the typical expenses for my life. For instance, when Connecticut was ravaged by tropical storms this past year, I had to take out a loan to fix my home. That has put me back financially. How am I supposed to live off of nothing in the middle of a pandemic? In working as a direct support professional, I am tasked on a daily basis with caring for others. But I live in constant fear that something will happen to me and there will be no one to care for me. When you board a plane, you are told that in case of an emergency, you should take care of yourself first before you take care of others. So how can we expect as professionals to, and caregivers to continue serving their communities? We do next to nothing to ensure to care for themselves. Please do the right thing and fund our services so we can continue to provide services for our individuals. It is very important. So caregivers like me can urge a wage and have benefits that allow us to do our jobs with the peace of mind and support that we need. Thank you for your time and my testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you for your testimony. Thank you for staying for the evening. So thank, have you. A thank you. You as uh, well. Thank you. Uh, Chris McNabb. Nabo. Good evening, Senator Austin, Representative Walker and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Chris McNabo and I'm founder and CEO of Horizons. I have submitted my testimony for your review and I have some additional thoughts. I wanna thank you both Senator Austin and Representative Walker for your leadership support at the press conference. You understand. If passed, the 461 million we are advocating for will be spread across all of the social service providers, not just the DDS providers. And that amount will get us to where we should have been in 2007. 2007, not 2021. About 15 years ago, the state made the decision to privatize more services. Why? Because we're closer to our communities. We live there too. We know our employers. We know the employers that we're trying to get our folks jobs with because we shop there too. We have the relationships. We can make the kind of connections that enable people with disabilities shine. We go to bat for them. The state by its very nature can't do that. The bureaucracy in acquiring rentals, building homes, finding jobs, getting vendors for supplies, even the lag in communicating between state departments is often mind boggling. Private providers are agile. For many years, we couldn't pay our staff enough because we're not funded to pay more. And that has to change. Every day, we are closer and closer to a staffing calamity. We're losing staff much faster than we can hire them. And here's the kicker we're still having some of our well-trained and brightest staff leave us for state positions because we can't pay them enough, but the state can? Now, how can that be right? The cost of constantly hiring and training is exorbitant and we're in competition with every industry in Connecticut. Horizons does this work less expensively than the state ever did or could ever do even with the proposed increase of 461 million. We need to offer wages of at least $18 to $22 an hour to be more adequately compensating our staff. And that needs to be indexed to keep pace with the rising cost of living in Connecticut. The nonprofit community provides over 90% of the services to Connecticut citizens with developmental disabilities. If the COVID crisis didn't galvanize the need for our essential workers, then what will? We can't make more widgets to bring in more funds to pay our staff. Please tell the governor that. Please act now to rest, rectify this situation. Only you can. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for, for your testimony. And we'll let the governor know for you, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Have a good evening. You as well. Thank you. Uh, Tony Vellucci? I don't see him on the board. Uh, he's currently not here. No. Okay. Um. Julie, and I'm not going to try your last name, Julie. <laughs> Julie Zeligowski. <laughs> well Good, e <laughs> Good evening, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. 
My name is Julie Zaligowski. I'm the Interim Executive Director for Heart United Incorporated, which is headquartered in North Haven, Connecticut. Heart United is a private nonprofit that provides supports to over 150 individuals with developmental disabilities in residential settings to include community living arrangements, independent homes, community resident services, and community companion homes throughout all of Connecticut. Heart United was founded over 38 years ago and our daily mission is to empower individuals with intellectual disabilities, de developmental disabilities, and their families to have more choices and opportunities in the community. We employ over 200 employees. Majority of our staff are working hands-on supporting the individuals in their daily life. They love what they do and they're very dedicated in, uh, to this very vulnerable population that they serve. Our staff are deemed essential but haven't received a COLA increase since 2007. They have to work two jobs, usually putting in anywhere between 60 to 90 hours a week and are still living paycheck to paycheck. They earn a fraction of what the state employees are being paid. And I feel strongly that it's time to end the inequality, reimburse us fairly for our services that we provide and to value the work that we do for the population that we serve. As we all know, minimum wage continues to increase as our direct care staff wages remain flat and have been flat for the last two years at a rate of $14.75 per hour. The private providers will not be able to stay ahead of this minimum wage crunch unless we're right funded and receive ongoing wage adjustments. The direct care job responsibilities include state required annual retrainings de-escalating very complex behaviors in supporting medically compromised clients. The health, safety, and well-being of the individuals we serve are in the hands of our direct support professionals. And providing direct care is far from a minimum wage job. The COVID-19 pandemic has absolutely exasperated the impact of inequity, of inadequate funding for nonprofit services and brought unanticipated and unbudgeted costs and operational challenges such as providing pandemic pay for our essential workers who are there on the front lines and have the higher, highest risk of exposure, requiring us to staff extra shifts during the day hours when our clients would normally be at day programs, but due to the pandemic, day programs were closed. Purchasing computers and printers and online meeting platforms and setting up remote workstations for all of our administrative office staff. So basically community nonprofits provide essential services to every city and town in Connecticut. And um, we're here, I'm here today to respectfully request that the, legislator appropri the legislature appropriate the $461 million over the next five years for community nonprofits. And I want to thank you all this evening for all of your time and the opera opportunity to address this committee. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony tonight. Thank you. Um, I skipped Deborah Lake. I apologize, Deborah. So we'll go back to Deborah Lake and then we'll move forward. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. And thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Deborah. Thank you. I know it's been a long day. Um, good evening. Numbers are running together. <laughs> <laughs> of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Deborah Lake. I am the Director of Program Planning and Implementation at the Governor's Prevention Partnership. We are a statewide youth prevention organization focused on supporting parents, programs, and communities with the best strategies and resources to provide Connecticut's young people with the tools they need to make good decisions. I'm here today in support of prevention work through the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. One of the best aspects of my work is being involved in the statewide youth advisory board supported by DEMIS and local coalitions. The young people involved show leadership in their local communities through peer-to-peer -peer prevention work. This work may include educational campaigns, trainings around how to reduce risky behavior, ways to support mental health, or offer access to a positive social group. As demonstrated in a research, recent research study conducted between October and December 2020 in Connecticut, these youth-led systems are essential. Connecticut youth are facing so many challenges, including increased access to alcohol, 
We know that overall alcohol sales have increased over 50% since uh, 2019 and internet alcohol sales have increased 291%. Our desire for contactless delivery means that packages are now arriving on doorsteps without any interaction between the consumer and the deliverer. According to the Connecticut research, youth believe both in their, that their own and their peers use of alcohol resulted in part from easier access at home compared to other substances. And many young people are reporting that because their parents are drinking more at home, alcohol is more accessible to them either with or without permission. Several young people commented that they were drinking not as they did pre-COVID um, as a partying um, way to escape things, but more now alone out of boredom. So we have the opportunity su to support our young people in reducing and preventing underage drinking, using peers as prevention messengers and focusing on their mental health, well-being and coping skills can increase the likelihood that a young person chooses uh, healthy behaviors. The prevention work done by our organization and many of the other statewide and local organizations supported by DEMIS is a critical way in which to ensure the continued health and success of Connecticut's young people. I want to thank you very much for your support regarding this issue. I hope that you will choose to continue funding and supporting prevention organizations such as the Governor's Prevention Partnership for the future health of our state. Thank you so much. I know it's been a long day. Thank you. And thank you for, for staying. And I apologize for, for skipping over you. I mean, the numbers come, I'm sorry. But thank you for <clears throat> thank you for your testimony. Have a good evening. Thank you, you too. Um, Suzanne Kulagowski. That's interesting. Your the, the, the last part of your name is spelled the same way as the person that testified previously. Like, yes, right. I noticed that yep. the chances of two Polish people in a row, right? <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you so much for all of the time and dedication that you have spent today. We do truly appreciate you sticking here um, through the long day. I'm Kulagowski, President and CEO of ARI of Connecticut. We are among the smallest providers of disability services in the state, based in and solely operating in Stamford since 1952, though we serve individuals from surrounding communities. Our small size is not because we have failed to grow. We have remained intentionally small as we strongly believe in the family-like atmosphere and the benefits that provides for the individuals we serve, especially the many who do not have family members of their own. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on House Bill 6439 today. ARI provides essential services, serving an incredibly vulnerable but awesome population, as you can see from the picture behind me. Just food on their table and clothe their children. They come to work dedicated to the individuals that they serve and committed to doing the best that they can, but they are physically and emotionally exhausted. They have earned and well deserve wages that allow them to support their family while still having time to actually see the family that they are supporting. Do not value. The state's failure to adequately fund our services has resulted in a growing number of vacancies in our direct care positions, higher turnover rates, and hiring staff with fewer qualifications requiring greater training and oversight. All of this has a negative impact on the individuals we serve and the peace of mind of their family members. Where would the state be without community nonprofits? How could anyone justify the current budget and the level funding? for among the most valuable services the state pays for. I implore the legislature to support and fund the request I've heard repeated so many times today, to provide $461 million to get us to where we should be financially for our funding, uh, if our funding had kept up with inflation, $128 million in new funding for fiscal 2022 
which is a net of 67 million to the state after federal reimbursement, to index increases to inflation to ensure that state will keep pace with future costs and to hold nonprofits harmless from the impact of COVID-19. Now is the time to make us whole and to demonstrate how very much you value the services and supports that nonprofits provide for the citizens of our state. Thank you again so much for your time. I truly appreciate all of your support. Have a good thank, evening. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. And you have a good evening too. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jim Williams. Uh, he is not here. The next speaker would be 169, Katie Bonshov. Okay, Katie Bonshov. And then after that will be Rick Sebastian and then Suzanne Pearson, and then Colette uh, Beminent. Uh, Good Katie? evening. Good evening. Can you hear? I'm sorry, I have no video. I'm not sure why, but. Okay, um, that's okay. We can hear you. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you everyone for sticking through this tonight. Um, I particularly want to do a little shout out to Lucy Datham, who knows our service as well here in Norwalk. Uh, my name is Katie Bansaf, and I'm the Executive Director of STAR Inc. Lighting the Way. And we provide services to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, we support over 500 individuals in our greater uh, Fairfield County community. And we employ over 220 staff. I'm so used to saying we employ over 250 staff. But since post-COVID, we have 220 and we're actively looking. And you've heard today repeatedly how hard it is to recruit staff at 1475 an hour in this environment. Um, I'm here to testify on behalf of the House Bill 6439. As you know, agencies like STAR funded through the Department of Developmental Services have not received a COLA since 2007. And while we're very grateful for the wage increase we received a couple of years ago, bringing our direct care staff up to 1475, there's been no increase since, and there's been nothing to keep pace with inflation and all the other expenses that we've incurred. Prior to the pandemic, STAR struggled to recruit and retain qualified direct support staff in Fairfield County. Then March comes, COVID-19 comes, and during this pandemic, along with other service agencies, STAR has worked diligently and I'm proud to say successfully to keep the people we support and their staff safe. We never closed our doors to our residences. And in fact, when um, faced with an exposure or a COVID positive situation, our amazing staff stepped up and provided safe and compassionate care, often joining the quarantine at the group home as a means to keep other residents, other staff, and their own families safe. We have certainly witnessed heroes in action. They have learned and followed and implemented all the PPE and safety protocols, and they continue to walk into COVID positive environments undaunted for 14.75 an hour. When it was determined that it may not be safe for the day programs to operate uh, early on in the pandemic when closed between March and July at DDS's request, um, and as employers shuttered their own doors to over 74 of our supported employees out in competitive jobs, our incredibly creative and flexible staff developed remote services, um, at which we continue today offering programming five days a week, up to six hours a day. Um, and as you heard earlier today from our superstar, Joey Agostino, um, that's been a lifeline for our individuals, um, keeping them connected, learning new skills, retaining skills, and mostly helping um, avoid the so social isolation that so many of our folks have been uh, subjected to. Flexibility has been the key to our success. We didn't need as many direct care staff to operate remote services, but I needed those direct care day staff to immediately transition into my group homes so that we could provide all the support that those folks needed there. They continue to do these services. And again, for 1475. Do you Katie, know can, many? Katie, can you start to sum up a little bit? Yes, here? I can. Um, how do you live in Fairfield County on 1475 an hour? I can tell you. You get to pick up all the overtime that you possibly can. You work two or three jobs. You apply for and receive government benefits. 
and you sacrifice time with your own family and children as you work through the exhaustion. And when your car breaks down or you get behind on your bills, you take a loan on your pension. An employee actually did that today to help pay her rent. We can do better than this in Connecticut. And I urge you to fully support the nonprofit sector. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Ms. Jerry was great. It was. Thank you. Have a good evening. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Rick Sebastian. Ma'am. Yes. Good evening, everyone on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your leadership. And thank you for your dedication to the citizens of Connecticut. My name is Rick Sebastian. I'm the dad of a 41-year-old daughter who has multiple significant disabilities. I introduced myself to you last year as a relatively new resident here in Connecticut. I'm a registered voter. I'm a taxpayer. Today, I'm speaking on behalf, in my role, as the president and CEO and on behalf of the more than 2,000 people that we support throughout the state of Connecticut on an annual basis. The Kennedy Center will be celebrating 70 years of service uh, this April and will begin a year long celebration. You've heard throughout the day, a number of my colleagues, a number of the people that we support, a number of our employees talking about a need for increased funding. I've submitted my written testimony. Tonight, I wanna to talk about the role of a healthy contractor. We are a state contractor. You're paying for services. The state of Connecticut is paying for services that they themselves cannot provide. Our agreement that we have as a nonprofit provider here in Connecticut is to advance the quality of life for people with disabilities and to assure that each of those individuals has the ability to thrive in their communities. We are essential. We're innovators. We're community-based employers. The Kennedy Center is the third largest employer in Trumbull. We are healthcare providers, we're advocates, we give voice, we are consistent, we are exceptional, we are surrogate families, we are tireless in our pursuits of creating opportunities, but I must say as a contractor in Connecticut, we are tired of too often being overlooked and forgotten in our state's budget considerations. There is a hashtag movement going around the country, forgotten faces, we represent more than 600 of those forgotten faces, essential workers in the developmental disability, the mental health system, and other disability systems throughout Connecticut. Day after day throughout the COVID pandemic, we heard media, we've heard government reports lauding and singing the praises of stop and shop grocery clerks, of delivery workers, of Pizza Hut drivers. We heard hardly anything about the essential work that was being performed by direct support professionals that you've heard from already today. Victor Frankel talks about being tragic optimism or having tragic optimism, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstance or to choose one's own way. I wish we were able to be tragic optimists as Victor Frankel uh, calls each of us to be, but unfortunately we're left with responding to unmet needs over 13 years. We're responding to needs that have now become more critical with COVID. The Kennedy Center has had tragedy because of COVID. 128 of our individuals that we support and our staff have tested positive. Four of our individuals that we support have, uh, have unfortunately passed away. 25 of our staff have lost family members. We have been inundated with COVID positivity since November through today. We had initial crisis from March to July. We flattened out through the summer and then started to see the increase that the rest of the nation saw throughout the, the fall and winter months. We experienced our first diagnosis in March of 2020. We couldn't find PPE and the PPE that we did find was costing us an arm and a leg because of the extorted the extortion prices that vendors were charging nonprofits like us. Rather than wallow in our misery, we did take Viktor Frankl's uh, tragic optimism at heart and we created a PPE distribution line of business. And to this day, we have supported more than 40,000 customers throughout Connecticut, including the state of Connecticut's Department of Social Services system. We have supported many of the nonprofits that have been testifying for you today. We've supported federal agencies. We've supported commercial vendors, small businesses, big businesses. Rick, I need, you, I, need, I, need, I need you to sum up. I need you to sum up because it's yes, 
Thank when, you. when we look at all of the fears and anxieties that exist, the last fear and anxiety that we really need to be paying attention to is where our dollar is going to come from to support all of the innovative work that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Certainly, thank you for your advocacy, and we look forward to a positive outcome in this budget year. Thanks. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, next, uh, Susan Pearson. 171, and after Susan, um, Colette Bement. Susan, yes, go right ahead. Good evening, Senator Austin, Representative Walker and the distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you so much for staying with us all day and all evening. I'm here to testify on HB 6439. My name is Susan Pearson. I'm the Executive Director of Network Incorporated. Network Incorporated is a nonprofit who serves 258 individuals and employs a staff of 390 within the intellectual and developmental disability community throughout the Northeastern and central parts of Connecticut. Previous budget cuts and chronic underfunding year after year have negatively impacted our organization, the people we serve, the staff we employ, which affects the communities as a whole. The consistent lack of funding equates to a wage that's barely above poverty level. The chronic underfunding does not allow us to offer many full-time benefited positions or any cost of living increases. The majority of our direct care professionals have single income stream and have to work excessive hours and multiple jobs to meet their growing financial needs necessary to support themselves and their families. Working in this field requires strength, commitment to take care of some of the most challenging and vulnerable folks of our state. Our staff are responsible for all aspects, including med administration, PT, OT, dietary, housekeeping, transportation, appointment management, it's been difficult to hire when the high level of responsibility does not match the low rate of pay that we offer. Network currently has 70 open part-time positions that equates to over 3,000 hours bi-weekly that we are unable to fill. This hardship has left us no choice but to staff all the time with overtime, which is another financial hardship to the agency. Our employees have pulled through this pandemic working around the clock to ensure the safety of those served the astounding amount of overtime employees are working to get the needed hours covered has led to diminishing levels of care for the folks we serve. And that's the saddest part of this whole thing is that we really want our staff to make a living wage so that they can provide the services that the folks deserve to have. So I'm here to respectfully request that the legislature appropriate the 461 million that everybody else has asked for over the five years for the community nonprofits. Thank you very much for giving me the time tonight. And I really hope that you can put the funding in that they, we so desperately need so that we can serve, continue to serve the people that we care so much about. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Susan. And thank you for, for staying to, through the night, through the night, through the evening to, to testify. Thank you. Have a good evening. Um, as well. Thank you. Colette? Yes. Good evening, Representative Walker and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Colette Amet and I'm from Tolland. I've submitted testimony, but I want to share with you now a more personal story. My 34-year-old son, Scott, who has intellectual and developmental disabilities, has lived for the past four and a half years in Willimantic with two housemates. They have an amazing staff from the private provider agency Horizons who help them with activities of daily living, shopping, cooking, cleaning, take them to medical and dental appointments. They're med certified. The staff also encourage and support the very social lives of these three guys, at least they did before COVID. And the staff has been there with these three men every step of the way through the past year in dealing with COVID-19, especially when their house was locked down for more than three months and visits from friends and family were not allowed. The wages at the community nonprofits are low. Staff at some agencies work two to three jobs just to make ends meet, and some rely on forms of public assistance themselves. Decades of cutting and underfunding the DDS budget has resulted in program closures and waiting lists for services. 
the community nonprofits, as you have heard, are having trouble hiring and it will only get worse. I was very upset and disappointed when Commissioner Sheff told the Appropriations Committee last week that he had not asked for an increase in funding for community nonprofits or funds for the DDS residential waiting list because now is not the right time to ask for more money. My question to him and to you is if not now, when? My son's staff are incredible professionals and they deserve to be paid more. Even though their wages were increased to $14.75 an hour, the private provider staff are still paid 40 to 50%, still earn 40 to 50% less than staff in the public sector. Turnover at community-based agencies is high. My son, Scott, frequently talks about missing staff who no longer work at his home and he can list them all. It's a long list. And to add to that, Scott does not like change. So it's very sad. He has developed a real bond with his caregivers and then they have to disappear because they can no longer afford to keep the job. I believe now is the time to pay a living wage at the community nonprofits. I know that the governor and the commissioner have not asked for increased funding for DDS. That is why I am asking the Appropriations Committee to add this funding to the DDS budget. The time is now. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your, for your testimony and the time is now. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Representative Walker. Good night. Good night. Um, Heather. Yes. Go Good evening, ahead. Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Heather Deerberger. I am the Human Resources Coordinator for Mark Community Resources and a resident of Marlboro. I am testifying today in support of HB 6439. We empower people with intellectual and developmental disabilities through employment, housing, social and community involvement, and advocacy. Our group homes operate on a fixed budget. Community nonprofits provide essential services in every city and town in Connecticut serving people in need and employing tens of thousands. I am here to respectfully request that the legislature appropriate $461 million over five years for community nonprofits. Since 2007, community nonprofits have lost at least $461 million in state funding that has not kept pace with inflation or adequately covered increased costs and demand for services over the last 13 years. As a human resources coordinator, I have seen firsthand how the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated the impact of inadequate funding for nonprofit services and brought unanticipated and unbudgeted costs along with operational challenges for many community nonprofits. Over the last 13 years, we have seen significant increases in health insurance, cost of vehicles to transport our individuals, gas, utilities, and a number of other significant costs, yet we've seen no increases in our rates to assist with the increases in costs. Also, we are not allowed to retain profits, which means that there is no funding available to cover any excess costs that we are incurring. We are operating on chronic underfunding. The state has not increased rates for direct care staff hourly wages that are set at $14.75 per hour. With the minimum wage increasing to $15, there has been no communication with the state on whether they will be increasing funding for hourly wages. It is also important to recognize the cost of the training and the certification requirements for our direct care staff, many of which require medical certifications to care for our individuals who have significant health needs. Demand continues to increase as funding is cut. I thank the committee for raising this important bill and I urge you to support HB 6439. Thank you for your time and consideration on this important issue. Have a great night. Thank you, Heather. And thank you for testifying and thank you for hanging in there. Thank you. Have a <laughs> thank good you. evening. Okay, bye-bye. Uh, Karen Riley. Karen Riley. He is not present, Madam Chair. 
Okay. Uh, Alicia, I saw her name. I see her name, but I haven't seen her. There she is. I'm here. How are you? Okay. How you doing? Good. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. I'm Olivia Duty, the President and CEO of Edelbrook Behavioral and Developmental Services. Edelbrook is a multi-service agency specializing in autism spectrum disorders, developmental services, and behavioral health treatment. We contract with the Department of Children and Families, the Department of Developmental Services, its municipalities, school systems, and we receive Medicaid funding. We support approximately 350 youth with highly complex behavioral and developmental needs and their families. And we do that with the support of more than 600 talented and caring employees in 20 locations throughout Central Connecticut. Our students and our residents come to us from nearly every community in Connecticut. They are your constituents. Our success is dependent on our, upon our talented and committed and compassionate staff. They work to build relationships, establish trust, and provide the most individualized care. I started my testimony with a quote from Gandhi, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. Amen. Every day, every day we work to fulfill our mission of helping people in need find hope and healing. We do this work in partnership with and on behalf of the state of Connecticut. We are asking you to help support that vital work by addressing the chronic underfunding of our nonprofit human service system. And I'd be remiss if I didn't especially thank you, Representative Walker and Senator Austin for your commitment and your leadership and really championing this issue um, and, and your um, attention and support and respect for everybody speaking today. The value of our work has never been more apparent than in the past 11 months. When most people were able to remain home during the height of the pandemic, our staff continue to support those who live in our group homes and our residential treatment programs. They showed up shift after shift in full PPE many times. They put those in need ahead of themselves. They quarantined with our individuals and at times remained with them for 14 days straight. They are the heroes of the pandemic. They're always essential, not just now, but always. And it is only right that state government recognize the value of their service by infusing resources into the system that will address years of inadequate funding. As you've heard tonight, we are at 14 years of essentially no cost of living adjustment. So I'm joining with my colleagues in asking for you to infuse $461 million into our system uh, by 2026. We're asking for Significant infusion of resources now, but as other people have said before me, if not now, when? Um, we are also able to draw down significant federal reimbursement for this investment. Um, and I ask that this isn't just a one-time infusion of resources, but that this is something that we look at for long-term and really make systemic change. Um, we are part of the fiscal solution. And I say, I'm up, yep. I'm all set, I'm just my last sentence. I just wanted to thank you for your time and attention and for your leadership and for being our champions. Thank you and thank you. And good to see you, good to see you. Good and thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Glenna Reigns. And after Glenna, Penelope Barsh, I think I gotta clear my glasses. Glenna, go right ahead. All right, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Glenna Rains and I work at Ability Beyond, a nonprofit based in Bethel that provides services for individuals with disabilities. I manage our employment programs for adults with mental illness in the greater Norwalk and Danbury areas. And these DEMAS funded programs serve over 160 people at any given time providing them with supports to both find and maintain their employment. Um, during this unprecedented time, we never closed our programs even for a day. We were always available to clients and had to quickly adapt how we provided our services. As a best practice, our services take place in the community where we now have an unanticipated and significant cost of PPE for our staff and clients to keep them safe. 
We have supported individuals who were essential employees working during extremely stressful times, um, potentially exacerbating their illness and making maintaining their positions even more difficult. We served as emotional support to them throughout the past year, as well as assisting them in navigating new job responsibilities and other changes. With unemployment being so high, more people are looking for work, making a program such as ours critical to economic recovery. Many of the individuals we support still remain on furlough from the jobs they held prior to the pandemic, and they rely on unemployment unless our program can find them something else. This essential job done by our team and other nonprofits was already hard. The pandemic has made it significantly harder. But despite that, our team has found over 100 new positions for individuals um, since March of last year. Um, and without our program, fewer people will be able to contribute to their communities. Employment programs have a significant reach beyond the people we serve. Our clients become taxpaying citizens and they reduce their reliance on food stamps and other public assistance programs. Employment also provides a positive self-image and helps people make progress in their recovery. Because of um, a lack of increased funding, we have not offered pay raises in years, um, which negatively impacts staff turnover. We need qualified and skilled staff who can assist our individuals. And the year after year of funding decreases or flat funding directly impacts our ability to attract the strongest candidates. Every time a team member leaves, this has a direct impact on the individuals we support. As a result of the pandemic, there will be more people experiencing mental health issues and therefore even more people needing our services. Now, when people are at their most vulnerable and when there are increased costs, coupled with a lack of increased funding, making our programs vulnerable is the time to invest in substantial improvements and enhancements to the behavioral health system. Thank you so much for your time and for staying so late to hear all of us. I really do appreciate it. And I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Have a good evening. Thank you. Um, next, we have Penelope. Yes, hi. I'm Penelope Barsh. I live in Meriden, Connecticut, and my son lives in a mosaic group home in Portland. Um, this is a picture of my beautiful son. Um, he's amazing. He has many multiple disabilities and multiple abilities, and he requires um, trained and, and uh, patient staff uh, to support him. I just wanna give you an idea of what is involved in taking care of my son on a daily basis. Um, Staff have to use a lift to transfer him in and out of bed and onto an adaptive toilet seat, onto his wheelchair and into a tub. They dress him, including his compression stockings and his ankle foot orthoses. He requires full assist uh, over his body because he has contractions. They have to follow medical orders for med administration. They have to prepare his meals according to swallowing protocol. They have to change his colostomy bag twice daily bowel sometimes leaks as they are cleaning this area as I've watched. They have to place him in a stander for exercise and complete two different stretching programs daily. They have to show patience and kindness with his limited communication. They have to design and implement daily activities to support his emotional and social needs. Um, they have to clean the group home, cook meals, laundry, and shop. Um, care continued. Um, through COVID staff and all the um, residents of the home contracted COVID. Um, I really, um, I, I really want to know what the value of, of a per staff person is that completes, has to complete all these tasks every day um, to provide care. And um, I ask, um, the state of Connecticut to please provide supports, financial supports for these people um, that care for my son and the, the others that live, live in um, group homes and, and day programs. He goes to a, a wonderful day program, Oster and Wallingford, and um, those staff also deserve um, pay for, for compensation for what they do. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for, for staying, and thank you for your testimony and your advocacy for your son you. and for all those that are in there with him. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, let's see, Mara Le Leanna, I don't see her or him on here. Uh, they are not present, Madam Chair. Okay, all right. Uh, sorry, we're on the last page.
Uh, Andrea, 179. Flamia? Andrea? Yes, hi, that's me. Oops. Hi. Andrea. Hi, how are you? Okay, <laughs> go right oh, ahead. Okay, um, good evening, Senator Osteen and Representative Walker and the committee. My name is Andrea J. Flamia, and I'm a family support worker with ZDS IFS Division and part of District 1199 and E. Um, I'm here today to talk about um, respite and funding respite within the Department of Developmental Services, State of Connecticut. We have a um, multifaceted respite that we do. And so I'm gonna talk about that throughout what I'm doing here on this testimony. Um, for the past 30 years, I've witnessed families in stressful times and in normal times. And as long as I can remember, I've witnessed families, uh, as, as long as respite has been, um, use respite services for uh, the individuals we serve in DDS. Respite has been a saving grace. It allows our individuals to grow in independence, make friends and feel what it is like to experience time with peer groups. That helps alleviate the isolation that many of DDS individuals who live at home experience. Respite also allows individual, individual families to get a break while knowing their loved ones are safe and with staff that are trained and that are able to care for them and ensure a time of both fun and learning. This helps families to alleviate stress um, of being caregivers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, especially during COVID, we've experienced a lot of stress. Um, in some instances, the relief is much needed because the families are caregiving for those who have challenging behaviors for long periods of time. And in turn, a high demand for attention and care is required of the caregivers. One example is um, I, I spoke with a woman who had two uh, people, two kids that were remote learning, um, a husband who was worrying about getting to work and um, someone who has autism and, and nonstop running around the house and, and all that kind of stuff and really looking for respite relief and really looking for respite services. Um, so I've witnessed those things. I've seen respite give families the break they need so that they can carry on with healthy caregiving while maintaining a healthy family. Uh, respite is an important piece of the pie of prevent preventative measures along with other services that support family cohesiveness. Um, that in turn can be the difference between an individual being able to live at home by preventing caregiver exhaustion, uh, preventing family breakdown, but also preventing escalations of behaviors. Um, I've talked to many of the, my individuals that I've served that um, they're like, I can't wait to go to respite. And at home, they may have a situation that is escalating to where it would be a health and safety issue. But when they go to respite and they get to relieve that and get to feel like their own person and be with their peers and relieve some of that stress, when they go back home, it's a much, much better situation. So it could be the difference in conjunction with IFS services um, in conjunction with behavioral supports and stuff uh, between can you, can you wrap, can you wrap up? Mm -hmm. uh, between somebody going into crisis or not. Um, we have multifaceted respite services that, that we have. We provide um, uh, those multifaceted services. The regular respite is prevention. Uh, we have a step down unit that, that is a stabilization. So an opportunity for stabilization of psychiatric issues or ER situations through a secure temporary clinical setting as a segue to a less restrictive environment, such as home to the and family, more appropriate situation. Um, and then one more long-term respite, um, if someone's getting surgery and uh, they don't know who's gonna take care of their loved one, then um, we would provide thank some- you. Thank you, thank you, Andrea. Thank you for your testimony. I'm, I just have to be fair to everybody. And Oh, no, 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 I, I, I totally agree. I just tried to get in the points real quick. Okay. All right, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Very me. Bye bye. Um, Carol, Carol Breslin. Hi, I'm here. One eighty. Go, Carolyn. Go right ahead. <laughs> so, good evening uh, to the heads of this committee and all of the distinguished members. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of this bill. Um, 
you guys have been here for a very long day and I very much appreciate the time and attention that you're giving to all of us. My name is Carol Breslin. I'm a program manager um, at Journey Found and I've worked in this field for um, supporting people with intellectual and developmental challenges for my entire career. Um, I've worked as a direct support staff, a manager, administrator, a volunteer, and I also act as a guardian for um, a number of people with intellectual challenges. And this is a field that's just very close to my heart and really, really important. Um, Nonprofit agencies provide essential services um, in every city and town in Connecticut, and we fill a vital need and we provide employment to tens of thousands of people. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm putting in my plug for the, the legislature to appropriate $461 million over five years for community nonprofits, because it's really crucial when, when agencies don't have the services or the resources that they need in order to meet the demands of the agency and the people we support, um, everyone suffers. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been employed as a float staff and then as a program manager during this pandemic year. Um, and I've worked directly with people served in situations which put my own health and the health of my family members at risk. I've worked extraordinary hours without complaint in order to cover shifts that were open due to staffing shortages and illness. Um, I recently commented to a family member um, that I had only worked 58 hours one week and I felt like I had been on vacation. Uh, there's just something wrong with that. You know, you shouldn't need to work 80 hours a week. It, it, it shouldn't be part of the uh, equation. Um, the work that we do in this field is absolutely skilled labor, um, but the wages that we're paid do not reflect it. Um, for $15 an hour, people can work in an, any number of other jobs that require a lot less commitment and a lot less training. The work that we do requires hands-on care. Um, there's no opportunity for social distancing and staff have to be hypervigilant to make sure that um, the safety of the folks we support and the safety of our families and the safety of our coworkers are, are secure. Um, in addition to uh, the direct care work that we all do, the people that we have many, many other responsibilities. We make sure that um, the houses are run, we pay the bills, we keep track of finances, we arrange medical appointments, we track all aspects of um, the care of the people we support. We provide input into complicated behavioral support plans and individual support plans. Can you can you sum it up? Can you I can. Um, and then make sure that all of those plans are implemented. So I just can't emphasize enough uh, how important it is that the services that are provided um, are, are are funded appropriately. And so, you know, we need a living wage. We need um, the agencies need to be able to function and be supported. And I thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you. I think we should all have a button that says, I support 461, Some, something like that. I know. think that's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> and you, made, you did make a valid point that, that, um, that really stuck to me was we spend more money, we pay people more higher hourly wages when they work with inanimate objects than when they work with people and protecting them and taking care of them. So. That's a, that's a very sad commentary. So thank you, Carol. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm. um, next, Emily Morris, Morrison. Emily Morrison, yes. Hello, everyone. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you so much for sticking around and giving everyone here an opportunity to share their story and testify today. My name is Emily Morrison. I'm a Putnam resident and I'm the Director of Development at United Services Incorporated in Dayville. Um, United Services is the local mental health authority for 21 towns in Northeastern Connecticut. We are a nonprofit organization and we operate more than 30 programs under our one administration, including outpatient mental health, substance abuse treatment, family programs, crisis services, and the region's only domestic violence program. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on HB 6439, an act concerning the state budget for the biennium. 
I am here to respectfully request that the legislator appropriate $461 million over five years for community nonprofits. This will replace lost funding from the service system and by extension, lost services for residents from years of flat funding and budget cuts. United Services is an essential healthcare provider and we have remained open throughout the pandemic. Our staff have continued to work with clients to support them where they really need us in the community. We are continuing to see the impacts of COVID-19 across all of our programs. Some of our programs are operating at more than 200% increase in services year over year, month to month. Our programs have been chronically underfunded and our staff who provide critical services to our community are alarmingly underpaid. We also have fewer services available to support residents here in Northeastern Connecticut than other people do in other parts of the state. I'm also a United Services Communications Officer and I interact with the public daily, even now during a pandemic as part of my job. And I hear from people all the time about the difference that United Services has made in their lives. Here in Northeastern Connecticut, we do not have duplication of services. United Services is the only organization providing our critical programs and we are drastically underfunded especially considering the important and life-saving work that we provide. The need for mental health and substance abuse treatment is only going to continue to grow, especially as we emerge from this pandemic. Please help us help our communities with improvements and enhancements to the behavioral health system. Now is not the time to flat fund the DEMAS budget, but instead to invest and show the importance of mental health. Please support the $6.3 million increase in discharge and diversion services, Community nonprofits such as United Services help people avoid the most costly care in the emergency departments, in jail, in shelters, and get them on a path to recovery, living on their own or with support in, community, in the community. We need these resources to respond to the needs in our community now. Thank you again so much for your time and your dedication. Going on nine and a half hours, it's really amazing, your, your effort to make sure that everyone is heard tonight, and I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, and thank you for your advocacy. Thank you. Oh, well, do you want uh, me to take over now? No, not yet. No, we're, I'm, I'm okay for now. <laughs> okay. Oh. But uh, I'm one of my favorite people. Hi, Lucy. I haven't seen you in a long time. You were the. <laughs> I remember. You, I remember we first met was when um, with um, uh, End Hunger, wasn't it? Right. End Hunger? Yep. Yeah. Many, yeah. many years I was at yes, End. Yes, yes. We won't say how long. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Let me say my children grew up at End Hunger, Connecticut. Yes. Uh, <laughs> grandchildren in that process, yeah. <laughs> oh, please, not yet, no. Um, good, uh, good evening, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Lucy Nolan, and I'm the Director um, of Policy and Public Relations at the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence. Uh, the Alliance is a statewide coalition of Connecticut's nine community-based sexual assault crisis service centers and our mission is to create communities free of sexual violence and provide culturally affirming trauma-informed advocacy, prevention and intervention services centered on survivors' voices. So that's why I'm here today because we get funding from DPH. Um, our member centers have also uh, submitted some testimony. So um, there is some in, in there. Uh, we're the only organization that provides both counseling and advocacy to um, sexual assault survivors and their supporters in Connecticut. We work with law enforcement, we work with um, hospitals, uh, we you know, sort of run the gambit of anything around sexual violence. Um, our certified sexual assault counselors proudly work to address the unique uh, and emerging needs of all victims, including victims of child sexual abuse, campus sexual assault, survivors who are incarcerated, survivors from ethnic and racially diverse communities and survivors from LGBTQ communities. Um, our hotline, we have a 24-7 um, hotline, both one in English and one in Spanish, and we work with victims um, when they need us, which may include um, going to the hospital with them when they're getting a rape kit done um, at any time during, um, during the day or night. Um, we are there for support um, and helping their secondary victims or even tertiary victims, anyone who's been involved and, and needs some help. Um, in the past year, it's, it has been difficult for us. We've needed to shift how we've worked like everyone else really. Um, and I 
just wanted to let you know a little bit what was going on. We have moved, we did move from in-person to virtual Zoom and counseling for counseling and group meetings. Um, when someone was getting a kit done at a hospital, we would accompany them with the phone if we weren't um, able to get into the hospital with them. Um, and one of the things was the fundraisers were for our member centers were actually, uh, you know, the stopped or they moved them to different things and, and it decreased some of the funding that they were expecting. Um, uh, so um, one of the things I wanted to say to tell you is that during the first four months um, of the pandemic, we saw a 341% uh, increase in calls for Im immediate emotional support. And then in Ju July, that's, that went down but what we saw double were the numbers of crisis calls to our hotline. And so we were, you know, we were able, we were there, we were able to help people who be, and I, you know, really was, I think COVID related. At first we were feeling like, oh, there isn't things going on, but it, we had the, mo needed the emotional support. Um, so we, and one of the other things that we did um, was help people with, they really needed help with, um, food resources, housing, homelessness resources, and employment resources. And so our advocates were able to, to steer people in the right way. Um, so can you sum up? Cause yep. So I just, I, I just wanted to, I can finish with this as you have my testimony. I just want to thank you all for doing the great work you do and making sure that everyone in Connecticut gets a, gets a chance to, to do what they can do. And, um, and thank you. Yeah, it just, it wouldn't have seemed to be a, a, a probes hearing if it wasn't at night for me. So I'm glad I <laughs> made it through. Amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Lucy. Have a good evening. Thank, thank you, you very much. Okay. Um, All right, Anthony? Tony, let me do it now. Okay, Anthony. You, need, you take a break. <laughs> We're going to need our voices tomorrow. Yes. Anthony Benoit? Yes. You're up, sir. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, good evening, Senator uh, Olson, uh, Representative Walker, Senator Maynard, uh, Representative France, and distinguished members of the uh, Appropriation Committee. My name is Anthony Benoit, and I have been a participant of Sarah Inc. for two years. Sarah Inc. is a wonderful program to be and since a uh, since being a part of Sarah, it, my employment specialist has helped me learn skills to be employed, and has helped me to search a and apply for uh, jobs. With the help of Sarah, I was able to begin my first paid job at Subway last year. Uh, I am writing to uh, I, Sorry. That's uh, right, you take your time. Don't worry. Thanks. Uh, come in on uh, HB 6439 and act concerning the state budget for the well, ending June 13th of 2023 20, and making uh, appropriations therefore. Uh, community nonprofits provide and Can't figure out this one. <laughs> that's a, that's um, right, Mr. Benoit. Just take your time. Thanks. One, one step in front of the other. That's all. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to skip over that one. Go uh, ahead. Uh, 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 services in every city and town in Connecticut, serving uh, people in 
need and employing teams over thousands. They are what 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 make Connecticut and a great place to live and work. I am here to respect uh, respectfully request that the legislature appropriation of six hundred and uh, I'm sorry, uh, 461 million over five years of community nonprofits uh, since 2007. Co uh, community nonprofits have lost at least 461 million in state funding that has not kept pace with influx or adequate cover increased costs and demand for services over the last 13 years. Please commit to uh, inc increasing funding by the full 461 million or 28% by fiscal year 2026. 20, um, a, a preparation of 128 million in new funding for community not uh, nonprofits in uh, fiscal year 2022. A seven degree increase. And next uh, increase to influx the ensure that state funding will be pace with increased costs in the future. Hold pro hold profits and fluctuation uh, harmless was from the impact of COVID nineteen. Uh, the the COVID. 19 pandemic affected me badly as as I thought it was only going I I thought it was going to last uh, one month well the pandemic occurred I continue working at subway even when Sarah Inc services were closed as as case and continuing uh, sorry as cases continue to rise I decided to take time off from work to keep myself and my grandmother safe from getting COVID as Sarah was closed I couldn't interact with anyone and it became uh, boring for me. During this time, I even started to get unhappy with my job. Once Sarah opened back up, I was able to uh, receive supports again, which I was very happy about. I told my employment specialist that I was unhappy with my job and she helped me to find a better fit for me. I now work at ShopRite, which is a job that I love doing. Once again, I respectfully request that the legislator So your new job is better for you, Mr. Benoit? Yes, ma'am. And I think what you want is us to give some money to the nonprofits, which would help out to include Sarah Incorporated. Uh, yes, ma'am. So I think that um, uh, we got your message. I think that's really wonderful. I think you did a great job testifying. And, uh, um, you know, I think that uh, we're hearing what you had to say. 
Um, I, I think everybody here uh, uh, really appreciates your testimony and I wanna thank you for having the courage and the tenacity, the, the wherewithal to come up in front of us. It's, it's very hard to speak in front of a lot of people, even via Zoom. Yeah, uh, it's it, it, it's a little stressful for myself. That's all right. Thank you. It, thank you so You're much welcome. for coming. We really appreciate and it. Problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benoit. Um, up You're next welcome. is is Allison Sear. Good evening, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Allison Sear, and I'm Program Manager of School-Based Health Services for the Community Health Center Incorporated. I'm testifying in support of House Bill 6439 and the line item for school-based health care. First off, just thank you for all your commitment to the testifiers tonight. Um, as we approach 8 o'clock, I know it's been a long day, so thank you for that. Uh, Community Health Center Incorporated provides health care cl to close to 180 community and school locations and specifically provided care to over 18,000 children during this last school year. I specifically oversee the school-based health care programs in all of the Meriden Public Schools, 15 schools in M Middlesex County and two schools in New London County. In these areas alone, we serve over 2,300 Connecticut students. Every child deserves a chance to be healthy and to reach their full potential in life, but many children have health problems and that, make, and that makes it difficult for them to learn and succeed, even during a typical school year. This year, children face even more struggles as they continue to live through the pandemic, where they were faced with social isolation and many other uncertainties. Enter the school-based healthcare program, where our staff are in the unique position to provide a safe space for students to be seen, either in person or via telehealth. Being a part of a school-based healthcare program teaches students to advocate for themselves and recognize their own healthcare needs as they transition to adulthood. I would like to take this time to share some exciting news. We recently implemented a garden program at three of our school clinics across the state. With the help of federal funding, we were able to build three greenhouses complete with storage sheds, gardening supplies, such as grow kits, and two large garden beds at each location and different curriculum for greenhouse learning. The students enrolled in our medical and behavioral health services at the three schools where the greenhouses are will be able to learn different therapeutic skills and healthy eating habits while getting real life hands-on experience in a garden setting. The first greenhouse groups are on track to kick off next Tuesday, March 9th at an elementary school in Meriden. Since starting signups for the groups last week, we have already received 20 new enrollments for that elementary school school-based health center alone. This is an incredible turnaround rate for enrollments and shows just how excited students are to engage in the different services we offer them. We are very much looking forward to bringing this experience to students through our program, who otherwise may never have had the opportunity to work in a garden before. In closing, school-based healthcare eliminates barriers to care, including location, cost, and the social stigma that prevents many children and adolescents from accessing the care they need. Community Health Center Incorporated seeks reimbursement for the services provided, but relies on state funding to support the uninsured and underinsured students. Please increase funding to school-based health care in our state so young people can continue to thrive and learn. This is critical to their future, but overall our state's future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Allison. Um, up uh, we really appreciate your testimony. Uh, thank you so much. Thank Up you. next is Andrea Ferrucci. Good evening, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. I'm Andrea Ferrucci, the Vice President of Operations for Mosaic and board member of the Connecticut Community Nonprofit Alliance. Mosaic is a mission-driven nonprofit organization supporting people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. In Connecticut, through the hard work and dedication of our more than 350 employees, we support over 160 people and their families in 40 programs throughout the state. We provide residential services, day supports, community companion homes, and individualized home supports to meet the personalized needs of the people we support. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on HB 6439. I respectfully request that the legislature appropriate 461 million over five years to support community nonprofits. 
Specifically, 128 million in new funding for community providers during FY 2022, index future increases to inflation to keep pace with increasing costs, and hold nonprofits financially harmless from the impact of COVID-19. Throughout the pandemic, pandemic, our Mosaic staff has worked diligently to ensure the people we support are safely receiving quality services. Over the past year, we have continued to support people. We did not close. Our employees worked around the clock. They continue to work around the clock to ensure health and safety of the people we support. Many leaving their own families day after day to care for the people in our Mosaic programs, to care for their Mosaic family. I cannot say enough about their dedication and their commitment. Earlier this evening, I was able to hear testimony from some Mosaic families where they shared with all of you uh, the, the vital services and supports that they're receiving from Mosaic. And you were also able to hear from some of our direct support professionals about how much they love the people that they support, um, but that they need to work several jobs to be able to continue um, to, to work in this field. And the work that they do is essential and they are essential and we need to recognize them as such. Throughout this pandem pandemic, the additional cost of procuring necessary PPE as well as additional staffing costs has made an already difficult situation one created by chronic underfunding much worse. Increased funding is critical to community providers. As you've heard from many of my colleagues throughout the day, since 2007, state funding has not kept pace with the increasing costs of capital expenditures, staff wages, health insurance premiums, overtime expenditures, technology costs, and so much more. Without vital funding, providers will continue to experience shortages and high, staff shortages and high turnover. Without sufficient resources, we'll, we will be unable to provide critical services from of our, some of our state's most vulnerable people. For these reasons, I respectfully request the Appropriations Committee appropriate 461 million over five years to support community providers. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for your support. I know it has been a very, very long day and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Hold on, hold on. Hi, uh, thank you very much um, for testifying. We absolutely hear what you're saying and we know that we need to do something here. I don't know exactly uh, where we'll come up, but I know we need to do something. Um, so just pay attention to where we are and keep the pressure up, okay? Okay, thank you. Have a good night. Um, you too. Um, up next is Lisa Jarden. Hi, my name's Lisa Jarden. Um, thank you, I'm Lisa. From I'm from Work for Marrakesh. I'm the vice president of person Center connections there. Um, I also am in support of the house bill 6439. I won't belabor all the numbers as I'm sure you have them all in your head. Um, and I'm not gonna go into a lot about what Marrakesh does because my five other colleagues really talked about that. And the fact that Heather Latour, our president and CEO, basically camps out on your doorstep so you can never forget who we are. Um, I just really wanna let you know one thing that you may not know about Marrakesh is that we are totally person-centered and we don't believe in turning people away. Um, my position is actually an unfunded position within the agency. And I'll be honest, I was worried during COVID that being an unfunded position would not be something that would survive. But Marrakesh is very committed to that anyone who calls with a need should get connected and have a way of support. So all of those calls come to me and I help people navigate systems. I help them find the connections in the communities to find the supports that they need. I help them apply for social security benefits. I help them do appeals. I help them find housing and subsidize housing. Um, so I really work fully within the community and during the complete COVID, I still continued to work with people in the community, whether it was going to their homes, which is what I normally do. I travel the whole entire state um, and I meet with families who are desperate because they're so afraid of the budget and they don't know what they're gonna do for their families. I meet with individuals who can't make housing costs and want subsidized housing people who have no benefits or even know how to attack the system and work with it. Um, so my position, even during COVID, I did that, but I also helped us run all our task force and be sure, but I stayed on top of what was happening. Um, 
So at Marrakesh, like I said, we're very person-centered and very committed that every person who calls gets an answer of some kind, whether it's this we can't help you, but this is where we can get you connected and help you provide those supports. Um, we really believe that no one should get turned away. And that's why it's so important that we have House Bill 6439 supported by all of you. Um, you have my written testimony, so I'm not gonna belabor this. I just wanna really end by, I've been here since eight o'clock, I mean, 10 o'clock with all of you. So I appreciate all your time and effort. And I really just want to end by saying, my mom always said, it doesn't matter where you go in life, it matters who you have beside you. And right now, the nonprofit world desperately needs all of you beside us. We need you to push through this bill and really work on helping us make things equal and right. So thank you very much. So I really love your mom's say statement. I think that that's really wonderful. Lisa, thank you very much for are coming here. I think that that's really, really good. And um, uh, we really appreciate you coming tonight and sticking it out with us. Up next is Kelly Julesen Scopino, um, whom I think we all know. So go ahead, Kelly. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you so much for having me tonight. Uh, I think we're now 10 hours into this. So thank you all for staying. And it's good to see you and Senator Abrams and Representative Kennedy and committee members. I am Kelly Julson Scapino. I'm the co-president of the Governor's Prevention Partnership. And I'm here tonight and we're not the same organization that we were a year ago. We're smaller with the loss of staff due to the pandemic. We no longer rely on our bricks and mortar space to deliver our trainings and events, but we still were able to reach hundreds of Connecticut practitioners, teachers, and families. Our lean but mighty team of 10 is united behind prevention and harm reduction for our young people. And we wasted no time to create an approach to provide and increase our services in this dreaded new normal. We led the way for mentoring relationships to go virtual. We brought the understanding of services like the critical mobile crisis unit to families' living rooms so parents weren't lost without that lack of school support. We delivered trainings in both Spanish and English and brought in a sign language interpreter and ran closed captioning when we could to make sure that our services were accessible. We have taken chances in the name of serving our youth better over the last year. And we couldn't have done any of this without the tremendous support from Demas. The commissioner and her prevention team always put partnership, collaboration, and connection at the forefront of their model with their grantees, recognizing that we are all stronger by working together. They rec recognize that prevention is not about a moment, it's about the movement. Unfortunately, one of the residual effects of the pandemic has been the increase in alcohol consumption, as my colleague Deborah pointed out earlier. Youth who start drinking alcohol at or before the age of 15 are five times more likely to develop alcohol dependence than if they wait till they're 21 to drink. Other states have conducted specific undercover operations to determine that minors were successful and able to order alcohol and online and then have it delivered to their doorstep. While I don't know of any widespread Connecticut data to support this, I can tell you that it's happened to me and my family at least once. One time, an unattended um, alcohol delivery occurred while I wasn't home and my children were home with an underage babysitter. And I understand, rightly so, there has been so much focus on the opioid epidemic, but we cannot lose sight of the alcohol use disorder and the devastating effects that it has on family. I would encourage you to consider supporting additional dollars for compliance checks to make sure that young people are kept safe during these times. Now, is the time not only to maintain these prevention services, but consider increasing that investment to ensure that the trauma associated with COVID-19 for our young people does not lead to additional long-term effects on their health and well-being. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kelly. Appreciate you coming. Miss having you in the legislature. Miss you guys too. Thank you. Up next is Christiana Emery. Uh, she is not present, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Yu. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm all right, how are you? Long day. Uh, yes, the floor is <laughs> yours. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's much I can, uh, well, let me introduce myself. My name is Catherine Hugh. I am a program manager at Mark Community Resources. Uh, we provide wraparound services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, we're based out of Middletown. Um, my specific job within the organization is program manager for the custom department. The custom department serves individuals who have uh, intellectual or developmental disabilities, but also have behavioral concerns. Um, so uh, to, to illustrate, um, you know, these are people who need to work on communication skills and without proper supports in place may express themselves uh, by biting, by hitting, um, inappropriate touch, hair pulling, um, things of this nature. And um, obviously it's incredibly important that we have qualified staff and staff that are ready to respond appropriately at any given moment to these concerns, because if something were to happen, it could be quite serious. Um, so I think that my department provides a pretty clear example of what can go wrong, what can go awry when the staff are not given the proper remuneration. Um, if the staff are tired from working a second job, if they are not feeling valued, oh, I got dogs barking. If they're not feeling valued by the wage that they're paying, if anything is distracting them from the, the you know, the, the task at hand, it can be um, a very difficult and a potentially very dangerous situation. So I, I thank you all for sitting through this incredibly lengthy um, ordeal, but I, I can't emphasize enough that um, the responsibility that our DSPs hold is, is truly life-changing for the individuals that we serve. They truly have in their hands sometimes the lives of these individuals and the fact that they are not compensated in a way that um, allows them to better themselves and support their families is, is truly a disservice both to them and to the individuals. And when we compensate them fairly, we demonstrate that we value not only the DSPs, but the individuals that they're serving. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Appreciate you staying with us and let's see where we can go. Up next is Laura Pate. Thank you so much. Good evening um, to the members of the committee. I really appreciate you being here. Um, my name is Laura Patey and I'm the chair of the board of Gilead Community Services in Middletown. Uh, Gilead provides a full continuum of mental health and addiction services in Middlesex County and has for the last 50 years and more recently expanded into Hartford County. Um, I'm here on behalf of our over 200 program participants and and uh, 300 dedicated staff members and the thousands of community members who support and benefit from the services that Gilead provides. I'm here for one reason and that's to ask as others have before me for you to appropriate the $461 million over the next five years based on the plan that's been outlined by the CT Alliance. Over the past 14 years, uh, nonprofits in Connecticut have lost at least $461 million in state funding by not keeping pace with inflation or effectively covering increased costs with the ever increasing demand for services. Um, the Alliance has done the analysis and so we know that what we've lost financially and COVID has made it clear just how important the services are that are provided by Gilead. It's vital that you work with us to protect and fully fund the essential services that organizations like Gilead provide to the community. Nonprofits such as Gilead are already stretched beyond capacity and are now faced with the challenge of caring for an increased number of people who are dealing with mental health and substance abuse issues. These issues are important to me and it goes beyond serving on the board of Gilead. My family has been directly impacted by the devastation that can result from the lack of adequate community services. As one of six children, I've experienced the impact that untreated mental health issues and substance abuse can wreak on a family. I've lost two brothers who struggled with mental health and substance abuse issues and didn't have access to the supports and services that they needed. I've committed my personal and professional life to doing what I can to ensure that other families don't have to deal with these unavoidable losses. Not surprisingly, these losses have impacted programming staff, staffing levels, our capacity to serve clients. 
Gilead, like other nonprofits, have not been able to provide the types of salary increases to employees that are deeply deserved. The truth is that the real costs in the years and lives lost to untreated mental health and addiction disorders. And I'm asking you to consider this impact and to recognize like so many of us already do that this isn't okay, that we need to do better and that we can do better. I have a quote taped to my laptop right here as a constant reminder to me. And it says, what we are not changing, we are choosing. Are you willing to make the critical changes and to appropriate the funds necessary to fund our community nonprofits? We're, we're counting on you. I'd like to extend also to each of you the opportunity to visit virtually or when time, when, when uh, pandemic allows in person, some of Gilead's programs and to see the important work that's happening every day. It's amazing to see the transformative power of consistent services offered by dedicated staff. Please join us in supporting this important work. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Laura, appreciate it. And I like your statement on your computer. Maybe I'll borrow it. <laughs> Up next is Patrick Johnson. Good evening, esteemed members of the committee and a special good evening to my own uh, state representative, Jillian Gilchrist. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. Uh, my name's Patrick Johnson. I'm testifying today as, the, as a retired CEO of nonprofit human service agencies in Connecticut, as a consultant and current board member of Connecticut-based nonprofit organizations, and with my wife Margie as legal guardian for her two disabled brothers. For the past 20 years of my 50-year career, I've been witness to and had to deal with the chronic underfunding of essential human services in this state. It's been and remains painful and profoundly disturbing. <clears throat> I want to share with you what I and my wife have witnessed as legal guardians for her brothers. Margie's brother, Joe, lives in assisted living at Mercy Community Health in West Hartford. He is 70 years old and is totally blind and has other serious developmental limitations. Her brother, Francis, is 71 years old and is also totally blind, nonverbal, autistic, and profoundly developmentally disabled. He requires 24 hours per day line of sight supervision and assistance with all daily living skills. Joe lived with his mother prior to moving to assisted living. She died several years ago at 88. Francis lived at Southbury Training School for over 43 years before transferring to an Oak Hill group home in Mansfield. Margie and I are in our 70s and older than her brothers. We have great grave concerns about their future and the future of thousands of people with disabilities like them. Of major concern is what happens to them should anything happen to us. We worry because the governor seems to think that they should be cared for by charity, like they did in the 18th and 19th century. Tragically, charity is inadequate to do the job and cannot supplant the responsibility of the whole community. We have witnessed nonprofits going out of business, programs being closed or reduced, underfunded staff being subjected to wage and benefit cuts, food budgets being cut, as well as buildings being neglected. It is painful to see underfunded staff being driven deeper into poverty dedicated professional staff who have the responsibility for the lives of people with disabilities are being paid less than fast food workers. Staff turnover has increased, thus driving down the quality of care and increasing safety concerns and training costs. COVID-19 has turned a crisis into a catastrophe as nonprofits struggle to cover unanticipated costs to improve the safety of program participants and their staff during the pandemic. Most of the staff are women and people of color who are working multiple jobs while caring for their own families. This is a civil rights issue and is being addressed in other venues, but not in the nonprofit world due to inadequate resources and our dependence upon state aid. <clears throat> like other, like, uh, like our program participants, nonprofits seem to remain invisible despite the thousands of people with disabilities who depend on them daily, as do Margie and I and her brothers. Please commit to increasing funding by the total 461 million 
by fiscal year 2026. And I thank you so very much for your thoughtful consideration and your perseverance and endurance this evening. Thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Johnson. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, up, up next is Joyce Lewis. Good evening. Thank you so much for this opportunity to testify. My name is Joyce Lewis and I'm the Executive Vice President of Key Human Services, a private nonprofit business supporting individuals with disabilities across the lifespan statewide. I've submitted written testimony, so I'll speak from the heart tonight with these two points for you to reflect upon as I speak. Please don't let state minimum wage increases erode the commitment made to our crucial workers two years ago to fund wages that are differentiated from minimum wage. And residential programs funded by DDS have not received supplemental funding since July. So this evening, I wanna talk about our amazing staff. When the pandemic began, we discussed with our staff uh, what was the possibility or even probability that they would be working with individuals with COVID-19? And how did they feel about that? Not surprisingly, most of them stated that they would not be willing to come to work in those circumstances. They were reasonably worried about getting COVID-19 and bringing COVID-19 home to their families. Everyone's natural concern and the reason that most people were at home during this time. Well, the days of COVID-19 came, and every day our staff came too. They care for people with COVID and people without COVID with the same care and concern that they put in every day. Every day in every situation, they've stepped up and stepped forward to protect, to engage, and support the individuals in our homes. Bravery is defined as being afraid, but doing it anyway. This is the kind of staff that we have. This is the kind of staff that, that goes out and deals with uh, an individual in quarantine for 14 days. And I call and I say, it's time for that person to be able to come out of quarantine now. And they say, oh, you know, that is really exciting. I'm so happy. She's going to be so thrilled. And all the staff will be thrilled too, because we're going to be able to give her the gift card that we collected and saved for her just to make her feel special and to show her how proud we are of her and how amazingly patient and careful she's been during this quarantine. This is our staff. This is our staff that use their own money to put in $10 a piece and to create for this young woman a $100 gift card to Dunkin' Donuts just because they were proud of her, just because they were excited that she would be excited. Now I'd be excited about that too. But I think that for our staff, that represented an hour of take-home pay or more. That's very generous and thoughtful of them. There were other ways that could happen. This is our staff. This is the staff that we work with every day. And I can't express how incredibly honored I am personally to work alongside these people every day. This is a level of commitment. This is a level of compassion, courage, resilience, and love that's insurpassable and worth immeasurably more than $14.75 an hour. And I think that that's something that we really need to think about. And then the crisis came. Uh, so since November, in our homes, it's been really horrific. We're a fairly large provider. And uh, since November, we've had seven homes where every individual was positive. Three homes where almost every individual is positive. Homes where three individuals have passed away. And the majority of our staff have also been impacted during that time. And what did they do? They kept coming to work. They kept caring. They came back from vacation to be able to help. They went out to do everything they possibly could to be there for the individuals that they support. Ms. Lewis, yeah. if, you, if, you, if you don't mind wrapping it up a bit. Sure, sure. Thank you. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, COVID funding has uh, stopped, but COVID has not. 
we don't have the resources to appropriately support our, our staff, our nurses, our managers. We need more funding. And that's what tonight is really all about for all of our providers. So that's what I'm asking for is more funding for our staff, for our managers, and um, to properly support all of them at this time. I wanna say thank you to you, to DDS, to our fellow providers, and especially to our dedicated staff. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Lewis. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Kathy, I can take over from now. Thank okay. you. Uh, up next is Angela. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the Bucarelli. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, <laughs> Representative Angela. Walker, after Angela. Yep. Go ahead, Angela. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, good evening, Senator Walker, Senator Austin, and distinguished members of the appropriate committee. My name is Angela Bucciarelli. I work a second job as a residential supervisor, second shift at Columbus House in New Haven. I am a resident of Naugatuck. I am testifying regarding the budget for the next fiscal year, HB 6439. I ask you to increase the budget line for housing support and services in proposed Senate Bill 340 to recognize the essential role of our work in serving the homeless. Working as a residential supervisor for me is extremely important, crucial, and at times very challenging. I play many roles in their lives. When they first arrive at Columbus House, I am faced with dealing with many different walks of life and different attitudes, whether they had a good day, a bad day, or an indifferent day. There is a check-in process which makes sure that the residents do not carry any substance abuse, alcohol, or weapons on their person. This is for their safety, for their safety and as well as for staff. I facilitate appropriate support and promote a professional atmosphere at all times. I oversee the residents' medication, safety, and well-being. Furthermore, being attentive to a resident's needs as well as their interests and their choices. I utilize my training to assist in de-escalating residents during a crisis. You know, uh, throughout this pandemic, it has been extremely challenging. Although we wear our masks, try to maintain social distancing, you know, there are some occasions where there is just impossible. And so I try to move forward with faith and doing the best that I can, keeping in mind that the residents come first and they depend on me. I am important to my clients because I make every effort to build a rapport with them. I always tell them that my office door is always open. This takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of uh, effort coupled with empathy and a lot of compassion. When that rapport is built, they are encouraged and they have the willingness to change themselves and then their pre present circumstances. I practice active listening. The, res the residents have a, have a need to be heard. They experience so many different feelings that while they reside at Columbus House. You know, and, and I tell them that it's okay to express feelings, that pain shared is pain lessened. No pain, no gain. You know, a lot of these uh, residents, they have no one to turn to. So I for say, it's like I wear, um, I multitask, you know, I be their mom, I be their friend, I be that listening ear, you know, which gives them hope. And that's exactly what they need is hope. Working as a residential supervisor is very gratifying and it keeps me humble. It keeps me on the beam to always try to maintain an attitude of gratitude so I can always be a power of example to these residents. If funding was increased to provide us with a living wage, it would be extremely grateful and it would provide us to earn enough money for a satisfactory standard way of living. Angel, Furthermore- Angel, can you wrap up? It's uh, been uh, over three minutes, so could you yes, wrap up? Yes, I believe it would reduce employee turnover and absenteeism. The homeless population needs to see consisting, consistency, knowing that a residential supervisor is always there for them because they depend on us. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And thank you for staying. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next, uh, Lawrence Johnson. Uh, he is not present. The next speaker won't be till 196, Stephen Mansfield. Okay, Stephen Mansfield. Good 
You have to unmute yourself, Stephen. Stephen? Okay, we're going to go on to the next person and maybe Stephen will get um, Rob Burrell. Uh, good evening, Representative Walker, Senator Austin, and other members of the committee. Uh, I'm Rob Brill, president of SEIU District 1199. Uh, that's the New England Healthcare Workers Union. Uh, and I'm here tonight to uh, speak about some of the funding issues that we see as critical for both public and private sector uh, DEMIS uh, uh, workers. We represent uh, 3,000 workers who are our state DEMIS employees. Um, and additional uh, multiple agencies on the private sector side, including both uh, NACHOG Hospital and the Institute of Living. Uh, so we feel like we're quite uh, uniquely positioned to speak about the, the challenges face, facing healthcare workers and the patients that they take care of. Um, you know, the, the uh, populations that are served by our members are, uh, you know, folks who uh, quite obviously um, you know, suffer from uh, really severe problems. Uh, you know, mental health is particularly acute um, in terms of figuring out uh, treatment options for folks who are low income um, and uh, substance abuse, uh, same thing. Uh, the, the, the folks that our members take care of are disproportionately black and brown um, and low income white. Um, and, you know, even before the pandemic, uh, what we saw was that, that uh, uh, both substance abuse and mental health um, options and treatment programs have really been chopped to the bone. Okay, that, that is just a reality that, that has faced uh, the, 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 the patient population over the past uh, decade and a half. So we are proposing some quite significant uh, and some might even say radical uh, funding increases uh, to the tune of uh, $360 million for the private sector and then additional expansion within the public sector um, but we think that those, those funding increases are, frankly, just as radical as the reality that people are facing. The past year has been a catastrophe uh, for folks in terms of mental health and addiction. It has absolutely been a train wreck. Um, there is a 33% increase in opioid deaths over the last two years. Uh, anxiety and depression disorders have spiked. Uh, there's been a 13% increase in suicides in the state of Connecticut. Um, opioid uh, overdoses have uh, drastically increased amongst black and brown populations. Um, the city of Bridgeport, uh, the mobile crisis there has faced a five fold increase in calls uh, in the largest city in the state. And we could go on and on. Uh, that is to say nothing of the conditions that are facing essential workers themselves, especially essential healthcare workers uh, who are dealing with a, a year of accumulated stress um, in terms of their own working conditions, risk to themselves, uh, physical stress, uh, uh, risk to their, to their, uh, to the, to their families. Um, the, the workforce is really at the point that it is breaking down. Whiting Forensic Hospital on CVH campus, there was a day in December where 21 out of 24 workers were mandated. Okay, uh, and, and for those that know Whiting Forensic, you know how difficult a workplace that is to work. Um, uh, in, uh, in, in terms of services, uh, over the years, residential treatment programs for folks uh, who are homeless uh, have evaporated to the point where unless you've literally been on the street for six months, you cannot get into a residential program. Uh, state workers, social workers, you used to be able to enroll people in programs, but if you couch surfed on your buddies, uh, couch for a night, the clock resets. Um, uh, there are not re-entry programs. You know, Connecticut has actually taken some significant steps towards being a second chance society. Uh, but when people come back from our jails and our prisons, the mental health and substance abuse uh, treatment programs are not there to help people. Um, and I've referenced mobile crisis. Uh, Bro, we do not I, have 24. Can I just get you to start to sum up because it's over the three minutes, sorry. Yep. We do not have 24-7, 365 mobile crisis uh, uh, across the state. Uh, so frankly, it, uh, uh, what we are asking for is significant funding uh, that would meet the needs of a distressed population uh, that has really been uh, pushed to the breaking point in the past calendar year. And we think that that would be money well spent. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, and good to see you. I couldn't see you from because you're in the, the shadows back there. I couldn't see you. From. Thank you, Wonderful thank you. Wonderful to see you. Take care, be safe. Bye-bye. Uh, I'm going to go back to Stephen Mansfield. I believe he's with us. Stephen? 
Good evening, everyone. I apologize. I stepped away for less than a minute and uh, missed my spot. Um, my name is Steve Mansfield. I'm the Director of Health for Ledge Light Health District, a regional health department that serves 10 municipalities in southeastern Connecticut. Thank you, Madam Chair, and the distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Like our local health colleagues across the state, Ledge Light Health District has spent countless hours building our staff capacity, developing communications channels, and solidifying the partnerships to assure that when we face the pandemic or any other public health challenge, we would be well positioned to protect the health and well-being of our communities. Um, I'm sure you all know this year we were called upon to activate those skills in response to COVID-19. And even as we're really pleased to report that the number of new cases in our jurisdiction has been on the decline, we anticipate that we'll be in the midst of this pandemic for months to come. Uh, I'm extremely proud of the way my staff and Medical Reserve Corps volunteers have risen to this occasion and of the way our communities have worked together to help assure that our residents have received clear messaging, accurate, accurate and up-to-date information, and most recently access to the vaccine. While our public health emergency preparedness and response activities are in the spotlight now, they represent only a fraction of the everyday work that happens at Ledge Light Health District and other districts across the state. Assuring food safety through routine and complaint inspections, addressing residents' concerns about pests and other nuisances, protecting children from lifelong repercussions of elevated blood lead levels, and responding to the ongoing opiate epidemic, providing education and support for people with living with, with diabetes, working with community partners to address the negative public health outcome, excuse me, negative public health outcomes resulting from systemic racism. These are only the few of the areas that we work, uh, work on every day, including through this pandemic response. Um, it is critical that we bring to light what this emergency has meant at the local level. We have been repeatedly called upon to do more public health work with less funding, and our ability to continuously respond is truly reaching its limit. My staff and the staff of my colleagues across the state are stretched so thin, uh, overworked, and underfunded for sure. And this isn't something that's new. Um, while this has continued for some time, it has never been more apparent than during this pandemic. Um, while maintaining all of our other responsibilities, we've been entrenched in this preparation and response from tracking travelers at the beginning of the pandemic, conducting contact tracing uh, activities and providing ma mass vaccinations most recently, we haven't stopped. Uh, and it's important to note that we have a cadre of 330 Medical Reserve Corps volunteers who are essential to this pandemic response. Their contributions to our contact tracing efforts, community preparedness, and mass vaccination capabilities are imperative to the emergency preparedness efforts. We simply couldn't do it without these unpaid volunteers. And let me repeat that. The folks who are doing the majority of vaccinations for local health departments like Ledge Light Health District are unpaid volunteers. We have to rely on unpaid volunteers to do this critical public health work because of the lack of funding. Please help us protect the public health communities you serve by immediately increasing the local per capita, per capita allocation for local public health departments and districts. Thank you very much for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you for, for testifying tonight. Have a good evening. Um, Heather Markey, Heather? Good Hi there. Good evening, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, uh, Representative Abercrombie, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Heather Marquis, and I'm speaking on behalf of my organization, Goodwill of Western and Northern Connecticut. Uh, our locally incorporated and independently run Goodwill has had the privilege of providing community-based services to residents of 104 Connecticut towns throughout a variety of state, with the help of a variety of state agencies. We serve individuals who've survived brain injuries, um, individuals who struggle with mental health challenges, the underemployed and individuals with intellectual and developmental diagnosis. Our community impact extends to over 13,000 Connecticut residents. And in the last year alone, our goodwill has helped uh, over 4,200 individuals achieve um, with, uh, employment or help towards employment in our self-funded career centers. Thanks for the opportunity to testify on House Bill 6439. As this committee in particular is well aware, nonprofits have spent much, much of the last decade doing more with less while desperately trying to preserve the safety net for our state's most vulnerable residents. 
We've partnered with state agencies to navigate past budget crises and more recently endured our largest battle to date with COVID. We've done all of this willingly and never more devoted to our mission. And in this adversity, we've seen the most inspiring heroic efforts from our employees on the front lines and those supporting them. There have been so many sleepless nights of worry, impossible decisions made, and long shifts always with the same goal, protecting and supporting those we serve. We do want to take a minute and, and show our gratefulness and appreciation to the state agencies, and in particular DDS and DMIS, who without their support and co continuity of funding, we would not have been able to continue programming or continue to keep some of our program staff employed. And I think that's important to note. But today we're really here to talk about opportunity, the opportunity that this committee has to make a difference with the newfound availability of funding. It's time to invest in nonprofits and the services we provide. We're asking you guys to invest in a sure bet. You know how much we can do with so little, you've seen it. Imagine what we could do with just a bit more. By funding these services, we could expand the quality of the safety net and preserve staff morale, and quite frankly, the field of human services. Specifically, nonprofits would be able to affect retention expand training, enable better use of technology and invest in data analytics that would further outcomes and quality of services to the people that we serve. You've heard the ask, and I won't go over it again, um, with the exception of bringing back uh, the magic number of 461, we're asking the same thing, and a special focus on the um, index increases to inflation. I think we keep coming back to this every year. And wouldn't it be nice to have a mechanism that kind of takes that into account? We really appreciate everything that you guys have done on this committee. It's like coming home sometimes to uh, warm welcomes. We know that you understand our plight and uh, we are excited to partner and we're hopeful this time that maybe it can make a difference. Thank you so much for your time and your consideration. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Have a good evening. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Heather Renee Paul. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, Senator Austin, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Let me start by thanking you for your hours of commitment today, and thank you for the opportunity to testify for the first time and also on House Bill 6439 to request more money for the community nonprofits in Connecticut. My name is Heather Renee Paul, and I am proud to work as a unit director at Reliance Health in downtown Norwich. I have exclusively worked at Reliance Health for the past 11 years, and during this time, I have seen firsthand the major effect our small budgets have had on our employees and our members. It has been made obvious that we have been in need of funding for so long, but the recent stress of the pandemic and the uncertain political climate I have seen more people experience mental health in their lives, even for the first time than ever before. And it's not gonna go away anytime soon. Our nonprofit compensation is not matching the severity of the work that we are doing each and every day. And when I mean severity, I mean that at any given hour of our day, we could have someone reach out to us saying that, I feel like I'm gonna kill myself. How do I get tested for COVID-19 without taking the city bus? I really need help getting into a detox program today. I don't have anywhere to sleep tonight. I am out of food and it's the weekend and the list goes on and on. Aside from tackling those challenging tasks, then we go home and we deal with the struggle of putting food on our tables, paying bills with credit cards, paying out of pocket payments for medical expenses because our deductible is so high that it'll absolutely never be reached. It makes sense that staff are going elsewhere to find employment and just leaving their jobs. It's also a slap in the face and seriously offensive that the state of Connecticut is hiring at an average of $33 an hour, but my nonprofit agency is only able to provide $14.75 an hour to do the same work, if not more work, but with less resources. Aside from the wage disparity, let's resonate on this. I worked with someone who left our agency one month ago because there was more money and resources available to her from state aid than in the nonprofit sector. Even though she loved her job, she had to leave. 
We work in the nonprofit sector because it's a part of our core values and because it's our passion. We don't do it for the money because there is none. We've just grown accustomed to living and surviving on poverty wages. I calculated it and our staff actually receive approximately $12 more per day than someone who qualifies for Medicaid. No one goes into the nonprofit sector though expecting to get rich, but shouldn't we all have enough money so we can survive and have a good work-life balance? My closing remarks is that I'm really tired of saying I believe in Connecticut and that this year things will change and the money is going to be coming. I have been providing false promises to my staff and to myself every day for years. This should not take 14 years to figure out. And I know you all know this. Something has got to change. I know that we can do better and we have to do better. Connecticut has to do better. But thank you for all that you do. I know that you're our allies and I thank you for your time today. And I would love to have a button that says 461. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your testimony and your statement about the fact that you're just a little bit above Medicaid makes it yeah. really brings it back home. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Jen, I can't get the last name, Surat, Surat uh, number 200. Saracen. <laughs> Saracen, is that a C? Okay, I've got scribbling over your name, sorry. No problem. Hi everybody, thanks for sticking in this late. Um, I will make my testimony short and sweet. I'm Jen Saracen, I am a QA director for Class Poems in Westport. I have worked for Class Poems for 32 years and I can count on my hand the years that we were able to give our staff raises. Our staff go year after year without raises. We work tirelessly on fundraising so that we can give some type of incentive to keep them working for us. It's mind blowing that they stay. They work every day with great responsibility on their shoulders. They are responsible for the well-being of people's lives. Over the years, I have thought to myself, you know, why do we stay working in such a stressful job for such little pay? The only answer I ever come up with is if we don't do it, who will? We care deeply for the people we serve and they need good people to watch out for them to ensure more than just their basic needs are being met. It's becoming harder and harder to hire good qualified people because people are figuring out that they can apply for a much less stressful job and make the same money? When is the state going to see that we need to invest in the people who need day-to-day -day care? In today's world, I would expect nothing less. After 32 years, I think it's finally time to pay our employees what they're worth. And especially after this COVID year, we had employees that put their lives on the line every day through this pandemic. They showed up and ensured the safety of each individual we serve. They deserve to finally be compensated and paid for the priceless work that they do. I thank you so much for your time and for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for your testimony and thank you for, for hanging in there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good evening. Uh, Luis Perez. Luis Perez. If you're muted. You're muted. Story of my COVID life. <laughs> um, so, uh, Thank you, Representative Walker, and good to see you and Senator Alston and, and the rest of the committee. Uh, we really appreciate the time uh, that you have afforded us today uh, to speak uh, on behalf of those that we serve and on behalf of um, those that uh, serve them. Um, I am speaking uh, on behalf of um, House Bill 6439. You have my uh, formal testimony, uh, so I won't go in that. Uh, I do want to point out some of the things that I have heard throughout the day, which I believe are salient um, reasons why 6439 should go forward. Excuse me, and I also want to share a personal experience. Um, so um, you have heard from program participants, both from MHC and throughout the system of, of work, really courageous individuals, um, special um, shout out to Mr. Benoit, who hung in there, and thank you, Senator Olson, for um, uh, uh, allowing him to, to give his testimony above time. Uh, that was amazing. Um, I also want to uh, point out that, you know, you've heard from our board chair, vice chair, uh, our uh, staff, 
uh, and our other program participants um, that uh, benefit from the services that they receive. Um, I think that uh, they have really uh, captured uh, the need uh, for this funding going forward. Um, but I also think that there are some things that we need to recognize, and that is that um, as a um, resident of Connecticut, my family has called Connecticut home since 1974. Uh, we have uh, generated three generations of um, individuals that have gone in both into public service in the areas of medical, um, education, uh, social work. Um, we're very proud uh, to be recipients of, of the benefits of being Connecticut residents. But today, not everybody is benefiting from the quality of life that Connecticut promises. Mm -hmm. And our staff and our program participants are at the bottom of that rung. So I really want to uh, underscore the fact that if we're going to address change going forward, uh, we need to address the social determinants of health. That's what most of the dollars that come from state funding besides Medicaid, right? And those rates need to be adjusted so that we can have access and providers that are able to provide those services. However, if we don't address the social determinants of health, which I can point you to many studies that show that um, they are the determinants that will lower cost in terms of primary care, mental health, substance use, we will be failing our Connecticut residents and the hope for them to be able to become productive members of the community. Our staff members cannot enjoy the hope of home ownership. They cannot enjoy the hope of providing um, the care for their families because they're, provide, they're, they're working two and three hours uh, a, 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 or two, three jobs a, uh, a week. Um, so they cannot be there for their family members. And that's our future you. as well. So I, I, I will wrap it up. Uh, as you know, I am very passionate about the work that we do. And I do want to thank you uh, very much uh, for the attention, for your leadership, and in particular, uh, for your comments during the uh, uh, press conference earlier in February. Uh, the covenant must be kept. Thank you so much all and thank you for your time and thank you for staying this late and sorry for the uh, other three that are behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good evening. Thank you, you too. Uh, Sarah the master. Hello, good evening. Um, I, uh, Representative Walker, uh, Senator Austin and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. I also, I also wanna take a second in the beginning to thank all of the staff um, that I know are working behind the scenes and. Um, I know you've been up uh, since probably earlier than me this morning. So thank you so much for all of your work in putting this public hearing together and making this process as accessible as possible to the public. Um, I'm the manager of government relations and public policy for the Community Health Center Association of Connecticut. Um, I'm here today, I'm here today on behalf of our health centers. We operate 17 health centers throughout the state. We collectively serve 400,000 patients every year. 21% um, of our patients identify as Black, and 49% of health center patients identify as Hispanic or Latino. A majority, 61% of health center patients receive Medicaid benefits. I'm immensely proud of the work that our health centers have done in fighting against this virus. Since the beginning of this, we rolled up our sleeves and we got to work. Since April of 2020, we delivered over 220,000 COVID tests to Connecticut residents. In addition to that, the Community Health Center Association has delivered millions of units of PPE to our health centers to make sure that our staff and communities remain safe. As we move beyond this pandemic and into the next phase that will hopefully be brighter and happier than where we currently are, we need to make sure that our health centers are able to recruit and retain a robust workforce. Tonight, I respectfully request that you appropriate $500,000 to the public health budget to reinstate the state loan repayment program. This program was administered for many years under the Department of Public Health and was discontinued in 2011. Neighboring states, New York, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts all have this program in place in addition to 37 other states. The Federal Health Resources and Services Administration will match state funds invested into this program up to a million dollars per year. 
The average medical student graduates with $190,000 in debt and 25% of medical students graduate with over $200,000 in debt. This amount of debt makes it very hard to work in a community in, in, to work in a community health center because other facilities are able to offer higher salary ranges than we are. We need these people to work in our health centers though. It is hard enough to recruit someone to work in primary care. We need to be able to incentivize the state's primary care workforce to do the work in our community health centers. Um, I, I, I will be submitting my testimony along with additional, I, I have a ton of information, but I'd happy, I, I'll happily open it up for questions. Um, this is a really vital component of the state's, uh, of, this, of reinvesting in our state's primary care workforce. Um, I know that uh, one thing that the pandemic has highlighted is the inequities in our healthcare system. And we need to make sure that we have the workforce so that our health centers can deliver the care that they need to, to our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And um, your testimony has been submitted. So if my colleagues would like to have a conversation with you, they, they can contact you. So that would be Thank great. Thank you. Thank you. And have a great day. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, Robert Clonan. Senator Oatson, Representative Walker, and members of the Brose Appropriation Committee, uh, Representative Gilquist. Uh, most importantly, Thank you for your dedication to the people of Connecticut and for allowing me to visit with you for a brief moment. Your patience is deeply appreciated. While you have heard hundreds of stories during this long day, my hope is that my story will remain in the back of your mind during your appropriation considerations. As a young family, we had just been transferred to a new location halfway across the country. While we look forward to new challenges, there were still tears from our parents and friends as we packed the car to leave for a place where, where there would be no relatives for support and no friends or neighbors to call upon at the beginning. We felt like the pioneer pioneers starting out in our covered wagon to go west. And by coincidence, we were traveling to Indian country or as it is now called, Oklahoma. Upon arrival, one of our first requirements was to find good health care for our six week old baby. Try to imagine the shock when during our very first visit with our new pediatrician, the doctor asked, do you know that your son is blind? Wow. Added to this would be the pain of soon learning that he also had intellectual disabilities and was deaf all caused by rubella. The rubella vaccine would come into being the year that he was born, a fraction too late for us to benefit. Worse yet was to find out several years later that his younger sister had a completely unrelated incurable genetic disorder that would also require a lifetime of special care. This certainly results in a change in one's life priorities but it also ensures that the parents will be providing unrelented ad advocacy for every single person who has a disability. Along with this fight for the best possible life for our children, we have learned that there are some very special families who are willing to stand by us every step of the way, 24 hours a day. This means the Oak Hill, Hark, and Keystone Human Services family of staff and healthcare workers. During 50 plus years of daily challenges, they have always been with us, sharing their dedication, devotion, and most importantly, their love. And perhaps their toughest battle has been during this recent pandemic. In our minds, each of them deserves a medal of honor and appreciation. But I think we can also recognize them in another way that is more appropriate. The day-to-day -day workers in these families have not received adequate wage adjustments in many years because there have been no specific rate allocations to provide to, provided for in final state budgets. This certainly does not reflect the consideration, respect, and support that healthcare workers in our nonprofit community deserve. Many years, 
and no adequate rate increases in the budget. Please make provisions in the current budget that our governor has neglected to include for adequate funding over the next five years for our families who care for those with disabilities. I think the timeline for avoiding this commitment has expired. Thank you very much for all that you do. Thank you, sir, and thank you for that story. That will be something that we will remember, especially when we are debating why we need to fund the services that everybody's advocated for for tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, last, Susan Bras Brasso. Brasso? Brasso. Brasso, I'm close. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Go right ahead, ma'am. Good evening, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Susan Brusso. I am the Chief Financial Officer of Edelbrook Behavioral and Developmental Services, an organization that provides education, residences, and other support for individuals with autism spectrum disorder and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Our organization serves individuals with the highest level of need in the state. I live in Voton, Hebron, and I am a CPA with 35 years of financial experience. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on HB 6439. I am the last scheduled speaker tonight, and I sincerely appreciate that you're all still here. Uh, and here are a few thoughts as you get ready to shut down your laptops for the night. Edelbrook is part of a group of organizations known as community nonprofits. Because of the nonprofit label, there has been a misunderstanding over the years in how organizations like Edelbrook operate financially. Nonprofit simply means that we are mission driven rather than profit driven. Uh, we're governed by a board of directors and any surpluses we have at the end of the year are reinvested in our programs. More relevant to our relationship with the state is that Edelbrook serves the state as a private sector vendor. Typically residents are referred to Edelbrook for service by either DDS or DCF um, as we're an acknowledged leader in our field. We provide our services and in exchange, we are paid by the state for providing those services. We in turn pay our more than 600 staff members and more than 75% of our annual budget is for salaries and benefits for staff. And then we pay occupancy insurance and all the other costs that you would expect any business to pay. So far, so good. However, beginning in 2007, community nonprofits have had what is euphemistically referred to as flat funding. This simply means that we have been expected to provide the same or better level of services while losing real spending power at the rate of inflation each year. Our nonprofit status does not shield us from the realities of increasing healthcare and workers' compensation costs, as well as increases in many other budget lines. Our costs increase every year. As payments for services have not included a cost of living increase, Financially, many organizations operate in a permanent financial crisis mode and have a very high turnover of staff uh, as staff leave after many years without salary increases. You've heard that again and again today. Here's my real life example. Edelbrook is going out to bid for a new audit firm for fiscal 21, 22, and 23. It's just a good business practice to do this periodically. We ask each firm that is submitting a proposal to indicate their fees for the next three years. Every firm we solicited, six in total, showed increases in fiscal 22 and fiscal 23 to represent a cost of living increase to those firms. I understand why these firms would build a cost of living increase in a three-year proposal. Even at times of relatively low inflation, their costs will increase over time. However, Edelbrook's payments from DDS do not include a cost of living adjustment. How in actual practice do I cover the increase in expenses over the years if DDS does not keep its payments for the services we provide at a level that adjusts for inflation? Since 2007, community nonprofits like Edelbrook have lost at least $461 million in state funding that has not kept pace with inflation or adequately covered increased costs and demand for services over the last 13 years. I respectfully ask that the state index funding increases to inflation to ensure that state funding will keep pace 
with increased cost in the future. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, and we appreciate your offer, but it is a late night. <laughs> no? No, no. Uh, but thank you no very way. much. And, and, and I mean, I appreciate um, everything that you, you did, and I'm sure that if we have some questions, I know um, what Representative Daysom is, um, she, she is a, an accountant, I believe, or a CPA, so she might have some questions for you. Perfect. And, so I will I will make sure that she gets in, in touch with you. But I thank you for your testimony, and I thank you for being an advocate for the population that you serve so strongly. Thank you. And good night, everybody. I just want to say to everybody that's on here, all of the appropriations members, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I will, I, I'm not, wait, I haven't finished it. I also <laughs> want to say that tomorrow night is not going to be fun. Tomorrow night, we have 360 people signed up. What? So, so. What? 360? What? 176. Oh. Okay. Not much so better, Miss Keene. Thank you, sir. Way much better. <laughs> you put her in charge. <laughs> okay. Hey, thank you, Madam Administrator. Uh, I'm sorry. Boy. It's going to be like a public health I public the, chairman. I look at the sheet. The Let's first send flowers. And times twelve sheets, so uh, that's how I got to that number. So Susan, okay. that's awesome. Okay. One hundred, one hundred, one hundred and seventy-six is much better, though. I'm glad you made a mistake, Kathy. <laughs> so I just went. I was terrified when Kathy said to me, "We have three hundred and sixty." I was crying. <laughs> but, but anyway, Matt. I, I want to thank you all hey, for. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> What'd you say, Senator Meyer? I said merit in math. It's very <laughs> math. To which I take great offense. <laughs> All right, uh, 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 Ms. Keene, you uh, you have something to say to us besides the fact that you just saved us a, about eight hours tomorrow night? Um, if I were timing you, I think the bell would have gone off. So I would like to say good night, Madam Chair. Good night. <laughs> good night. 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 Good